This is Lorne Green. We're going back now to the Old West, to a time and place where life was simpler, more honest, and certainly more violent. Where men and women were always what they seemed to be, except at certain times and in certain places. And that's the story you're about to hear. A story of a man who really might not have been what he seemed. A man who felt himself to be outside the law, and who finally had to make a terrible decision. Now let me introduce you to our storyteller, the Reverend Thomas Haller, a hard, gray, little man of God, and former cavalryman, a minister well suited to the needs of his frontier flock. It was a warm April morning in 1879 when Bill Miller showed us his true colors. Picture him now in his general store on Main Street, sweating a bit in spite of the mildness of the day. A small boy named Jason had just returned from delivering the latest order of groceries and rubs on his sleeve the bright new copper penny he has earned. Bill Miller is tired and bored. His last customers, a pair of churchly ladies, poked their noses through his finest yards of Belgian lace for nearly an hour, then went away declaring none of it fit for purchase. Ah, but here are two new customers... Yeah, storekeep. We want to look at your dresses. Yeah, we want to look at your dresses. Well, I think you gents come to the wrong place. The Tin Dipper's right next door, as fine a saloon as ever served three-day-old rot gut. And so they looked each other over. The middle-aged storekeeper in the loose white apron and string tie. And two easy-moving men with rimroll stetsons low over wide, dark, staring eyes. Miller's heart was beating very fast, as it always did when he'd faced a real hard case or two. But on this soft-spoken April morning, something new entered the equation. These two hard cases were in for a surprise themselves, for they've just met a storekeeper who's just a little bit more than they'd ever met before. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, The Storekeeper, by John Allen. Our stars, John Larch, Keith Andes, Mary Jane Croft, and Vic Perrin. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of fine names to make Sears names stand for quality. Names you've always counted on, like Kenmore, Craftsman, Easy Living, and Die Hard. Names that kids and moms cheer, like Winnie the Pooh and Tough Skins. Names that are a part of your life today, like Permapress, Klingalon, and Winter 2. And, of course, there's Sears Best Products in everything from T-shirts to tractors. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of truly dependable names to make our name. Sears Roebuck and Company. Helen, don't buy that pain reliever. Why not? They're all the same. Check the labels. Okay, uh, two tablets of regular Tylenol, 650 milligrams. Check the other pain relievers, too. Bayer, 650 milligrams. Bufferin, 650 milligrams. Anison, oh, 800 milligrams. I didn't know Anison had more pain reliever. That's what makes Anison different. More pain reliever and a special combination of medical ingredients. I'm switching to Anison. Get the Anison difference. Use only as directed. We are back in Bill Miller's general store at what one might call the moment of truth, although they would laugh at that phrase in a western town of the 1870s. As the Reverend Haller tells us, Two men face the third, the storekeeper, and he makes a guess that really isn't a guess. I think you gents want what's in the cash drawer. Who is it now? He reads our mind. (laughs) Okay, mind reader, just open up the till. Here, let me help you. 
really hate to have you take it. Worked awful hard for them few dollars. Well, look at the trouble we're saving you taking it to the bank. Get it, Bob. You boys are making a mistake. Oh, under the apron. He had a belly gun. I ain't never seen it so fast. Jason, boy, go for the marshal and the doctor. Here, here, take these guns and lay them outside the door where the marshal can pick them up. I told you, boys. Now you just slide down there and rest easy till the sawbones comes. Marshal Blodgett restored the peace, though he had very little to do at that point. He invited storekeeper Miller down to his office at the jail for a little talk. I was a witness to that conversation, for I'd been tasting the marshal's bitter coffee that soft April morning. The boy, Jason, had just stammered out a story of the shooting to the marshal. It had been excused with another bright copper penny, promising to go home and tell his mama all about it. And he surely will tell her, too. Be all over town by noon. Well, Mr. Miller, you did shoot two men just now. You'd expect it wouldn't be all over town? Well, I guess... You ever see those two before? Nope. Little Walt Besser and Bob Morgan. Two curly wolves, if ever I seen them. How did they make your acquaintance, sir? Well, they just come in the store and went for the money. I asked them not to. Would have given them a dollar each for a bath and a few beers that asked me. But much to your surprise, they didn't ask. Nope. No curly wolves, like you call them. They, they never do. They never do. And so? And so, well, they went for the cash drawer, and I slammed it on the tall one's hand and went for the belly gun. Never noticed you carried a weapon. <laughs> well, uh, under the apron with, with my beer belly and all, you don't really see it. May I see it now? Oh, sure. Here. <clears throat> don't see many of these short-barreled Colts. How many times you fire it? In the store? Well, two was all it took. Lucky I was close to them. Chance to aim. For the shoulder. You worry me, Mr. Miller. You're just a touch too good with a revolver for a common storekeeper. Gunfighters make me nervous. <laughs> me too, Marshal. Uh, could I have a cup of that coffee? Oh, sure. <laughs> Here you are, Mr. Miller. Uh, drink slowly. It'll take the skin off your bones. Mr. Miller, where do you hail from? Maslon, Ohio. I know that town. And where were you before you came here? Um, too many questions, Marshal. Don't like to talk about it. That store won't do too well if you're spending the day in my jail. Hmm. I guess not. All right, I drifted around. After the war, I punched cows up in Kansas. Worked on the railroad out of Abilene. Drove a freight wagon. Went back home, got a steak from a dad. Came out and bought old Benson's store. You know the rest. You do look familiar. You ever wear a beard? No, sir. Been clean-shaved all my life. Serve in the war? Yes, sir. Oh, Ohio Cavalry Unit. And so did I, sir. What was your regiment? Oh, not too long ago. Don't remember. Marshal, can I go now? I guess so. Jason Boy tells the truth most of the time, and from his story, he was pushed. Those two curly wolves that pushed you do have a certain stink around these parts. Quite up to doing what you said they did. Here, Miller, your short colts. It'll need cleaning. Yeah, thank you, sir. It surely will. Don't use it again, Miller. Not in my territory. Oh, hope not ever to have to use it again anywhere, Marshal. You believe him? The shooting? Yes. He saved me some trouble with those two badens. There's something... Familiar about him. Can't get a hold of it. Well, I'll tell you something familiar, Reverend. I know a gunfighter when I see one. One good thing, when this story gets around, his cash drawer is going to be safe as a church. <laughs> Safer than my church. <laughs> Marshal, you seem very nervous these past few days. I didn't know it showed. What would you say if I was to tell you we're going to have a shipment of gold in this town in the next few days that'll pop your eyes right out of your head? Well, I'd say that I have to go now and ring the bells for vespers. But tonight, well, I usually start to write my Sunday sermon. But if you want to come over tonight and talk about a shipment of gold that'll make my eyes pop, 
why the sermon can always wait a while. A performance story from Phillips Petroleum. My name's Pete Wirt. I'm president of a paving company here in Oklahoma City. We fixed a lot of streets in the past few years, some more than once. It seems we kept repairing the same places and the same streets year after year. Excuse me. Hey, JR, move that roller off the map. Sorry. We just couldn't always get the repairs to last. Then about four years ago, the city decided to try a new fabric underliner from the Phillips people. They called it Petromat, and they said it would make the streets last longer. Well, they weren't kidding. Where it's been used here in the city, there hasn't been a single pothole. Not one. Not one in four years. Which means not a single cent of taxpayers' money has been spent to repair them. And I'm happy about that, because part of that tax money is mine. Phillips Petroleum. Good things for cars and the people who drive them. In the cool of an April evening, as he worked on his next Sunday's sermon, Reverend Haller welcomes his friend, Marshall Blodgett, in the study of his modest church. I've been sort of nervous lately, as you remarked earlier. Something big coming up. That golden egg mine. The old shaft up there behind Buttercup Mountain? Yes, sir. Nobody knows it yet, but the golden egg is played out. Mine manager, sassy old cuss named McGraw, he sent me a message a month ago. Vane's played out. No more gold. He's letting go them 15 miners he's got up there. Going to give him double the last month's wages and what he calls severance pay. Mm. Conscience money, I expect. And that's my problem. A lot of money when you lump it together. So much that it's risky to make the payoff up at the mine. Too easy for somebody to slide in there and steal that payroll. Yeah, probably three, four thousand dollars. <laughs> You're close. Anyhow, McGraw is going to have the payoff down here tomorrow at the bank. The cash is coming in tonight by stage, all in gold. McGraw don't hold with paper money. Nor do many people around these parts. That much gold draws baddens like flies to honey. I do figure we may have company. You know something? Well, been checking around. Spent a month's pay on telegrams. Got every wanted poster in three states lying on my desk right now. Uh. Now, where do you come out? Well, best odds to hit us is an outfit called the Mason Gang. Very smooth fellas. Always scout it out first and keep their numbers small as they can. I think I heard a song about the Masons once. Hmm. Let's see, how did it go? Uh, uh, one for the front door, one for the back, and one to get the money in the old gunny sack. And one to hold the horses. Yep. They do banks that way, just the four of them. Well, but they could be anywhere in a thousand miles. What says they'll come here? Just that funny feeling you get in this business. You've been around long enough. And one thing they're noted for, have it from the sheriff at Medville, old Lonnie Sims. They hit a bank on him there last spring. Lonnie says, watch for their scout. The guy comes into town weeks ahead, sets himself up as a businessman, so as to look the place over. I still don't see why you connect the Mason gang to this. Old Lonnie Sims says their scout sometimes sets itself up as a storekeeper. Let me introduce you now to two new friends on a picnic. Bill Miller, the storekeeper, has driven Elizabeth Slater, the schoolteacher, out to a cool and piney glade High on a granite cliff above the town of Eagle Ridge. See a long way from here. Ah, you certainly can. I brought cold chicken and a bottle of wine. Wine? Where the heck did you get wine out here? Oh, they freighted it in for me. <laughs> school teacher with a wine cellar. How do you buy wine on ten dollars a month, school teacher? I am of independent <clears throat> means, Mr. Miller. Isn't that why you're courting me? <laughs> no, it's because you're a, a beautiful lady in a land where the beautiful ain't ladies and vice versa. Then you laugh easy. And you have a sparkle like the moon and the river. And I do cook very good chicken. Yes, you do. Yeah. And I'll take a drumstick. Um, as soon as you've tried your luck with this wine cork. And 
And later, Bill Miller lay with his head in Miss Slater's lap and looked up and knew pine trees had never been so beautiful. She leaned aside to escape the smoke of his Mexican cigar and asked him a question. Who are you, really? Bill Miller, storekeeper. Yes, and I'm a refugee princess from Imperial China. (laughs) Oh, really? You're somebody else, Bill Miller. You walk kind of carefully, and you have a way of using your eyes when you come into a room. That's not like any storekeeper I ever saw. You've got big, soft hands that haven't really lifted store boxes and bales in years. Mm, What does all that mean? Well, I'm attracted to you. But I don't know if I want to be around any man very long when I don't know who he really is. I wonder about you too, Elizabeth Slater. School teacher who lives by herself in a big house, drives match Morgan trotting horses to her hundred dollar rig, keeps a wine cellar, and freezes the men who come courting her with a stare as sharp as a January icicle. I didn't freeze you, did I? No, but you <laughs> you made me push those school kids of yours in that tree swing almost an hour before you came out to thank me. <laughs> You looked so funny, pushing the swing and twisting your head to try to see me through the window. You didn't look quite comfortable. And school teacher doesn't seem quite comfortable for you, Elizabeth Slater. Oh, it's a way to live. Gives one peace, everything but money. But I have enough of that. And no inheritance either. I made it myself. Hmm. Honesty becomes you, Miss Slater. Especially when it might get you in trouble if it was to be spread around. Let's just say that a long time ago in San Francisco, there was a girl who ran a mm, boarding house, and she was very good at it, made lots of money. But she learned to hate it. And one day she just got up the nerve to sell the boarding house, to come back to the mountains, teach school, because her mother taught school. She always loved her mother. Oh, you see this, Mr. Storekeeper or somebody else. I'll use this on you some dark night if you ever repeat a word of what I've said. Put that little pistol away, please. Sorry. So am I. You can trust me without a gun, Elizabeth Slater. Now, I'll ask you to pour me some more of that clear white wine that's stronger than it looks. Chablis, Mr. Miller. Oh, thank you. Chablis. And now, let me tell you about a man I know. Farm kid from Ohio. Went with the cavalry to Shiloh and some other places. Learned to like shooting. Found out he was really good at it. But learned also that it's a little easier to talk your way to what you want than to shoot for it. Hmm. He got bent. This boy did bent real crooked. And he couldn't blame bad company or whatever. He just... Like the easy way of things outside the law. Like what? Well, like helping banks figure out what to do with their money. (laughs) I heard a little rhyme about a man like that. One for the front door, one for the back. One to put the money in an old gunny sack. Where'd you hear that? One of the children came to school singing it. A harmless little tune about a robber gang called the Masons. Yeah, there's another line. And one to hold the horses. You've always got to have somebody hold the horses. You know how bank robbers work, Mr. Miller? Uh, well, no. We we had to have horse holders in the cavalry, you see, whenever we fought dismounted. Oh, of course. Ah, why is it? Why do I have such bad luck with men? Here I've met this very interesting man, and now I'm afraid he'll be shot for a bank robber. Look, Elizabeth the Beautiful, pour us the last of that wine... And believe me when I tell you I'm just a plain old storekeeper. You don't talk like a storekeeper. You don't shoot like a storekeeper. Bet you don't even kiss like a storekeeper. Mm, Worse luck if I did. Here, madam. You may judge for yourself. As a storekeeper and a teacher tried to untangle each other's identities but decided to fall in love instead. A worried little Scotsman visited the marshal in his office far below the picnic pines. The owner of the Golden Egg Mine, Angus McGraw, tried to fence off his fear and tension with bluster, but it didn't really work. Oh, 
For gore. Angus McGraw, the golden egg. I know you. None of your damn jokes about how we're all out of golden eggs. I didn't name the god for second mine. I'd let them call it anything they wanted if my uncle willed me a gold mine. I'll take none of your lip, Sheriff. Marshal, please. No sheriff here. I'm deputy marshal for this territory, Mr. McGraw. And if you insist on raising your voice to me, I shall have you take your chair and sit out in the street. I am worth a million dollars, sir. I've never thrown a man worth a million dollars out of my office. But there's always a first time. Marshal, I'm scared as hell. You've heard the rumors about the gang? Well, yes, the Mason gang I've been hearing about, but only rumors. Where are all your armed guards to cover the payoff tomorrow? I wrote you that I'd pay for up to 20 rifles. My lord, we're up against the slickest gang of bank robbers west of the Mississippi. Now, Mr. McGraw, no one even knows if the Masons are within a thousand miles. And even if they are, they only come to four men. We are not fighting the massed armies of Emperor Napoleon. Well, the payout starts at noon tomorrow. My miners and their families will all be here. I don't feel too good about losing their jobs in the first place. When they find out the payroll's been McGraw, stole... McGraw, the payroll ain't gonna be stole. Now, why don't you just get the hell out of here and come back when your money stage rolls in tonight? According to this magazine, Stanley, we don't kiss enough. Look, I get these cold sores. It hurts to kiss. Stop hurting. Start healing with Camphophonique. Just a touch of medically effective Camphophonique instantly stops pain of cold sores, helps speed healing by killing infectious germs and forming a protective Amadian shield. Bet our scores improved since a week ago. Mm, way above average. Stop hurting. Start healing with Camphophonique, the little green bottle full of first aid. Use only as directed. Every time I shop, it seems prices have gone up. Well, I found a way to save money without sacrificing my family's nutrition. A few times a week, I serve an egg dish for dinner. Scrambled eggs, omelets, the cookbooks are full of recipes. And egg dishes are high in protein. Eggs are one of today's best food buys. For instance, when eggs cost 75 cents a dozen, they're only 50 cents a pound. The Incredible Edible Egg. The American Egg Board. After Angus McGraw, the manager of the played-out mine, slammed out of his office, Marshal Blodgett had a feeling of uneasiness, and he certainly wouldn't have felt any better if he'd been at the town's bank at that moment. Storekeeper Miller was making a deposit and taking his time about it. Here you are, teller. $18.32. Oh, I'll take a receipt, thank you. (laughs) Not much to show for a week's work. Thank you, sir. And here's your receipt. Uh, Mr. Miller, sir. I said, here's your receipt. Huh? Oh, yeah. Say, nice, cozy little bank you got here. Just the one front door. Suppose you have a back door, too. Oh, yes, sir. Back there. You have to go through the manager's office to get to it. (laughs) He likes to see who comes in and out the back way, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) And your accounting room? Don't have one. Any big shipments come in, see? We just use the manager's office there. Ah, I think that would make it easy for a, a bank robber just to slip in by the back and take what he wanted, if he knew they was working there. No, sir, not that easy. It's double locked, and we keep a 12-gauge by the door to uh, answer any knocks we don't expect. Ah, oh, <laughs> yes, I, I think that would do the job. Well, thank you, Teller. I wish you a good day now. Well, it'll be a long one for sure. Got to come back after supper and help count something special. Be a long night. Yes. Yeah, I expect it will. Good day to you. And Marshal Blodgett would have been even more uneasy had he been able to see into a clump of pines high on the canyon rim about seven miles east of the town. Well back in those pines were tied three big gaunt horses, the kind of stringy hammerheads favored by frontier cavalry. And sitting beside a very small fire, sipping coffee out of Battered army mess cups were three tired and edgy men, bearded, heavily armed. One glanced at a battered pocket watch slid from a greasy leather vest and then nodded. 
The fire was doused with the last of the bit of coffee. And the men slouched to their horses, tightened saddle cinches, slid short rifles into scabbards, and mounted up. They rode their horses out to the canyon's flinty lip, sat there huddled in their faded blue army tunics against the cooling twilight wind. One man lifted a battered spyglass to his eye, watched a plume of brown dust swirl down the road far below. Soon all three could see the dusty brown stagecoach trailed by no less than seven men, each with a long gun across his saddle horn. The three men high on the granite cliff smiled at each other, the lip-drawing smile of the curly wolf, for such they were. And then three of the four members of the notorious mason gang turned and picked their way slowly down the cliffs, down a trail that would bring them to the dusty road a comfortable mile or so behind that galloping stagecoach in its heavy pine boxes of gold coins for which they had plans that night. The marshal and I took our supper that night at Elder Bennett's boarding house, as we usually do Thursdays. The marshal and I have often discussed how Mrs. Elder Bennett can take good steaks from well-fed steers and turn them into thick brown boards that'll separate your teeth from your gums. But we agree that the only thing less to be desired is to eat our own cooking all the time. Well, we were joined at supper that night by storekeeper Miller. The marshal saw him passing on the street and pressed the invitation. Our conversation over the first cup of coffee was somewhat strained. Well, uh, thank you, gentlemen, for inviting me to sup with you. Say, Reverend Haller, pardon my remarking it, but are you carrying iron tonight? Uh, well, well yeah, yes, I am. I, uh, <laughs> since I am found out, I shall take this old war souvenir out of my belt where it's been bruising my stomach and lay it on my lap. Uh, much better. A little strange, ain't it? Ministers supposed to wear Bibles in their holsters, not a, a Colt's Dragoon. Oh, you're right. Of course, Mr. Miller. But uh, later on tonight, I intend being in a place uh, out of curiosity where I may need to protect myself. The bank, you see, has... Reverend a... Haller. <laughs> well, even a moonlight walk in these parts requires a precaution or two. That old horse pistol looks well used. Mm. <laughs> well, it's, it's time it was, sir. Though I, I must register the fact that it has not been used since I took the cloth. Oh, war service, sir? Oh, I had the honor to serve in the 5th Ohio Cavalry. Did you now? And suddenly it burst upon me. This middle-aged, clean-shaven storekeeper. I knew where I'd seen him before. And I wanted to shout a welcome to an old comrade on arms, but, but something cautioned me, held me back. The 5th Ohio Cavalry, you say? Gentlemen... I see that Mrs. Elder Bennett is still frying those poor steaks long after they're done, so let me take a moment for a tale from the war. A tale that may interest you especially, Mr. Miller. We were at Shiloh in a nasty little tangle that shortly became a nasty big tangle. I rode with my colonel down to Pittsburgh Landing to get new orders from that hard little man, Grant. And we found him by the stink of his cigars, even in the dark. And on the way back, we got lost, miserably lost. We blundered into a rebel picket, and my colonel was shot and dragged into a creek by his horse. I took a ball in the shoulder and went down, too, but managed to clear my stirrups. Well, just then, four men on horses came flying through the creek at a gallop, spraying water and revolver shots like a Fourth of July celebration. They bounced me and my colonel up behind their saddles and galloped us back to our lines. Oh, uh, thank you, Mrs. Bennett. Now, the young corporal who rescued us was a boy named Bob Mason, possessing a fine, full beard despite his tender years, and he and the three who rode with him were inseparable, served out the war, then told us they were going west together. Now, word has it that they found it easier to live by robbing banks than by honest work, and they took the corporal's name as their name, the Mason Gang. You tell a good war story, Reverend. It does not ring a bell of memory? None at all. My Lord, this state... And I suppose you never wore a full beard, sir? Nope. And you never served with the 5th Ohio Cavalry at Shiloh? I don't remember my regiment, Reverend. And you're spoiling my dinner with your questions. Men make very close associations with the units with which they serve in the war, Mr. Miller. 
I find it passing strange that your memory is so poor... Your collar prevents me from saying what I should like to say just now, sir. Gentlemen! For a few moments that evening, death was the fourth companion at our supper table. The storekeeper's hand was just inside his coat where it might rest easily on the butt of the short barrel revolver he had used with such recent skill. I let my eyes roll slightly toward the marshal. Saw his thumb slide the thong off the hammer spur of his revolver. And I must confess something against which I was to pray forgiveness for many a night. My own hand was about my revolver. The hammer coming back under my thumb. Then, Miller's elbow hit the table. <laughs> well, there, I've, I've lost mistake. Well, gentlemen, I've other business this evening. Would you excuse me now and pay Mrs. Bennett for me when you pay your own? Marshal, Reverend, good night. The Bell System presents Mr. Ray Charles. Reach out, reach out and touch someone. Reach out, call up and just say hi. Won't you reach out, reach out and touch someone. Never too far. They're waiting just to share your day. You can touch base with all your friends and family wherever they happen to be. All it takes is a thought and a telephone, and it feels so good. People from coast to coast calling up friends to keep them close. Mm. Families who care so much, don't you know? They're keeping in touch. They're keeping in touch. Your telephone keeps you close no matter how far away you are. And keeping close is the best reason to call up and say hi. Reach out, reach out and touch Lorne Green again, and here's the fourth act of The Storekeeper. The next chapter of that memorable evening in our raw little town occurred at the gabled mansion of our so-called teacher, Miss Slater. I heard about it much later from the lady herself. Evening, Elizabeth. Why, Mr. Miller, Bill, it's late, uh, but come in. Yeah, I can't, I can't, but I need, I need to talk. Can you come out on the porch and sit with me a minute? If you want. I've got a shawl right here. Oh, good, good. Why don't we sit here on the swing? You're awfully nervous. Yeah, I am. I can't tell you why either. just wanted to see again. Before I go. Oh? You're leaving? I'm so sorry. Now, don't go and get that schoolmarm's tone to your voice. I don't need it. Yes, I have to go one way or the other. I'm not sure which. Sounds like a melodrama. Our hero has come to a fork in the road. Yes, damn it, I have, and it's driving me crazy. And it doesn't include me? Bill Miller, I have some rights in your decision, too. We love each other. At least we say we do. I want us to be together. After the knocks we've had, we deserve a chance at something good. They know who I am. That day on the picnic, that was the truth I told you. I'm Bob Mason, and tonight we're going to take that mine payroll. Or we were... I don't want to know what you're going to do tonight. Don't tell me. Uh, too many things against it. I know these people too well in this half-dead town. For the first time in my life, I want to be a storekeeper. Bring people things they need and make a little money at it, too. They know who I am, Matt Marshall, and, and the minister had me cornered in the boarding house tonight eating supper. The minister, I saved him once at Shiloh. He remembers me. They had you cornered, a sleepy old marshal and a man of God? Mm, but your pretty face they did. Oh, I know a shooting situation when I see it. That sleepy old marshal was half drawn out of his holster... Yeah, and your man of God had an old Colts Dragoon right up on full cock, and he really wanted to use it. But you're really not running from them. <laughs> nope. You know, when my when my three friends come in, I can take that mine payroll slick as a whistle. They have a back door to the counting room. We can just blow down easy, be in and out before the dust settles. But you're not going to. Well, I'd like to be not gone to, but my three curly wolves, they don't take no for an answer, not even from me. Yeah. Maybe the easiest thing is just to do it and get the hell out of here. 
Could you do it without shooting? Could you do it without shooting, Mr. Mason? I heard you. And you know the answer. Good night. I don't know what you're going to do tonight, but I hope I see you again sometime. Now, I'm going to go and get a bottle of very good wine, drink it all very slowly, because I won't be able to sleep tonight. And I hope we both see the sun come up tomorrow. I sat with the marshal. And in the manager's cramped little shoebox of an office in the bank that night, watched the tired teller slide shiny gold coins out of sacks taken from the thick pine boxes, piled them on the table, then count them into the smaller bags that would go to McGraw's miners in the morning. Uh, Marshal, it's uh, it's ten o'clock. I have to go. I didn't expect you to stay this long, but gold makes a man want to stay and watch, don't it? Yeah, I've seen more of it tonight than I may see the rest of my life. <laughs> Now, you understand, I have to go. I don't need you. Yes, but but you're all alone. Not quite. Spent some of McGraw's money, hired four of them guards that come in with the money stage tonight. But I saw them all leave with the coach. You surely did. But you didn't see them come back in after dark. Two in the livery stable in the alley where they can cover the back door. Two more sitting on the porch across the street. So you've got some help. (laughs) <laughs> well, I, I'd wish you a good night's sleep, but that'd be the worst thing that could happen, falling asleep. No, no sleep tonight. Not till after that money goes to the miners tomorrow. I didn't sleep much that night either. But instead climbed the rickety ladder to the bell tower of my church with my old spyglass to see a sight I shall never forget. At a little past midnight... A full moon popped up over the shoulder of the eastern mountains. And down the eastern trail, with the moon at their backs, came three men, cantering along almost without a sound, on horses whose hooves must have been wrapped in gunny sacks. I was sure it was the rest of the Mason gang. I raised my old revolver to fire three warning shots, but uh, held back. I saw a single figure break from the brush at the edge of the town and ride hard toward the men coming in. And they stopped, talked. Then all four turned and went back east along the trail, walking their horses slowly as though they were talking together. And suddenly, the talking ended. I hope you never have to see the Colts revolver fired at night. But if you do... You will remark how bright the muzzle flashes can be, how they can light up the sudden violence of jumping, frightened horses as three tired and angry men attempt to kill a fourth. And then the shots fade into the mountains, and the distant running horses' sounds flutter off into the silver night, as though you never saw a thing at all. I propped myself in the church belfry and stared at the moonrise, until at last the glow of the coming sun profiled the mountains and then climbed down my ladder and went to bed. That morning, the miners got their pay, and a happy Angus McGraw gave the marshal a bonus, almost large enough to cover all the money he had spent on telegrams about the Mason gang. But that was not the end of it. Oh, no, not quite. For there remained the question of what had happened to our storekeeper, the man who had done the right thing in spite of himself and his three violent friends. What had happened to Bill Miller? The marshal and I had our answer a few weeks later. The conclusion of our story after these words. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of fine names to make Sears names stand for quality. Names you've always counted on, like Kenmore, Craftsman, Easy Living, and Die Hard. Names that kids and moms cheer, like Winnie the Pooh and Tough Skins. Names that are a part of your life today, like Permapress, Klingalon, and Winter 2. And, of course, there's Sears Best Products in everything from T-shirts to tractors. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of truly dependable names to make our name. Sears Roebuck & Company. 
sinus flares up. I'm clogged up. Headaches. My whole face hurts. Help. Send for Sign Off. Sign Off helps relieve your pain, helps clear congestion, ease sinus pressure and post-nasal drip. Sign Off does it all. Send for Sign Off. And for the fastest known form of congestion relief, Sign Off Spray. S-I-N-E-O-F-F. Sign Off. The sinus medicines in the bright red box. Is here. For occasional use only as directed. Marshall and I heard the end of our story and the beginning of a new one. As we watched the stage prepare for departure one morning, three weeks later. Miss Slater, you're leaving us? Yes, Marshall. Good morning, Reverend. Yes, Mrs. Quackenbush will teach the children for the rest of the term. Oh, might I ask your uh, destination? I'm going back to San Francisco. Oh, then you better get in. Old Charlie's looking at his watch. (laughs) Well, I'm so happy. Old Charlie will just have to hold his stage for another minute while I tell you something. If you swear on the Bible... Oh, I do that all the time. (laughs) (laughs) I meant no offense. No, I just thought you two might like to know that I'm going to visit a very special friend. A letter came three days ago. My friend had a bad accident while hunting, shot himself, and he was near death for a time. But he's much recovered now. I am going to nurse him back to health, then assist him in a new business venture. Uh, you'll be running a general store, no doubt. hmm? You must know my friend. Goodbye. Goodbye. We handed the beautiful lady up to her seat in the coach and saw old Charlie raise his whip to the horses. But the marshal gestured at the driver and leaned to Miss Slater at the window. As you restore his health, please try to break his bad habits, Miss Slater. Like wearing a Colt's revolver under his apron. (laughs) Oh, my yes, Marshal. But we've already broken him of one bad habit, haven't we? Mm. The others will just have to take time. Reverend, come along to the tin cup. We'll have a little something to toast the Mason gang and a man who made sure they never came to visit us. How did that little song go? One for the front door, one for the back, and one to get the money in an old gunny sack. And one to hold the horses. Kellogg's waits for you, that spirit comes shining through, promising you a great day. How could you think of starting this bright new morning without your K E double L? Oh, it's double good with Kellogg's, you'll have a great day. Kellogg's has been making great days for more people for more years with more cereals than anyone. Corn Flakes, Rice Krispies, Frosted Flakes, Product 19. Trust your morning to Kellogg's. The very best part of start. Your bright new morning is Kellogg's way. It's not far away. Kellogg's will help you say it's gonna be a great. We're gonna see a great. It's gonna be The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, The Storekeeper, was written by John Allen and produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Lauren Green. Our stars were John Larch, Keith Andes, Mary Jane Croft, and Vic Perrin. Featured in the cast were Tyler McVeigh and Jack Manning. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. This is Andy Griffith. Join us tomorrow at the same time. I've got another story I think you'll find riotously amusing.
This is Lorne Green. It all seems so obvious to us now for the past to look back upon. But to those who lived it with no such past to guide them, all was mystery and terror and even worse, contradiction. We hold these truths to be self-evident, declared Thomas Jefferson in 1776. But to him, those truths were anything but self-evident one year earlier when he wrote, We mean not to dissolve that union which has so long and so happily subsisted between us. We have not raised armies with ambitious designs of separation from Great Britain and establishing independent states. No taxation without representation. What principle could be more self-evidently just? Yet in 1765, when the British passed the Stamp Act, no such principle had ever existed in America or England. What then did those vociferous colonists of 1775 really think they were doing? And why? The strangeness of it all deepens when we turn to the shadowy, remote, godlike figure of George Washington. Our 20th century minds can scarcely grasp what really moved him and why. But that is exactly what we are going to probe in the story you are about to hear. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, The Mutiny Against George Washington, by Edward Borgers. Our stars, Fletcher Markle and Tommy Cook. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of fine names to make Sears names stand for quality. Names you've always counted on, like Kenmore, Craftsman, Easy Living, and Die Hard. Names that kids and moms cheer, like Winnie the Pooh and Tough Skins. Names that are a part of your life today, like Permapress, Klingalon, and Winter 2. And, of course, there's Sears Best Products in everything from T-shirts to tractors. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of truly dependable names to make our name. Sears Roebuck and Company. Runway clear. Flight 49, you're cleared for land. Some people can't afford a sore throat. Doctors recommend chloroseptic lozenges with anesthetic action to deaden pain fast. In a medical study, adults preferring chose chloroseptic three to one over the other leading lozenge for quick, temporary relief of minor sore throat pain. Flight 63, do you read me? Loud and clear. If you can't afford a sore throat, get chloroseptic lozenges or fast-acting chloroseptic liquid. Use only as directed. We'll now hear about the mutiny against George Washington from a soldier of the Revolution who knew Washington well. My name is Kenneth Hawkins, Continental Army. Yes, I... I did know the commander. Met him in a strange way, to be sure. And yes, I was there at the mutiny. The beginnings, though, I had to get from my cousins, John Adams and Sam Adams. You see, I was rather busy at the time, at a couple of places called Lexington and Concord. But on May 17, 1775, John and Sam were in Philadelphia at the Second Continental Congress. And the news from my part of the country hit Philadelphia just in time to give that Congress a real lift. Sam, it wasn't just a British defeat, it was a rout. <laughs> we chased them, John, like terriers after an alley cat. Another half mile to Charleston and they'd have trampled on each other. Now it's only a question of how much time before we drive them into the sea. Nothing like a little good news to set the whole Congress afire. Well, it's done that all right, for all except our stone-faced giant from Virginia. Huh, outside there, through the window, the one dressed in his scarlet uniform. 
Stands out from the rest of us drab exhibits like a cockatoo and a flock of sparrows. You're speaking of Colonel Washington, of course. Colonel? Oh, you mean that uniform isn't a fake? That iceberg really is a soldier? He served with Braddock and at Fort Necessity. Disasters both, but they've certainly given him more experience than most colonial officers. Well, well. It is odd he doesn't seem more pleased with a military victory in Massachusetts. Oh, come, John. Don't be naive. Is one prima donna delighted with another prima donna when she hits a perfect high C? Outside, right at this moment, the tall, stately figure my cousins were talking about was walking toward the state house. He moved slowly, staring down, oblivious of those hurrying past him. Uh, Mr. Washington, sir, uh, good morning, Colonel Washington. Yes. Uh, I'm Perkins from the Pennsylvania Packet. Uh, These are grave times, Colonel Washington. The gravest, sir. Uh, Colonel, in these days when the fate of all of us hangs by a thread, what are you thinking about? I've been studying the bricks in Philadelphia's streets. Bricks? If you will measure, sir, you will find that one brick is ten inches long by three inches wide. Uh, yes, sir. Twelve bricks laid end to end make a road three inches wide and ten feet across. Four such bricks laid side by side make one foot wide. Uh, true. How many feet in a mile? Uh, uh, 5,280. Times four bricks wide equals 21,120. Times 12 bricks across equals 253,440 bricks for one mile of Philadelphia brick road 10 feet wide. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Colonel Washington, do you know what is to be discussed today by Congress? I understand it's a wordy debate on the natural rights of man. You're not interested in the debate, Colonel? Abstractions bore me. Good morning, Mr. Washington. Greetings, Colonel. John Adams. Samuel Adams. Good morning, sirs. Wonderful news from Boston. We have provoked the British. Certainly, let us hope not fatally so. Are you sorry, Colonel Washington? I fear bloodshed in this business is inevitable. I'm sorry that it's begun before we have even the shadow of an army. Still, I'd rather have been with the Minutemen at Concord than with poor Pitcairn's gorgeous redcoats. That was the success of a puppy nipping at the rear shank of a sleeping bulldog. I would not count on it as general practice. What do you think should be done, Colonel? I am not one who believes the roused wrath of the armies of the king will be a festival of joy. (laughs) No, no. Nor I. At present, our colonies are 13 puppies, erratic, running about in a hundred directions, yapping at each other, waiting to be gulped up one at a time at the English bulldog's leisure. And your prescription, Colonel? Thirteen bands of gypsies who call themselves colonial militia must be welded into one army. Representing one people under one command, able to move anywhere, anytime, in any way, as one unit. Otherwise, we all sit here waiting for doom. One army? From militias as different from each other as Arabs and Eskimos? How would you achieve that? With the great leveler of all human distinctions. Discipline. A high price, Colonel. Too high for justice? Too high to save representative government? (coughs) Excuse me, gentlemen. John, would you let me stand in the sun for a few hours? I need thawing out. Colonel Washington's not a man who overwhelms you with cordiality, is he? Still, what he said about the need for one commander, one army, one nation, uh, he wasn't totally wrong, you know. Hmm. Well, here comes the member of Congress least likely to agree with anybody. Let's see what he says. Morning, Dylan. Beautiful day. Rain, probably. Little trouble with the king's army up in Concord. Be more. You can count on that. We're going to have to stand together against the common threat. I reckon Rhode Island will take no more sass in Massachusetts. There's talk we should get all our armed forces together under a single commander. I don't know. Personally, I'm against it. You? You, Sam? You're against it? For heaven's sake, why? Why? Well, good Lord, man. You're talking about a giant army. What if it should mutiny? If you consider paint as more than just a covering for your walls, 
Consider quality True Test paints from True Value Hardware Stores. Hi, Pat Summerall to tell you that True Test Easy Care flat latex wall and trim finish actually helps protect your walls from stains and finger marks with its durable, scrubbable finish. Or choose True Test Satin Hue Flat Latex for a velvety finish that will soften your rooms and enhance the furnishings. Get True Test Easy Care or Satin Hue only at participating True Value Hardware stores. At the store, they told me there's a powerful anti-itch drug I can buy without a doctor's prescription. Now, I use Bicozine Cream as directed. No more burning, embarrassing itching. No more scratching. Bicozine actually speeds healing. Bicozine Cream. What a relief. For constipation, remember x Pills, the overnight wonder. x Pills, the overnight wonder. x Pills, for occasional use only as directed. It's mid-May in 1775, as young Hawkins continues his report on what was happening between his cousins John and Sam Adams at the Second Continental Congress in Philadelphia. Poor cousin John. He thought Sam Adams was his ally. It certainly didn't look that way now. Sam, I, I don't understand. Why are A you A giant opposed? army is exactly our problem right now. Our problem is the eternal British Parliament. A big army is always a threat to liberty. Soldiers soon think of themselves as a body distinct from the rest of the citizens. They're used to reaching for their guns, and they do what their commanders tell them. I say, he who creates a big army forges his own chains. I know what you're trying to do, Sam. You're trying to talk me out of an adequate army by a lot of scare stories, but it won't work, see? Why not? Because I know we'll never get rid of the king's army unless we have a powerful, single, coordinated army of our own. And how do you expect to keep such an army from taking over the country? By having Congress stand over that army like an elephant on a cat's tail. By electing and dismissing their officers as we see fit. By keeping our thumb on every crust of bread they eat and every shirt they put on the backs. By telling them where to go and when to stop. And by being sure they're never too far ahead of starvation. Get a strong continental army with a strong commander-in-chief and keep them both in their place with a strong continental congress. Good day, gentlemen. Sam, what were you thinking of? You were on the wrong side of that argument with Dylan. Well, John, in the first place, you'll never get a commander-in-chief unless you have the support of Nat Dillon and his friends. In the second place, you'll never get Nat's support for anything, unless you oppose it yourself. Uh, so, that's what I did. <laughs> that's it. In the third place, those misgivings were all mine. And I wondered if Nat could give him any kind of an answer. I must say he did pretty well. You know, John, Washington's not the world's great socializer, but he does have the word of the hour. Discipline. He's not a New Englander, Sam. All the fighting's going on in Massachusetts. Well, that's the point, John. If this is just a New England war, we're going to find ourselves very lonely. We need some solid link to the other end of the country. Make a southerner commander-in-chief of everybody's army, and you make this everybody's war. Mm. Can he win battles? No general wins battles, John. That's the business of soldiers. I'll nominate him. Today. And that's what my cousin John did, all right. And with a leading New Englander making the nomination, it went right through. In the middle of June, the new commander-in-chief set out for Cambridge, Massachusetts, to take formal command of his new unified army. It was there that I... It still makes my flesh creep. All right, boys. The breastworks at Breed's Hill saved at least 200 lives for us. We never know when the king's troops may bust out of Boston looking for us again. Now let's set up some more welcome hills for them. That makes sense, Lieutenant. Grab an axe and let's go. Uh, Lieutenants ain't supposed to do all the work in this army. Hey, look. It's the commander himself. It's Washington. Salute you, dummies. <clears throat> welcome to our humble camp, sir. Who's in charge here? I am, sir. Lem's our lieutenant, sir. Lieutenant? Yes, sir. Good man, too, sir. Best in the army. Uh, we think, sir. Lieutenant, are you aware that officers are not supposed to assist privates in the execution of their chores? I've heard the regulation, sir. 
Uh, but you see, sir, things are different here in Massachusetts. Up here... Are you we... aware that officers are not supposed to assist privates in the execution of their chores? Yes, sir. Yet you, an officer who should be setting an example of obedience for all your soldiers, you have taken it upon yourself to disregard the regulation? Yes, sir. You, take this rope and tie his hands together tight. But you see, sir, he was... Private, you must learn that in the Continental Army, orders from an officer are given only once. Yes, sir. Put put out your hands, ma'am. Sure. You, put on that limb so this man can tie the lieutenant's wrists to the branch. Yes, sir. Yeah, you got him secure there, Nicholson? Yep. Yep. Strip off his shirt. Me, sir? You. Yes, sir. Who's the drummer here? Uh, me, sir. We'll need your whip. Well, sir, I, I have no whip. There's never been such a thing in this camp. Well, take mine. Yeah. Uh, I... Yes, sir. You will lay the whip on this man's back until I tell you to stop. Yes, sir. Harder, drummer. You must leave at least a mark each time. That's better. Continue. Three. Four. Five. Uh, drummer, that will be all. You... Cut the ropes that bind the prisoner. Surgeon, tend the offender. When he is conscious again, tell him to report to Captain Johnson for further assignment as private. Are there questions? Gentlemen, this is not a family outing. This is war. Your enemy is the world's best trained army. Their success is discipline. You must match that discipline. Liberty or slavery, life or death, choose. That night at General Washington's headquarters, the candle burned late. Uh, what is it? You sent for me, sir. Oh, yes, the lad who administered the whipping. Your name? Hawkins. I'm the company drummer, sir. It seems that's one of my duties. You did your task well. Yes, sir. There were tears in your eyes. Yes, sir. Lemuel Hawkins is my older brother. Ah. How do you feel about him now? Just like I did before. I'm proud of him. Hmm. Let me ask you this. Do you think what he did was right? I think this was a better army when my brother was Lieutenant Hawkins, sir. Every man did his part gladly because it was something we'd all hatched up together. We were all sharing together and we were all going to benefit from it together. Now you've shackled our wrists and our feet and our minds. You've been a hand of ice on the Continental Army, sir. Indeed. The way we were doing things, we scared the British Army white. I'm not sure whether this new army will have the heart to fight at all. All right. Now shoot me, sir. You asked. <laughs> Save now on tools that have earned the right to wear the name Craftsman. Save $20 on a Craftsman 3 8 inch variable speed reversible drill. Or on a Craftsman variable speed saber saw with manual scrolling action. Or on a Craftsman dual action pad sander with built in dust pickup. Now only $29.99 each during Sears National Hardware Week sale, where America shops for value. Sale ends March 15th. These are the minimum savings nationally. Regular prices vary in some markets. How many cold tablets do you take a day? Two? More. Four? More. Six? Yeah. A day? Uh-huh. And then more at night? Right. Why? Well, they're new. Take contact. One capsule helps all your congestive symptoms up to 12 hours. All day? And all night while you sleep. That's the wonder of contact. Hey, you're the guys on TV. <laughs> yeah, we're the guys on TV. Take your contact. Take it fast. Give your cold to contact. Take only as direct. On 
a June night in 1775, young Hawkins faces General George Washington in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He's been asked to speak his mind and has done so boldly. Washington's face went as still as a painting for about five seconds. I didn't figure I had a minute to live. But at that moment, I didn't care. I was a lot madder at General Washington than I was at the British Army. So I just glared at him and waited for the bullet. If I ask, I want the truth. Do you think these men will desert? No, sir. Why not? Well, sir, we think you're wrong about the whole way you're going at this army. But you may be right. If Parliament chooses, they can make this a lot bigger thing than the little skirmishes we've just had at Concord and Breed's Hill. So maybe it has to be just the way you say. Anyhow, you're what we have, and we stand with you, sir. Hawkins, I shall need an aide de camp. I'm asking to have you transferred to me. Yes, sir. Wherever I'm needed, sir. That's the kind of general he was all through the war. Most of the men worshipped him because he never showed fear or dismay. A few noticed that he never showed anything else either. And a few others... But first, there was victory at Yorktown. British hopes for victory in America collapsed. Peace talks began over in Paris with Benjamin Franklin, head of our delegation. But then the talks bogged down and stalled for months. An American newspaper reporter tried to find out why. Dr. Franklin, all American citizens are becoming distraught about this peace treaty with Great Britain that never seems to get signed. I can imagine so. The peace negotiations are still going on here, aren't they? Oh, yes, yes. Every day something happens or doesn't happen. You do realize, Dr. Franklin, it's a terrible strain for us. The United States is in limbo, neither at peace... No war, neither slave nor free, neither subject nor independent. That's distressing, certainly. It's been a year since Cornwallis surrendered at Yorktown. A year and a month. But British troops still patrol the streets of Manhattan. It's outrageous. The American army sits a few miles above New York at Newburgh on the Hudson, not daring to attack for fear of upsetting the negotiations, not daring to go home for fear the negotiations may fail and the war may start again. Quite so. Well, sir... Can't you demand that the British do something? I think it would not be wise to signal our unease to the British. But if there isn't some sort of breakthrough soon, I'm not sure even General Washington can answer for the consequences. Tell the troops to be patient. Patience is a quality much admired in Europe. On Friday, March 14th, 1783... The American army was concentrated at Newburgh on the Hudson. That day began the events that precipitated the mutiny and also showed us what kind of man Commander Washington really was. I was stationed with him at his headquarters. Mr. Governor Morris, sir. <clears throat> Leave us, Hawkins. Yes, sir. Mr. Morris. You know that at any moment we may hear news of the signing of a peace treaty between Great Britain and the United States? I devoutly hope so. Ah, indeed. But don't be too devout, General. When that news arrives, we shall all face a new threat. Oh? Even in our gravest peril, Congress has been remarkably casual in meeting its financial responsibilities. That's certainly been true with the Army. When war pressures stop, this congressional irresponsibility may well increase. I suppose so. You can understand that this will be a matter of concern to those of us who loan millions of dollars to the people of America, always with a clear statement of the inescapable obligations involved. I understand your concern. There were also promises by Congress that the Army's brave men and officers were to receive substantial pensions for their sacrifices. I have struggled for months to get those promises redeemed. I also. You can picture, General, the possible keenness of disappointment for the Army and for those of us who have loaned money. I can. Has it occurred to you, sir, that those disappointments might be dangerous? 
In honesty, sir. In honesty? Yes. You and your army have seen better than anyone else what happens when a government is too weak for survival. You do see that we must have a strong and responsible government. I see that. Only one man is acceptable to all factions. The hero of Valley Forge in Yorktown. The living symbol of national unity. That's why you are indispensable when we, the enlightened ones, seize power. Overthrowing the government that I and the men serving under me have suffered so much to create? It is your suffering soldiers, General, who demand that I and my friends seize power and that you take the title of Prime Minister, or, if you will, King. My own soldiers have come to you, but their officers would have forbidden In such... In this case, sir, the officers are the leaders. The whole army has never stood so united or so firm... On what? You will be the figurehead. You need command only those matters of immediate interest to yourself. In your name, all men will keep the peace, the most urgent need. I and my friends, who seek no publicity, will do the ruling. We will tame your army with money, and tame your irresponsible citizens, in turn, with the army. And if I refuse? Your refusal would not change the nation's history, it would only make it bloodier. In any case, the army and I will take control. The nation will remember you, if at all, as the man who failed us when we needed him the most. It's bad for everyone, including the leader, when any one man has power that no one can question or check. I'm working for a representative government in which all points of view are heard and weighted. All points of view? All points of view among property gentlemen. Ah. In those same years, I, an experienced and trusted commander in a territory I knew best, was told I must take second rank to English-born officers of lower rank and no ability simply because I was colonial-born. A gentleman of worth and valor shackled simply because of his birth. Oh, beware, Commander. This way lies Jefferson's mad dog democracy. I know. I've always been clear that no man could be a gentleman could have wisdom or character until he had acquired substantial property. Those who dug and spun and built were ants, marvelous in their power and beauty, but also useless and dangerous unless guided by an intelligence of which they themselves were not part. Of course. What has made it possible for me to succeed was the certainty that exactly what I was doing was exactly right. Naturally, and now you Now I'm no longer certain. Firm... You're what? No longer certain. Not certain? Jefferson claims that the human ants who labor have wisdom, neither more nor less than that of gentlemen, and character neither better nor worse than that of gentlemen. I am I'm not... aware of Mr. Jefferson's follies. But I am no longer certain that he is absolutely wrong. You what? I am no longer so certain of anything that I am willing to be a party to forcing it on others. This is a joke. <laughs> a test. I never indulge in either. I hadn't even considered. Your will is cracked. You are a war casualty. At least, Mr. Morris, to you. I, uh, I must salvage what I can. <laughs> It's all right. Saved my life one dreadful night when I told Big Dutch I want to fight. He said, how about now? He broke a table over a chair. I went from a coop to go anywhere. My lights had been on while I was there. Motorcraft, don't fail me now. I turned the key as it came through the door. My motorcraft made the engine roar. Then I heard Big Dutch as he stamped and swore. Going to get me a motorcraft battery for sure. Quality parts for all makes of cars. Motorcraft for sure. Sinus flares up. I'm clogged up. Headaches. My whole face hurts. Help. Send for Sign Off. Sign Off helps relieve your pain, helps clear congestion, ease sinus pressure and post nasal drip. Sign Off does it all. Send for Sign Off. And for the fastest known form of congestion relief, Sign Off Spray. S I N E O F F. Sign Off. The sinus medicines in the bright red box. Is here. For occasional use only as directed. Thank you. 
Lorne Green again, and here's the fourth act of the mutiny against George Washington. Hardly had Governor Morris gone out the door than a second visitor arrived in General Washington's office. Mr. Dillon, thank heaven you've come. Well, that's an unlikely speech for sure. Sir, I must tell you about a matter of the gravest consequence. Indeed, you must. Sit down, please, and I'll ask you about it. B- but uh, You I... are under the command of the Congress, sir. It is for me to ask you questions, not vice versa. Washington, I hear reports of things I don't like. Mr. Dillon, sir, we're wasting precious time. What you need to know... I will be the judge of that, sir. Now, Commander, if you will, please examine this document. It arrived addressed to me and through me to the members of the Congress of the Confederation. Again and again, honorable gentlemen, you have promised us half pay for life. A year has gone by and you have done nothing. You have lied to us, honorable gentlemen, again and again. Lied. Note the insolence of that word. I note its truth, Mr. Dillon. Oh, come, come, General. Surely you know this Congress has no power to tax without the state's consent? And you know the states will never consent to give a whole army half pay? Yes, sir. I know it, and you know it, and Congress knows it. So to promise these men such things is to tell a knowing lie, is it not? Read, read, read it. Uh, It may be dangerous, gentlemen, to trust forever the patience of your soldiers. There. There you are, General. Now will you try to tell me that the Continental Army is not threatening the Congress of the Confederation? What you have been warned, Mr. Dillon, is that liars, even liars in the highest office, cannot count forever on the patience of the people who elect them. Oh, no? Well, soldiers, may I remind you, General, are not the masters, but the servants of the state. It is their patriotic duty to accept the lies of their elected officials, to believe those lies, and to execute their duty accordingly. If they do not, they should be court-martialed, the lot of them. Can't you discipline your own army, General? You forget, Mr. Dillon, a government that deceives and exploits its citizens forfeits the right to their loyalty. That was the message of the revolution to all rulers. You, you dare. General, you are to dissolve this army at once. On the word of one congressman? This is royalty with a vengeance. I shall speak with the congress. Tell them what I know and they will command you. Will you obey them? General Washington, sir? Mr. Dillon, at this hour, pirates prey against our ships with careless contempt. Spanish ships forbid us the use of our own Mississippi River. Indians and mobs threaten us daily. British troops still occupy American soil. At any moment, war may again break out. I would tell this to Congress, sir, and at the same time warn them... we are to be threatened if we have an army and threatened if we do not. Is that your message to the Congress, General? Freedom is always threatened, Mr. Dillon. Your only options are to meet those threats wisely or stupidly. What is it, Hawkins? The the army, sir. The army, Hawkins? They are in revolt, sir. Mr. Morris and Major Armstrong have just made speeches that have ignited the whole army. Tomorrow morning, they set out for Philadelphia to seize the government. There. There. You see what I told you? Who opposes Armstrong, Hawkins? No one, sir. And when they march, no one in this land can stop them. No doubt. Betrayed, betrayed, I knew it. Sir, they beg that you will lead them. And if not? Then Armstrong will lead them. And you will be alone, sir. They'll cut my throat. I'll never get out of here alive. Uh, Hawkins. Yes, sir. Congressman Dillon is to be escorted safely out of camp. Well, who, who is You, to... alone. Y- y- yes, sir. What is your answer to the army, sir? I shall come to them tomorrow morning at ten o'clock. Dress parade, please. But your answer, sir. Tomorrow morning, Hawkins. Ten o'clock. Yes, sir. At ease. Gentlemen, <clears throat> this morning I have... Uh, uh, uh... Are you all right, sir? My glasses, Hawkins. Oh, I brought them, sir. Here. Thank you, Hawkins. What's the matter? <clears throat> Why the delay? Why don't I, you... I beg your pardon, gentlemen. I ask your indulgence while I put on my spectacles. I have grown not only gray, but almost blind in the service of my country. If this were a public occasion, gentlemen, I should use it as I have used all such occasions to praise your courage and devotion to duty... 
in the face of unimaginable sufferings. Are oh, you just trying to distract us, Washington? Uh, Major Armstrong, have I lied to you this morning? Well, no. When I speak my first lie, please interrupt me again. Uh, yes, sir. You complain, gentlemen, of the incompetence, indifference, corruption, and deceptions of the government to which you have committed your lives. Yes, sir. Let the record speak. What man, first and most often and most forcefully, voiced these complaints to Congress itself? That's why you must be our leader, sir. Gentlemen, you honor me as always, and once again I thank you. But, gentlemen, I must tell you frankly of my... Weakness as a leader. What? No, no, gentlemen, I can lead only when I know whom I lead and why I lead them. Until today, I knew both. Now, I know neither. So you must tell me. Major Armstrong, who are you? And why am I to lead you? You're asking me? Yes, Major, I ask you. What's up? Speak again, mistreated American soldiers. Why, so you are. All of you. And if more mistreated than as British subjects, you should lay down your arms and beg King George to take you back. Shall we all do so, Major? Tell me where to lead you. All we want is justice. And so do I. Now tell me, when you get to Philadelphia, what will you do? We'll kill the slimy congressman. Then who will right your wrong? Suppose Congress agrees to anything you ask. Suppose there is enough money for five years full pay pension and that's all. Will you accept it or reject it? You see, gentlemen... You are not a government able to face your own problems and solve them. You are a mob, able only to destroy others and finally yourselves. Is this to be the dismal end of our eight years together? Well, that's, uh, oh, something has to be done. Gentlemen, gentlemen, I've led you against a king whom our people did not choose, a parliament for whom our people did not vote and laws in whose creation our people played no part. I have led you that we might have a government of our own image, laws of our own passing, and officials of our own election. Well, that's what we wanted, too. And you have fought and bled, and now you have it. Yes! 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 There's no more justice than before! You can't have justice until you have liberty, freedom of choice. We've been fighting for a representative government in which all have a voice. That battle is almost won. Do you want to cast it aside to create a tyranny in which you yourselves are the tyrants? Well, Congress cheats us, lies to us. They do. But remember this. Your own states have given them the task of looking after you, but denied them the power to do anything about it. Congress can't raise a penny of taxes without the consent of all 13 states. And at least one state always refuses. What else can Congress do but lie, cheat, and pray for better days? Then what are we to do, sir? Look to the laws we pass, to the men we choose. What you are doing now, what do you ask me to do? is to destroy your own instruments of choice. Yesterday, I led you against those who would deny you your own representation. Now, you ask me to lead you against yourselves, while you tear down the very hopes that were the object of our common agony. Major, I would sooner strike daggers into the heart of my own child. Well, then, uh, I... How can we make anything better, sir? So far... Of our own choice, we have created a government too weak to do harm and therefore too weak to meet our most urgent needs. We must make that government strong enough to save us from starvation, from fear, from disintegration, even in the moment of victory. Then, so long as men are foolish and greedy, 
We must hold that government to strict account. Major Armstrong, you have a better plan? I... I, I no, sir. Not I. Others? I thank you, gentlemen, for your attention. It seems to me that this so-called mutiny is now at an end. The conclusion of our story, after these words. Maxwell House is coffee to wake up to. Maxwell House, good to the last drop. Every morning, 20 sit-ups, 20 push-ups. It gets my morning moving, but it doesn't get my morning going. For that, I want a good cup of coffee. Maxwell House coffee. Mmm, Maxwell House. Like sit-ups and push-ups, it's part of my morning ritual. The best part. Good to the last drop, Maxwell House. Every time I shop, it seems prices have gone up. Well, I found a way to save money without sacrificing my family's nutrition. A few times a week, I serve an egg dish for dinner. Scrambled eggs, omelets, the cookbooks are full of recipes. And egg dishes are high in protein. Eggs are one of today's best food buys. For instance, when eggs cost 75 cents a dozen, they're only 50 cents a pound. The incredible edible egg. The American Egg Board. Hawkins? Yes, sir. Thank you for standing firm. Now then, would you like a furlough, Hawkins? Oh, yes, sir. You have a family, a girl waiting? No, sir. No one. Yet you're eager to be away. Why? You'd be offended, sir. Hardly as offended as I'm now curious. I'm... Going to work against you, sir. You're joining King George? No, sir. Quite the opposite. You're an authoritarian. I'm going to work for questioning and challenge. Your liberty is a closed corporation for the few lucky enough to be wealthy. I'll work to make it open for everyone. I'm going to work for the principles of Thomas Jefferson. Heaven save us. I knew you'd be offended, sir. I... Think not, Hawkins. <clears throat> I struck at the heart of my day's authority. It's reasonable that you should strike at the heart of yours. When one starts a revolution for the rights of man, who can say where it should stop? March 12th. It's coming closer. The last day of Sears' biggest catalog sale of the entire year. Over 150 pages of great values. Through March 12th, you can save on everything, from appliances to home fashions, automotive to hardware. And it's as simple as browsing through the Sears Midwinter Sale catalog and picking up your phone. So call Sears Catalog Telephone Shopping before March 12th and save. Sears, where America shops for value. Helen, don't buy that pain reliever. Why not? They're all the same. Check the labels. Okay, uh, two tablets of regular Tylenol, 650 milligrams. Check the other pain relievers, too. Bayer, 650 milligrams. Buffering, 650 milligrams. Anison, oh, 800 milligrams. I didn't know Anison had more pain reliever. That's what makes Anison different. More pain reliever and a special combination of medical ingredients. I'm switching to Anison. Get the Anison difference. Use only as directed. The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, The Mutiny Against George Washington, was written by Edward Borgers and produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Lorne Green. Our stars were Fletcher Markle and Tommy Cook. Featured in the cast were Len Berman, True Boardman, Harley Bear, Barney Phillips, and Byron Kane. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI.
Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. This is Andy Griffin. Join us tomorrow at the same time. I've got another story I think you'll find riotously amusing. This is Lorne Green. It was not unusual in the Old West for there to be many womanless homes. The life of a settler was hard, too hard for some, and many women died young, particularly during the rigors of childbirth. Emma Jenner was one such woman who died giving birth to her first and only child, Jimmy. But her husband, Edward Jenner, bravely stayed on at their small farm just outside Cascade, Wyoming, and raised the boy Jimmy by himself. He tilled the land, raised wheat and corn, and put salt pork away for the long, cold winter. He also watched his son grow gradually into a man of 19 years. Jimmy, take some of these logs into the house. Sure, Pa. Uh, Here over there, son, a little to your left. I got him. Yeah, a couple more right in front of you. Thanks, Pa. It's not easy raising a boy by yourself, especially a boy like Jimmy. You see, Jimmy Jenner is blind. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, The Blind Gun by John Vornholt. Our stars, Corey Burton and Vic Perrin. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of fine names to make Sears names stand for quality. Names you've always counted on, like Kenmore, Craftsman, Easy Living, and Die Hard. Names that kids and moms cheer, like Winnie the Pooh and Tough Skins. Names that are a part of your life today, like Permapress, Klingalon, and Winner 2. And, of course, there's Sears Best Products in everything from T-shirts to tractors. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of truly dependable names to make our name. Sears Roebuck and Company. Helen, don't buy that pain reliever. Why not? They're all the same. Check the labels. Okay, uh, two tablets of regular Tylenol, 650 milligrams. Check the other pain relievers, too. Bayer, 650 milligrams. Bufferin, 650 milligrams. Anison, oh, 800 milligrams. I didn't know Anison had more pain reliever. That's what makes Anison different. More pain reliever and a special combination of medical ingredients. I'm switching to Anison. Get the Anison difference. Use only as directed. On any farm, there is a division of labor, as no one person could possibly do all the work himself. The Jenner farm was no different, and certain chores gradually fell upon Jimmy, despite his blindness. One of these chores was the nightly cooking. Yeah, that was real good, Jimmy, and real filling. It was only still. Still, you're becoming quite a cook. No, no, you stay put, son. I'll clear the table. At least I can do for such a fine meal. Was it a pretty sunset tonight? Passable. I heard a saying in town the other day. Red sky at night, clear to daylight. Red sky at morning, better take warning. Is that true? Not that I've ever seen. Seems like the sky is always red at night. What does red look like? What does red look like? Well, 
You know last week when you burned your hand on the stove? Uh, you remember how that felt? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what red looks like. <laughs> I can see how that saying got started. Uh, Pa, how'd you hurt your leg? How'd you know I hurt my leg? Because you've been walking funny all day. I can tell the difference, you know. Huh? Might as well tell you, though, I'm I'm not proud of it. I, I got myself into a little scrap at the fife and drum this morning. I guess I jerked something in my leg. Uh, Anyhow, that stupid bully Gus Keeler was picking on poor old Lucius Michaels again. I told him to stop. He wouldn't, so I made him stop. And lucky for me, I can still handle a bum like Gus Keeler when I have to. You shouldn't fight, Pa. I shouldn't go into that mangy rat hole for a drink. From now on, when I go into town, I'm just going to get my supplies and get out. I'd like to go to a saloon sometime. <laughs> what on earth for? So so you can get into a fight, too? No, just to see what it's like, to feel the atmosphere. Huh. Are the saloon girls pretty? Yo, you're all fat and ugly. All of them? Now, look, are, are we going to gab about saloon girls all night? What do you want me to read to you? But my ma was pretty, wasn't she? Pretty? <laughs> Your ma was beautiful. She wasn't anything like a saloon girl. She was, she was small, real tiny, with skin so white and pure it felt like the petal of a flower and, and her hair. Blonde, the lightest, creamiest blonde there ever was. Pa? Yes, son. Why don't you read me something? Yeah, what did you like to hear? Euripides, Shakespeare, Dickens, or something from the Bible? You know, all these books I read to you from were your mother's. She made me promise before you were born that I'd see to it you got a good education and became an avid reader. That's something else I regret, because you sure got the mind for it. I don't mind not reading, as long as I have you to read to me. Good, son. So what'll it be? How about a story by Bret Hart? Uh, don't think we better start anything right now, Pa. We're going to have company in a few minutes. What? Sounds like just one horse. And he's got to be headed here, because there's nobody else out this way. Sometimes I think I'd trade one of my eyes for one of your ears. And <laughs> I'd take you up on it. Well, I'd better go on out and see who it is. Probably some peddler lost his way on his way to Cheyenne. Who is it, Pa? Can't see his face, but he's headed this way. Now go on out and meet him. It's you. Yeah, it's me, Gus Keeler. Who'd you expect? Pa, you all right? Yeah, Jimmy, I'm all right. You just go on back in the house. That's your blind young'un? I heard about him. Seems like tragedy runs in your family, Jenner. You have no quarrel with him. But I do with you. You embarrassed me today, Jenner. Embarrassed me real bad. You got the best of me in front of my friends. Friends? Those people aren't friends of yours. They're scared of you, that's all. That's the way I like my friends to be. That's why we can't have no more of what happened today. Fetch me my rifle, Jimmy. Yeah. Don't you move, blind boy. You hear me? I'm blind, not deaf. Leave him alone, Keeler. Just leave him alone. I intend to. I don't think I have much to fear from some stupid blind boy. But you, Edward Jenner, you're a different story. You stay away from me, and I promise I'll stay away from you. Oh, you'll stay away from me, all right, permanently. Pa, what's he doing? You stay put, young'un. Maybe he'll live. But not you, Edward Jenner. If you're a religious man, you better say a prayer. A prayer? You know, something from the Bible, like a psalm. What's that one about walking through the valley of the shadow of death? I was like that one. The 23rd psalm. Say it. You can't really mean Say it! <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Oh. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. No! Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Pa! Oh. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. 
And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. No, Pa. No. No. I'll make you pay, Gus Keeler. I swear I'll make you pay. The Bell System brings you Miss Tammy Wynette. Reach out, reach out and touch someone. Reach out, call up and just say hi. Reach out, reach out and touch someone. Wherever you are, you're never too far. They're waiting to share your day. Reach out. Whoever you're missing, wherever you are, there's nothing like a phone call for chasing the blues. Try it tonight. Reach out. I work all day, my job is rough. I need a boot that's good and tough. Why do guys with the roughest jobs wear red wing boots? Because outside they're tough, full grain leather, and inside they're all comfort. Right down to a special compound under the insole that fits like a footprint in wet sand. This is Kurt Gowdy saying, if you work hard for a living, you've earned your wings, red wing. I've earned my wings. Jimmy picked up his father's lifeless body and carried it the entire six miles into the town of Cascade. No one asked Jimmy how he found his way. No one even asked him how long it had taken him. But there were enough questions to warrant a hearing into the death of Edward Jenner, presided over by Judge Harcourt. You may continue, Marshal. After Jimmy brought the body into town, how did he come to your attention? I was getting to that, Judge. Somebody found him, uh, Elmer Goody, I think it was, and brought him to my office. The boy says to me very calm that Gus Keeler rode out for their place and shot his father dead in cold blood. That sounded sort of sensible to me since the two of them had been in a fight that morning. Objection. Opinion of the witness. Objection sustained. Just try to tell the story, Homer, without embellishing it too much. All right. But I did do some investigating. I asked Jimmy... How do you know it was Gus Keeler, since you're, uh, blind? He said he knew his voice, and that sounded okay to me. So I arrested Gus Keeler. Did Keeler resist arrest at all? No, he came along right peaceably. Sort of surprised me. Objection. Sustained. Did Gus Keeler at any time ever admit to the killing? No, Your Honor. He said right from the beginning that he was innocent. Okay, Marshal, you can step down. I'd now like to call to the stand Jimmy Jenner. You comfortable, Jimmy? Yes, sir. Now, tell us in your own words exactly what happened. Well, Pa and me had just finished supper. We were sitting around talking, like always. We heard a horse coming up. I heard him first. And Pa went outside to see who it was. He didn't even take a gun out there with him like most people would have. Pa trusted everybody. He didn't ever expect anybody would do him any harm. Pa was a good man. Anyhow, it was Gus Keeler who rode up. I've heard his voice several times when I've been in town, hanging around outside the saloon. I came out of the house to see what was going on, and my Pa and Gus Keeler were talking about the fight they'd had that morning. Pa wanted to let bygones be bygones, but Gus Keeler didn't see it that way. He said he had to keep Pa out of his way permanently. Pa told me to fetch his rifle. And that's when Gus Keeler drew his gun. Well, now, now, how do you know that, Jimmy? I heard him cock it. He told me to stand still. Then he told Pa to say a prayer. When Pa didn't say anything, Keeler ordered him to say the 23rd Psalm. You know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But before Pa could even finish it, Gus Keeler shot him dead. Order. 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 Uh, Was your father armed, Jimmy? No, sir, he wasn't. That's all the questions I have. Uh, Would the defense attorney like to cross-examine? I certainly would, Your Honor. Uh, Jimmy, how do you know your father wasn't armed? Well, he... He never carried a gun. How do you know that? I... I know my father. But you can't say for sure that he wasn't armed. You didn't see him walk out. Can you say with positive certainty that your father was not armed? 
No, I suppose not. Jimmy, who fired first? First? What do you mean? Well, you just said you weren't sure whether your father was armed or not, so it is possible that he fired first. No, he didn't have a gun. He couldn't have fired at anyone. Now you say he wasn't armed again. A minute ago, you didn't know, Jimmy. Your testimony is very confused. <laughs> now, no need to badger the witness, Mr. Poole. This is only a hearing. Simply ask him straightforward questions. Yes, Your Honor. Jimmy... You heard a shot, is that correct? Yes, it is. Did you see who fired it? Mr. Poole, I don't see. Did you see who fired it, yes or no? Well, no. All you know for sure is that you heard a shot. You don't know where it came from. As far as you know, your father could have shot himself. Shot himself? He did not shoot himself. Order? Order. Let's, uh, let's face facts, Jimmy. You can't be sure of anything. You heard a shot and your father's dead. That's all you really know. Anything else is just your imagination. Uh, no more questions. It was him. It was Gus Keeler. State your name. Gus Keeler. Did you know Edward Jenner? Slightly. Were you at Edward Jenner's house the night he was killed? No. Did you know his son, Jimmy Jenner? Never met him. He says he knew you. I don't know how. How do you feel about Edward Jenner's death? Well, I didn't know him very well, but I'm real sorry. Seemed like a good man. <laughs> he was a good man in a fight. Did you kill Edward Jenner? No. Liar. He's a liar. It was him. It was. Order. 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 Now sit down, Jimmy. It won't do you any good. Do you have any more questions, Mr. Poole? No, Your Honor. Then the witness is retired. I've made a very difficult decision. I'm sorry, Jimmy. I can't in good conscience send this case to a jury for trial. There just isn't enough evidence. I know you believe what you've said at this hearing, Jimmy, but with no other witnesses, it's just your word against his. And the word of a blind man is, well, just not worth as much as the word of a man who can see. Case dismissed. You was cheated, son. Who are you? Lucius Michaels. I was the one your pa stood up for when he got into that fight with Gus Keeler. I'm the one that got him killed. No, sir. Pa would have helped anybody in the same spot. He was always helping people who needed help. I guess that's because he was used to having me around. Still, I'm powerful sorry. Your pa was one of the best men I ever knew. My pa told me a, a little bit about you, Lucius. Weren't you once a gunfighter? Well, some say the best in the territory. Of course, that was a long time ago when there were a lot of mining towns. I was once marshal of six towns at the same time. What are you doing now? Mm, cleaning saloons for drinks and tips. Do you ever shoot anymore? Shoot? My hand shakes so bad I can hardly hold a gun, let alone shoot one. I like to think it was age that done me in, but I know it was drink. Still, when it comes to... to, to... Lucius, what's the matter? Why don't you go home, Lucius? Quit bothering the blind boy. Can't you see he's grieving? Well, yes, sir, Mr. Keeler. No, Lucius, you don't have to go anywhere. Mr. Keeler's the one who's leaving. Oh, I am, huh? Haven't you learned your lesson, blind boy? Keeler, you won today, but this fight is far from over. I'm going to hound you till the day you die. <laughs> Did you hear that? The blind boy's going to hound me till the day I die. He probably hit me with his cane. <laughs> See ya, blind boy. You and that old drunk belong together. Yeah, I wish I had my nerves back for just ten seconds. I'd have that jackass laughing out of a hole in his ribs. You you still know a lot about guns, don't you, Lucius? Uh, as much as there is to know. And you could still teach someone how to shoot and to draw? Oh, I taught many a man how to shoot. I taught Tom Horn when he was just a boy. Somebody's got to rid the world of Gus Keeler. I said I could teach. I didn't say I could do it anymore. You gotta be young, have quick reflexes. After all, half a fast drawn is instinct. There's no way I could go up against Gus Keeler. I don't want you to. I want you to teach me to shoot. I want to learn enough to kill Gus Keeler myself. If you have 
house is too hot If your house is too cold Well maybe it's a house But it's hardly a home And if that fits your description We've got the prescription Call your GE Climate Doctors We've got the cure We are the experts We'll check out your house for free We've got heating and cooling That'll save you energy Think it hurts to pay for central heating and cooling? See your participating GE Climate Doctor. Now through May 2nd, he'll give you GE's special preseason offer on many energy-saving systems. So call your Climate Doctor, your GE dealer, in the yellow pages under air conditioning equipment. Take advantage of this preseason offer. He's got the cure for painful heating and cooling costs. Call your GE Climate Doctors. We've got the cure. Call your GE Climate Doctors. General Electric, we bring good things to life. It's not every day an ex-gunfighter is asked to teach a blind man how to shoot and fast draw. But Jimmy Jenner was not an ordinary blind man. He was determined to avenge his father's death in the street if need be, having been denied justice elsewhere. Uh, let me get this straight, son. You want me to teach you how to shoot? That's right. I don't care how long it takes. Uh, Jimmy, you're a nice fella and all that, but uh, I don't know if it's possible to teach a blind man how to shoot. Well, you said yourself that fast draw is mostly instinct. And when you draw on someone, do you really have time to aim? No, but you got to know the general direction the person is standing in. I know where you're standing. About a foot to my left and no more than three feet away. You're also not very tall, about a foot shorter than I am. How did you know that? The direction your voice is coming from. Mm. You forget, Lucius. Blind people have better hearing than people who can see. I can recognize people by their footsteps, and I can tell if they're behind me, in front of me, or, or to the side. And it's true what they say about blind people having extra senses. Well, I'm not saying it wouldn't take a lot of extra work to teach me to shoot. But I can practice at night, which is one advantage. You make a good case, Jimmy, but... I don't know. Didn't you ever have a shootout in the dark? Of course I did. Well, how'd you know where the other man was? Well, instinct, experience. Mm -hmm. well, all right, I suppose it's possible you could learn a little. But you ain't gonna learn enough to go up against Gus Keeler. He, he's a pretty fair shot when he ain't drunk. Well, maybe I will. And maybe I won't. But I aim to try. And if you don't teach me, Lucius, I'll find somebody else who will. I'm prepared to pay. No, no, now don't do that. Some other jackass will just take your money. You're awful young anyway. H how old are you? Nineteen. Hmm. That's old enough to avenge my father's death. Lucius, if somebody killed your father, wouldn't you want to even the score? Son, that's how I became a gunfighter. Then you'll do it. That would be something, teaching a blind man how to shoot. Against my better judgment, I might give it a try, but there are two conditions. One, we give it a couple of weeks, and if it ain't working, you got to promise to forget all about it. And two, no pay. Agreed. But if I don't pay you, you got to let me give you something. I know. How about if you moved in with me at the house, eat and sleep there? That way you could work on me day and night. All right. But I got a feeling you was planning that all along. <laughs> Hi, Lucius. How are things in town? Oh, fine. And I got a little something for you. You got it? Oh, let me hold it. Whoa, 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 whoa. Guns are like people. Each one's a little different, and each one's got a story. I'll have to tell you a little bit about this one before I give it to you. It's used, been around a few years, but that's all right. It's a Colt 45 standard single action. Somebody sawed off the barrel a little bit and greased the action, so I know it's seen the inside of a holster before. It's got a cheap wood butt, but that's all right. I always liked wood better than pearl. Pearls are my too slippery. The trigger. Trigger's good and easy. Let me have it, Lucius. All right. Here. My. It's heavy. Is it loaded? <laughs> it ain't. <laughs> can't get over how heavy it is. Believe me, it'll be light as a feather in no time. In fact, that gun has just become part of your body. You're going to eat with it, sleep with it, do your chores with it. You're going to feel naked without that gun. Can I cock it? Yep. And you can pull the trigger, too. I left the shell casings in, because it's not good for the hammer to strike nothing but air. <laughs> Okay, 
Okay, Jimmy, let's try this. I'm just going to walk around you and clap my hands. When I clap my hands, you point the gun in my direction and you fire. I want to see how good you really are at telling direction. Ready? Ready. Okay. How'd I do? Well, you killed me twice, wounded me twice, missed me altogether twice. Can we do it again? Jimmy, we're going to keep doing it till you kill me all six times. And remember that number, six, because that's how many shots you got. No more, no less. Let's try it again. Ready? You haven't told me what you're thinking. About what? About me. It's been two weeks. Am I going to make it? What I was really thinking about was a drink. Lord, I miss that saloon, even with Gus Keeler in it. I need to know, Lucius. Is there any point in you staying on? Jimmy, I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it with my own two eyes. If you'll forgive me pointing out that difference. I think tomorrow it's time to get the bullets out of the cupboard. Yes, sir! Just... One thing bothers me. What's that? Well, you might get pretty good with a gun, especially at fast draw. But what good'll it do you? Gus Keeler's still gonna kill you, and if he kills you, I'm gonna have to kill him. I just don't know if I'm up to it. No, Lucius. Whatever happens between Gus Keeler and me is the end of it. I'm making that part of the deal right now. I've grown mighty fond of you, boy. You're a trier. A real trier. I bet your pa was proud of you. There's one more thing I've been thinking about. And when it's over between Gus Keeler and me, whatever happens, I want you to know that you can stay on here at the farm. <laughs> you might even like it once you get used to it. Oh, I like it already. But I think it's time to turn in. We got a busy day ahead of us, what with live ammunition and all. <laughs> Tin can set up along the fence by the chicken coop. You know where that is. I got a string attached to each can, and when I shake it, I want you to shoot. I got the can spaced two feet apart. When do I get to use the holster? In due time. You gotta learn how to shoot first. Now, I'm gonna rattle a can. Ready? Ready. I got one. But you missed three. You got two left. Try it again. Hey, son. What say we knock off? It's getting pretty dark. Well, that doesn't bother me. Uh, You go in if you want to. I'll I'll stay out here and practice. By yourself? Well, Sure. I'll walk up to the fence, touch the can, and take ten paces back. It'll help me to judge distances better. Hmm. Well, I suppose so. Okay, son. See you inside. Lucius? Yeah? Tomorrow I want to practice the draw. Why not? Lucius, what's the matter? Nothing. See you later. Now, when you fast draw, every part of your hand is doing something. Your trigger finger's squeezing the trigger, your thumb is pulling back the hammer, and the rest of your fingers are lifting the gun out of the holster. It's all one smooth motion. Remember, it's the hammer that actually fires the bullet. The trigger don't do nothing but free the hammer. That's why you pull the trigger first. Pull the trigger first? Yep. And that way, by the time the gun's cleared the holster, all you have to do to fire it is to lift your thumb off the hammer. That is, providing you pulled the hammer back. Of course, some people fan the hammer, but I don't hold with that. Why waste four or five shots when one good one will do? What happens if I let go of the hammer too soon? You shoot your foot off. One 
Want some more coffee, Lucius? No, thanks. I'm going to have another cup, and I'm going back outside to practice. What for? By now, you're damn near as fast as any man who ever lived. Did you really mean it? Damn near as accurate as a man who can see, at least on a quick draw. It's all thanks to you. Now, don't say that, boy. I feel bad enough already. Bad? How many men are there who could train a blind man to shoot? That's just it. You're the only blind man in the world who can shoot. No matter what happens between you and Gus Keeler now, you're going to become famous. Even if you live, even if he don't even fight you, you're going to be the most famous gunfighter since Billy the Kid. Don't worry. Nobody's going to know about this except you and me. You ain't going to go up against Gus Keeler? Oh, I'll go up against him. He's still the man who killed my father in cold blood. But when I do, nobody's going to know who I am. What's it a name? Well, it takes a lot of fine names to make Sears names stand for quality. Names you've always counted on, like Kenmore, Craftsman, Easy Living, and Die Hard. Names that kids and moms cheer, like Winnie the Pooh and Tough Skins. Names that are a part of your life today, like Permapress, Klingalon, and Winter 2. And, of course, there's Sears Best Products in everything from T-shirts to tractors. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of truly dependable names to make our name. Sears Roebuck and Company. <laughs> How many cold tablets do you take a day? Two? More. Four? More. Six? Yeah. A day? Uh-huh. And then more at night? Right. Why? Well, they're new. Take contact. One capsule helps all your congestive symptoms up to 12 hours. All day? And all night while you sleep. That's the wonder of contact. Hey, you're the guys on TV. <laughs> yeah, we're the guys on TV. Take your contact. Take it fast. Give your code to contact. Take only as direct. Lorne Green again. And here's the fourth act of the blind gun. Now, let me get this straight, Jimmy. Gus Keeler ain't gonna know who you are. He ain't the one that's blind, you know. I have a little plan. As I see it, I got two main problems going up against Gus Keeler. Now, one, he probably won't draw on me if he knows who I am. And two, he's got to make a sound every second or I won't know where he is. What I plan to do is put us both on equal footing. Now, Lucius, uh, if you look in my pa's bookcase, you'll find an almanac. An almanac? What's that got to do with anything? Just find it. Okay, but I thought we were planning a gunfight, not planting corn. Okay, I got it. Now, look up the moon tables and find me a night with no moon. No moon. Yeah, that might help. Here we go. There's a new moon in three days. My pa had a black suit. He wore it at funerals and such, and he also had a black hat. You think you could go into town and get me a black shirt? Hell, I got a black shirt. Good. Then we got the whole outfit. Now all we need is some black paint and some soot. Black paint and soot? This is beginning to sound a mite weird. I'm hoping it will be. Uh, You'll have to help me, Lucius. I want to paint my belt buckle, my snaps or buttons, anything that's shiny, black. Uh, We'll even have to paint the gun black, I'm afraid. Oh, not so, not so. All you have to do is paint the butt and the hammer black. That's all it shows above the holster. You're beginning to get the idea, Lucius. It's a smart idea. And you'll cover your face and hands with soot, is that it? Right. I'm even wearing patches over my eyes. Hmm. I want to be damn near invisible. Okay, let's say every inch of you is covered in black and there's no moon. Still going to be lights on in town if that's where you're going. Not if we wait till almost midnight. Gus Keeler stays up drinking that late, doesn't he? (laughs) Later. Most people will be in bed by then. I figure you can take care of what other odd lamp might be on. I suppose. But you got to get Keeler out of the saloon. And how will you keep him talking? Leave that to me. I know exactly what he's going to say. <laughs> and, and so I said to him, pay up, peddler. Or I'm going to take those corsets out of that bag of yours and wrap them around your neck. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do then, Gus? Bought me a whole nother bottle. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that reminds me, it's your turn to buy the drinks, ain't it, Bo? Ah, but Gus, you know I ain't got no more money. How do I know it? Gus, I already bought three rounds. Well, I'm thirsty. Let me see if I'm talking to Gus. yours. Gus! <laughs> Gus! Well, 
look at that. A four-bit piece. <laughs> Barkeep, three whiskeys here. Gus, you tore up my pocket. Have that fat wife of yours back Barkeep! I'll buy you a drink, Bo. What you drinking? Uh, gin. No drink for me, Gus. I gotta be getting home. Well, I just ordered you a drink, you gotta stay. Well, I, I'm going to Cheyenne in the morning tonight. Fred, I said you gotta stay. Okay, Gus. Okay. There it is, Jimmy. The saloon. About 50 yards ahead of us to the right. I'll go see if Gus Keeler's there. He's there. I can hear his voice. From here? Don't worry, Lucius. If you're ever blind, you'll get good at that sort of thing, too. How does the street look? Oh, darker than the devil's armpit. Besides the saloon, there's only one other light on in the liver stable. I can get it easy. Speaking of the devil, you look like his spitting image in that getup. You think Keeler will recognize me? What's there to recognize? Every inch of you is black, including your eyes. Good. He'll see me the way I see him. You stay here while I get the lamp in the stable. Bartender? Yeah, Gus? You poured this one a little short. Well, they poured it like I poured all the others. That's what I mean. You afraid I'll get drunk and disorderly and wreck all the furniture? You, <laughs> you've done it before. And I'm liable to do it again if you don't pour me a decent drink. Oh, okay, Gus, just relax. <laughs> hey, you boys want more? Uh, no, no, I, I'm fine. None for me either. I, I gotta be getting home soon, Gus. Well, me too. And leave me to drink all alone? Now, oh, that ain't very sociable. Friends should stick together. Here's to my friends, my true good friends. <laughs> okay, son. The street's dark as sin. I'll sneak into the saloon and get the lamps there when you call Keeler out. Everybody will be watching him. Thanks, Lucius, for everything. Son, if this don't work out... I want you to know it's been a powerful honor to know you. And it's been a powerful honor to be taught by the greatest gunfighter alive. Yeah. I'd almost forgotten I was anything great till I met you, Jimmy. Good luck. See you back at the farm. Yeah. Remember to shoot low, because you got a tendency to go high. Right. Gus Keeler. Gus Keeler! I think I heard somebody call you, Gus. Gus Keeler! Come out, Gus Keeler! Stop that damn piano! Gus Keeler! Come out, Gus Keeler! What for? To die! Die? What well, we'll see about that. <laughs> Damn, how come it's so dark out here? I can't see you. Come closer, then. Hey, the lamp in the saloon. Doesn't matter. You don't need light to die. That's twice you said I'm going to die. Who are you, anyway? Death. Death? Hey, what is this, some kind of joke? It's no joke, Gus Keeler. I am Death himself. But I'm going to give you a sporting chance. A better chance than you gave any of the people you killed or injured. I'm going to let you draw against me. Hey, hey who are you, really? I, I can't see your face. I don't have a face. Oh. God almighty. You don't have a face. Do you know the 23rd Psalm, Gus Keeler? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, then I, I, say it. But, but I, I... Say I, it! I, oh. Uh, the, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He, uh, he, he maketh me to lie down in uh, green pastures. Say the whole psalm, then draw. He, he, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me uh, beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He, he, he leadeth uh, me in the paths of righteousness. Say it. He, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. Uh, for his name's sake, uh, yea, uh, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fare no evil, for thou art with me. 
thy rod and uh, thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou uh, uh, anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall be Goodness and mercy. Oh. Is that you, Fred? Why is it so dark? Who shot Gus? Don't, 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 don't go after him, Marshal. He ain't human. Ain't human? I saw it with my own two eyes. Ask anybody here. Gus Keeler was so bad, death himself called him out and killed him in a gunfight. The conclusion of our story, after these words. Where could you learn how an oil surplus has turned into a shortage for West Coast refiners? Or why drug companies may be the target of an IRS crackdown? By reading the Wall Street Journal. Every business day, the journal gives you in-depth information on every phase of business. So have a pencil ready for an important offer. Recent articles have reported on the big move at a major automaker to cut costs, the rebounding bond market, and why it pays to buy and hold on to used cars. You would have read what the White House is up against as pressure mounts for bold new steps to curb inflation and what the outlook is for the prime interest rate. Another story told who's giving a big steel company a helping hand. The Wall Street Journal. It's all the business news you need when you need it. Right now, you can get 20 weeks of the journal. That's 100 copies for just $26. A real money-saving offer. So in the continental U.S., call this toll-free number now. 800-331-1000. That's 800-331-1000. Except in Oklahoma. You'll be billed later. It can probably be said that nobody missed Gus Keeler very much. In fact, Cascade, Wyoming, was a perceptibly nicer place to live after his departure. Morning, Lucius. Morning, Jimmy. Morning, Fred. Hi, Fred. Where are you all going with that suitcase, Jimmy? Well, I'm going to Boston to study something called Braille. Braille? What's that? Oh, something some Frenchman invented to teach blind folks how to read. Well, how does it work? Well, if he knew that, he wouldn't be going. I think it's through touch instead of sight. Oh, well, who's going to take care of the farm? Well, I am, of course. You? Lucius Michaels? <laughs> well, what's so funny about that? Jimmy's taught me a lot about farming in exchange for something I taught him. Now, how long you been gone, Jimmy? Oh, two years. Two years? Hey, Lucius, did I tell you what happened to Gus Keeler? Damnedest thing ever happened to these parts. I heard, I heard. Look, Fred, I'd like to jawbone with you, but I gotta get Jimmy on that train. Oh, sure, sure. Have a good trip, Jimmy. Thank you. Oh, windbag. <laughs> you sure you won't mind living on the farm? Mind? Well, it's the most peace and quiet I've had in 30 years. Sure you won't mind living in Boston? Two years a long time. Being able to read is something my pa always wished for me. I think I ought to do it for him. Yes, yeah, son. I reckon so. What? Well, up you go. I'll miss you. I'll miss you, Lucius. But all right. Somehow. I just bet you will. And you know, to this day, in Cascade, Wyoming... They talk about the night death himself called Gus Keeler out and killed him in a fair fight. This is Ashford. And Simpson for the Bell System. Know how good it is to hear from faraway friends? Well, turn the tables on them. Pick up the phone and let them hear from you. You don't need a special reason except that you care. I care. Come on and reach out. Reach out and touch someone. Reach out. Call up and just say hi.
our Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, The Blind Gun, was written by John Bornholt and produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Lorne Green. Our stars were Corey Burton and Vic Perrin. Featured in the cast were Marvin Miller, Tom Holland, Jack Carroll, Harley Bear, and Howard Culver. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. The Elliot Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CVI. This is Andy Griffith. Join us tomorrow at this same time. I've got another story I think you'll find riotously amusing. This is Lauren Green. When gold was discovered in California in 1848, the news spread slowly at first. But by the spring of 1849, gold rush fever was sweeping the eastern states like an epidemic. Tens of thousands of people, hoping for quick riches and a new life, left their homes and headed west. Some went by ship. Far more across the continent in wagon trains across vast plains and mountains that had scarcely even been mapped. The dangers of the trail were far worse than anything they could possibly imagine. They would face storms, hostile Indians, shortages of food and water. Disease would strike like a thunderbolt, creating panic wherever it appeared. But gold is a powerful magnet. And as soon as the spring grass was high enough for their stock to graze on, the 49ers were ready to set out on the trail to California. I insist on good discipline, Mrs. Fraser. I intend to run the wagon train with a firm hand. I expect you do, Mr. Blackstone. There will be no weak links in our chain. You and your nephew are fully prepared for our great adventure? Pretty near. I just got... The train must leave on schedule, Mrs. Fraser. Saturday morning, you know. The time is growing short. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Cash on the Barrowhead, by Robert Ellis. Our stars, Peggy Weber and Vic Perrin. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. What's it a name? Well, it takes a lot of fine names to make Sears names stand for quality. Names you've always counted on, like Kenmore, Craftsman, Easy Living, and Die Hard. Names that kids and moms cheer, like Winnie the Pooh and Tough Skins. Names that are a part of your life today, like Permapress, Klingalon, and Winter 2. And, of course, there's Sears Best Products in everything from T-shirts to tractors. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of truly dependable names to make our name. Sears Roebuck and Company. 40 Love Smashing. How she plays? No, how she looks. In action-proof eye makeup from Maybelline. Like ultra big, ultra lash mascara, smear proof, smudge proof, waterproof, so long, longest looking lashes stay in the thick of the action. Game set and match. Action proof. Keeps you looking good after the action too. Ultra big, ultra lash mascara, incredibly long looking lashes without flaky fibers from Maybelline. Smashing. <laughs> By May of 1849, the frontier village of Independence, Missouri, 
had become a boom town, an overnight melting pot, where people of all kinds were thrown together in a headlong rush to the gold fields. In the crowded dining room of the Argus Hotel in Independence, Matty Fraser and her nephew face each other across the supper table. I can't wait for you any longer, Aunt Maddie. I gotta get to California as fast as I can. But you promised me, Frank. I'm counting on you. I gotta have a man to help on the wagon. It's the rules. You can get somebody else. Easy. There's lots of fellers around. Well, I can't take just anybody. You're my sister's boy, and I trust you. I gotta get to the mines before the gold's all gone, Aunt Maddie. Well, we're leaving Saturday. That's not so far away. It's four days. I... I'm leaving tomorrow. Tomorrow? With a couple other fellers. No wagon, just our horses. We figured to catch up with the Madison train. They left here a week ago. We can oh, join them. Frank, the... you just gotta wait for me. I don't trust nobody else. I can't help it, Aunt Maddie. I'm real oh, sorry. Please, but... Frank, I need you. No. Oh, Frank. My mind's made up. I'll come say goodbye in the morning. Oh, Frank, come back. Frank! Excuse oh. me. You probably don't want to be bothered by a stranger at the next table, but I... You're right, I don't. I couldn't help overhearing your conversation. I was talking too loud again. I've got a proposal for you. May I join you at your table? <laughs> well, you're polite anyhow. All right, come on over. Ah, uh, that's better. I'm Gideon Winslow. What do they call you? Giddy? <laughs> no, just Gideon. Well, my name is Matilda, and they call me Maddie. Maddie Fraser. Where are you from? Boston. Boston, huh? So that's why you talk so funny. Do I talk funny? Now, you don't sound much like Missouri. What's your proposal? In your conversation with your nephew... You said that you're going to California. Well, so am I. You need a man to work your wagon, and I need some wagon space. Are you to... crazy? Why should I take you on? I don't know nothing about you. Give me a chance to tell you. I'm 23 years old and in good health. We Winslows are very respectable people. My father operates the family shipping business, and I'm expected to... Well, you don't care about that. I'm a graduate of Harvard College. I don't care about none of them things. They don't mean nothing out here. What do you know about greasing an axle? Do you ever drive two yoke of oxen? Can you handle a gun? Do you know yes. how... Yes, what? Oh, I'm an excellent shot. I have my own rifle and my own horse. I can provide my own supplies Oh, and, and out here, you're a greenhorn. I'm afraid that's exactly the right word. At least you're honest about it. I wouldn't be able to fool you for very long, would I? You didn't do nothing wrong back in Boston, did you? No, I'm not running away from anything. I just felt I wanted to do something exciting before I settled down to a job and a family for the rest of my life. Now you're really talking funny. Well, I suppose I am. Are you going to California to hunt for gold? I ain't going to hunt for it, no. I read in Niles' register that the miners pay for everything with gold dust. So I'm going to set up a nice pair of scales on the front desk of my hotel and just way out. You've, you've got a hotel in California? Well, I ain't got it yet, but I'm going to have it. Might even build one. Back in St. Louis, I... Uh, you don't know St. Louis, do you? No. Well, me and my husband owned a hotel there. <laughs> Then he died last year, and I had a bad spell myself. And... A spell? Are you sure you're well enough to travel? Of course I am. I ain't had nothing for a long time now. Anyhow, I just started thinking it was time for a change, so I sold the hotel, and uh, I'm going to California to open up a new one. Which wagon train have you joined? Blackstone's. Mr. Andrew Hollister Blackstone's. You don't sound as if you like him very much. I don't think he likes me very much. The whole train's missionaries and people like that from Ohio. Except me. Very proper folks. Mr. Blackstone is your guide? No, we ain't the guide. We got a good mountain man as guide. Blackstone don't know no more about the trail than you do. He's the captain of the train. We all elected him. 
That is, they did. I voted for somebody else. Why go on his train if you dislike him so much? There are trains forming up all the time. I don't have to like him, do I? I just figured I could trust religious folks. Besides, it's the first train I can be ready for. Having trouble getting supplies? No, I got everything I need. I'm just having a little work done on my wagon, and the dratted wheelwright and the coopersmith are so busy, you gotta wait in line. Do you have a gun? Got a rifle, same as you. Between the two of us, we should be able to hold off the missionaries, don't you think? <laughs> You're all right, Gideon, even if you don't know much. But, you know, I got to be careful about who I take on. Oh, drat. What's the matter? Oh, here comes Mr. Andrew Hollister Blackstone himself. Now just keep your mouth shut, Gideon. Maybe he won't notice you. How do you do, Mr. Blackstone? Good evening, Mrs. Fraser. I trust you are well. Oh, heard a fair, Miss Blackstone. I am pleased to hear it. There is a great deal of sickness going around. I am disturbing you at supper to inquire if you're absolutely certain that your wagon will be ready on time. Oh, I'm certain. We'll ride as south, promise me. Splendid, splendid. Many people have applied to me for a place in my train. Very worthy people. I have had to tell them that there are no openings, unless, of course, someone were to drop out. I ain't going to drop out. And what about your nephew? What about him? Well, you remember I told you earlier that I do not accept any wagons with only females in them. There must be at least one man to work each wagon. No weak links in our chain, you know. I remember. Your nephew will accompany you as planned? Well, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, no. No, Mr. Uh, Fraser. But why not? Well, he had to leave. I don't like this at all, Mrs. Fraser. Last-minute changes are usually mistakes, hasty and ill-advised. And I insist upon getting acquainted with every member of my little band before we leave. Unless you find a replacement for your nephew, and at once, you I'm have... going to replace him, Mr. Blackstone. Huh? Oh, and who are you? Gideon Winslow. 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 Oh, I knew a family by the name of Winslow in Cincinnati. They were Presbyterians. I'm from Boston, sir. Oh, Boston. Ah, oh, yes. There are a great many radical ideas coming out of Boston these days. I haven't brought any with me, Mr. Blackstone. Well, that is good news indeed. But I must tell you that I will accept only people of good moral character. We forbid profane swearing and obscene conversation. I should hope you would, sir. A man's outer grace reflects the harmony of his soul. Gracious me, you quote Plato. And we're out here in Missouri. I am impressed. My, my, Mrs. Fraser, where did you ever find this young man? Oh, he just... I would think you made a splendid choice. Splendid. I would say you have fulfilled our requirements very nicely. We will all meet again, then, on Saturday morning. If I can be of any service, Mrs. Fraser, please let me know. Oh, yes, Mr. Blackstone, I sure will. I hope we will be able to share some conversation in the course of our long journey, Mr. Winslow. I'll look forward to it, sir. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Good night, then. Good night, Mrs. Fraser. Oh, good night. Good night. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, you've got your place in the train. Yep. Yes, I have, thanks to you. You sure know how to manage Blackstone. That'll come in handy on the trail. Why, he was almost a human being when he left. How'd you do that? Lots of practice. I knew half a dozen professors like him at college. Who's Pluto? Uh, Plato. He was a teacher, too. Hmm. Maybe you're going to work out all right after all, Gideon. Have we made a bargain, Maddie? Reckon we have. I don't know how much help you're going to be, but you seem proper enough, so I suppose I can trust you. You might look a little happier. How about a handshake? Here's my hand. 
Well, I guess we're stuck with each other, ain't we? Thanks for all the enthusiasm. Oh, we both could probably do a whole lot worse. I like pepperoni, but it doesn't like me. Feel better fast with Digel. With the ingredients in Digel, relief from acid indigestion and gas starts in less than a minute. I like corned beef. I like cabbage. I like franks. I like beans. I like spaghetti. And meatballs. But they don't like me. If you like something that doesn't like you. Feel better fast with Digel. Digel relief starts in less than a minute. For occasional use only as directed. There's no other deodorant soap more effective than Dial. You get that clean, fresh, confidence feeling all day long with Dial. How would you plan that clean, fresh, confidence feeling all day long with Dial? How would you glad? You'll be glad Dial's active deodorant ingredient keeps working all day long. That clean, fresh, confidence feeling all day long with On Friday morning, the day before the Blackstone train is to leave, Matty Fraser makes an important stop at the front desk of the Argus Hotel. Good morning, Mrs. Fraser. I hope you slept well. Oh, not bad, not bad. Remember that package you put in the hotel safe for me? Uh, certainly. But I... I hope you aren't checking out. I haven't made up your bill. No, no, not yet. But I want my package, if you please. Yes. Yes, of course. Just a moment. Ooh, that safe looks strong enough for the U.S. Mint. <laughs> yes, doesn't it? Nothing's too good for our guests. Let me see. Uh... Ah, yes, here's your name, Mrs. Fraser. Uh, yours is the package wrapped in uh, blue silk? Yep, that's right. Still there, is it? Well, naturally, Mrs. Fraser. Here you are. The safety of your valuables can be taken for granted. There has never been any kind of... Uh, uh... Robbery? Well, I should hope not. Uh, really, I assure you... Oh, I'm just pulling your leg, young man. Don't oh. pay no mind to me. Do I sign for this thing? Uh, yes. Yes, please. Right here. Right here. Uh, if Mr. Blackstone asks for me, you can tell him I'm going to the wheelwrights. My wagon's just about ready. Oh, you'll be leaving us soon? Yep, early tomorrow morning. I expect you're going to California. Nowhere else. It sounds just wonderful. Imagine, you'll be able to pick up chunks of real gold right out of the riverbeds. Well, I don't know about that. Maybe it ain't all that easy. Besides, California's 2,000 miles away, and we ain't even got started yet. Many 49ers left for California with no more equipment than they could hastily toss into a farm wagon. They set out with hope and a prayer, and an innocent trust that they could count on their fellow Argonauts if they needed help. The Blackstone wagon train forms a long line of 18 canvas top wagons moving slowly across the prairie. Matty is at the reins of her wagon near the end of the train. Gideon, on horseback, rides beside her. Far ahead, the outriders have come upon a wagon that broke down beside the trail the day before. Mr. Blackstone himself has stopped to talk with the unlucky party. How could you have been so foolhardy as to set out for California without even a spare wheel? What did you say your name is? Uh, Norris, sir, Norris. Uh, this here's my daughter, Angela. Pleased to meet you, sir. Well, how do you do? There are just the two of you. That's right, sir. We left Independence with a Callahan train. Didn't anyone offer to help you? No, no, sir. Not a soul had lent a helping hand in our hour of need. They just went on without us, a hard-hearted lot, sir. Yes, well, uh, can the wheel be repaired? No, I don't think so, sir. And it isn't just the wheel. Gracious me, what else is wrong? Well, 
when the wheel give out, the axle busted, too. And I ain't got nothing to fix it with. What's happened, Mr. Blackstone? Well, nothing to any of our wagons, I'm happy to say, Mr. Winslow. But this poor man, Mr. Rub, uh, uh, Norris, is in dire straits. Lack of foresight, of course. No, sir, lack of money. Well, whatever the reason, it wasn't wise to set out on a long journey so poorly prepared. No spare wheel, no means to repair the axle. Oh, we thought everything would be fine, sir. We thought everybody would help each other on the train. Well, we'd have helped them if they needed it. But it's not really fair to ask anyone to give up spare wagon parts at the very start of a 2,000-mile trip. You've got two horses tied behind your wagon. Why don't you ride back to Independence and buy what you need? Well, like my daughter says, sir, we ain't got the money. Well, I... I hardly know what to say. We'll ask if anyone can help, of course, but... Um... Mr. Winslow, do you think Mrs. Fraser can give this poor man a wheel? Maddie's got spares. Maddie? Maddie Fraser from St. Louis? Yes. Do you know her? Oh, know her? Sure I know her. Why, she'd be glad to help out an old friend. Really, Mr. Norris, I think you're expecting a great deal to presume that much on friendship. Her wagon's almost up to us. Uh, Maddie, over here. Bring the wagon over here. What's the trouble? This man, Mr. Norris, says he's a friend of yours. He does? Well, what did he tell you? Oh, boys. Oh. Only that he knows you. Norris, huh? That's right, Maddie. I don't think... Uh, I ain't never seen you before in my life. Oh, we met two, three times in St. Louis. I was just telling these gentlemen you'd be glad to help out an old friend. But Mrs. Fraser said she yep, didn't... Yep, Maddie, I need a new wheel and something to fix the rear axle with. And I just knew you'd help well, me out. even if I did remember you, and I don't... I ain't sure I could help. Not even a man who put up at your hotel in St. Louis? My hotel? Yep. The River House. Real nice place. Oh, I suppose it's expecting too much that you'd remember everybody that stopped there. Uh, Mr. Norris, we really do not have time to reminisce like this. There's a storm coming, and we absolutely must move on. Of course, I knew your husband real well. Nice fella. Too bad he died. I have... Uh, I was awful sorry to hear about it. I bet you miss him a lot. Uh, Mr. Norris, I do not wish to appear rude, Ever but... tell these gentlemen what a famous place the River House is, Maddie? No, I... No, I never oh, did. Oh, I'd give it a real good recommendation any time. Right now, if you want. We're wasting time, Mr. Norris. You have a wheel and axle to be repaired. Now, don't you think... Oh, Maddie's going to help me out there. Ain't you, Maddie? An old friend of your husband's? Maddie? Is anything wrong? N no, Gideon. I think, uh, I just think it's my moral duty to help Mr. Norris. Now, that's the Maddie I remember. Why, this is surely a, a, a very generous action, Mrs. Fraser. Very, uh, Praiseworthy. And uh, I'll need some help with the axle. What? Well, I mean, I can't do it all alone now, can I? That's a two-man job, you know. Gideon, do you think you might give Mr. Norris a hand? If you want me to, Maddie, of course. But, Mrs. Fraser, this is really too much. I cannot hold up the entire wagon train. Well, I, I guess you'll have to go on without us, Mr. Blackstone. We'll try to catch up later. Oh, I don't like this at all, Mrs. Fraser. This kind of unexpected change of plans is always disruptive. Life is full of surprises, ain't it? Well, somebody's got to help him out. It's, it's the proper thing to do. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Very commendable, Mrs. Fraser. Really admirable. But the rest of us absolutely must continue on. I I hope you understand. I I would really like to help. Oh, but, uh, I understand. Well then, that's settled. I trust we will meet again. Oh, and and soon, of course. Mister Blackstone, 
Thank you for everything. Not at all, my boy, not at all. We, uh, we must always try to look on the bright side of life, mustn't we? Even when things seem most, uh, uh, hopeless. <laughs> Goodbye, Mrs. Fraser. This is Ashford. And Simpson for the Bell System. Know how good it is to hear from faraway friends? Well, turn the tables on them. Pick up the phone and let them hear from you. You don't need a special reason except that you care. I care. Come on and reach out. Reach out and touch someone. Reach out. Call up and just say hi. Blackstone wagon train has wound over the hill and dropped out of sight. As the dark clouds of a spring thunderstorm move slowly closer, two wagons stand near each other beside the trail, alone in a great expanse of green prairie. Well, the sooner we start the repairs, the better. I'll tie up my horse and take a look at that wheel. Mr. Norris? Hmm? Don't tell the boy about St. Louis. Please. Why not? He looks old enough. He wouldn't understand. Well, that's your problem. I got more important things to think about. What do you want? Well, you know what I want. The money. Mr. Norris, this is very strange. It looks it looks as if your wheel spokes were smashed with an axe. Well, now, what do you make of that? I can't imagine what happened, but look at this spoke right mm. here. And here, don't they look like cuts from an axe? I guess all that education you got back east did you some good after all. Nurse, you leave him out of this. The wheel was smashed with an axe, smart boy. I did it myself. You planned it like this. You knew you could make me drop out of the train. You catch on real fast, Maddie. Oh. You're almost as smart as he is. Maddie, what's this all about? You got him, Angela? I got him, Paul. Uh, and they're both loaded. Here you are. Hey, those are our rifles. You hold it right there, smart boy. Now that's better. All I had to do was keep you too busy talking and Angela could have emptied your whole wagon. How does it feel to look down the barrel of your own gun? What do you want with us? Money, of course. Money? We haven't got much money. I'm talking about $15,000, smart boy. What? Maddie, I don't know... Don't you ask her. She'd only lie to you anyhow. Now, just a minute. I'll tell you all about it. Woman like her, I'm going to tell you just what kind of woman you're traveling with, smart oh, boy. Oh, Gideon, I never want to. Just listen to me, smart boy, and when you've heard enough, you can climb on your horse and ride right back to Independence. I'm not likely to do that. Oh, no? Suppose I tell you that Maddie's hotel was really a... You want me to call it a dance hall, Maddie, or maybe a saloon? I don't care what you call it. Everybody in St. Louis knows about the River House and... The kind of people that went there. Seems like you weren't too fussy. Me? Why, I never set foot in it. I never been near a place like that. Angela, darling, the words burned my throat when I said I'd been there. I know, Paul. But I had to say that so she'd know I could tell Blackstone all about her. Doesn't matter, Paul. Just so's you understand, darling. No, Maddie, you and me ain't never met before. Maybe I ain't as perfect as that jackass Blackstone, but I got my pride. And a lot to be proud of, too. Don't you talk to me like that. What do you got to be proud of? You even lied about being a widow. She never had a husband, smart boy, not in St. Louis, anyhow. Was that supposed to make you more respectable, Mrs. Fraser? Uh, you just ask your friend Winslow now if he still wants to travel with a woman like you. Oh, yeah. You must have a twisted view of life, Mr. Norris. I'm glad I don't feel the way you do. Twisted, huh? We'll see what's twisted. 
I got the two of you right in the palm of my hand. Of course, you're holding a gun on us. I know a lot more than you think I do, smart boy. Angela and me were sitting right near you and Loudmouth here in the hotel dining room that night when you joined up together. We heard every word the two of you said. That explains it. I got a real surprise when I found out we were so close to the famous Maddie Fraser. The whole of St. Louis was talking about it when she sold the river house. You got uh, 15000 for it, didn't you, Maddie? None of your business. Oh, it's my business, all right. Well, now, I just put two and two together. If you sold out in St. Louis and you're going to buy a new hotel in California, then it seems like you might be carrying a lot of cash with you, don't it? Maybe it'd be worth my time to keep an eye on you. You followed me? <laughs> yep, I sure did. Right from the hotel desk to the wheelwrights. And you carrying that package from the safe all wrapped up in pretty blue cloth. Now, I says to myself, why would she take her money to the wheelwrights? There's a lot of carpenters in town, and they could have made a nice box for her to keep it in, if that's all she wanted. No, she goes to a wheelwrights, the fella that builds wagons. So I says to myself, she must be having the money built right into the wagon somehow, like a secret compartment. Well, you ain't never going to find it. Matty, I ain't even going to look for it. Huh? Well, not right away, anyhow. I got all the time in the world. We're going to leave you two right here and take your wagon to California. What? If I ain't found the money by the time we get there, I can take your wagon apart, board by board. If only you'd told me about it, Maddie, I might... Shut up, you two. Angela? Yes, Pa? Get our things out of the busted wagon and put them in Maddie's. All right, Pa. We've been sitting here all packed and waiting for you, Maddie. It was a pretty clever scheme all around, Mr. Norris. I've got to hand it to you. You know, I can't figure you out. If I was in your boots... I'd be madder than a wasp right now. I can't think clearly when I'm angry, Mr. Norris. Well, you go right ahead and think all you want to, smart boy. You can't do nothing. It's too late. All set, Angela? Almost, Pa. Couple more bags. How are you feeling right now, Maddie? Don't you wish you'd stayed put back in the river house? Don't you talk to me. Why, if you hadn't sold it, you could still be parading around your fancy red parlor, acting like the Queen of St. Louis, looking superior and, and... And what, Mr. Norris? And, uh, and acting like everybody always said she did. All righty, Pa. Everything's in the new wagon. You seem to know the river house pretty well, Mr. Norris. Shut up, you, and and get over there by the busted wagon. Go on, move. As long as he's got the gun, Maddie, we'd better do what he says. I guess we better. Oh, get in on... No talking. I don't want any talking. I, does Angela know about your visits to the river house, Mr. Norris? You shut up. I never set foot in a place like that. Oh, Pa, stop. Angela, darling, don't listen to him. What difference does that make now, Pa? Don't you ever get tired of pretending? Pretending? My own daughter calls me a liar? Oh, it's a good thing your mother ain't a liar. Ma knew all about it. You never fooled her for a minute. She knew all about all those places you went to. I I, I just can't believe it. We always had to pretend about everything. Right up to the night Ma died, she was still pretending, making excuses for you. And then hours after she died, and you finally came home up. Well, I don't know which hurt most, losing her or or seeing you kneeling next to the bed, holding her dead hand and and telling me you had to work late, pretending again like you always did. Angela, Angela, darling, I I never meant to... I was only trying to... to, uh, Hey, you Winslow, you quit whispering. We were just wondering if you'd let us get some things out of our wagon. It's starting to rain, and Maddie should have her bonnet and shawl. She can sit in a busted wagon. It's going to be hers anyways. Oh, Paul, let her get her things. What difference does it make? Uh, all right. But we're going to search anything you take, just to be sure. That's kind of you, Angela. Thanks. Here, Maddie, let me help you up. Oh, right. uh, well, I won't be in here a minute. i got my eye on you, Winslow. You caused enough trouble already. Angela, I'm sorry. Don't be. It would have happened sooner or later, anyhow. You're getting wet. It don't matter. Rain feels good. Maddie, what is it? Norris, I'm going into the wagon. 
Hey, you come back here. Pa, something's wrong. Maddie, my God, she's unconscious. Pa, look at her face. Extra car wax that gives you more than just a shine. Turtle Extra. There's more than sunshine and raindrops out there. Howling wind, bitter cold, fierce heat, mud, pollution. To protect against all that you need. Turtle Extra. The extra protection of polymers. The extra durability of silicones give you extra hard shell protection. Probably more protection than you'll ever need. Turtle Extra. Extra hard shell. Turtle Extra. <laughs> How many cold tablets do you take a day? Two? More. Four? More. Six? Yeah. A day? Uh-huh. And then more at night? Right. Why? Well, they're new. Take contact. One capsule helps all your congestive symptoms up to 12 hours. All day? And all night while you sleep. That's the wonder of contact. Hey, you're the guys on TV. <laughs> yeah, we're the guys on TV. Take your contact. Take it fast. Give your cold to contact. Take only as direct. Lorne Green again, and here's the fourth act of Cash on the Barrelhead. Daddy, can you hear me? Ah, she's play acting. There ain't nothing the matter with her. Oh, Paul, her face is all gray. I think she's coming too. Maddie? <laughs> what is it? What happened? Oh, I've got a terrible pain in my stomach. Like a knife. Oh, my son. She's all doubled up. Ah, uh, she, she, she's faking. It, it, it's some kind of trick. Have you ever had anything like this before? Nothing, nothing this bad ever. You got to get her out of here. Oh, can, can I have some water? Get in. I'm terrible thirsty. The canteen's right here. Do you think you can sit up a little? I don't know. Awful cramps. Get in. Awful. All around my stomach. Here, Here, let me let me hold your head. Oh, oh, easy, get it. Can you swallow some water? My throat is just a fire, get it. I can't hardly get it down. What's the matter with her? I don't know yet. Here, Maddie, have another sip. Well, you got to get her out of here. Get her out of here, and right now... Oh, but, Paul, she looks awful sick. She is faking, I tell you. There wasn't nothing wrong with her a couple of minutes ago. Well, there is now. Can can she get up? She's pretty weak. She ought to rest a little. Well, she can rest in a busted wagon. Now, Paul, don't be like that. She's sick. Why'd she have to get sick in here? Why couldn't she get here, sick? Here, here, Maddie, let me put this towel under your head. She's, she's covered with sweat. Well, what difference does that make? It's going to be all right, man. It's going to be all right. flowers are going to get all melted. What's she talking about? She's delirious. Maddie, Maddie, who's Betsy? Here, see if you can sit up a little more. There, there. Pain. A stomach hurts. Oh, oh. Let me, let me try your pulse. Do you know how to do things like that? Oh, oh yes. Oh. Shh, 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 Maddie. Oh. Everything's going to be all right. I just want to hold your wrist for a minute. Can't we pick her up? we got to get her out of here. Oh, now let her be for a little. Hurry up, smart boy. Do something. <laughs> Mama always liked the flowers. Betsy. Betsy, I, I, I can barely feel her pulse. It's terribly faint. Oh. Well, what does that mean? She keeps clutching her belly. The pain must be getting worse. She's in a terrible way, Paul. What are we going to do? We're going to get her out of here. That's what we're going to do. No, wait, wait. I think... I... Let's see. She's thirsty and sweating a lot. Stomach pain. We all wet. Oh, Betsy. Betsy, please. I've had about as much as this as I'm going to take. Domino cramps. Let me get over there. Get out of my way. I'll just grab her shoulder. Oh, oh, please. Oh, get him. Cramps, get him. Weak pulse. Oh, dear God. What is it? What's she got? It's cholera. It must be cholera. Oh, cholera. Oh. Let's get out of here. Oh, it hurts so. Get in. Don't 
Leave me. Here's your horse, Paul. Hurry. I'm riding out of here, Norris, and you aren't going to stop me. Betsy? Well, it's about time you came back. Will you help me sit up? Uh, there. Uh, How's that? Uh, you had my head so twisted I couldn't breathe. I didn't even hear him go. What took you so long? They headed back toward Independence. I had to wait till they were out of sight. Uh, Maddie, you were wonderful. Well, of course I was. Well, my idea about the cholera was pretty good, too, uh, don't you think? Gideon, it's probably the best idea you ever had. What did you put on your face to make it look gray? Soot from the lantern there. You ain't the only one around here with their wits about them. My horse is already tied behind the wagon. I'll get our rifles and put Norris's things back in his wagon. You think you feel well enough to travel? <laughs> The conclusion of our story, after these words. Do you know how 20 million Americans get away with cheating on their income tax? Why the U.S. Treasury has started to sell off part of its gold reserves? Or where to get double-digit returns on your savings with free checking? You can read fascinating reports like these every week in U.S. News and World Report, the news magazine that helps you understand national and world affairs, helps you with health, business, and legal problems, shows you how to fight inflation and keep more of what you earn. No other news magazine covers the news that affects your world as completely as U.S. News. But find out for yourself. Right now, call 800-228-5454 and save 17% off the regular subscription price with a 25-week trial subscription for only $9.87, just about 40 cents a copy. Send no money, but call now, 800-228-5454. Tell the operator you want 25 weeks of U.S. News for only $9.87. 800-228-5454. Toll free, 800-228-5454. Well, the rain stopped, Gideon. Do you think we're going to be able to catch up with Blackstone? Easily. How come you're so sure? Tomorrow's Sunday. Who ever heard of missionaries traveling on Sunday? We'll be there in time to join them in their first hymn. Well, hallelujah. Wonder if I can get the soot washed off by then. Gideon? What? Oh, I just thought I I ought to tell you where the money is. It's right there. The flour barrel? Yep. It's Betsy Brand flour. <laughs> you, you mean like the old saying, cash on the barrel head? <laughs> well, it ain't exactly on it. It's more like under it. I had a false bottom built into that barrel. I'd have been proud to have thought of it. You know, a thief would have to be pretty smart to beat us, Maddie. Let's go. <laughs> Do you have cash you'd like to invest sensibly? Then you should know about Dreyfus Liquid Assets. It's the money market fund that combines your money with that of other investors to earn the kind of high interest rates large investors enjoy. 
Start with as little as $2,500. Make added investments as low as $100. With Dreyfus Liquid Assets, your money, or as much of it as you need, is yours whenever you need it. Phone for it. Write a check for cash or to pay your larger bills. You keep right on earning till the check clears. No charge or penalty for withdrawal. No sales fee. Not even a charge for the checks. Today, you owe it to yourself to earn as much as you can on your money. So call now, 800-228-5454, for a prospectus, including management fee, charges and expenses, and a clear, concise explanation of how Dreyfus Liquid Assets helps you get the lion's share from today's money market. Read the prospectus carefully before you invest. Day or night, call 800-228-5454, toll free. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Cash on the Barrelhead, was written by Robert Ellis and produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Lorne Green. Our stars were Peggy Weber and Vic Perrin. Featured in the cast were Brian Farrell, Marvin Miller, Joan McCall, and Corey Burton. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CVI. This is Andy Griffith. Join us tomorrow at this same time. I've got another story I think you'll find riotously amusing. This is Lorne Green. On some distant western plain in 1891, a bunch of Texas cowboys huddle around a campfire. The trail herd is bedded down, and the exhausted drovers welcome the peace and quiet that nightfall brings. Zack Barnett, the weather-beaten old trail boss, glances up at the Big Dipper, the position of the constellation in the sky tells him it's time to change the night guard. Dixie, you got the third watch. Better get to it. I know. I know. Don't seem like a fella never gets a chance to sleep around here. Oh, what are you kicking about? You can sleep all winter when the drive's over. Mm, I reckon. Trouble with you boys is you got it too easy nowadays. You don't know what it's like to be on a real trail drive. Pushing a couple thousand longhorns up from Texas. No trail to follow except the one you make as you go along. I reckon them days is gone forever. Railroads made sure of that. That's why I count myself lucky. I came up the good night loving trail with that first herd of longhorns. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, The Good Night Loving Trail, by Steve Sharon. Our stars, Jeff Corey, Sam Edwards, and Herb Rudley. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. Product value. Sears Laboratories work to maximize that value for you. Its manufacturing consultants work with products and their manufacturers to cut production costs. One example is our power spray carpet cleaner. Its plastic parts require molds to form them. 
Molds are expensive, especially certain designs. So our manufacturing consultants recommended designs that cut mold costs. End result, a better value for you. Sears Laboratories. One reason Sears is where America shops for value. Make some Kraft macaroni and cheese. Please, please make some Kraft macaroni and cheese. It's nice and cheesy and it's really pretty easy. Please, make some Kraft macaroni and cheese. Mmm, when you make Kraft macaroni and cheese dinner, the cheese sauce is so rich and creamy, you know they're going to like it. So By the 1890s, cattle are shipped to marketplace by rail. The days of moving great herds north and long trail drives are over. It's the end of an era. But one old trail hand remembers how it was in the beginning. Back in '65, Reconstruction and carpetbaggers had dropped on Texas like a flight of hungry vultures. There was too much beef and too much of that good-for-nothing red money. One thing there wasn't enough of was good cow hands. The war had seen to that. I was just a button then, but I could set a horse as good as some that were bigger and older. And when Charlie Goodnight got back from the war, he'd give me my first job. I weren't with the outfit long when Comanche stampeded one of the herds and drove them off. Now, Charlie, he, he didn't take too kindly to that, so we all lit out after his cattle next day. There was 14 of us, including Charlie's stepbrother and partner, Wes Sheik, and one-armed Bill Wilson. We trailed him for 25 miles, all the way to the Brassos River, where we stopped. Come on, Charlie, what are we stopping for? Are we going out to the herd? Nope. We ain't too far behind him, Charlie. I, I've been studying the signs like you showed me. And what did you find, Zach boy? Well, I didn't count any bug tracks crossing them hoof prints. And you said that's a sure way to tell if they're fresh. Well, you're right, Zach. You read signs almost as good as a ranger. But but not as good as you. <laughs> well, if you'd counted the unshod bony tracks and the number of moccasin prints, you'd know there's just too many Comanche for us to go after the herd. Ain't that so, Bill? <laughs> yeah. Uh, unless Zach wants to get his hair listed by them thieving barbers. Oh, no, thanks. Uh, I reckon I like my scalp right where it is. So that's it, huh? We're just going to let the herd go. Don't see we got much choice, Wes. Well, that is the damnedest thing I ever heard of. After all we've worked for. What do we get to show for it? Nothing but a seat full of blisters. I don't like it any more than you. We'd best head back and protect what's left of the herd. I reckon Charlie had about enough of rustlers, engines, and reconstruction. But if he had a plan, he was keeping it to himself. Uh, Charlie, Wes, uh, uh, could you come outside? Sure, Bill, uh... Anything wrong? Well, uh, uh, just me and some of the men like to have a word with you. Howdy, boys. All right, howdy, howdy, Charlie. Well, uh, wh what is it, men? Well, uh, I don't know if you and Charlie heard the talk, but uh, worry has it that some of the outfits hereabouts is uh, uh, getting ready to make a drive up Kansas way. Yeah, we, we heard. And I reckon all of Texas will be heading north to trade cattle for some of them Yankee dollars. Yeah, yeah, well, that's the uh, way we figure it. Too. Slash Wise looking for trail hands right now? Yeah, and uh, they're paying $25 a month and found any hand that finishes the drive. And they ain't the only ones that are spur off that's looking for hands, too. I see. Uh, well, <laughs> naturally, we'd soon work for you and Wes, Charlie, but... But times is tough. That's why we come. Yeah, we, we, we know how hard hits you've been, what with engines and rustlers running all parts of your herd. Uh, uh, we figured... What we want to know is, are are you going to Kansas? Oh, me and uh, the, there's nothing I'd, I'd like more than to drive our cattle up to the railhead, but... And I would, too, uh, 
if it wasn't from a partner here. Charlie is dead set against Kansas, and he, he's got final say. Oh. Well, uh, in that case, uh, I reckon we'll want to be drawing our wages. Now, hold on, Bill. Wes is right. I am against Kansas. But come spring, we'll be shaping up a trail herd just the same. We're going west to Colorado. Colorado? But there ain't no trail to Colorado. Why do you want to go that way for? You you must be local. (laughs) That's what I told him. Two reasons. First, if everybody in Texas takes a herd to Kansas, beef prices are bound to be lower. In Colorado, they got more mining camps than a cow has flies. They need beef, and the figures to be good money in it for the one that brings it to them. Second, there's good range land up there, and if for some reason they can't sell my cattle, well, at least I can hold them. Sounds awful chancy. Why, well, yeah, yeah, that, that's mighty hard country between here and Colorado. And, and like Zach says, ain't no trade. I'll pay top dollar to any hand that signs on. If I lose the herds, you'll all get paid just the same. You got my word on it. Uh, uh, all right. All right, I'll go. I reckon you can... Count me in two. All right. In the spring of 66, Charlie began shaping up his herd, what was left of it. Thanks to engines and rustlers, there was barely a thousand head of cattle. When the time came to buy provisions for the drive, me and Charlie rode into Mr. Loving's store in Belknap. And I want a five-gallon keg of sourdough and a jug of vinegar and some dried apples. Oh, don't forget the chewing tobacco. You know how one-armed Bill likes a good chaw. Yeah, thanks, Saki. Uh, give me some plugs of that chewing tobacco. Uh, hey, good night. I hear you're making a drive to Colorado. That's right. I reckon I'll pay my respects now, because... You're the biggest damn fool I ever seen if you think you'll make it alive. <laughs> no man ever took a herd to Colorado and lived to tell about it. I did it. Back in 60. Well, how did Mr. Loving? Charlie. You took a herd to Colorado? Drove north to Kansas, then west along the Arkansas River, all the way to Puebla. Well, uh, I reckon you might drive that trail and still keep your scalp, but not if you go the way good night's planted. You got another trail in mind, Charlie? Oh, yes, sir, Mr. Loving. I have. I'd like to see it, if you don't mind. Well, no, sir. <laughs> the fact is, I was sort of hoping I'd meet up with you before I started. Good. Let's go in the back room where we can talk. All right. <laughs> Mr. Oliver Loving was 54 years old then. He'd been in the cattle business about 20 years... And I reckon he knew more about beef than any man on the frontier. He had an education and was real religious-like. Charlie was a hell-raiser in them days, but you could tell he had respect for Mr. Loving. And so I figure the safest way is swing southwest instead of going north. The old Butterfield Mail Route. Yeah, it'll add several hundred miles to the drive. But with luck, you won't run into any Comanches or Kiowa. Exactly. Mm. Now, we'll strike for the middle concho where we can lay over and water the herd. Then drive across the 96-mile desert and reach Horseshoe Crossing on the Pecos. That'll mean going without water for six days. You think we can make it? Oh, it's a gamble, Charlie, a big gamble. Uh, Well, the plan seems sound enough, but that's hard country. I know it is, sir. Charlie, if you let me, I'd like to go with you. <laughs> let you? Well, I reckon there's nothing I'd like more. I need your advice, Mr. Lovin, and your help. Fine. I'll shape up my herd, and the good Lord willing, we'll go to Colorado together. When you're traveling across the country for business or for fun, a phone call keeps you close to home, close to everyone. Reach out, reach out and touch someone. Wherever you are, you're never too far. A telephone is right nearby. Reach out, call up and just say hi. Reach out and touch someone far away. 
the Bell System. Hi, I'm Kareem Abdul-Jabbar of the Los Angeles Lakers. Many sports involve flying objects, tennis balls, baseballs, hockey pucks, and in my game, hands and elbows, all threats to the player's eyes. When you take part in the sport, use protective eyewear. Eye injuries are 90% preventable. Learn more from the National Society to Prevent Blindness. For free information, write Prevent Blindness, 79 Madison Avenue, New York City, 10016. On June 6th, 1866, the most important day in young Charlie Goodnight's life, he and Oliver Loving began their historic attempt to blaze a new trail from the Texas frontier all the way to Colorado. Mr. Loving and young Charlie threw the herd together just outside Belknap. 2,000 head of longhorns and 18 men to move. Mr. Loving? I'd be obliged if you'd take charge of the drive. Oh, nonsense, Charlie. You should be trail boss. This is your drive. All the same, I'd feel a dang sight better with someone of your savvy boss in the herd. <laughs> you mean age. <laughs> Very well, Charlie. You and one arm, Bill, take the point, then. Right, Miss Lerner. Shiloh and Wes will ride swing. All right. Zach, you got the drives with Simp and Big Jim. Yo. The rest of you men spread out on the flanks. Head them up, and let's go to Colorado, boys. When we reached the headwaters of the Concho, we held the herd until they drank their fill. Then we filled our canteens and water barrels and pushed on into the desert. Stretch that water, boys. It's got to last another six days. We trailed the herd from sunup until late at night, trying to get through that furnace as quick as possible. It was when I was riding night guard that we got our first sign of trouble. Rider come in! Yeah, looks like a key. What are you doing back in camp, Zach? Your chef's still got another hour yet. I know, Mr. Loving, but... But we can't get the herd to bed down. Driving them so far without water's made them cattle too thirsty and restless. I was praying this wouldn't happen. They just keep milling about out there. We're having the devil's time trying to hold them. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Loving. I understand, Zach. Sorry, boys. Looks like it's going to be a long, sleepless night. Ain't they all? Are you hurting, Mr. Loving? Everybody. Off and on. Off your butts and on them horses. Mr. Loving, this will never do. We can't camp anymore until we're through this desert. If them cattle want to walk, we'd best put them back on the trail instead of trying to hold them. I guess you're right, Charlie. You take charge and see what you can do. All night and all next day we moved on. Our lips cracked open under the hot sun and alkali dust choked up parched throats. If it was bad on us, it was worse on the cattle. Their ribs looked like bed slats and their tongues were dragging in the dust. The strain of the desert was bearing down on all of us, even the best of friends. Bill, you're letting the herd get too strong out. Now close it up. I get all this she stuff can't go no faster west. Now hold back the leaders if you don't like the pace. I don't like it, and I'm telling you, close it up. Uh, if you think you can do better, then you ride drag. If I do, I won't be losing cattle the way you're doing. You must have lost near a hundred head thanks to you. You saying I can't do my job? If we had hired a man with two arms, maybe we'd keep more cattle. Why, you... <laughs> Break it up! Break it up, I said... If the Lord intended men to fight like dogs, he'd give them longer teeth than claws. What's got into you boys? Uh, nothing. You two want to lock horns, that's your business. After we finish the drive. Until then. That's my fault. I, I didn't mean what I said, Bill. I, I reckon the heat's made me a mad touchy. Yeah. I know that point. That's my fault for getting so riled. What's the matter? Nothing, just a case of frayed nerves. 
Anybody seen Zack? Uh, he was up on the line just a little while ago. Come on, Bill. Better help me find him. There's the kid's horse. He ain't on it. Maybe he got screwed. No, Zack's too good a rider to get left a foot in this country. He must be in some kind of trouble. Uh, he'd be... There he is. There he is. On that ground. Near that brush. <sighs> Zack, Zack, are you all right? Uh, what's the matter? Uh, is it engines? What's wrong? You fell off your horse. That's what's wrong. Uh, I, I did. Oh, I reckon I fell asleep. Fell <laughs> <laughs> asleep? Oh, oh, oh. Sound kind of hit you, <laughs> Zack. You not here. I'm sorry. I'm just so blame tired. I can't keep my eyes open. Yeah, I know. We could all use a good night's sleep. <laughs> uh, here. Here, kid, take some of this backy. You just jaw that up real good and rub some of the juice in your eyes. Tobacco juice in my eye? What for? <laughs> It'll sting like hellfire, but it'll keep your eyes open. <laughs> <laughs> It did sting like hellfire, but that was the last time I ever fell asleep in the saddle. Well, we pushed on. Canteens went dry. By the next day, the water barrels were empty, too. We had to suck on cartridges to stop the thirst. No use, Charlie. The she stuffing calves can't keep up. I'm afraid we'll have to leave them behind. Yeah, I reckon we ain't got much choice. How many you figure we'll lose? Maybe a hundred head. That's a hell of a lot of cow. I'll save what I can, but if we don't get some water soon, we'll lose the whole herd. Zack, ride down the line and collect the canteens from the men. Right, Charlie. If you'll take over, Mr. Loving, Zack and I can scout ahead for a water hole. Go ahead, Charlie. Poison? Yeah. Alkali. Ah, damn this desert for a hellhole. What do we do now, Charlie? Push on, Zack. Push on and pray we find water in time to save the herd. Vice President Nixon. I think Senator Kennedy is wrong on three counts. First I of all... I always have difficulty recognizing my position when they're stated by the Vice President. I know That's all is gone into the Yankee bullpen. Reggie Jackson... We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence by the military-industrial complex. I have agreed. Ignition sequence. But one day, this nation two, will rise one. up. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a grave announcement to make. Those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmland tonight are the vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. This is Orson Welles to assure you that the war of the world General has no further General informs me that the forces of Germany have surrendered to the United Nations. But old soldiers never die. They just fade away. America. It speaks for itself. From the Freedom's Foundation at Valley Forge. Parched with thirst, Charlie Goodnight and young Zack Barnett rode on ahead of the herd in search of water. They found it in the form of an alkali hole, which would have meant sure death to them and their cattle. I was beginning to think we'd never find good water, and that I'd made my first and last drive and was going to die right there in the desert. Zack! Look, there! What? Ain't nothing but an old swallow. Unless the heat's got to me, that swallow's carrying mud to build a nest. And mud means water. We must be near the Pecos. Feel a breeze? Yeah. And it (sighs) smells downright wetsome. Better hurry, Zacky boy. I might just drink the whole damn Pecos. Oh, not if I get there first. Yahoo! We 
filled the canteens and got back to the herd, just knowing we was getting near water cheered the men, and we thought our troubles were over. It was two o'clock in the morning when some of the cattle started acting up. What's got into the herd, Charlie? They're starting to act crazy. They smell the water, and they're fixing to run for it. I don't think we can hold them. We'll have to turn the herd south, away from the alkali hole. If they get in there, we'll never get them back. Stand free! All hands and the cook! Turn them south! Turn them south! When the cattle reached the river, they didn't stop but poured right over the bank, taking horses and riders with them. The ones in front got pushed out without ever getting a drink, so they turned back and added to the confusion. Yeah, we spent two long days trying to save the herd from the river and the quicksand. I've never been so dog-tired in all my life. Uh, all I want to do is close my eyes for about a month or two. You did a good job today, man. Get yourself some grub and try and catch some sleep. Yeah. Cookie! Cookie Jamoka! Here's the problem. You look pretty tired yourself, Mr. Lovey. You ain't slept for the last four days. Oh, I'll be all right, but I'd be better if we hadn't lost so many cattle. Damn that Pecos River. I hate it. It's worse than the engines ever were. And now, Charlie won't do any good to blame the river for our trouble. Why shouldn't I? The damn thing drowned over a hundred head of our cattle. Not to mention another hundred we'll have to leave behind in the quicksand. I tell you, that Pecos is the graveyard of the cowman's hopes. If that was all we lost, it wouldn't be so bad, but counting those we left back on the trail, we've lost almost a third. This drive's had nothing but bad luck since the start. Well, as the good book says, man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. You might be right, Mr. Loving. Sometimes I think them troublesome sparks is flying right up my britches. The herd settled down now that they had the water they needed. We recrossed the river and headed up to Pico some 20 miles where Charlie said we'd find grass. <laughs> what we found was damn little grass and about a million rattlesnakes. Cusses, varmints! Seems to me you're wasting a lot of cartridges shooting them rattlers, Bill. Well, I got plenty. Besides, I like to cut off the rattles and save them. I'm sending them to my sweetheart. <laughs> We pushed on into New Mexico. The country began to change as we went. The grass got greener and the drive got easier. Except for the job I had to do every morning. Days wasting! Everybody up! Off and on! Cookie says he'll throw breakfast in the creek if he don't come and get it. Shiloh, take a man and spell Wes and Big Jim on guard. Morning, Mr. Loving. Good morning, Charlie. Fred, I got some bad news. We got eight new ones. What? We never should have put a mixed herd on this trail. It's making the cows drop too soon. Well, there's only one thing to do. Zach? Yeah, Charlie? Take my gun and some cartridges and ride out to the bed ground. Eight more drop during the night. Charlie, I... I sure you wish you'd get somebody else to do it. I, I just don't like to kill them little calfies. Well, Zach, I don't either, but it has to be done. You know they won't be able to keep up with the herd, and it's better than letting the wolves get them. Oh, I'll do it, but I sure won't like it. There's a good lad. Oh, the camp! Those aren't any of our boys. No, they ain't. Well, let's see what they want. Come on in. I smelled your fire. Mind if me and my two cars have some of that coffee? Help yourself. Where are you boys from? Fort Sumner. Aren't you three taking an awful big gamble riding through this country? Uh, 
we thought we'd take the chance now that the Navajos and Mescarellos are back on the reservation. And Comanches don't usually come this far west unless they got a good reason. Say, you you didn't bring them Longhorns all the way up from Texas, did you? We sure did. Well, I never thought I'd see that happen. I reckon you're headed for Fort Sumner, then. No, we're headed up Colorado Way. Huh? Price of beef must be awful good up there to make you pass up the reservation. What do you mean? Ain't you heard? The Indians are starving, and the government is buying all the beef they can lay their hands on to feed them. What? Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. That's why I'm in such a hurry to get back to my own herd. How much are they paying? Eight cents a pound on the hoof for two, threes, and up. Yeah! Woo! Saddle up, boys! We're going to Fort Sumner! Thanks for passing the word! Don't mention it! A performance story from Phillips Petroleum. Dr. Stanley, report to emergency. Oh, Mike, we need the results back on that blood work right away. Sure. Okay. Um, I'm Lucy Rivera, an emergency room nurse here at Bayshore Hospital in Pasadena, Texas. Recently, we had an accident victim here in our emergency room. He had massive chest injuries, and his chest was filling with fluid so rapidly that he would have suffocated if we hadn't put him on chest drainage immediately. Our chest drainage system here uses a jar made out of a plastic from a company that supplies a lot of medical plastics, Phillips. These jars are almost shatterproof. Thank goodness. You know, replacing a broken jar takes time, and some of our patients just don't have much time. Phillips Petroleum. Good things for cars and the people who drive them. Lorne Green again, and here's the fourth act of the Good Night Loving Trail. At Fort Sumner, Charlie and Mr. Loving sold all the steers for $12,000 in gold. Mr. Loving pushed on to Colorado... Well, Charlie went home in time to get another herd on the trail for winter. That first drive showed that there was a new trail for Texas Longhorns, but that weren't enough. The trail had to be held against engines and rustlers. All of Texas was watching to see if Good Night and Loving could keep the way open that next year. What with all the delays we've had, we'll never make Santa Fe in time to bid on those cattle contracts. Ain't much we can do about it, Mr. Loving. The herd can only move so fast. That's just my point. Maybe I should go on ahead. Well, Wes is in Fort Sumner. If we're late, he'll go on to Santa Fe and make a bid for us. Now, don't get me wrong, Charlie. Your stepbrother is a good man, but he's short on experience. I'd just as soon be there when they put up the contracts. It's too dangerous. Especially now that the Comanche know we're moving cattle through these parts. They've already attacked the herd once. I've decided to go anyway, and there's nothing you can say that'll change my mind, Charlie. Zach? Yo? Ride down the line and tell one-armed Bill I want him. Uh, sure, Charlie. Since I can't talk you out of it, Mr. Loving, I'm sending Bill Wilson with you. He's the best man in the outfit, and you just might get through with him. But only if you ride at night and hide out during the day. Don't worry, Charlie. I'm sure the good Lord will protect us. I hope so, Mr. Loving. I sure do hope so. Well, for the first two days, Bill and Mr. Loving did just like they promised. Riding at night and laying low during the day. The uh, sun's been up two hours now, Mr. Lovin. Uh, we best pick get under cover. Bill, if it's one thing I hate, it's night riding. We haven't seen any sign of Indians yet. I'd just as soon keep on going. Yeah? It's all right with me. Charlie ever found out we didn't do like he said, he'd sure be around. <laughs> well, then the best thing to do is not to tell him, eh, Bill? <laughs> <laughs> Damn, it's them cussing Comanche. Now, quick, off your horse and up in them rocks. Well, we're in it now, ain't we, huh? 
They got our horses. Let them go. Maybe that'll satisfy them enough to let us keep our hair. I don't think so. How many do you think there are? Enough to make it uncomfortable. You speak any Spanish, Bill? Maybe we can talk them into it. Uh, don't move, Mr. Levin. Let me take a look. Oh, how bad? Uh, that looks like a ball went clean through your wrist and worked its way into your side. Uh, here, here, use my wipe to stop the bleeding. Mr. Lovin, why, we'll, we'll be getting out of here. Listen to me. The moon's going down. It'll be dark enough for you to slip across the river now. What? Charlie and the others, uh, they're only a day and a half behind us. If you can hold out and until... No, no. I just can't leave you here to them devils. I'm dead. Please, go to Charlie. I want him to tell my family what happened. What, Mr. Lovin? Tell them I didn't let the Comanches take me. That I went into the river and shot myself rather than be tortured to death. Please. It's important that they know how I died. Huh. Oh, all right. All right. Then I'll be back. I leave you, leave you the handguns. If the Lord wills it, and I do hold them off, I'll slip downstream a couple of miles and hide. Uh, well, we'll look for you there then. Here, take my Henry. The cartridges are waterproof. Uh, all right, but if you hear them engines laughing, you know they seen me. The sight of a one-armed man holding onto a rifle while he tries to swim a river, bound to look downright you. <laughs> Good luck, Bill. Yeah. I'll be back. I remember I was pointing the herd with Charlie. When we both saw something move up in the hills. Zach? Did you see that? Yeah. What'd you figure it is? It could be a Comanche scout. Better tell the men to shape the herd for a fight. I don't want to get Look, caught out. There it is again. It's an engine, all right. No. He's given me the frontier sign to come to him. I think he's white. Uh, maybe it's a trick. We'll soon find out. Come on. It was one-armed Bill Wilson. He, he, he was in bad shape. We took him back to camp, but it wasn't until next day before he could tell us what happened. Charlie took six men and headed up the Picos to where Bill said the fight took place. Searched all day, but there was no sign of Mr. Loving. And we pushed on. Herd's all bedded down, Charlie. Thanks, Zach. You better get yourself some grub. Mm -hmm. coming in, Charlie. It looks like Wes. I thought he was supposed to be in Fort Sumner. Well, what, what are you doing here, Wes? I got tired of waiting for you. Figured I'd best ride out and see if he's all right. We're all right. But I got some bad news. No. Oh? Mr. Loving was killed by engines two weeks ago down on the Pecos. No, no, Loving is at Fort Sumner. Impossible. Yeah, he's Loving is kind of poorly, and he's under the post doctor's care, but he's a long way from dead. Zach? I'll saddle up. <laughs> so he got away from them Comanches after all, huh? Yeah. When nobody came, he slipped yeah. into the river and yeah. made his way upstream. Uh -huh. 
some Mexicans found him and took him into Fort Sumner. <laughs> He's uh, really anxious to see you, Charlie. Not half as anxious as I am to see him. Yeah, we rode all day and all night. 110 miles it was. By dawn the following day, we were in Fort Sumner. The wind on his side is healing fine. It's the arm that's got me worried. What's the matter with it? Gangrene, I'm, I'm afraid that it'll have to be removed. Oh, Lordy. <sighs> uh, do what you have to, Doc. No, no not me. No, see, I, I've never amputated a limb before. I, I, I can't do it. You've got to. You're the only doctor within 200 miles. No, I, I, I really shouldn't. You see, the mind's You not... know what I think? You want to let Mr. Loving die because he's a Texan, and you just as soon get rid of one more Johnny Reb. Well, Doc, you either operate or this world's going to be shy another Yankee. Very well. I'll, I'll amputate his arm. The conclusion of our story, after these words... Have you seen so many tears? Have you heard so many cries? That when another soul in pain appears, you look with indifferent eyes. This is Judy Collins. Eight million people in this country have kidney disease, and no one takes it seriously. Kidney Foundation. Taken a long time. Why don't you try to get some sleep, Charlie? If anything happens, I'll. Let... How is he, Doc? To tell you the truth, I don't know. The artery was exceedingly large. He's lost a lot of blood. I did the best I could. I know, Doc, and I'm obliged to you. And now I want to tell you just what a fool you are. What? I'm a Scotsman. I've only been in America two years, and I don't know a damn thing about you rebels, and I couldn't care less. I didn't operate on Loving because I didn't know if he could stand an anesthetic. But since you insisted, well, you'd just be thankful that your partner didn't die right then and there. But after everything Mr. Loving been through... Shock was just too much for him. He lived for 22 days, getting weaker and weaker, till finally... Charlie. Charlie? I'm here, Mr. Loving. Oh, my young friend. I should have taken your advice. If I had, maybe I wouldn't have... Uh... Well, it's too late now. Uh, I want to ask you a favor. Charlie. Yes, sir. Do you think you could continue our partnership after I'm gone? Just until my debts are paid off and my family's p provided for. I'd do that anyway, Mr. Loving. Oh, thank you, Charlie. I know you, you'll keep your promise. My only regret is that I, I won't be buried in Texas. Where your treasure is... There will your heart be also. Don't worry, Mr. Loving. I'll see you get home. Will you, Charlie? Oh, that'd be real nice. You're a good friend. I'm going to miss you. Charlie. 
Charlie kept his promise, yes. From that day on, whenever someone spoke of Mr. Loving, Charlie'd get real quiet. My old partner, he'd say. And we all knew he was thinking about the old days. The trail was open, and Charlie kept it that way. Texas had a new market for their longhorns. A year later, Charlie pushed the trail up into Wyoming. And later, it stretched up Montana Way, where they called it the Texas Trail. But most know it as the Goodnight Lovin' Trail, in honor of the two men that pioneered it. I'm proud to say... I rode with both of them. Autograph battery, it's all right. You saved my life one dreadful night. When I told Big Dutch I won't fight, he said, how about now? He broke a table over a chair. I went from a coop to go anywhere. My lights had been on while I was there. Motorcraft, don't fail me now. I turned the key as he came to the door. My motorcraft made the engine roar. Then I heard Big Dutch as he stamped and swore. Going to get me a motorcraft battery for sure. Quality parts for all makes of cars. Motorcraft for sure. Nothing beats a great pair of legs. Can you imagine a dancer with wrinkles around her ankles? Hi, I'm Juliette Prowse. As a dancer, my pantyhose must fit perfectly. So I wear legs regular pantyhose with memory on. Stretches out and back. Fits whether I'm kicking high or bending low. Legs regular pantyhose with memory on and a pure cotton panel. Believe me, Juliette Prowse. Nothing beats a great pair of legs. The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, The Good Night Loving Trail, was written by Steve Sharon and produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Lorne Green. Our stars were Jeff Corey, Sam Edwards, and Herb Rudley. Featured in the cast were Corey Burton, Robert Easton, Tom Brown, and William Lally. The music for radio theater was composed and conducted by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. The Elliot Lewis production of Radio Theater is a presentation of CVI. This is Andy Griffin. Join us tomorrow at this same time. I've got another story I think you'll find riotously amusing. This is Lorne Green. He's gone away for to stay a little while. But he's coming back if he goes 10,000 miles. Mm -hmm. It's a spring day in early April. Mm -hmm. New grass growing on the green Tennessee hillside. Fish playing tag in the creek. Birds sending their sweet notes into the air. To mingle with a young girl's sweet, sad song of love. Oh, who will tie my shoe? And who will glove my hand? And who will keep? my ruby lips when he is gone. 
Miss Joe Bear. Miss Joe Bear. Miss Joe Bear. You hear me calling you? No, Mammy, I didn't. I'm sorry. Is it Papa? Is he worse? He's awake now. And I thought you might take some broth up to him. Yes, of course. But I doubt he'll take any. You know Papa. How stubborn he can be. Oh, but you can get around him. <laughs> I've seen you do it easy enough when you want a new dress or a petticoat. Oh, Mammy, I don't want Papa to die. I know, child. I know. If anything happens to Papa, nothing will ever be the same again. Change can be hard when it comes. So you come along in now, Miss Jobeth. There's a storm brewing. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, The Legend of Gibson Holler by Shirley Gordon. Our star, Tony Tennille. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. Product value. Sears Laboratories work to maximize that value for you. Its manufacturing consultants work with products and their manufacturers to cut production costs. One example is our power spray carpet cleaner. Its plastic parts require molds to form them. Molds are expensive, especially certain designs. So our manufacturing consultants recommended designs that cut mold costs. End result, a better value for you. Sears Laboratories. One reason Sears is where America shops for value. It happens in every city. First neglect, then decay, then the fires. And when the city, state, and federal programs run out, and even landlords disappear, what's left? People. Many with no help and no hope except for Vista. Volunteers in service to America helping restore neighborhoods by developing the programs people need to help themselves. Put yourself where you're needed. Call Vista, 800-424-8580. Vista often means the difference between help and no help at all. A public service of this station and action. Spring, 1861. The season that celebrates new life is shadowed by gathering thunderclouds of change and death. Papa? Is that you, Joe Bear? Mammy said you were awake. How you feeling, Papa? Don't waste your young days worrying about your old Papa. I brought you some broth. Please take some to build up your strength. Please, Papa. Mammy sent you to work your wiles on me, I suppose. I told her you'd be stubborn about it. Well, you match your stubbornness to man whenever you have a man to. Then I'm here to see that you drink this. Here, let me help you. <laughs> Papa? <laughs> Papa, are you all right? I'd rather we talked. I have something I I want to say to you while, while I still can. Papa, don't talk like that. I won't have it, you hear? <laughs> you sound so much like your mother sometimes. <laughs> it pleasures me. Oh, there's the feel of winter in this room. Let me open the curtains. Even though a storm's brewing, there's spring outside the window. Let me show you. No, no. Let the curtains be, Joe Beth. But it'd do you good, Papa, to see the sun again and feel the warm breath of spring. No, no, no. The sun feels heavy on my eyes now. No matter how mild the breeze, my bones become too quickly chilled. <laughs> Come here. Just sit by me and listen as I asked you. <laughs> yes, Papa. I'm listening. This is your spring, Joe Beth. And it's not me with whom you're going to share it. 
Papa, please. If you're going to talk like that, I won't listen. This is not a sad thing I'm saying, girl. I've had my own spring, and it was a beautiful time. I shared it with your mother and planted the seed of you. I wish you'd drink your broth, Papa. And I wish you'd be still and hear me, daughter. Yes, Papa. Though I am shut up here in this dark room, I still see the things that concern me. I see what's happening to our country. This talk of fighting, Papa, is it going to happen, do you think? There's no stopping it now, I'm afraid. But the trouble's far away. It needn't reach us here in the valley. It's already our concern. Good Tennessee men are rallying to the Confederate cause. Robert won't have to be a part of it, will he, Papa? Then it is Robert who is your concern. Of course. He's like a brother to me. And a son to me. Robert's so gentle. He could never be a soldier. And Jonathan Grant? What nature of man is he, Joe Beth? What do you know of Jonathan, Papa? I know he is a stranger who has come here with strange new ideas. I know you've been seen in his company. I like him, Papa. I like him a lot. He is a Yankee, Joe Beth. Are we already at war that we're choosing sides? Jonathan believes in progress, Papa. He says there's more to the world than we can see of it here in Gibson Hollow. Well, you find it <laughs> hard to listen to your Papa. I see you've been listening well to Jonathan Grant. <laughs> oh, oh, Papa, if you should make yourself worse because of me, I'll just die. <laughs> then they ask you to see no more of this Yankee stranger. But, Papa... It doesn't matter that I'm ill. If I were as well as I've been all my life before this, I'd expect the same respect for my wishes that my daughter has always granted me. But I must see Jonathan, Papa, at least once more. To tell him goodbye, at least. <laughs> Very well. You may see him once more, but only to tell him goodbye. I'm tired now. I want to sleep. Yes, Papa. Oh, Papa, please. Be stubborn. Don't die. Excuse me, I own that shoe store across the street. Uh-huh. Want to buy it? Well... I'll be honest. I have great shoes, but no customers, so I'm ready to sell the whole thing at any price, you name it. Twelve dollars. Sold. Ooh. Well, now that you own a shoe store, what'll you do with it? Well, advertise. Well, I tried. A lot of newspaper ads, then TV and magazine. Well, I'll probably go radio. R radio? Yeah, according to the latest studies, every day radio reaches more people than newspaper, TV, or magazines. How did you What's know? more, radio targets customers. I'll match up the right stations for my dressier lines uh -huh. and different stations for young casual. Since radio costs a lot less than newspapers or TV, I'll get good efficiency. <clears throat> Listen, I'd, uh, I'd like to buy my store back from you. Well, at a fair profit. Okay. How much do you... Uh, $156,000. That's a pretty fair profit. Take it or leave it. I'll take it. What you don't know about radio could cost you a lot. What you can learn is free for the asking. Call this radio station or the Radio Advertising Bureau. They brought you this message. Radio. It's red hot. And so the shadow of war stretches across the land until, even here in this peaceful Tennessee Valley, lines are drawn, loyalties questioned, and a stranger is branded. What is it, Jonathan? What's wrong? You shouldn't be seen with me anymore, Joe Beth. But it's all right. Papa said I could. For this once more, at least. But if anyone should see us together... and. The way things are getting to be... Come along, then. I know a place we can go, and no one will see us there. But Joe Beth, I just don't think... It's my special place, Jonathan. Deep in the woods. I've gone there to play and dream ever since I was a little girl. I've been wanting to show it to you. All right, then. If it's your special place, I want to see it. Isn't it beautiful? 
Yes. Beautiful. It's a magical place. I used to think that little people came here. Fairies, elves, or whatever you might call them. I truly believe they came here. I think maybe they still do. I hope they do, Jill Beth. We're going to have need of a magical place. I don't understand what's happening. I don't like it. Papa wouldn't even listen when I tried to tell him about you. He said you were a Yankee and that was that. It's what I'm called now. If being a Yankee means I was born and raised up north and love it there, then that's what I am. But it doesn't mean I hate the South and the people here, Jill Beth. I guess that's what Papa thinks. Oh, Jonathan, he's forbidden me to see you anymore. What are we going to do? It'll be all right. But I've never gone against Papa's wishes before. And now he he's so sick. Then we won't see each other anymore, Joe Beth. No. No, I couldn't stand not to see you. I, I, I care for you so much, Jonathan. And it doesn't matter to me if you are a Yankee, whatever it means. I care for you too, Joe Beth. Then what are we going to do? I'm going to have to leave here. When? For how long? I don't know. But there would only be trouble if I stay here any longer. And I have to go see for myself what's happening. Oh, Jonathan, I don't want you to leave. I'll be back. I promise you. And maybe by then my people up north and your people down here will have found a peaceful way to settle their differences. Oh, I have an awful feeling that nothing's ever going to be right again. You're going away and Papa's going to die. Your magic place will still be here, Joe Beth. The little people will look after you until I come back. Oh, Jonathan, hold me. Joe Beth? Robert. Sorry, Joe Beth, but I had to come find you. This is Robert Arlington, Jonathan. He... He's like a brother to me. Hello, Arlington. This is Jonathan Grant, Robert. I've heard the name spoken. I can imagine in what tone. Robert and I grew up together. We played here together as children. So I knew where to look for you, Joe Beth. And Mammy sent me to find you. Papa? Is he worse? You better come right away, I think. I'll go on ahead. Oh, Jonathan... Our only time together, and now I have Go to... along, Joe Beth. If you were late, you might blame me. Yes, I must hurry, but... I'll be back. I promise you. Oh, Miss Joe Beth. Your papa. No, Mammy. No. Oh, Mr. Robin. I'm glad you're here. Oh, Papa. Oh, Papa. He went peaceful, Miss Joe Beth. I should have been here. I shouldn't have gone wandering off. Well, I told him I'd sent Mr. Robert for you. That seemed to put him at ease. He knew you'd look after Miss Joe Beth fine, Mr. Robert. I will as best I can. You know that, don't you, Joe Beth? Yes, Robert. Of course I do. You've looked out for me ever since I was seven. When you pulled that thistle from my foot, remember? Mm -hmm. That's what gave your papa peace at the end. Knowing you had Mr. Robert. I know. But that doesn't bind you to me, Joe Beth. Not just because it was your papa's wish. I'm bound to you by more than that, Robert. I haven't forgotten. Oh, who will tie my shoe? And who will glove my hand? And who will kiss my ruby lips when he is gone? I've heard that young Yankee stranger, Mr. Grant, has turned round and pointed his boots back up north. Hmm. <laughs> Good thing, I'd say. But things the way they are. He'd about worn out his welcome hereabouts. All the same, he's coming back. He isn't gone for good. Well, folks say he's gone for no good. And that is good riddance for Gibson Hall. It isn't fair. They didn't get to know him like I did. 
They wouldn't even listen to what he had to say. They heard him talking about his love for the North. But he loves the South, too. One no more than the other. He believes that's the way it should be. And the way it will be one day. If that day is coming, it's a long way off. There's going to be a war between the North and the South, Miss Jobet. You know your papa said so himself. How could papa know? Lying up there so sick in that awful dark room. Everything that was important to Gibson Harlow and the South found its way into that dark room. And your papa turned the light of his mind on it. Your papa saw things better than most folks. If there should be war, Mammy, what would it mean? What would happen to us? I don't know exactly, child. Lots of things would change, I imagine. I guess we learn to pray harder than we ever prayed before. What about Jonathan Grant? If he's still in the North in this war, what'll happen to him? If there's war, that Yankee man will have to make up his mind just which one he really does love the most, the North or the South. And if it's the North, he sure won't ever be welcome back here. He'll be back. War or no war, it doesn't matter. He'll be back. He promised me. If this land is my land, if it's America the Beautiful, why aren't we taking better care of it? Cars are filling the air with pollution. Smokestacks are filling the air with pollution. Lakes and streams are getting loaded with dirt and pollution. We've got to clean it up. So many mornings when I go out of the house, the air smells so bad. Is it that way in cities all across the country? Even in the country, we're getting dirt and smog. It's just not a city thing. The Lung Association asked us to say what we feel about air pollution. I guess this tells you how we feel. We'd like to do something about it, but we need everybody's help. Maybe if we all join together in a fight against air pollution, with the Lung Association, we could clean the air. You can write for free information to your lung association. They'll answer. This message is brought to you as a public service by your lung association. Who cares about every breath you take? On Yandro's high hill, where them white doves are flying. From bow to bow, and mating with their mates. So why not me with mine? For he's gone away. Oh, he's gone away for to stay a little while. Mm -hmm. The people of the Tennessee Valley heard the song of Jo Beth and saw the gray of her eyes turn to blue as she gazed north over Yandro. But he's coming back if he goes 10,000 miles. Joe Beth? Robert! Oh, you startled me. May I sit with you a while? Of course. He never had to ask my permission for such a thing before. Well, things seem different now. Even between you and me. No. Whatever else happens, nothing will ever change between us. Uh, we're not children any longer, Joe Beth. Things have already changed between us. My feelings for you haven't changed, Robert. Not a speck. What I feel for anyone else has nothing to do with how I feel for you. Remember, I said your papa's wish wasn't binding on you. I wasn't thinking of papa's wish. Let me finish. I feel bound by my promise to look after you. You needn't, Robert. You needn't feel bound to me. Oh, I didn't mean to make it sound like a burden. It, it could never be that. It's just that now... I have to go away. Go away? Where to? What for? Well, the news is certain now. There's war. And the fighting's not only in the east. It's right here in Tennessee as well. Yankees are set on marching through our whole state. But they won't come here. 
Not to Gibson Hollow. Well, I want to make certain they won't. I'm going to join up with the Tennessee Army. But you're a farmer, Robert, not a soldier. It's a farmer's job to protect his land. Yankees are locusts. A plague come to ravage our good southern soil. So you'll put aside your plow and pick up a gun and kill him? If it comes to that, I guess I'll have to. No. I remember once when, when we were children, climbing up on that old oak tree over there. You accidentally knocked a nest off the limb and looked down to see the baby birds dead on the ground. You hadn't done it on purpose. You hadn't meant to kill them. I know. I, I remember. And do you remember how you cried? Cried so hard you couldn't stop. When you become a soldier who kills on purpose, will you be allowed to cry, Robert? Yankees are not harmless baby birds. They're men. Some of them as gentle and kind as you. I have to do what I have to do, Joe Beth. And I feel it's part of my promise to look after you. Going off to kill or be killed? I'll thank you to do neither on my account, Robert Arlington. <laughs> Joe Beth, I shall miss you. We've been together all our lives, practically. Until lately, anyway. Lately? I've been here same as always. I haven't budged from Gibson Hollow since I was born. But all these last months, while you seem to be here as always, you're, you're truly miles away. Your heart rode out over Yandra with Jonathan Grant. Oh, Robert. I can't help but wonder where he is. How he is. Just the same as I'll wonder and worry if you go off as you say you're gonna. Just the same, Joe Beth? <laughs> no, not the same. It's true, Robert. If Jonathan is off someplace fighting for what he believes, and, and you go to fight against him for what you believe, then my heart will be as torn apart as this nation. Truly. <laughs> Have you seen a mammy drilling in the field like toy soldiers? Practically every man in Gibson Hollow. Henry the blacksmith, Francis Abercrombie the clockmaker, the men off all the farms, Thomas Price, Stuart Forbes and his two boys. And Mr. Robert. <sighs> and Robert. He's bound and determined to go off to this war. Well, you couldn't expect anything else, Miss Jo Beth. And your papa would be proud. Papa'd be drilling out on that field right along with the rest. I know that. Mr. Roberts says those Yankees have set out to march their way right through Tennessee. I know. If that's true, then maybe... Miss Jo Beth, you haven't still got your mind fastened on that young Yankee man who rode out of here way last spring, have you? I just want to know, Mammy. Know where he is and if he's all right. Well, you better hope he's nowhere around here. With that company of Confederates out there getting all fired up to go shoot themselves some Yankees. I just can't imagine it, Mammy. Robert firing a gun at another human being. Or or Big Henry the Smithy, who, who'd never even say a cross word to a mule. War. Why can't they just play soldiers and let it go at that? It's too bad they can't, Miss Jobeth. For a fact. Jobeth? Robert, come in and rest yourself from all that tromping up and down and pointing your hunting rifles at each other. We we'll leave tonight, Joe Beth. All of us. Oh, Robert, no. Then the war has come here to Gibson Hollow for sure. If we're going to see all our men folks march off to go soldiering. There won't be anything to see. Band playing and flag waving we'll have to keep till we get back home. After we won the war and sent the Yankees back where they belong. You mean sometime tonight? When nobody's looking, the whole lot of you are just going to go off down the road and, and that's it? We're assembling at dusk and peeling off in pairs through the woods where we won't be seen. There's a chance Yankee patrols may be in these parts already. Well, I'll fix you a packet of food to take along, Mr. Robert. I'll fix it right now. Thanks, Mammy. It'll be welcome for sure. I don't like it. I don't like the whole thing one bit. <laughs> you don't like anything to change, Joe Beth. You never did. Too many things are changing too fast. I'll be remembering how it used to be when I'm riding through your magic place in the woods tonight. <laughs> Maybe the little people will come a ways with me. I hope they'll go all the way with you, Robert. 
wherever this war takes you. Wherever I go, you'll be with me in my heart, you'll be. And you'll be in mine, as you always have been. I'll build me a desert on Yandro's high hill, where the wild beasts won't bother me, nor hear my sad cry. For he's gone away for to stay a little while. Joe Beth. Who is it? Who's there? It's me, Jonathan. Oh, Jonathan, it is you. I can scarcely believe it. I told you I'd come back, Joe Beth. I knew you would. You look the same. Pretty as ever. I'm glad that you at least haven't changed. I've grown up. I'm more a woman now than a girl. Yes. With all that's happened, I suppose you are. Oh, Jonathan, you shouldn't be here. That that Yankee uniform could get you shot. I hated joining up on one side against the other, Joe Beth. But I have to tell you... I do believe in what the North is fighting for. Freedom for all people. I don't understand any of it. I only know I don't believe in killing for any reason. I haven't needed to point my gun yet. I pray I never have to fire it. I wonder if I could. Robert said the same. But he's leaving this very night to fight this war, too. Only on the other side. There shouldn't be sides. There shouldn't be a war. We should all want what's best for this country and fight together to win it. I tried to explain to folks around here that's how you felt, and that was your reason for riding back up north. Nobody would listen. And you'd better ride off again quickly before any of our men who are still about learn that you're here. I have to ride off again, Joe Beth. I have no choice. But I had to make good my promise to you. I trusted your word. But I didn't wish you to risk your life for it. I'll be back, if this stupid war allows it. Goodbye, Jonathan. Take care. Don't worry. I'll make it safely through the woods by night. The woods? No, no, you mustn't. The woods are alive with southern rebels tonight. Your magic place, Joe Beth, remember? I'll be safe there. No, no, Jonathan. Goodbye for now, Joe Beth. That's the kind of world we were made to live in, a green and beautiful environment. And when we make it ugly, we pay an enormous price in all sorts of tensions and the physical and emotional ills they cause. That's a fact of life. So the beauty you grow in your yard is more than beauty. It's a matter of survival. We've got a big green world to share. All we have to do is care. Public service from the Green Survival People and the American Association of Nurserymen. Lorne Green again, and here's the fourth act of The Legend of Gibson Holler. Miss Joe Bent. Why do you think you're fixing to go this time of night? I have to find Robert. Mr. Robert? But he's somewhere off in the woods by now. I know. But you can't go traipsing all through the woods this time of night, Miss Jo Beth. Oh, Mammy, ever since I was little, I've sneaked off to my special place in the woods many a night without you or Papa knowing. I, I wanted to see the little people dance. Well, there's more than your little people dancing in the woods tonight. You go creeping through there now, you're likely to be mistook for a yank and get yourself shot. Oh, don't even speak of such a thing, Mammy. That's just why I must hurry and find Robert. You see, there there is a Yankee trying to make his way through these woods tonight. Miss Joe Beth, you talking about that young Mr. Grant? 
You mean he's dared to come back into these parts with the way things are? Only to keep his promise to me, Mammy. And now he's set off through the woods where, where Robert and the others are... I have to hurry. But, Miss Jobet, you're likely to get hurt. And whatever are you thinking you can do? I don't know, Mammy. I don't know. I only know I can't just stay here and do nothing. Oh, child. You got as much chance of seeing your little people dance as you have of stepping between a Yankee and a rebel and stopping this war. Robert? Robert, can you hear me? It's Joe Bear. Smithy? Mr. Abercrombie? <gasps> Jonathan! Oh, oh no! Oh. I'm all right, Joe Ben. Who who did it, Jonathan? I don't know. I didn't I didn't see anybody. Oh, I ha- I have to get you back to the house so Mammy and I can tend to you. I don't. You'll have to try to get back on your horse. I I, I don't think. I... Here, here l- let me help you. But Joe Ben, you shouldn't. You expect me just to leave you here bleeding? But hush now, hush now. You you save your breath. Rest as easy as you can while I lead your horse back. Mammy, Mammy, come help me, please. Miss Jobet, you all right, child? It's Jonathan. He's been shot. Help me get him into the house. Yes, sir, Miss Jobet. You sure? A poor man's still alive? Oh, he has to be. He's a Yankee soldier, Miss Jobet. There's apt to be trouble. It doesn't matter. We have to help him, Mammy. Of course we will, child. Of course we will. But I don't know if we can. It appears to me he's hurt pretty bad, Miss Jobet. Oh, Jonathan. Jonathan. Jobet? It's Robert, Jobet. Let me in. Robert? But... I thought you were gone with the others. I had to come back when I found out that one of us had shot a Yankee soldier in the woods. It wasn't me, Joe Beth. I want you to know that. Oh, I knew it wasn't. I knew it couldn't be. Come in, Rob. It isn't important which one of us it was. He just panicked when he saw a real live Yankee soldier. Maybe I'd have done the same. I don't know. No, Robert. You wouldn't have. Anyway, when he told me he'd done it, I guessed right away who the Yankee probably was, and I went back to see if I could do anything. And I saw the trail of blood, and I followed it here. I'd gone to look for you to to let you know that Jonathan was riding through the woods, that he wasn't on army business. He'd only come to see me. I'm sorry, Jubeth. He's hurt pretty bad, Robert. Mammy's doing what she can. All the same, you know you shouldn't be harboring a Yankee soldier. You ought to turn him over to somebody. Who, Robert? You? Is that why you came? To take him captive? We are at war, Joe Beth, and I am a soldier now. And Jonathan is not just a harmless baby bird you've knocked to the ground. I told you I didn't shoot him, Joe Beth. But I think now he should be turned over to the authorities. Then that is what you came to do. I just don't want you to get in trouble. If your papa was here, you know that's what he'd do. But papa isn't here. And you may be a soldier at war, Robert... But I'm not. But don't you see? It would be the best for him. He's wounded. He'd be given care, probably better than you and Mammy can give him here. It's the right thing to do, Joe Beth. Now you sound just like Papa. Very well. Your prisoner is in there, on the sofa. Joe Beth. (sighs) Maybe I can help Mammy see to his wounds. Thank you, Robert. How is he now, Mammy? Much better, Miss Joe Bear. His fever's even most gone. He's going to make it fine. Oh, Mammy, I'm so glad. Well, you can mostly be glad Mr. Robert came back to help. He got that bullet out and fixed up the wound good as any doctor. Robert was always patching up hurt animals. And me, too, whenever I got banged or scratched. Guess he could have been a doctor if he chose to. Only now he's a soldier. With the soldier's job to do. You mean 
take Jonathan prisoner. Mm -hmm. But he can't. He can't save Jonathan's life, and then it just doesn't make sense. Don't guess much of anything about war makes sense, child. But, Jonathan, are you sure you feel able to ride again? I'm sure. Robert? Goodbye, Joe Beth. Take care of yourself. Good care, Joe Beth. Same as you gave me. Goodbye, Jonathan. Goodbye, Robert. Be careful. Both of you. Just about to the place where that Johnny Red bullet stopped you, Mr. Grant. I recognize it well enough, Mr. Arlington. I just wish, if I had to be shot, it didn't have to be here, in this particular spot. Joe Beth's magic place, you mean? Yes. Joe Beth is right. This was a magic place. No place for wounding and killing and soldiering. I guess then it was magic to you, too. Yes. And still is place where time stops. Things can be the way they were. That takes magic, all right. So you ought to be glad that bullet struck you down here, Mr. Grant. How so? Because it doesn't count. It doesn't? It never happened. Which means I should be on about my business as I was. You should see to yours, as you were, Mr. Grant. May Joe Beth's little people ride with you. And may they stay close by your side as well, Mr. Arlington. He's gone away for to stay a little while. But he's coming back if he goes ten thousand miles. Awful, Mammy. Did you see? They put up a bulletin in front of Mr. Abercrombie's store. A casualty list, they call it. I saw, child. And Mr. Abercrombie's name was first on the list. I know. And, and some of the others, too. Stuart Forbes and both his sons. Oh, I can't believe it. It's a hard thing. A hard thing. If they post any more lists, I'm not going to look. Well, there'll be more. More every day, I fear. Robert's name mustn't be there. It can't be. I pray not, Miss Jobeth. And Jonathan, if anything happens to Jonathan, how will I even know? You know, child. You know. Oh, it's happened. I know it, just like Mammy said I would. I knew that Robert was dead the instant it happened, weeks before his name was put on the list. And now I know Jonathan is gone, too. Now I know there are no little people, and there is no magic place. Not anymore. The conclusion of our story, after these words. Hello, this is Bob Keeshan, also known as Captain Kangaroo. Our basic philosophy is to teach children through entertainment, to challenge children to use their imagination, to encourage creative self-expression at home and with their friends. One of the best tools we have is music. Music that children can make themselves or that they can enjoy as listeners. The musical interests that are stimulated by programs such as Captain Kangaroo need to be developed by continued participation in musical activities at home and in the school. Music participation should be available to every child, an important part of the daily school experience, because music is basic to education and to personal growth. Being part of a band or a chorus provides a needed creative outlet as well as teaching self-discipline and cooperation. Support the music programs in your school. Help a child grow. A public service message from the American Music Conference.
There is a legend now in Gibson Hollow, the story told of nights when the moon hangs low over the peaceful Tennessee Valley, when among the creature sounds of the woods, folks swear they hear the song of Joe Beck. Oh, who will tie my shoe? And who will glove my hand? And who will kiss my ruby lips when he is gone? Joe Bear. Robin, where are you? Over here. Bet you can't find me. Oh, Robert, don't play tricks on me. Come on, Joe Beth. Remember how we used to play hide and seek here when we were children? We're not children anymore, Robert. This is our magic place where things can be the way they were. No, Robert. There is no magic place. Hush. Don't let the little people hear you say that. There are no little people. Joe Beth. Jonathan. I promised you I'd come back. Oh, Jonathan, are you truly here? I had to come back to this place, Joe Beth. And Robert, you're truly here too? Come and find me, Joe Beth. And who's to say she isn't there still? The girl with the blue-gray eyes, singing of her true love, and watching her little people dance. For he's coming back. If he goes ten thousand miles Dad, my skin is all itchy You have a rash uh, Dear, do we have anything for Amy's rash? Uh-huh, Cordaid Cordaid? Cordaid, the new hydrocortisone cream What I used for my eczema And what I used for my dermatitis Hmm, Cordaid Cordaid also gives temporary relief for poison ivy, insect bites, and other itches and rashes And I can use it too? Yes, even for you, Amy For skin irritation, itches, and rashes, Cordaid's the one A new breakthrough, Cordaid with hydrocortisone Ask your pharmacist or doctor about Cordaid Read and follow label directions Hello, I'm Roger Staubach. There's an important birthday coming up soon. In 1980, our friends in the Salvation Army will be marking their 100th anniversary in the United States. Think of the good that this organization does in just one year, then multiply that by 100. I think this is the time to say thank you, Salvation Army, for helping the troubled, the needy, the friendless. And we wish you another 100 years of service to God and man. The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, The Legend of Gibson Holler, was written by Shirley Gordon and produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Lorne Green. Our star was Tony Tenniel. Featured in the cast were Helen Martin, Michael Miner, Robert Towers, and Dawes Butler. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you by Corte, the new hydrocortisone cream from Upjohn, a significant breakthrough providing temporary relief from skin irritations, itches, and rashes. This is Andy Griffith. Join us tomorrow at this same time. I've got another story I think you'll find riotously amusing. This is Lorne Green. Her name was Vinnie Ream. She was a child of the frontier, born in Indian summer in the year 1847, 
on the very edge of the wilderness. Her father was a surveyor for the United States of America when it was a fledgling giant struggling to realize its true size and might and destiny. He was one of the few curious and courageous men who charted the unknown regions of the young country. Years later, after an illness disabled him, making him old before his time, his daughter Vinnie would recall him coming home from surveying trips, hatless, the wind and sun in his hair. She would especially remember his last return, his slow walk up the hill, looking for her in their secret place. Paul, you're home. <laughs> finally home. No, I knew I'd find you here. I thought you'd be coming home today. Oh. I waited here for you. Well, and how long you been waiting, Vinny? Oh, hours, I suppose. But it doesn't ever seem like time passes when I'm here. I feel swallowed up in this place, a part of it. <laughs> yeah, have you been seeing your faces and figures? Yes, and I found a new one. See there, up along what? the ridge, how the rocks hang together, so jagged and craggy? Do you see, Paul? Mm, yeah. It's an old man's face. <laughs> Only you can see it as I do. <laughs> yes, it's an old man's face. Uh, you love it here, don't you, Vinny? You'd you'd be sorry to leave. Yes, very sorry. You look tired, Papa. Oh, it was a long trip. And I think my last. Vinny, how would you like to live in the city? What city? Washington. I've never lived in a city. What is it like? Well, for one thing, there are faces and figures in marble and bronze, not clouds and rock. They're real statues that you could you could see and touch. It sounds wonderful. I'd like that. But I should miss this place terribly, Pa. Yeah, so would I. I'd miss that old man up there. <laughs> For me, it's like looking in a mirror. But you're not old. <laughs> yeah, well, I feel old. In Washington, I I could find a slower job, quieter. You're tired, Pa. Let's go down to the house. Vinnie Ream was destined to leave her home in the wilderness. It was as if she were following one of her father's careful and precise maps. The course was clear for her. In Washington... A man awaited her, a man whose roots were in the West as hers were, a man of large importance and vast melancholy, a man not unlike her father in spirit. He waited to shape Vinnie Ream's life and to give to her her greatest triumph. His name was Abraham Lincoln. They would meet in Washington. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Vinnie Ream by Pamela Russell. Our stars, Joan McCall, Robert Rockwell, and Jeff Corey. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of fine names to make Sears names stand for quality. Names you've always counted on, like Kenmore, Craftsman, Easy Living, and Die Hard. Names that kids and moms cheer, like Winnie the Pooh and Tough Skins. Names that are a part of your life today, like Permapress, Klingalon, and Winner 2. And, of course, there's Sears Best Products in everything from T-shirts to tractors. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of truly dependable names to make our name. Sears Roebuck and Company. I have a dream. Ignition sequence starts. One day. Three. This nation will rise up. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Liftoff on Apollo 11. On the vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. This is Orson Welles to assure you that the war of the world has no further significance than as the holiday offering. General Eisenhower informs me... That the forces of Germany have surrendered to the United Nations. America, it speaks for itself. From the Freedom's Foundation at Valley Forge.
Washington in 1864 was a hauntingly incomplete city. The Capitol Dome was bare scaffolding, and the Washington Monument fell far short of its intended height. Some frightened citizens saw it all as an omen, a sign that the war would end in the defeat of the Union, that General Lee's army would invade and burn Washington before it was ever a finished city. But for 16-year-old Vinnie Ream, it was a place of excitement, totally different from the wilds she had known, and it filled her with dreams and ambitions. She was a clerk in the post office. She took the job to help her family. Many girls were working, replacing young men who had gone in proud blue uniforms to serve and save their country. Vinnie was a great favorite in the post office, a tiny, swift-moving girl with long black curls down her back. Vinnie, it's lunchtime. I just want to finish this. You write so quickly. But still, it comes out so clear and beautiful. Mr. Abercrombie says my hand is like muddy chicken prints. <laughs> there, all done. Let's go outside and eat. It smells so awful in here. It's sad to think of all the mothers and sisters, daughters and sweethearts who send their soldiers food. And it never reaches them. It sits here and rots. Yes. And we have to sit here and smell it. Come on, Denny. <laughs> It's cold. Let's sit here in this patch of sun. Oh, the light should be wonderful this afternoon. After work, I think I'll walk over to Lafayette Square. All I ever want to do after work is take a nap. Doesn't it wear you out, Vinny? Oh, I get a little tired sometimes. It was hardest in the beginning. I don't know why, but I always feel better after I stand for a while in front of the Andrew Jackson statue in the square. You like statues, don't you? Yes, I do. Uh, how's your father, Vinny? The same. Paul hardly ever leaves his room anymore. I miss him. You know, it's as if the Paul I knew went away and left behind someone who resembles him, but isn't really him. Oh, did I tell you we've taken a border? No. Senator Ross from Kansas. He's all alone in the city. His family's back home. He's an old friend of my father's. Ma says it'll help having him with us. Times are hard. I only wish I could do more to help. You do as much as a full-grown man, Vinny. Working all day in the office, performing the hospitals for the soldiers at night, singing in two different choirs on Sundays. I still can't quite believe that the churches pay me to sing. <laughs> Why wouldn't they? Anyone would. You sing beautifully. Maybe you'll even sing on the stage someday. Uh, Ma says it's not a decent occupation. You, but if you love a thing and do it well, how could it be indecent, I wonder? It doesn't seem right that you shouldn't be able to be a singer if you want to, Vinny. Maybe it isn't singing. But I know that I was meant to do something very different from other people. I was born to live a different kind of life. What do you mean, Vinny? I, I don't see things the way other people do. You know, I remember the first day, the very first day I came to Washington... <laughs> I saw President Lincoln driving through the streets in an open carriage. I'd never seen a face like his. I chased after the carriage, hoping to see him for a moment longer. It stopped, and I stopped. I stood and watched him. And then I looked down at my hands, and they were moving. I wasn't moving them. They were moving by themselves, independent of me. Uh, the carriage drove away finally, and... There I was, standing ankle-deep in mud, <laughs> the hem of my best dress ruined, and my hands tingling. I look for him everywhere now, Jane, hoping to see him again. I carried his face in my mind for so long, but it's beginning to fade. I feel I have to see him again. Sounds like you're in love with him. Oh, no, 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 it's not like that. It's his face. There is... Everything in his face. I tried to write a poem about him, but words can't describe. Maybe someday there'll be a statue made of him, and that'll say it. Maybe you'll make the statue, Vinny. For certain, you're not like other folks. I expect you could do just about anything you set your mind to do. You're not like anybody else. And there's nobody better to be with than you, Vinny. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Even when I was a little girl, way back as far as I can remember, I could see faces in forms in the mountains and the clouds. 
Only Pa understood and could see them, too. I wish this war was over and all the boys were home again. <laughs> and working in the post office. <laughs> yes. Uh-oh, right now Mr. Abercrombie is peering out the window at us. He's always peering somewhere. Mm, time to go back. Take a deep breath while you still can, then. <sighs> Someday I'll tell people that I worked here and they won't believe me. <laughs> yes. Someday when you're famous, Vinny, I'll tell people that I knew you and they won't believe me. <laughs> I'll send them over here to Mr. Abercrombie. He'll be here forever, and he'll tell all. Ever wonder what a family's for? Family's all for love. For talking with each other, sharing things you feel proud of. When families pull together, riding out some stormy weather. Growing stronger, growing closer, cause they care. To make it whole A focus for your love It takes a father and a mother With enough love for each other To show how children grow And love is shared They're the heart of the family A part of the family And love is a family affair A message of love and concern From Boys Town Then he went often to Lafayette Square to stand before the Jackson statue. It was one of her secret dreams to meet the sculptor, Clark Mills, who had his studio in Washington. She confessed this one day to their boarder, Senator Ross, and the following Saturday, not quite believing what was happening to her, she found herself on her way with the senator to the sculptor's studio. Will we just walk right in? Yes. Mills never locks a door. Everyone knows that if you walk into the studio and he speaks, then it's all right. But if he does not speak and continues on with his work, then you just turn and walk out without a word to him. Oh, I hope he speaks to us. I hope we won't have to leave right away. I've never been so close to a sculptor's studio, and it was so difficult to talk Ma into letting me come today. I shall just die if I have to walk away and not have even a word with him. Don't worry. I have a feeling we'll be welcome, Vinny. Aren't you welcomed everywhere you go? Doesn't everyone always want you with them? I don't know. I, I never really thought of it. It's quite true. You have a special quality that attracts people. They're drawn to you. Why should Clark Mills be any different? But he uh, might be very busy working. There is one sure way to find out. Let's go in. This is it? We're here? Yes, Vinny. Uh, I pray he speaks. <laughs> hello, Senator. Mills, hello. Well, I see that you brought your little friend. Yes, Clark Mills, this is Miss Vinnie Ream. How do you do, Mr. Mills? Very well, very well. And how old are you, Miss Ream? Sixteen, sir. Are you certain of that? Why, yes, sir. I'm certain of my age. You're so very small. Perhaps I only appear so because you are so very large, Mr. Mills. Must a sculptor be so very big? I'm well, not afraid to speak up, are you? No, sir. Well, it helps, Miss Ream, to be large. Why do you ask? Do you want to be a sculptor? Yes. But the truth is, I never really thought of it until now. But yes, I do. Being here, I feel as if... as if I'd come home. I love the look and the smell of this room. I belong here. Until this afternoon, I wanted to sing, but... but now all that seems so far away. Yes, Mr. Mills, I want to be a sculptor. Am I too small? Maybe. My hands are too small? I don't have the strength? Is that is that what you think? Well, the real question is, have you the will? Have you a large, strong will? Oh, I have that. But why don't you ask me if I have the talent? Well, because you couldn't know that about yourself. And besides, talent comes second. First, you must have the will, the indomitable faith. If you do not believe totally in yourself, then no amount of talent will prevail, little one. I understand. All right, then. 
Here, take this and sculpt me. Oh, I'd rather not sculpt you. What? I'm sorry, Mr. Mills, but I don't know your face well enough yet. I'd rather do something I'm familiar with. I'll do whatever you like, Miss Ream. The senator and I will leave you to your labors. Uh, come, senator. I'll show you a bust I'm doing of one of your colleagues. He's not of your party, but you'll admire him this way in mute clay. <laughs> Where did she come from? Wherever did you find her? I board with Vinnie's family. She's quite a remarkable child. Oh, Vinnie's more than that. I'm finished. You work very quickly. Let's see what you've done. Here it is. Well, you should have told me that you've studied, Miss Ream. But I haven't. Never? Never, sir. May I ask why you chose to do an Indian? I know Indians. I grew up with them. It is good, Mr. Mills? It's a good beginning. May I study with you? Vinny, I'm, I'm not sure that your family would, would want you to. You should think of that. What's important to me is if Mr. Mills wants me to. If he thinks that I should, that I could. Do you, Mr. Mills? Do you want me as a pupil? Yes, I do. Then I will be your pupil. Uh, do you know full well all that that entails, little one? I think that I do. Why did you do that? You said it was good. I said it was a good beginning. It was really very bad. But it was mine. No, it was not. It was mine. Everything you do will be mine. You will be mine, my pupil. When that ceases to be true, I will no longer be your teacher. You will no longer be my student. You will be a sculptor. But until then, you will be mine. Can you accept that, Miss Ream? I will try, Mr. Mills. Then we can begin. Dad, my skin is all itchy. You have a rash. Uh, dear, do we have anything for Amy's rash? Uh-huh. Cordaid. Cordaid? Cordaid. The new hydrocortisone cream. What I used for my eczema. And what I used for my dermatitis. Hmm. Cordaid. Cordaid also gives temporary relief for poison ivy, insect bites, and other itches and rashes. And I can use it, too? Yes, even for you, Amy. For skin irritation, itches, and rashes, Cordaid's the one. A new breakthrough. Cordaid with hydrocortisone. Ask your pharmacist or doctor about Cordaid. Read and follow label directions. Hi, I'm Gary Coleman, Gift of Life Chairman of the National Kidney Foundation. I'd like to tell you about a little kid from Zion, Illinois, about my size. When he was five years old, his kidneys failed. But he's alive and well today because he had a kidney transplant. That's why he wants you to give generously to your kidney foundation. You'll help support research into the causes and cures of kidney disease, a major killer in our country. He's sure that the more you give, the more we'll live. I know, because I'm that kid. It was winter in Washington, and the Civil War was in its fourth year. Vinnie had been studying with the sculptor Clark Mills for several months. Seventeen years old, her dream crystallized over the months of hard work and learning. She was obsessed with the idea of sculpting a bust of President Abraham Lincoln. Am I late? I'm sorry. You know you're late or you wouldn't be running. It seems as if there's more mail every day, piles and piles of it. It's difficult to believe that letters are the only contact some have had with their boys in the war in four years. How much longer can it go on? I can hardly remember a time when there wasn't the war. Vinny, what is it that you want to tell me? Why are you saying so many words and none of them the words you have in your mind? You know me too well. What is it, Vinnie? I stopped somewhere between the post office and here. That's why I'm late. And? And and I just found out that it's been arranged for me to meet with the president. Well, I won't ask how it was arranged. You have a genius for that sort of thing. When is this historic meeting to take place? Tomorrow. Why are you angry? I know why you want to meet Lincoln. You're going to try to persuade him to allow you to sculpt him. Yes, it's all that I've dreamed of, thought of for months. And you don't want me to do it. I don't understand you. Why? You're not ready, that's why. Anyway, Lincoln will never agree to it. 
He's turned away every artist who's come to him requesting him to pose. I know I can convince him. And to think I once questioned whether you had a strong will. I don't know how you contain it in that little body. Sometimes I don't. Like now, I feel I'm bursting. I will sculpt the president. I was meant to do it, and I will. Doesn't it mean anything to you that your teacher has told you that you're not ready? It means something to me. But not enough to stop you? There's nothing that can stop me. Nothing and no one. Lincoln can. He can say no to you. But he won't. Has anyone ever said no to you, Vinny? <laughs> you just did. Yes, but you seem not to hear me. There's your answer. People have said no to me, but I haven't heard them. I keep saying yes over and over to myself, and I don't hear them. So you're finally going to see him face to face tomorrow. Yes. Can't you be glad for me? You ask too much of me, Vinny. Why do you say I'm not ready? Because you're not. You're close, so close. I've never seen anyone, man, woman, or child, soak up knowledge, drink it in, and absorb it the way that you do. You're gifted, supremely gifted, and you've worked very hard. But you're rough yet. Every day you come tearing in here like one possessed, and I give you what you need. You take it all from me. Sometimes I think you'll drain me dry, but I don't care. I'll give everything to you, but we must have more time together. So you're saying that I'm still a student, still yours. I I'm not a sculptor yet, not my own. Uh, yes, exactly, yes. And, and I need more time here with you. Yes. For me or for you? You think that I want to keep you here for myself? Don't you? Yes, I do. I can't bear to think of you going away, not coming to me anymore, not needing me any longer. I'm here now. I isn't that the most important thing? Yes, you're here now. But already I hear your steps away from me, little one. Miss Vinnie Ream. Yes. Through that door. Oh, this must be Miss Vinnie Ream. Hello, Mr. President. Oh, it's a pleasure to meet you. I've been hearing about you. Uh, you're a sculptress. Yes, sir. Oh, sit down here. <laughs> and you want to sculpt me? Yes, sir. Why me, Miss Ream? Surely there are prettier subjects. For me, Mr. President, there is no other subject. There is only you. Well, you're very young and you're a long life ahead. I think you may find many others. Well, I hope that I do, sir, but uh, first there must be you. I see nothing but you. Every piece of work that I begin, no, no matter what it is, ends being you. My teacher is growing impatient with me. Clark Mills is your teacher. Yes, sir. I uh, study with him every day after I finish my work at the post office. Do you like it at the post office? It is necessary that I work. I, I don't mind it. But you'd rather be sculpting. Yes, sir. It's my life's work. I'm certain of that. <laughs> Your life's work. You're very fortunate, Miss Ream, to have it revealed to you so early. At your age, I didn't think that I would ever know why the good Lord saw fit to put me on this earth. I'm still not sure that I know the why of it. Mr. President, you need only walk through that door to the people who wait outside and they'll tell you. <laughs> I can tell you, sir. Can you? Well, tell me then, Miss Ream. You're here to guide our nation to preserve our union and to lead us safely and together through the fire. Of course, sir, I cannot truly know the heavy burden that you bear. Only you can know that. Only you can feel it crushing down upon your shoulders. It occurs to me that by my coming here, I may be adding to that weight. You, you must forgive me. I am only a poor girl who is perhaps too ambitious, too presumptuous and unthinking. I will go now. Thank you for allowing me to come here. Now, wait. Now, no, don't go. You wanted to ask me to pose for you. Are you going to leave without even making a request? I think there are far too many requests made of you, Mr. President. Then do not ask. But do not go either, Miss Ream. Tell me about yourself. You're from the West, is that right? Yes, sir. I was born in Wisconsin, and I've lived in Arkansas and Missouri. You've traveled much for one so young. My father was a surveyor. Was? He was taken ill. 
He's no longer able to work. And that's why you're a clerk in the post office. Yes, sir. <laughs> do you really want to know all this? Oh, yes, yes, I do. Well, then I'll tell you. <laughs> I, um, I try to live my life with a sense of purpose. I work, I study, I go evenings to the soldiers in the hospitals. I sing in church choirs and I'm paid for it. I write letters to some of the prisoners of war at Fort Delaware. There's no pay for that. Oh, no, Mr. President, not not in money anyway, but uh, I think I easily get as much from them and more than they do from me. War is a terrible thing, sir, and I, I certainly don't need to tell you that, but it is, and I can't help saying it. The loss is not only the young men who die or who are wounded, but it's those who are captured and put in prisons. They feel, sir, that they're forgotten men. That even while they still walk and breathe, life has ended for them. It goes on all around them, and yet they're no part of it. It's one of the worst things about war, the horrible waste. I despise waste. That's why I try to use every moment of my life, sir. Uh, do you suppose that, uh, that you could manage to come here every day between 12.30 and 1 o'clock? Here, sir? Yes, Miss Reem, here, uh, to sculpt me. Oh, I could, sir. That half hour is the time of the day that I rest, so no one ever comes to see me then. You may have your tools sent over, but it can be for that half hour only. That's all I can give you, Miss Ream. Thank you, Mr. President. Oh, it's I who thank you for sparing me the time. <laughs> tomorrow? I mean, sir, may we begin tomorrow? Oh, yes. Goodbye, Miss Ream. Goodbye. Uh, Mr. President? Yes? Sir, if you're going to do any reading, uh, please have someone light the lights for you. You'll ruin your eyes. It's the first lesson that an artist learns, that light is precious. <laughs> but I'm not an artist, Miss Ream. No, Mr. President, but you are precious, like the light. Do you mind my watching you? Oh, no, sir. I only wish you'd watch more often... How long has it been now? Oh, nearly five months. Oh. It was winter when I began. Now it's spring. The war is over. And I'm almost finished. I like what you've done. Uh, I like what what I appear to be to you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. When, when you look up at me that way, you remind me of someone. My son, Willie. Willie died. I know, sir. I'm sorry. D don't, don't look away. But, but I am so sorry, sir. Sorry that I remind you. No. No, I'm happy to be able to see him again. Even a little of him. Within you, Vinny. Vinny. Yes, sir? Uh, you're leaving? It's nearly time, sir. Why do you think, Vinny, that it is... That so many of the little ones, the innocents, are taken so early from us. I don't know, sir. Well, of course not. None of us know. Perhaps it's not for us to know. I hate it. But I wouldn't wish for the power to stop it. Sir? I've had the power to give life or take it away in this war. With a few words, I could save a deserter from the firing squad. I could approve the strategy of a battle and cause thousands to die. It weighs on me, Vinny. Most terribly, it weighs. A man should not have this power. It is God's alone. These many soldiers have been at my mercy all this long war. Now it's finally ended. Please, God, don't give me the power over the children. They couldn't be in better human hands than yours, Mr. President. You are God's tool on this earth. I truly believe that. I wish that I could. It's over, Vinny. Why do I feel such dread and foreboding? Why? I don't know, sir. Mm. Well, it's time you were leaving, Vinny. Uh, what will you do this evening? Well, I, I shall be singing in a special Good Friday service, sir. I wish that I could hear you, but I must attend the theater this evening. I will see you Monday. Uh, yes, yes, Monday. Goodbye, Vinny. Goodbye, sir. The 
president has been shot. Shot. The president has been shot. The president has been shot. Ma! Ma! Vinny, what is it? A bad dream? Did you hear those men outside? No. They were shouting that the president had been shot. No, Vinny, no. It can't be true. Most likely those men had too much to drink. But why would they say such a terrible thing? Well, there's no knowing why people do the things they do. You go back to bed, Vinny. You catch your death of cold. But, Ma, I have the feeling that the president really has been shot. And that he's dying. And that I'll never see him again. Go back to bed, Vinny. In the morning, that feeling will be gone. The president is fine and well. You'll see. Just wait for the morning. Yes, Ma. Only right now, it seems the morning will never come. Would you go halfway around the world to help get a job done? Bonnie Brennan of Brookline, Massachusetts would. Bonnie's a Red Cross volunteer nurse, and she's gone to Thailand to work with medical teams helping Cambodian refugees. And then there's Mary Ann Ryan, who only had to go around the corner to her Red Cross chapter to help. You see, Mary Ann thought no one would want her after she lost her sight eight years ago. She figured her nursing career was over. But Red Cross knew her experience was too valuable to waste, and we were right. Mary Ann has established prenatal care classes, a blood pressure screening clinic, and mother's aid courses, all for the Red Cross chapter in Doña Ana County, New Mexico. Bonnie and Mary Ann and hundreds of other Red Cross volunteer nurses believe in getting the job done, wherever it is. So if you're interested in nursing and health, they sure could use your help. You don't have to go halfway around the world, but please make the trip around the corner to the Red Cross chapter in your community and help keep Red Cross ready. Lorne Green again, and here's the fourth act of Vinnie Ream. One year after Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, Congress commissioned an artist to do a life-size statue of the martyred president. They chose Vinnie Ream, and she became the first woman to be commissioned by the United States government for a work of art. The selection caused great controversy because of her youth and seeming inexperience. Nevertheless, amid the outcry, she set up a beautiful flower-filled studio in the Capitol building and began to sculpt. Generals, senators, and sightseers all flocked to get a glimpse of Vinnie Ream, the girl artist at work her dark hair flowing down her back, and a white dove perched on either shoulder. Vinny, you're working very late this evening. Hello, Senator. Yes, uh, it's been a long day. I've had a group of surgeons here for hours. They've just left. Surgeons? Before I begin to drape the statue, I want to make certain that it's anatomically correct. The doctors were giving me their opinions. They all agree that it's just as it should be. You've worked so hard, Vinny. I... I don't know how to tell you what I have to say. What is it? What's wrong? I've brought such trouble to you. Oh, tell me, please, what's happened? Late today, Congress passed a resolution closing your studio. <gasps> the statue is to be removed. You were to be informed in the morning, but I had to come and tell you now. It's because of me, all because of me. I don't understand. They they cannot move the statue. It will be ruined. They cannot close my studio. I must work. Why are they doing this to me? It concerns President Johnson's impeachment. I voted against it, Vinnie. The president is saved. The, the radicals are enraged. They think that you influenced my vote. I, I cannot let it happen. I, isn't there someone I could go to? You'd, you'd have to go into the lion's den. I'll do that. The only one who could help you is the most feared and hated man in this city. Maybe even in the country. Who? Thaddeus Stevens. I'll send him a message asking him to come and see me. He won't come. He certainly won't if I don't ask him. Vinny, you, you've succeeded in doing many things that I did not think possible, but this you cannot do. Give up. In a while, after things have quieted, then maybe you will be allowed to return and complete your work. But, but for now, it's over. Not yet. Not until I speak with Thaddeus Stevens. Have you ever seen the man? No. Oh, he's hideous, cruel, and, and vindictive. 
They say he's dying, but slowly, because even death fears him. When he approaches, dragging that club foot, everyone shakes with dread. I won't. I will ask him to come here, and he will come. You are Thaddeus Stevens? I am. And you are Miss Vinnie Ream? Yes, sir. Why have you asked me here? I wanted you to see something. The statue. Come. This is it? Yes. Why is it so dark? Nearly black. And dripping wet like that? I was preparing to wrap it in towels and leave it. I've been ordered to go. You know that. If no one comes after me to keep the statue damp and pliant, then it will dry out, harden, crumble, and be lost, gone. It suits the man, black as it is. Oh, no. It must one day be carved in the purest white marble. I was to go to Italy to find the perfect piece, but now, now... Now you will not go. So it seems. So it is. You asked me here to see your statue. I have seen it. I will take my leave. Wait, please. It is not my statue. Are you saying that you're not the artist? I am the artist. This is my work. But it is the people's statue. It belongs to them. It should be placed in the capital rotunda so that everyone who desires might see it and remember the man that it represents. But that is not to be. And I don't understand why. I was hoping you could tell me. You should have stayed with your clay, Miss Ream. And not mixed in matters that do not concern you. What matters? The impeachment of Andrew Johnson. I can say quite truthfully that I never discussed anything of that nature with Senator Ross. What is your relationship to the senator? He boards in my family's home. He's my friend. He's helped me. To do what? To achieve a goal. Realize a dream. He introduced me to Clark Mills, who taught me to sculpt. And the senator arranged for me to meet Abraham Lincoln who taught me about greatness and sadness and the depths of a human soul. I I consider myself among the few fortunate ones who knew Abraham Lincoln when he lived. He, He turned my selfish and childish ambitions into something very different. He is dead, and there are thousands, millions, who will never know him. I want to give them at least a, a poor replica of him, some small awareness and knowledge of the man. You have the power to deprive them of even that. And if you do that, Thaddeus Stevens, I for one shall hate you forever. I have been hated. Have you ever been loved? No. Save Abraham Lincoln's memory for his people and you will be. Save this piece of clay, you mean? If you truly believe that, that it is no more than that, then we're both wasting our time here. How long uh, before it would be finished? There's still much work to be done. Uh, Another six months on this, and uh, then it will be taken to Italy. The marble would have to be found, and finally from this model, the statue would be carved in the the marble. That could take as long as uh, two years. So then there is nearly three more years of work to be done. No. I've been ordered by Congress to stop work. There's no more work at all to be done. Three years is a long time. It can be. I wish I had them ahead of me, but I do not. I will not see this statue completed, Miss Ream. But you will. And the people will. You mean I don't have to go? You will stay on here until you go to Italy. But Congress and the resolution... Other resolutions can be passed, Miss Ream. This is your studio for as long as you need it. Thank you, sir. I still think the darkness suits him. Oh, no, no, I see him in pure white. Perhaps you could find a piece of veined marble, Miss Ream. We're none of us all one thing. Goodbye. Good evening, sir. The conclusion of our story, after these words. 
Maxwell House is coffee to wake up to. Wake up, George. Coffee. <sighs> coffee in bed? Mm, Maxwell House coffee, George. Mm, delicious. But it's not my birthday. It's not Father's Day. Oh, right, George. It's Saturday. And on Saturday, I start your day with a cup of Maxwell House. Oh, so I can drive the boys through two feet of snow to hockey practice. And I can go back to bed. Good night, George. Good to the last drop, Maxwell House. Hello, I'm Joe Wamba. I'm the guy who tries to tell police stories like they really are. In my books and screenplays, I've separated the facts of life from all those fantasies about cops and robbers. Whether you're looking for a slice of real life or some fancy detective work, check into your local library. You'll find the world's most famous crime fighters right there on the shelves, just waiting to be discovered. Stake out the library. A big payoff is waiting for you there. A public service message from the American Library Association. On a cold, wet January night in 1871, a crowd stood outside the Capitol. They were waiting to be allowed inside for the unveiling of Vinnie Reams' life-size statue of Lincoln. There was not room for all of them to enter, but still they stood in the rain. The sound of the Marine Band playing a dirge drifted faintly out to them. Ladies and gentlemen, four years ago, a little girl from Wisconsin occupied a modest position in the post office department at $600 a year. She had faith that she could do something better. Congress, with almost equal faith and liberality, gave her an order for the statue of the late President Lincoln. That statue and the artist are now before you. Justice Davis of the Supreme Court will now unveil the statue. The artist, Miss Vinnie Ream. Thank you. Thank you all. This night will live forever in my memory. I shall never forget a moment of it. When all of us here tonight... All of us who were privileged to share this earth with Abraham Lincoln are gone. I hope that this statue will evoke the man in the eyes and hearts of all who come after us, all who pass by here. And I hope that they, too, shall never forget. Thank you. This is Donna Fargo, and that's my song. Hey, Mr. Music Man. Hey, Mr. Music Man. Give me a ride on your guitar. Play those strings and low down blues. You know, country and western music is a uniquely American form of expression. Another unique American institution is your American Heart Association. It works for us every day of our lives to prevent heart attack and heart disease. Find out what you can do to help. Ask your American Heart Association. We're fighting for your life. The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Vinnie Ream, was written by Pamela Russell and produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Lorne Green. Our stars were Joan McCall, Robert Rockwell, and Jeff Corey. Featured in the cast were Jack Manning, Mary Jane Croft, Stephen Roberts, Jane Webb, Ray Tosco, and Stan Waxman. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. The Elliot Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CVI. This is Andy Griffith. Join us tomorrow at this same time 
I've got another story I think you'll find riotously amusing. This is Lorne Green. He knows she's coming, riding furiously toward him. But Leroy wants to pretend her coming doesn't matter. Still, his blood races. Morning, Mr. Dunn. I didn't think I'd see you today, Amanda. You're seeing me now. It's real good to see you, Amanda. You don't act like it, Leroy. Well, it's good to see you anyway. You're worried about Daddy, aren't you? You know what the judge said. Who cares? Leroy, listen to me. Daddy doesn't run my life. Well, maybe not, Amanda, but he runs everybody else's. He runs you, that's for sure, because all you want to do is punch cows. I like my work, and I like being close to you. That's all I got in this world just now, Amanda. I'm not going to ruin it. It's no good, Leroy. Whatever's got to be done has got to be done on my terms. That's still no good. That's double no good. That's impossible. Mercy, Amanda. You got to go to college, right? There's no time. I'll be on the next train behind you. You will? I love you. I told you that a hundred times, and I mean it. Call me Leroy. Oh, oh my. Oh. Daddy! Pack your gear, Leroy. Done your fire. It's my fault, Daddy. Tie your mount behind. Get in, daughter. And you'd best keep your distance, Mr. Dunn, if you know what's best for you. Clear. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, The Fence Cutting, by Andy Nance. Our stars, Corey Burton, Joan McCall, and Parley Bear. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of fine names to make Sears names stand for quality. Names you've always counted on, like Kenmore, Craftsman, Easy Living, and Die Hard. Names that kids and moms cheer, like Winnie the Pooh and Tough Skins. Names that are a part of your life today, like Permapress, Klingalon, and Winner 2. And, of course, they're Sears Best Products in everything from T-shirts to tractors. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of truly dependable names to make our name. Sears Roebuck & Company. There's no problem that can't be solved if we work together. This is Gregory Peck speaking for the Alliance to Save Energy. You know, our energy resources are not as abundant as we once believed. And we waste a shameful amount of it. Let's start using our energy wisely. Send for a free booklet called 101 Ways to Save Money by Saving Energy. Write the Alliance to Save Energy, Box 57200, Washington, D.C., a public service message from this station and the Advertising Council. That evening, Amanda McMillan argued Leroy Dunn's innocence before the bench of her skeptical and wounded father, the Post Oak County Judge. I feel awful about this, Daddy. The boy wants his job. That's all he wants. He wants to punch cattle, that's all. He doesn't want me. I just had to tell him goodbye, that's all. But the longer Amanda pleaded, the surer the judge became of his decision. He was about to deny her appeal when a surprise witness, his foreman, Corny Gines, 
interrupted the proceedings. I can get them 200 into Sweet Creek with the boys I got, but none of them ever been on a cattle drive, sir. I gotta have Leroy if you wanna take them to Shuckville. Judge McMillan quickly calculated the difference in freight rates and then announced his decision. It was a parole, not a reprieve. You tell that boy if I catch him with my daughter again, he'll spend the remainder of his wasted youth behind bars. We leave Judge McMillan to plan the education of his daughter and the incarceration of her suitor. Just now, Corny and Leroy return with a new bull for his honor's herd. Mercy, Cornelius. There's only two men in this whole county who could have done what we'd done. When you're pie-faced, it's Mr. Gines to you. Well, we drove 200 steers down 18 miles of state highway without knocking down a fence. Ain't, That's something. Ain't nothing at all. It's talent, Mr. Gines. God-given, but ours nonetheless. Won't be no call for it, Leroy. These sidebusters are getting thicker than fleas on a stray dog. All one stiff drought and they'll all be gone. No sod, no trees. One stiff drought and this land blows away. The land just don't blow away, Corny. You ever been in a dust storm, son? Why, I was riding for the Lazy A when we was halfway to Oliad and she begun to blow up. All some... that dirt didn't come from heaven, Leroy. Well, what's a man to do, Corny? I'm going to work for Mr. Sly next month. Cornelius Gaines pushing broom? <laughs> That's a sight. Well, it ain't no career, Leroy. He's digging post holes. Uh, who's digging post holes? Now you are, if you stick around. See that animal in front of you? You could slide a board under him and iron you Sunday linens with his brisket. Well, surely the judge is going to eat him. Macmillan won't pay no five grand for steak. This here's a breed bull. Well, what's a man to do, Corny? Get straight for one. The judge is up there on his porch. How's he to know we've been drinking? Your breath could back a boar hog off a pail of slop. Now shut up and stay mounted. Well, lads, how many fences do we have to mend? None, sir. We delivered them. Not so much as a scraped high. Straighten up, Leroy. Good work, Mr. Gaines. Oh, thank you, sir. Leroy here is quite a cowboy. Oh, uh, hello, Miss Amanda. Back in the house, young lady. Uh oh. This man is drunk. I seem to have slipped, Your Honor. Mr. Gaines, Mr. Dunn here is drunk. How do you explain that? It weren't his fault, Your Honor. If Sheriff Parker had caught you, he'd have run you both in for public intoxication. And you, Mr. Gines, for giving drink to a miner. Now, I only stole a few nips when Corny wasn't looking. Corny, is it? A few nips, is it? Get off your tail when the judge is talking to you, son. <laughs> it oughtn't to tote more than half a jug, sir. How'd you steal all that whiskey from Mr. Gines? Didn't seem like stealing, sir. I bet it didn't. I'll bet Mr. Gines was passing that jug around like it was the Lord's own redemption. Now, that's not the case at all, sir. This the jug in question? Yes, sir. When did you first see this jug, Mr. Dunn? Uh, the Oakside Ford, sir. And you saw it when Mr. Gines raised it to his lips? I suppose so, Your Honor. And how often did you see Mr. Gines raise this jug? I don't know. Twice, maybe. And how often did you drink from this jug, Mr. Dunn? I don't know. Every, every time we stopped for water, I guess. Now, I'd stand between the mounts where Corny... Uh, where Mr. Gines couldn't see me, and I'd take a long swig, maybe ten, twelve times. Explain this to me, Mr. Dunn. If you only saw this jug twice, how did you take twelve long swigs from it, sir? I don't know, Judge. I, I must have cut my eyes from it once. Judge, is it, huh? I'm going to have to talk to you, son. Mr. Gines. Uh, yes, sir. When you and my lads are on the trail, you represent the Flying M. And I don't treasure the thought of my lads traipsing through the country looking like stumble bumps. Uh, sorry, sir. Now take these animals out to the barn before they finish off the rest of my day, Lillis. Bull, too, sir. Most especially that bull, Mr. Gines. See that he has a clean stall and plenty of feed. Yes, sir. 
Well, what do you have to say for yourself, Mr. Dunn? I don't know, Your Honor. I like working for you. I wish I could haul you over to Sheriff Parker right now. But you're such a sorry excuse for a liar, you'd take Cornelius with you, and I need Cornelius. I'd make it up to you if you'd keep me on, sir. Now, how could you possibly do that? I'd try real hard, I guess. There's only one thing that riles me more than you, Mr. Dunn. You know that? And it's those Lukeweiler lads. They came hat in hand to borrow my money, and I lent it to them. Then they turn around and claim a big hunk of my land under the Homestead Act. And they need their fences cut about as badly as you need to pound rocks. That's how I feel. Yes, sir. <clears throat> now, I, uh, I'm not going to fire you right now. I, I want to see you first thing in the morning. Yes, sir. Now, uh, of course, if I heard somebody cut the Lukeweiler fences, well, I'd feel too good to fire anybody. Uh Uh-huh. You're, uh, looking a little ill, son. Maybe you'd better head back to the bunkhouse. That's all, Mr. Dunn. Yes, sir. Leroy, squat down over here. I got the chili on, and there's uh, plenty of hot coffee. Thanks. I'll tell you one thing. A man's not in trouble until he's got to depend on you lying to get him out of it. <laughs> you uh, you feeling sick? I'm fine. You sure now? I walked it off. Yeah, you're in a fine steady. What'd the judge say? Nothing. He fire you again? Maybe tomorrow. Well, I'll take care of him tomorrow. Here, eat some chili. Oh, no, thanks. Still feeling a little rough? No. You know, you were going to have me snarling and pitching on the ground if you don't tell me what the judge said to you. He says he wants the Lutweiler fences cut. And you told him to go to hell, I hope. No. Well, that was a mistake, son. It'll cost you your job. It'll what? Well, you should have told him to go right to hell. Right then and there. I don't follow you, Corny. Well, I've been riding for the judge a good while. Nearly five years now. And I know the old buzzard pretty good. Underneath all that there Your Honor stuff, there's one tough man. Probably the toughest old hoot I know. Yeah? In fact, Leroy, if you'd have told him to go to hell right then and there, you'd never have to worry about him again. Now, as it is, well, he knows you've been thinking about it. He'd have fired me on the spot. No, you ain't listening, son. I'm trying to tell you something. Now, the way I see it, I got till dawn to get them fences cut. There ain't no sense in it, Leroy. The judge is going to fire you in the morning no matter what. We'll see. There's lots of work around. Maybe you'll get mine if you take to heart what I told you about the judge. I got a job now, and I'll have one tomorrow. The issue ain't fences, see? The issue is you and the judge. Well, it's fences tonight. It's me and the judge tomorrow. You know what I think? I think the thought of being too far away from Miss Amanda has addled your brains, boy. Back off, Corny. I see I'm going to have to hog tie your carcass to your bunk. Catch me first. Yep. Come back here. Leroy. Leroy. <laughs> Boys, mount up. Leroy's lost his fool head. When I went back to school, I was 35 years old. Today, I feel like that was one of the best decisions that I have made during my lifetime. That's Rachel Haradia. She used to run an adding machine in a job she found tedious and unchallenging. Now, thanks to technical school, Rachel Haradia helps to run a hospital. Now that I have technical training, I feel that I really have a lot more opportunities to be a more useful human being to myself and to other people. I just found an enormous amount of requests, and I can pick up the newspaper every day and see the jobs that are open to me with this technical training. I am very glad I went back to school. (laughs) If you think technical school might be what you're looking for... Write Careers, Box 111, Washington, D.C., 20044. We'll send you a free record brochure that could change your whole life. A public service of this station, the U.S. Offices of Education, and the Advertising Council.
The men of the Flying M are lathering their mounts through the inky night, hard on the trail of Leroy Dunn. Well, we lost him, boys. Well, Mr. Gines, I see his track there. Not more than five minutes ahead. Well, uh, let's get some shut eye. What do we want with that fool anyway? That's what I say. Cornelius had to turn the boys back right then. He didn't want them or their tracks around the Lutweiler place. And that was a good decision. Leroy had ridden so hard he was already into the Lutweiler corral, hanging off his mount like an Apache horse thief, dead set to cut fences. Giddy up! Help! After. Get your guns, Bubba. The judge has come here to burn us out. I don't see nothing, brother, but what in tarnation are you doing? Yonder, Bubba, get your rifle quick. You left the damn corral open. Hell, I did. It's some flying in, boys, I tell you. Ma never taught you to lie. <laughs> you call yourself a loop wire. Uh, I'm sorry, Bo. Now you got the damn horses running all over creation. I could have swore I saw a sorrel in the bunch, Bubba. You saying things, brother, Bud. You saying things. Now go get them dogs quiet so I can get some sleep. I'm sorry, Bubba. I truly am sorry. But one of them horses wore a saddle. Oh, you just seeing things, Butchie. I know how bad you want to drag them cowboys through the dirt. Be patient. We going to get our chance soon. See to them dogs before I smack you again. Damn dogs. Leroy knew those dogs the Lutweilers ran would eventually give them away, so he cut the Lutweilers' horses loose. It was a good move, except for one thing, which Leroy didn't count on, but wouldn't catch up with him until first light when he was nearly done, when he had most of the boundary fence cut at eight-foot intervals. Get your guns, Bubba. The judge done cut our fences. You well pissed. Oh! Now, why'd you have to go and poke me for I didn't cut no fences. If you hadn't left that corral open last night, we'd have had horses to catch that sneaking bomb in and sprang him up. String him up? You think we can, Bubba? We can't even catch him, you babbling Egypt. The car? We can catch him, Bubba. We got the car. There he is, Bubba. Don't kill him, Bubba. Turn loose, you idiot. What's wrong with you? You kill him or can't hang him. I won't kill him, Butchie. W- watch out for that tree. Mercy sakes. We'll catch him on the bridge and I'll bulldog him down. We can hang him from the trusses. Look it, Butchie. He shot up river. Bubba, he's getting away. Kill him. Kill him. Leroy charged the sorrel up and down the river bank, never quite feeling secure, until he heard the last ground plunk into the water out of range. But if the Lutweiler brothers couldn't catch him, Mr. Rattler only had to lunge from the outcropping rock. (laughs) Girl! Girl! Leroy pulled his pistol but he knew he couldn't use it. There was no choice at all. If he could stay conscious against the pain in his shoulder, he could roll into the river before the rattler struck again. The muddy water revived him and stifled his screams. It also carried him back toward the Lutweilers. He tried to swim out of the current toward an eddy, but he had only one good arm. It was no use. Luckily, the current carried him under a pile of brush. Thank you, Lord. Unluckily, a pair of cotton-mouthed moccasins had chosen the very same brush pile on which to sun. But they also chose to ignore Leroy that day, having fattened up on frogs. 
Still, Leroy waited under the brush pile while the Lutweilers looked for him. Leroy eyed the white bellies of those two snakes, all the while visualizing his face swelled up as big as his arms swelled now. Despite the cold water, it was the size of a melon by the time the Lutweilers gave up looking and drove off. Then there was nothing to do but struggle through the brush, fighting for his consciousness against his pain, until Leroy collapsed that evening on the judge's front porch. Leroy! Leroy? Oh, Leroy. Don't... Here. What's that for? Cut off my shirt before you try to lift me. No, cut it here. There. Now... Come on, I'll take you inside. No. That uh, day bed over there. You come inside, Leroy. No, honey. Your daddy would have a fit. You're hurt. To hell with daddy. Oh, all right. That's quite a story, honey. But why'd you do it? I don't know. I just felt I had to, Amanda. Never take Daddy at face value, Leroy. Never again, okay? I don't understand. You wouldn't. You think I'm stupid, don't you? It's crossed my mind. It's okay. What's okay about it? It's the kind of stupid I love. <laughs> Hell of a note. You're cute when you lose. You ain't never seen me win. You may not like it. I'll take my chances. Shh, now, uh, Daddy's coming. Mr. Dunn's hurt, Daddy. He needs a doctor. He needs about two to five years. No. I'm taking him in. I've got no choice. He needs a doctor. The sheriff will take care of that. What are you trying to do, Daddy? Get inside. I'll deal with you later. <laughs> Hello, this is Joel Gray. Good health at birth for every child is the goal of the March of Dimes. And early prenatal care for the mother-to-be is the single most powerful force in attaining this goal. If you're pregnant, here are some guidelines. Some do's and don'ts from the nation's leader in the fight against birth defects, the March of Dimes. Do see a doctor or visit a clinic early and often during your pregnancy. Trouble can be detected early and taken care of. Do eat enough of the right foods. What you eat... Your baby eats too. Don't drink. When you drink, your baby does too. And too much alcohol can harm the fetus. Don't smoke. Smoking increases the risk of low birth weight and miscarriage. Do get plenty of rest and exercise in moderation. When you feel in tip-top shape, your baby will too. Child care must start long before birth. Do give your baby good prenatal care. Wise words from the March of Dimes. Despite dire warnings, Judge McMillan has found young Leroy Dunn with his daughter and is driving him to jail. Is that coincidence or connivance? Only the judge knows for sure. Let's hear that story again. Again? Like I said, Your Honor, I ran into the fence and bunged up my shoulder. I got mad, so I cut it. Now, that's got to hold up, son, because the Lutweilers found a horse in the river with my earmark on it, and in the saddlebags, a fence-cutting tool with my brand on it. Now, don't worry, sir. You're still alive after this long. That snake bite's okay. I know. Now, don't worry about the outcome. I'll see you get probation. That's trusting you a lot, Judge. You have to. Besides, probation means you can't leave my county. Uh Uh-huh. I don't know how I'll explain this to my daughter. Mm-hmm. I am not fooled by your indifference, Mr. Dunn. Any problems with your daughter will go away when I do. Maybe. Maybe she loves you. <laughs> Looks like that's what you got to bet on or against, Judge. And I got to gamble on your luck. Bad odds both ways. You're probably a pretty good poker player. Too broke to be much good. 
Thanks for bringing him in, Judge. There's a big bunch of mad settlers out looking for him. He's a good boy. Well, uh, maybe a little time in the pen will make him a man, Sheriff. Sheriff Parker, los vigilantes, los vigilantes are back. That's a hot bunch of folks, Judge McMillan. Maybe you ought to get out of here the back way. Uh, yeah, thanks, Sheriff. I want to look over the pole cat who cut our fence. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, sure the care. prisoner ain't allowed no visitors. Come on, Baba. Let's go in and get him and string him up. Now, all of you. All of you. Back off from here. Just who's going to make us, Sheriff? Oh, now, now, hold on, sir. Back off. Easy like. You ain't scaring me. Senor Sheriff Parker give you a choice, I think. Back off, or back off holding your entrees, comprende? We got rights, Dagnabbit! Shut up, Butchie. Come on. We ain't gonna string him up. Come on, folks. Courthouse yeah. saloon. Oh, Ranks oh, are on me. Yeah. 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 Those boys sure know how to spend the judge's money. Is it true about no visitor, Sheriff? Huh? Can the prisoner see a visitor, like me? Huh? What are you doing here? Aren't you Judge McMillan's daughter? I'm Amanda McMillan, Sheriff. Uh, uh, Domingo, uh, there's a bunch of ranchers down at the saloon. Rhodes Ranch, Box Inn, some of the Flying M. Better go see what's brewing. Si, sí, senor. Uh, if there's a fight, you stay out of it. Come get me, huh? Si, sí, si. Sí. All right, Miss Amanda. But don't take too long, okay? Sure. Good to see you. You don't act like it. I'm a little surprised. You gotta get out of here. It's a little late for that. There's a mob out there ready to hang you. They won't hang nobody. They can. They got a law on the books during the range wars. Fence cutting is a capital felony. You read your dad's books? This is serious. Yeah. I'll help you break out. We don't agree this is serious, honey. Uh, let's be a bit more practical. Look, Leroy. Daddy's going to put you away. This ain't serious. It's desperate. He won't put me away, Amanda. You don't know my daddy. He's got a bigger stake in this than you realize, Amanda. There's no time to argue. You. Uh, that's his stake. What? He's on to us. He knows he'll lose you. He already has. He knows more about us than we do. Never mind him. He knows I love you. You didn't know that before? Not like I know it now. I've known that for some time now. You McMillans ain't any smarter, just quicker. It's time you held me, Leroy. Huh. See you, Parker. Un combate grande in la cantina. Let's go. We're alone now. Later, we gotta move. Uh, you got a file in your purse? Better. A uh, blowtorch? A dynamite? Keys, silly. Daddy's keys. Well, it's mighty like my day to swing. Come on. You sure? Trust me. That's what your daddy said. Hurry, the loot wilers are coming. How do you know? I don't know. Come on. But I bet that saloon brawl is a draw. Uh, the loot wilers couldn't draw a cow patty with a stick. You never know. Get in. You didn't bring horses? The other side. I don't know how to drive. You should have brought horses. Why? Oh, never mind. Baba! He's gone! What in tarnation? You said we was gonna string him up! Parker's in the judge's pocket to wrap. Let's go! We don't know where he went! He took the shortest way out of the county. He had to. Come on, we'll hang that skunk here. What are you doing, Leroy? This is my favorite spot on the river road. We ought to let this Betsy cool off. There's no time for this, Leroy. Uh, not as much as I want. Not near enough. What are you 
talking about, Leroy? I saw some dust about five miles behind us. What are we stopping for? Now, one flat and that's the end, honey. Your daddy's coop just ain't made for this. You ought to brung horses. I'm sorry, Leroy. I guess we'll just have to take our chances. No. Uh, you go on as far as El Paso. I'll meet you there. We're in this together. We can't split up now. Look at Amanda. There's going to be trouble. I-, I can handle trouble, but i got to do it my way. Now, I'll see you in El Paso inside a week. No, Leroy. We're wasting time. Amanda, if you want to be my woman, you got to start doing what I say. You know better than that. Uh-huh. I want to marry you, see? I love you, and I want to marry you, so I, I got to get this trouble cleared up first. You see that? What if they hang you? Amanda, I think we got the luck of love. I, I, I know things could go bad, but I just don't see myself hanging, you understand? Sometimes, Amanda, life comes down to that. You just got to hope, that's all. I want you to have hope just this once. I'm due a win, you know. I love you, Leroy Dunn. You better get going. They're on the bridge by now. I don't know how to drive. You're a smart lady. You'll figure it out along about San Leon. Now get! My horse is tied behind the jailhouse, Leroy. A week? A hurry. I hear him on the grade. I don't think we should be up here. Why? What if someone sees us up on a ladder peering into a bedroom window? Well, then let's climb in. No, no, don't. We don't. There. See how well Mr. and Mrs. Conrath are sleeping on their new King Coil Posture Bomb mattress? I took your word for it in the store. I like to show my customers firsthand how terrific King Coil Posture Bomb really is. Boy, they really look comfortable there. They are. Here, I'll wake up Mrs. Conrath. Uh, Oh, hi, Mr. Harris. Hi, Linda. Would you tell my customer here how you got the exact firmness you wanted with a King Coil? I got the exact firmness. I didn't mean to wake you. No Want to try the King Coil Posture Bomb? What? Sure. Here, I'll get up and you get in. Yeah, but your husband is oh, still... Oh, it's all right. Yes. Mr. Harris has brought people by before. Right. Boy, this King Coil Posture Bomb is so comfortable. I wish my wife could try I'll it. I'll go get her. Wonderful. I'll make some cocoa and crackers. Right. Tell her to bring my new jammies. Isn't okay. this fun? Larry, wake up. We have company. What's your name? <laughs> try a King Coil Posture Bond. Its unique bonded construction assures comfort and durability year after year. King Coil Posture Bond. Lorn Green again, and here's the fourth act of the fence cutting. The Lutweilers rounded the grade out of the river valley to find a lone cowboy in the middle of the road. It's him, Bub. Let's string him up. You fellas wouldn't have a hank of line I could use, would you? It's him, I tell you. Uh, sure don't, mister. You didn't see a rider slapping leather to beat hell go by, did ya? I can't say I have. Now, don't you lie to me, boy. I've been following his dust for five miles. It's him, I tell you. You see any tracks in this sand? Grab him, Bubba. Will you hush up, butchy boy? Uh, been fishing, have you? Something big took my line. Well, we might have something back there. Let me look. That's Leroy Dunn himself. Grab it. We got him down. Stop kicking, Butchie. We gonna string him up now. He won't be fit to hang. What do we do now? Find his hands behind him line. Why? Here's some rope. That's hanging ropes. Well, ain't we gonna hang him? Sure, we gonna hang him. We gotta bind his hands first. Why? Here's some leather. That'll work. Why we gotta bind his hands? We won't struggle, so. Can't we see him struggle? Will you push up? Come on. Here. Now, 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 blindfold him. Why? We gotta do it proper. Don't, right. don't you peek now, cowboy. <laughs> 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 
I'm gagged. Yeah, well, it stops the screaming. Oh. <laughs> Over yeah. here. This oak looks good. Yeah, well, we, we need is a horse. A horse There's there. some horses coming up behind us. That's hard turn up. I see a cow, folks. You eat it. <laughs> Now, what do we need a horse for? Well, the prisoners got to have something to stand on. Uh, bring up the automobile, Butchie. Uh, there ain't no room, Mr. Lutweiler. Butchie, what are you doing? Stop! I'm trying, but I'm sliding. Uh, wait, I got some tow chain. We'll get you out of there. Nah, uh, this ain't going to work. Butchie ain't moving. Okay, son. I'll hitch my car to yours. Hey, here comes the sheriff. Can't we just hang him and be done with it? Look like they were airing for a fight. Where'd all these cow folks come from? <laughs> my prisoner. Anybody who comes near my jailhouse gets a gut full of lead. They understand? Well, son, I can charge you with jailbreaking, car theft, horse thieving, and fence cutting. Not to mention malicious mischief and inciting a riot. And kidnapping like Senor Lindbergh, no? You know, the judge hasn't complained about that yet. Or the tools you took from him, or the keys to my jail. Now, what do you got to say for yourself, Dunn? I don't know, sir. Seems like a cowboy's work is never done. Muy mal, no. Pretty bad, Domingo. Looks like you're going to be a lifer, Dunn. And since you're a jailbreaker, here's a set of stripes to wear. Got to take you over to the judge's chambers. He wants to talk to you so that he can decide how to charge you. Holler when you're ready, son. Okay, Sheriff. And no one's in the street except Olino. Still get your pistol belt and rifle. You don't know when that mob will hit town. See? Here's a prisoner, Judge. Oh, thank you, Sheriff. You can go. He's a jailbreaker, sir. I can take him, Parker. I reckon you can, sir. Well, I uh, guess you know the probation deal is off, son. I didn't know there was a deal. There might have been. If you hadn't busted out and started a riot, you're going to do time for that. Maybe. Oh, if you think you can implicate me, you ought to know you don't stand a chance of that in this county. I'll stick to my story. It doesn't matter to me one way or the other. But I have you in here for us to find out what you did with my daughter. I know. Way ahead of me, are you? Yep. Well, you'd better tell me where she is. You'll find out in good time. The only way you're going to get out of prison before old age... Is to tell me where she is. The only way you'll see her again in your lifetime is if I meet her where I said I would, and soon. That's impossible, of course. I don't think so. I'm not going to let it happen anyway. You know, Judge, and when I told Corny about you and the Lutweilers, uh, he said I should have told you to take a leap, but I didn't. I took you at your word, something your own daughter told me never to do again. So it seems to me this whole business is all you're doing, and it makes me mad. It's going to make me mad for some time. I don't follow. Well, Judge, since you made these arrangements we're discussing, it seems to me it's your problem. If you got a problem with these arrangements you made, and you might, considering where they leave Amanda... Seems to me you can afford any price you gotta pay to unmake them. It gets a little cold being the only desperate man around here when I got no bigger stake in this than you. I think you've got problems with these arrangements. It's not my problem anymore. You see that? I 
Take it you're not going to tell me where my daughter is, then. If I see her again, I'll ask her to write you. I'll find her anyway. A lot of good it'll do you when you do. You understand that, too, don't you? As far as I'm concerned, Mr. Dunn, it's all settled. I'm going to take Parker and Domingo over to the saloon where we will discuss your charges. Now, since you won't tell me where Amanda is, I'm going to ask for kidnapping. You stay here till we get back, and you'll get everything you deserve. You understand? Yes, sir. Come on, Mr. Parker. I need a stiff drink. What about my prisoner? That near lynching ought to keep him cringing. And he won't get far in those stripes anyway. In that case, we'd be honored, sir. The conclusion of our story after these words. Hi, this is Sandra Strauss with another fresh approach. Treat that tomato with tender loving care. The United Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Association cautions that bruises can prevent tomatoes from ripening properly or lasting as long as normal. Contrary to tradition, it is best to place tomatoes in a cool place, away from direct sunlight, if they require additional ripening. Too much sunlight can cause tomatoes to soften without ripening. Ripe tomatoes should be used within a few days, while light pink tomatoes will ripen, if not refrigerated, in three to five days. Delicious broiled, baked, roasted, fried, stuffed, or used in stews, soups, or gravies, or eaten right out of hand, the tomato is a champion in nutrition with a high content of vitamins A and C, plus iron and niacin. And the average-sized tomato has only about 35 calories. This is Sandra Strauss with The Fresh Approach. If anyone knows what happened to Leroy Dunn, he's not telling. There are a few clues, however. First, the horse Amanda McMillan rode in on disappeared. Where it was tied lay a rumpled set of jailbird stripes. But the strangest thing was this. Cornelius Gines was hauled off to jail for parading around town in his union suit. Now, some insist it was due to his friendship with Leroy Dunn, but others argue he was the victim of Demon Run. Maybe we'll never know, unless we go to El Paso. El Paso! Where is she? Where's my woman? Uh, uh, Amanda! Over here! Leroy! Amanda. Leroy. That's my woman. Twelve years later, the Dust Bowl blew away the judge's fortune and drove the Lutweilers to California. Leroy and Amanda Dunn left El Paso to establish an automobile dealership, which survives to this day. Well, darling, we're off on our honeymoon to... Hey, wait. This isn't my car. You're not the woman I love. No, sir. I'm the man from Buick, and this is one of our V6 Buicks. It's time for your V6 surprise drive. Yeah, but this is my wedding day. Th this is no time for a test drive. Nonsense, sir. You'll be married all your life, but test driving a V6 Buick is a very special occasion. But what'll I tell my wife? Why, tell her how much you like the V6. You think she'll go for that? Take a V6 Buick surprise drive at your Buick dealers now. Childhood accidents are a normal part of growing up. But the suffering that millions of American children experience is no accident. It's called child abuse. This is Roy Rogers. And Dale Evans reminding you that child abuse can be prevented. Right 
Prevent Child Abuse, Box 2866, Chicago, Illinois, 60690. Remember, abused children are helpless unless you help. A public service message of this station, the Advertising Council and the National Committee for Prevention of Child Abuse. The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, The Fence Cutting, was written by Andy Nance and produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Lauren Green. Our stars were Corey Burton, Joan McCall, and Parley Bear. Featured in the cast were Norman Alden, Marvin Miller, Dawes Butler, Tyler McVeigh, and Jack Carroll. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CVI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you by the King Coil Posture Bond Mattress. Its unique bonded construction assures comfort and durability year after year. The King Coil Posture Bond Mattress. This is Andy Griffith. Join us tomorrow at this same time. I've got another story I think you'll find riotously amusing. This is Lorne Green. It is 1913, and Woodrow Wilson is president of the United States. But on the walls of this Montana schoolroom hang the portraits of two other presidents. George Washington and Abraham Lincoln stare down in a kind of benign severity upon the children working at their desks. It is nearly time for dismissal. Ruth Stoddard smooths back her hair in its tight bun at the nape of her neck. She gazes at her students, knowing the few who love her and the many who laugh at her. She's 30 years old and a spinster. All her world is bounded by the walls of this schoolroom. She looks out one of the high, tall windows. Snow is beginning to fall. At the sight of the soft, white drift, something stirs deep within Ruth. She begins to tremble uncontrollably. She speaks, keeping her voice steady with great effort. Class, attention please, it has started to snow. You may leave class a few minutes early. Class is dismissed. Ruth Stoddard cannot take her eyes from the window and the incipient storm beyond it. Her breath is coming fast in ragged gulps. She tries to force the vision away, but it is upon her. She sees a face. It's her father's face, with dead, staring eyes and rigid, gaping mouth half buried in snow. Ruth can feel herself running, madly running from it, and stumbling, falling in the deep snow, seeing only inches from her eyes a severed hand reaching up from the cold, icy depths. Ruth, are you all right? I was passing by your door. I thought I heard a scream. No, I'm fine. You probably heard one of the children out in the yard shouting. Oh, yes, probably. Are you certain you're all right? You're as pale as a ghost. I'm fine, really. I'll see you tomorrow, then. Goodbye, Evelyn. But Ruth Stoddard is far from fine. Alone in her schoolroom, she covers her face with shaking hands. Ruth carries a terrible secret within her. A secret she has kept for long years, and even from herself. Only in nightmares would it break through. But today, it forced its way out into the open for a moment. Out into a snow-white afternoon reality. And that's only the beginning of our story.
Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Daddy's Gone by Pamela Russell. Our stars, Gene Howell, Lillian Bayer, and Keith Andes. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears. Where America shops for value. Product value. Sears Laboratories work to maximize that value for you. Its manufacturing consultants work with products and their manufacturers to cut production costs. One example is our power spray carpet cleaner. Its plastic parts require molds to form them. Molds are expensive, especially certain designs. So our manufacturing consultants recommended designs that cut mold costs. End result, a better value for you. Sears Laboratories. One reason Sears is where America shops for value. There's a place for everyone in the PTA. When we became a single-parent family, problems at home were affecting my kids in school. But working with the PTA made it easier to cope. As a teacher, I know that children benefit when there's trust between parents and teachers. The PTA makes this possible. My wife and I feel the PTA is a place to solve school problems. Everyone gets involved. There's a place for everyone in the PTA. How about you? Write National PTA, 700 North Rush, Chicago 60611. That night, after sitting silently through supper at the long and loud boarding house dining table, Ruth Stoddard goes up to her room to read English compositions. It's late when she finally goes to bed. She's afraid to sleep, frightened that the nightmare will come. And it does. She awakens in terror and sits up the rest of the night staring out at the white expanse of snow in the blackness. She arrives early at school the next morning. Evelyn sees her in the hall and, noticing her friend's dark-circled eyes and shaken attitude... She insists they have a cup of coffee and talk. Evelyn, I appreciate your concern, what but What is I... it? What's wrong, Ruth? It's nothing. I don't mean to pry, but I know there's something. I can see it in your face. I'm worried about you. I think it might help if you talked about it. I know you have good intentions. I care. I want to help if I can. I know that. You're always so alone, Ruth. It's not good to be by yourself all the time. I don't mind. I'm quite used to it now. I don't believe that. Well, there was a time when I thought that maybe I might find someone, or someone would find me and we could share, but... No, that's not meant for me. Some are born to lead a solitary life. I'm one of those. I've accepted that. I don't mind, not anymore. Really, I don't. You don't look at all well. Look at your handshake. You can barely hold the cup. I'm fine. And I say you're not. You can call me a busybody and snoop, but I know that something is disturbing you. Please, don't bottle it up inside. You'd feel better if you let it out, whatever it may be. That's just it. I'm not at all certain what I'd be letting out if I did. What do you mean? I... I don't know anymore if it's a dream or... Or what? Or... You see, I've had this dream for years. A horrible dream and always the same. I had it again last night, but it's yesterday that really frightens me. What happened yesterday? It came to me in class. In the daytime, not like a dream at all, but the same as the dream. The same same thing, but more like a, a terrible memory... What is it that you see? My father's face. His head has been severed from his body and it's partially covered over with snow. And then I see a hand, his hand, dismembered, reaching out from the snow, reaching out to me as if to pull me down under into that vast, endless cold. Oh, Ruth, it is awful. 
I've had the dreams since my father disappeared. Uh, deserted mother and me when I was ten years old. That's... Oh, that's twenty years ago. And suddenly yesterday, I begin to wonder if I was dreaming or if I was remembering. You think that your father might not have run away but died? Yes. Died in the snow. Was killed, maybe, in the snow. And I was somehow a part of it. Perhaps I... Ruth, Ruth, you can't go on like this, tormenting yourself this way. I know of someone who could possibly help you. Who? Tandy Robards. Oh, I've heard that name, Tandy Robards. The woman who claims to be a seer and who holds seances out at her place by the railroad tracks. That's Tandy Robards. Yes. Oh, I could never go to someone like that. Why not? Oh, I just couldn't. She's a stranger to me, a total stranger. Sometimes it's easier with a stranger. Oh, no, not for me. I, I couldn't bring myself to tell her these things. Tandy Robards has very special gifts of perception. She has sight into the future. She hears what you say and what you don't say. I am not a believer, Evelyn. Well, let me ask you this. Can you stand another 20 years of the dream? No. No, I can't. I'll take you to Tandy Robards. She can look within you. She will tell you what she sees. I'm not certain I want to know. We'll go to her tonight. Yes. All right. Tonight. There are certain foods, plants, and animal products you can't bring back to the U.S. You can't because they're prohibited. They're prohibited because even one of these foods, plants, or animal products might carry a disease or pest that could spread to our crops and gardens and animals with devastating results. You haven't been everywhere on the globe yet, but there's always tomorrow. And before you go again, write for the free booklet that explains the law. Even one can hurt, write for travelers too. Write to Traveler's Tips, U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington, D.C., 20250. It's free. Approaching it, it is an ordinary-looking house... And Tandy Robards, standing in the doorway, is an ordinary-looking woman. Evelyn and Ruth enter. Once inside, Ruth feels the extraordinary strangeness of the place and the woman. This is my friend, Ruth Stoddard. Ruth, Tandy Robards. Hello. Hello, Ruth. Please come this way. I've fixed tea for us. Oh, this is my special room. When I walk inside, the walls embrace me. I feel a kinship with this spot. Have you a room like this, Ruth? Oh, I have only uh, the one room in the boarding house where I live, and it's just... uh, Well, it's only a room to me. I never gave any thought to it being any more than that. Well, rooms will take on the characteristics of those who live in them or have lived in them. They absorb the past and sometimes even reveal it. Rooms are as human as their occupants. This is my room. My very special room. Do you like it, Ruth? It seems comfortable. Of what are you afraid, Ruth? Oh, so many things. Everything, it seems. I I thought it would be so difficult to come here and talk with you, but it isn't. Why is that? I want to listen, to hear you, Ruth. That's why. Now begin in this way. What is the thing you fear most? The the dream. It's about my father. In the dream, he's dead. I see his face and his hand in the snow. Is your father dead? 
I don't know. I haven't seen him since I was a little girl. He ran off from us. Who is Martha? That's my mother's name. But how did you know? These things come to me. I do not question them. I ask that you do not. I'm going to lower the lights now. Don't be afraid, Ruth. <clears throat> Shall I leave? No, stay. No, stay, Evelyn. We need your belief here with us. Ruth, I want you to close your eyes and try to bring forth your dreams. But all of it, not only the small piece that you have spoken of, but all of it. What do you see? What do you see that you do not speak of? Ruth, tell us, what is it that you see? I see, I, I see the snow. It's soft and melting, but cold, still so cold. I'm walking in the snow, and I look back, but there are no footprints. They've already melted away. I feel so strange, invisible. Then I see it protruding. It's the head with Daddy's face. Horrible. Dead. Oh, I I run. I run and I, I fall and there's a hand sticking out from the snow and it's, it's his hand. I crawl away from it and the wet snow is melting on my coat. I, I get up and I begin to run again. I run and, until I hit up against something tall and stiff, unyielding. It's Mother. She's standing and her hands are in fists in her apron pockets and... When I look up at her, her face is so hard and tight. She pulls me up the stairs. She's dragging me, and I'm screaming. I'm, oh, Daddy! 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 Ruth! Ruth! Don't speak ever. Uh, Ruth, what uh, more do you see? Nothing. Nothing more. I'm, oh, I'm in some small place. It's dark. I, I, I can't move. I can't see. It's so dark. I... My coat is wet still. Dark. Dark. Have I done something wrong? <laughs> then there's nothing. Nothing more. That's, that's all there is. Open your eyes, Ruth. Ruth? Evelyn, <laughs> you know where the kitchen is. Would you go and bring another cup? Ruth has broken hers. Oh, oh yes. Ruth, it's not a dream. It could be. It, it could still be. No. I, I feel a violent cold fury, like a savage blizzard. But this was a human raging. I can feel it. Is it mine? Is it my rage? My violence? You must go to Martha, to your mother. I'm afraid. I know, but you must go to her. I feel that she is somehow waiting. For me? Yes. No, no, maybe not. Maybe she's waiting for Daddy to come back. Maybe that's what she's waiting for. That's that's what you feel. No. Well, why couldn't it be that? Because your father is dead. This I know. And you know, Ruth. And so, too, does Martha, your mother, know. Do the trains come past all through the night? How can you sleep? There's no sound I like more than that of trains passing in the night. And I rarely sleep. You don't sleep? I seem to need only occasional little naps. Like a cat? Yes. Exactly like a cat. It's time for us to say goodbye, though we haven't finished our tea. Ruth, go to her. She waits for you and no one else. I'll go. You know the way out. Goodbye. Hello, this is Roger Staubach. I think most of us have a picture of what the Salvation Army does. For those with long memories, it might be the brave donut lassies of the First World War. We all know about the Christmas kettles and the wonderful things the Salvation Army does during the holiday season. Anyone who has seen a community devastated by a fire or flood probably thinks of the practical help and the spiritual uplift that the Army's trained workers brought to the scene. But I didn't realize until recently that the Salvation Army has been in the helping business for a hundred years. 
These Christian warriors in blue uniforms first came to this country in 1880. This is an anniversary we can all take pride in. For a hundred years, this army has expressed the best in the American character, kindness, compassion, thrift, and practical know-how. I say thank you, Salvation Army, and I wish you many more happy birthdays. There is a part of Montana known as Mirage Country. Some people say it's a quirk in the atmosphere, and others only shake their heads and wonder at the inexplicable happenings that often occur. Coming down a road a few miles up ahead, a house appears where there is no house and never has been. It stays and stays on the horizon until you believe in it, then it disappears or flips upside down and you begin to doubt your eyes and your sanity. Ruth Stoddard is coming into this country to her mother's wheat farm, chasing after her own mirage of murder and madness. Excuse me, miss. Yes? Uh, I couldn't help but notice that you've been waiting here a mighty long time since you got off the train. I was watching from the window across the street. Well, that's the sheriff's office. Yes, miss. And I'm the sheriff. Well, then where's Sheriff Tanner? Oh, uh, Clyde Tanner died last summer. Oh, that's terrible. Oh, I'm sorry to be the one to tell you. Oh, I, I didn't really know him well, but... Well, it's never pleasant news. No. No, it isn't. Now, if you knew Clyde Tanner, you must be from around these parts. I used to be. Oh. Uh. Oh, Bill Beaumont, miss. But my name is Ruth Stoddard. Stoddard? Martha Stoddard's girl? <laughs> Hardly a girl anymore, but yes. Oh, well, you're, you're waiting for your ma, then? Yes, and it's not like her to be late. I wired I was coming. Well, she's got a long ride in from the farm, and the roads are in pretty bad shape after the last storm. Has it been a bad winter? Well, not as bad as some, but... Now, if you'd like to get out of the cold, Miss Daughter, you're welcome to come over and sit by the stove in the office. Oh, no, thank you. I'll just stay here. I'll, uh, I'll just... Stay here? Yes, uh, but thank you. Well, do you mind if I sit here with you for a minute? No, I don't mind. Hmm. You're a, you're a teacher, aren't you? Yes. Where is it that you teach? Box Butte. Oh, yeah, I've heard of it. Up in the Rockies, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, a lot different than the country around here. Quite a lot. It's hard to believe that it's all Montana. It seems like different worlds. Mm, yeah, I'll bet it's good to be home. Home? Uh, yes. Yeah, your ma's a fine woman. Oh, I've, I've never talked to her much. She's not the talkative kind. <laughs> you, you take after her there. But folks around here speak mighty highly of her. A woman alone. She's, she's sure admired. I'll, I'll tell you that. Ah, there's your ma. <laughs> Going to see some, some kissing and hugging now, I'll bet. You would lose that bet, Sheriff. Mrs. Stoddard. Sheriff Beaumont. Hello, Mother. Ruth. Here, I'll put that bag in back for you. Here now. <laughs> Here, let me help you up there, Miss Stoddard. <laughs> Thank you, Sheriff. Oh, please call me Bill. Bill kept me company while I was waiting for you, Mother. And it was a pleasure. Much obliged to you for watching out for Ruth, Sheriff Beaumont. Get up now. I'll I'll ride out to the farm one of these days real soon. I'd like that, Bill. Aren't you a little old to still be trying to hook on to a man, Ruth? I was only being civil. Oh, sight more than civil, I'd say. How are you, Mother? Mm, I stay pretty much the same, Ruth. Yes. You know that Bill Beaumont can have his pick of all the pretty young girls around here. Mother, please, I was only talking to the man. I thought you knew man. better. I thought you were smarter than that. The trouble, nothing but trouble, men are. So I've heard, Mother, all my life, from you. <laughs> you and Bill Beaumont, you just don't figure. Why, he can Mother, have we his were pick. talking, that is all. I just don't want to see you get hurt. I know. But it is you who hurts me most, Mother. Get up. Hmm. 
It's a wonderful dinner, Mother. You remembered that ham is my favorite. No, I didn't. I just fixed it, that's all. I'm sorry. I thought that since this was my first night home that you'd done something special for me. Uh, even if it wasn't true, you could have let me think it. I'm glad you liked the ham. Mother? Yes? I, uh... I don't know how to begin. We never talk. Well, what is it we've just been doing? I, I don't know. Not talking. Not really. I want so much to say this, and I I don't know if I should, and I, and I don't know how. Well, if you're having regrets before you start, you're sure to afterwards, so why don't you stop now? I can't do that. Mother, um, I want to talk with you about Daddy. Help me clear the table, Ruth. No, not just yet. I don't like leaving dishes set. Mother, Mother, please stop. Uh, don't touch me. Don't you be messing with me, Ruth. Oh, I remember how you were always saying that to me when I was a little girl. Did you say the same thing to Daddy? I won't have that kind of talk in my house. I, I want to hear about my father. I can barely remember him. I want something of him other than a terrible dream. A dream? I, I don't want to talk about that. I, I want to talk about Daddy. Well, what do you want to hear? Do you want to hear that he was a cheat and a liar? Do you want to hear that he never loved me? Why, well, he despised me, and because you were part of me, one more thing hanging on to him and holding him down, he hated you, too. No, no. You asked to hear about him. Well, I can tell you more, Ruth. So much more. No, no. Yes, you asked, and I'm going to tell you. I don't want to know. Well, you should know. I should have told you long ago. I should have kept you from ever believing in love or in men. Mother, please stop. Your father. Your daddy. Why, well, he hated you. He used to watch you and laugh and, and tell, tell me that you was uglier even than I. He laughed at us. He hated us. We was ugly to him. So your daddy, he ran off with a pretty cheap little... You're lying. Tramp. I won't believe it. And don't, don't you ever ask me about him again. And don't you cry, Ruth. Why, you're even uglier when you cry. That's what your daddy always said about you. Now help me clear the table. Yes, Mother. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. It's broken. Being sorry is not going to mend it. I'll get the broom. I'll sweep it no, up. No, I'll do it. You're no use here at all. I'm no use anywhere. Oh, you are good for something, Ruth, for being sorry for broken dishes and for yourself. Oh, why don't you go on up to bed? I think I'll sit in the parlor for a while. I don't want you wandering around the house like an unquiet spirit. Go up to your room and go to sleep. I'm afraid to sleep. Do you want to know why? I know why. It's the dream. Yes. You've had it ever since you was a child. You'd wake up in the night screaming, and I'd go into you, and when you'd see me, you'd scream even louder. You never would say what it was you saw in that dream. Oh, you was a hard child, Ruth. A hard child to love or to comfort, but easy to hurt. You almost asked to be hurt. Just like tonight. Now, I'm not surprised that you still have that dream. Because you haven't changed, Ruth. You haven't changed at all. I'll go to bed now. Good night, Mother. Good night, Ruth. <laughs> Maxwell House is coffee to relax with. I have 35 children to take care of, and I'm not even married. I'm a school teacher, so when I get home in the evening, I really need to relax and have a good cup of coffee. Maxwell House coffee. Mmm, I've tried other coffees, but I've learned one lesson. Maxwell House is coffee you can count on. Good to the last drop, Maxwell House. Hi, I'm Bill Cosby. There's an important chapter in my life, my local Red Cross chapter. Ever wonder what they do there? They help relocate fire victims. They help older folks. Careful, Mr. Rand. Teach kids to swim. Kate, that's good, Eddie. Give veterans a hand. And do scores of other jobs that help people personally. Your local Red Cross chapter needs your help. Make it a chapter in your life. Help keep Red Cross ready. Days are long out on the farm, but when it is finally night 
the darkness comes fast, like a heavy curtain falling before the light. And the nights are longest of all. Ruth is used to being by herself, but what hurts her is that she feels most alone when she's with her mother. The morning she sees Sheriff Beaumont ride up, she is happy but apprehensive. There's a sense of anticipation at his arrival, as if something were about to happen. It's Bill. He did come, like you said he would. Well, you sure been waiting for him, watching out of windows. Don't think I haven't seen you at it. Well, he's here now, so go on out to him. I don't want him in my house. Mother, he's only paying a visit. He's being kind. He's a kind man. Oh, go on, run after him. Make a fool of yourself. Go on, Ruth. I'm go. going. I wouldn't want him in this house. Good morning, Bill. Morning, Miss Stoddard. If I'm going to call you Bill, you must call me Ruth. All right, Ruth. Well, where's your ma? I'd like to say hello to her. She's uh, in, she's inside. She's not feeling well today. Oh, nothing serious, I hope. No, it's it's nothing serious. Well, it could be the grip. A lot of folks down with it. Could be. Uh, you tell her for me that she should be resting and not up looking out windows. She's watching us. Hmm. Appears that way. She's not ill. I. I just said that. Oh, so it's not the grip. It's me that's ailing your maw. Why is that? Oh, it's not you. It's me. Hmm. It's it's not good between you and your maw. The other day, I, I couldn't help but notice it was like ice when the two of you met. You see a great deal. <laughs> Watching folks is a kind of habit with me. It's because I'm a job, I guess. Is it too cold to take a little walk with me? I'd love to. This is a mighty nice farm. Yes. I like it best when things are growing and the hired hands are here working, no matter whether it's plowing or harvest. But in the winter, it gets so quiet and still. Dead. Yeah, Montana winters can be kind of deadly, and that's a fact. Can I ask you something? Yes. Where's your pa now? You've heard the story, haven't you? Well, I've, I've heard a story. My father ran off and left my mother and me when I was ten years old. I haven't seen him since. Well, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not excusing his running. I can understand things going sour between a man and a woman. What I can't understand is his, his deserting you, his child, his own baby girl. He never come back once to see you? No, he never did. Hmm. I'm really sorry. It was a long time ago. Are you trying to say to me that it, it doesn't matter to you anymore? Yes, that's right. No, I don't believe you. I can see the hurt still in your eyes. We'd, we'd best be getting back. I'm sorry, Bill. It's hard for me to think of or talk about my father. I, I want to, but it's so hard for me. And then there's Mother. She still hates him so, and I... I... There's no need forcing yourself. If someday you, you feel like talking, I hope you'll come talk to me. Why, thank you, Bill. Well, I'll, I'll be riding out this way again tomorrow. Could I come by and see you? Yes, please do. I'll be seeing you, Ruth. Tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. Give my regards to your ma. What was you dreaming about? Tell me about the dream. No, no, I... Why won't you tell me? Are you afraid? Yes. That's why you come here, I know, because of the dream. Now, tell me. I have to know what it is that you see in your dream. I, I see Daddy. How do you see him? I see him dead. I see his face and his hand in the snow. He's dead. He didn't run away. He died. Tandy Robard says he's dead. She told me so. She did. She did. Who is Tandy Robart? She's a woman who looks inside of people. Well, whatever are you talking about? Did I... Did I kill him, Mother? Did I... 
Is that what happened? I can't remember. I can only see flashes, little, little torn bits and pieces. But I know that Daddy died. I know he didn't run away like yours said he did. Did I kill my mother? Did I? I can't remember. I must know. Danny Robars looked inside me and she saw, but she wouldn't tell me. She said to come to you. You have to tell me, Mother. I can't live not knowing. Why were you so angry? Why did you drag me up the stairs? Why did you lock me in the closet? Why were you punishing me, Mother? What had I done? Oh, what had I done out of the snow, Mother? What? <laughs> nothing. You did nothing, Ruth. <laughs> now go to sleep. Go to sleep. I uh, uh, know that none of it was your uh, doing. Sleep. Uh, sleep well for once. Uh, Mama's gonna make it all right. Uh, you just go to sleep. And sleep well, dear Ruth. My dear Ruth. Yes, Mama. Mother? Mother, why did you let me sleep so long? Mother, where are you? Mother? Mother? Mother, are you here? to go into the house. What are you going to do? I'm going to take care of things in the barn. What do you mean? You mean you're going to take her down from there? You're going to take the rope from around her neck? Is that what you mean? Go on in the house. Uh, don't leave me alone for long. I won't. I won't. I promise, Ruth. I won't leave you alone. Uh. Ruth? Are you all right? I took this quilt from her bed. I thought we could cover her with it. I know she doesn't feel the cold now, but... But she wouldn't have wanted people looking at her. We can put this over her, can't we? Yeah. Oh, why did she do it, Bill? Why did she? Last night, I remember. She was so sweet to me, like I'd always wanted her to be. Why? Why did she want to die? Maybe, maybe this will tell you. What is it? A letter I found in her apron pocket. Would, would you read it for me? I can't. Oh, are, are you sure you want me to? Yes. All right. My dear Ruth, these years have been torment for me. All, All these, these long, long years, years since, since I, I killed, killed him. him. I killed your father, my husband. But he was never really a father to you or a husband to me, so I told myself that I'd killed some evil stranger, a, a wanderer who'd come here to do us harm, an intruder. And it was that, truly that. Still, I did murder, and I have suffered for it every day since. I write this to you to explain, not to excuse myself. I ask only your understanding. Your forgiveness is too much to beg of you. It was in the winter. You'd gone to visit your Aunt Idy. He come to me and told me that he was leaving me, that he'd met someone he loved, loved to look at and to touch. He told me he couldn't stand to see me or to feel me near him. Oh, if only he'd gone then, right after those things were said. But there was a blizzard that night. We was trapped together, two people caught in fearsome hatred and loathing. And it went on for days and days. I thought it would never end. 
I had to do something to end it. I intended to kill myself with his gun, but he walked into the room, and I don't know why, I'll never know why, but he tried to stop me. He fought. The gun fired, and he fell. The gun was in my hand. He was lying on the floor, not dead, but moaning, bleeding. And I fired again. And again and again. And then he was dead. But that wasn't enough for me. I went out through the snow to the barn and I got an axe. I carried it back to the house. And after I finished with him, I buried the pieces of him in the snow. And the next day it stopped snowing. The Chinook blew in a warm, dry wind, melting the snow and freeing the roads. You come home from Aunt Idy's. You kept asking me where Daddy was. I just hated it that you loved him still. I told you Daddy's gone. No, you said, I'll find him. You ran outside. I, I called to you, but you wouldn't stop. You found him in the melting snow. And I locked you in the closet while I went and dug through the snow into the hard ground and put him deeply in it. You was such a little girl, I thought you'd forget what you saw that day. I never wanted to share my torture and my guilt with you. I'm sorry that you shared any Ruth. The shame and the horror is mine alone. Bury it with me. My love to you, Mama. Oh, I do understand. Finally. And I do forgive you, Mama. Bill, please take me out of here. I can't stand here another minute. Where will you go? Back to Box Butte. It's the only place I have. Maybe not. I'll look for you in the spring, Ruth. When things are grown. I'll be here. Yes. Well, thank you, Bill. <laughs> The conclusion of our story, after these words. I'm lost and lonely, scared and sad, trembling at the thought of making you mad. My love is yours, but at times you're so cold. If life's like this, take me before I grow old. This song was written by a man now serving time in the state prison. Most of the men and women in prison today were abused children, and many abused children grow up to abuse their own children. Child abusers can be helped. Find out how. Write Prevent Child Abuse, Box 2866, Chicago, Illinois, 60690. Please stop the hurt. I've suffered since my birth. Joy. A message of the Ad Council and the National Committee for Prevention of Child Abuse. The children are playing in the yard. There is still snow on the ground. Everything is the same as when Ruth Stoddard left school to visit her mother. Everything except Ruth Stoddard. It may have been only two weeks... But it seems an entire lifetime has passed. In a way, a new life has begun for Ruth. She steps inside the building. Ruth, I've been waiting for you. How are you? I'm all right, Evelyn. Walk with me to my class. I'm so anxious to see it again. Is it any different to you? No, no different. A little musty, maybe. Uh, you... Seem different? I am, I think. I wanted to tell you how sorry I am about your mother. Thank you, Evelyn. And thank you, too, for helping me shed light in some dark corners. No more dark corners and no more bad dreams. That's what's different about me. I've 
also decided that this will be my last term here. Oh, I'll miss you. I'll miss you, too. I'm going home. All the ghosts are gone. It's time to begin living again. Yes. I I think it's finally your time. And finally, my life. Say, if you're free tonight, I know someone who can take you to all the best places, introduce you to people you never dreamed you'd meet, and show you the bad and beautiful side of life at the top. She's Diana Davenport, and her novel is called The Power Eaters. The Power Eaters are three passionate women. One runs a publishing empire. One runs a country. One must run for her life. Diana Davenport is your passport to their world, the world of the Power Eaters. The Power Eaters, now a faucet paperback. I'm George Kennedy, here to tell you about a remarkable machine. It's both a communications device and a food processor, and its beauty can be dazzling. It's built to last the life of its owner, requires no electricity or gasoline, just healthy foods and regular cleaning. I'm talking about your mouth, especially your teeth and gums. With all they do for you, aren't they worth a little care? For a free brochure on how to become a wise dental consumer, write the American Dental Association, Chicago 60611. The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Daddy's Gone, was written by Pamela Russell and produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Lorne Green. Our stars were Gene Howell, Lillian Baev, and Keith Andy. Featured in the cast were Jane Webb and Robin Braxton. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. The Elliot Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you by Maxwell House Coffee. Maxwell House, always good to the last drop. This is Andy Griffin. Join us tomorrow at the same time. I've got another story I think you'll find riotously amusing. This is Lorne Green. It seems that the children of every generation find something to rebel against. There are those who rebel because everyone else is doing it. It's popular. This is the kind of rebellion that usually fades as youth ages. But there is the youthful rebellion that matures and becomes a lifelong crusade. Sarah and Angelina Grimke daughters of Judge John Falcheron Grimke, a member of the South Carolina Supreme Court, and Mary Smith Grimke, were leaders in a rebellion that became a lifelong crusade, one that this great country should never allow itself the indulgence of forgetting. John, I just don't know what to do about them. I just don't. Do you know what they did today? Yes, I do. Noni told me the moment I came in the door. Cutting the lace trimmings from their dresses and the bows from their shoes. Why? Why did they do it? They said it was a needless indulgence. That's the reason they gave. But it doesn't stop there. Oh, no. They insisted that I provide the household slaves with daily religious instruction. How do you think I feel? A member of the South Carolina Supreme Court with two daughters traipsing around town talking about how inhumane slavery is. I mean, just think, here we are, plantation owners, respectable members of the community with two daughters who... I I just don't understand it. We've given those girls everything. It wasn't us, John. I hate to say it, but having an older brother preach abolitionism and then pass away gave them the idea that whatever he said was the gospel truth. 
Oh, I wish to heaven Thomas had lived. I'm sure he would have seen the error of his ways. Well, I dare say you're right. But I am simply appalled that they should want to toss aside all the benefits of their heritage. They could be the bells of Charleston, but they don't want that. They want to spoil everything. I think the best thing we can do is pray for them and hope that they will eventually see the light. History has offered us many characters in search of a role to play. It has seldom presented us with two women playing such tremendous roles in the history of the anti-slavery movement, the pre-civil rights organization. This introduction to the Grimke sisters is only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, the Grimke Sisters, Abolitionists, a portrait of real people drawn from life in America in the 19th century by Odie Hawkins. Our stars, Mary Jane Croft and Janet Waldo. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value, a name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears where America shops for value. Product value. Sears Laboratories work to maximize that value for you. Its manufacturing consultants work with products and their manufacturers to cut production costs. One example is our power spray carpet cleaner. Its plastic parts require molds to form them. Molds are expensive, especially certain designs. So our manufacturing consultants recommended designs that cut mold costs. End result, a better value for you. Sears Laboratories. One reason Sears is where America shops for value. Dog days in Eagle County, Iowa. No breeze, no trees. Just searing sun and dust that cakes in your throat. But one thing washes it clean. Nesty. All over. Nesty tastes good all over. All over. Nesty tastes good all over. Nesty iced tea. No sugar, no bubbles, no additives. Just clean, light, pure tea. In order to really understand the nature of this story, we must force ourselves back into another time. We must force ourselves to relate to a time in our country's history when some human beings belonged to other human beings. Slaves who had value only if they were able to work from before dawn till long after dark. Dear Diary, I find it most difficult to record my feelings at this time, but I know I must do it. Every nerve in my being rejects the terrible emotions that are aroused in me by the event that forces these words into my diary. I listened to Noni being lashed again yesterday, and in some strange way, I began to feel a sting of the whip on my own back. Noni, one of our household slaves, would not be whipped so often, Mother says, if she remembered to do everything she was told. Well, I don't see how it'd be possible for her to remember all the things she has to do in a 24-room house. Yesterday, after I'd seen and heard Noni being whipped again for some petty thing... I felt I had no choice but to try to help her escape this never-ending punishment. I ran down to the harbor with an idea. Sir, pardon me, sir. Aye, and what might I do for the likes of such a pretty little lady as yourself? Uh, are, are you the captain of the ship? Every day of the week, little lady. Every blasted day of the week. Look alive there, or you'll be in the brig four days in. Now, let's uh, speak quickly, little one. We've got loading to be done. Well, I have something very important to ask you. May I come aboard for a moment? Well, that you may for only a moment. But careful how you step the gangplank. We'd not like to be fishing you out of these cold harbor waters. <sighs> Captain, Noni, our slave, was whipped again today. She was. I want to help her escape. I feel so sorry for her. She's always being beaten. She sleeps in the hallway. Uh, did you not say that she was a slave, little one? Yes, but she shouldn't be. No one should be a slave. Well, there are wiser heads than ours debating that. Uh, what might your precious name be, little one? Sarah Grimke. Oh, are you one of the Grimkes? 
I mean, is your father Judge Grimke? Yes, do you know him? Well, I, I dare say there's not a soul in Charleston who doesn't know Judge Grimke. Now then, uh, how about this slave? Yes, her name is Noni. I have a few coins. I'll pay for well, it. Well, I, I couldn't take your money, little lady. Nor could I offer you any aid in this matter. Why not, Captain? Because, well, because it's against the law. But slavery is against human nature. If that were the case, the good Lord would not have allowed it to exist in the first place. Now, I'll have to ask you to step ashore, little one. Uh, you say you're Judge Grimke's daughter? <laughs> Absolutely refuse, Mother. Now listen to me closely, Angelina. Your father and I are Episcopalians. Your grandparents were Episcopalians. And in order for you to take your place in our society, you must be confirmed in the Episcopalian Church. Don't you understand how important that is? I refuse to be a part of a church that will not say that slavery is wrong. Angelina, how can you do this to us, to your family? You'll be the only girl in your group who hasn't been confirmed. You'll be an outcast. I don't care, Mother. Oh, why do you and Sarah make life so difficult for us? For yourselves? You sound just like your brother Thomas. Slavery is morally wrong. It is indefensible in any humane terms. But you must be prepared to suffer the consequences for saying so. After all, we are the Grimkes of South Carolina. Slave owners. It truly pains me to have to say this to you, Sarah, because I hate to forbid you and your sister anything. But I must insist that you do not continue to teach Noni how to read. But, Father, why shouldn't she be taught how to read? Why? Simple. She's a slave. Slaves shouldn't know how to read and write. But why, Father? Why? Because it's against the law. That's why. We must be very quiet, Noni. No one is to know about our lessons. Now then, I will show you each letter of alphabet and how to form it. Is the door locked? If you're caught, Father will probably sell you, and I'll be given a harsh talking to, worse than the one he gave Sarah. Dear Diary, I have just returned from a business trip to Philadelphia with Father, and several great changes have happened in my life. The first and greatest is I've decided to become a Quaker. To my knowledge, there are only two Quakers in Charleston, both old men, and I shall become the third. I'm sure Father will be outraged, but it doesn't matter. I was very impressed by the Quakers in Philadelphia, the simplicity of their dress, the calmness of their manner, their way of treating people, and the fact that they don't own other human beings. I have sincerely questioned myself about my reasons for becoming a Quaker, and all the answers seem fair and correct. I wonder how this will affect Angelina. My poor darling little sister, I sometimes wonder if it's fair to have burdened her with the weight of understanding that our dearly departed brother passed on to me. Slavery is a low, mean, vicious, immoral way of life, Sarah, both for the enslaved and the slaver. Can't they understand in the process of keeping another human being in chains, they must also become bound. If only I were younger or she were older, it, it'd be so much better for us. Sometimes being 13 years older than she makes me feel that I'm imposing my ideas about life on her. But then I have to thank God that it is I, not some crazed believer in slavery, who's the major influence in her young life. She will be so lonely when I leave, I know that. But I must leave soon. I'm of age, and despite what father and mother think, of sound mind. I must leave this hell filled with the bodies of people who are beaten, starved, and worked to death. My soul recoils at the idea of remaining in a place where death is the only salvation from such evils. I will take the stage to Philadelphia and make a new life for myself. If you need anything at all, just let us know. Oh, my little girl. My I'm little... not a little girl. I'm 27 years old, Mother. Angelina. Oh, don't feel badly about leaving. I know why you have to go. I'm glad you understand. All right. Bye, Mother. Dad. Take care. <laughs> Right 
Right now's the time to buy paint and stain because all Olympic products are on special. Buy four gallons, get one more free. That's one free with four on Olympic Overcoat, a latex house paint that really beats the weather, and on Olympic latex stain, a stain that lets you stain over paint. Even one free with four on Olympic oil stain, the number one seller. It's not every day you can save so much on something so good. Hurry, special ends June 1st at participating Olympic dealers. This is KC of KC and the Sunshine Band. Believe me, I wish I knew a song about the great work the USO is doing because I'd sing it. Instead, let me tell you in simple words that the USO gives a human dimension to the military life of millions of people. Maybe it's with a hospital visit to a disabled vet, recreation for a young GI, or an informal education program near a remote base. The USO, service is their middle name. Show your concern and support them through your local USO campaign or the United Way. The story of the Grimke sisters, abolitionists, continues. Dear Sarah, I shall soon leave Charleston to come to Philadelphia to be with you in a place where people are not treated like beasts. I am hurt by the thought that I will probably never see Mother again, not until she has given up slavery, which I think will be never. I understand better with each passing day why you felt compelled to leave the place of our birth. In this year of our Lord, 1829, I too shall leave. I will be with you and we will follow the Quaker teachings together. I think very often, my dear sister, of how different all of the children of our family are. Thomas with his strong sense of right and Henry, our brother. Angelina, will you please stop going on and on about this? These people are our slaves. Can't you understand that, sister? If God had intended them to be ordinary human beings, he would have made them white. First Sarah, now you. Why must you go? If Sarah has not been able to make you understand, and our brother Thomas before her, how can I explain it? We will not be slave owners, Mother. Can't you understand? We will not own people and force them to work for nothing. We cannot offer our blessings, but I will say to you, as I said to Sarah, if you need anything at all, just let us know. Uh, Goodbye, Angelina. Goodbye, Mother, Dad. Goodbye, Henry, my dear brother. And now, brothers and sisters, we will pray silently in the manner that doth announce to the world that we are of the Quaker persuasion. Uh, Sister Sarah, Sister Angelina, please move to the... to the other section. Why should we move to the other section, please? While this badge of degradation, being forced to sit in a segregated section of this meeting, is forced on our black sisters, we feel it is our duty to share it with them, to point up the hypocrisy of a religious group that doth not profess a belief in slavery, but in some rare fashion can justify segregation by sex and color. If you persist in sitting for worship in the black female section of the meeting hall, we have no choice but to exclude you from our meeting. If that is the case, then so be it. You may have no choice but to exclude us, but we have the right to remove ourselves from this hypocrisy. Sarah, did you see their faces? Yes, Angelina, I did see their faces, and I don't think we have anything to be joyful about. Oh, oh no, I didn't mean to. But I know what you mean. It was a bit funny, wasn't it? Those sanctimonious souls sitting in their segregated pews, thinking that God approves of them because they dress simply, say thee and thine and don't own slaves. I agree, it was funny. I wish I could laugh. Sarah, have you read this? This article in William Lloyd Garrison's paper, The Liberator? Yes, I've been reading The Liberator for some time. The abolitionists... Sarah, the abolitionists, I think they're the right people for us. I'm writing Mr. Garrison a letter. Dear Mr. Garrison, it is my deep, solemn, deliberate conviction that the abolition of slavery is a cause worth dying for. We just received an extraordinary letter from a woman named Angelina Grimke. 
We must print it. It expresses the deepest concern for human rights I have ever been exposed to. But, Sarah, don't you see how wrong it is? To offer slaves an opportunity to colonize Liberia? No, I don't see it so wrong. It is wrong not to abolish slavery. We should devote our total energies to the elimination of slavery here in our own country. It is wrong that people should be forced to leave this country in order to be free. I strongly disagree with you, Angelina. I think it would be an advantage for the Negroes to be in their own society. But, but Sarah, don't you remember? It was for this very reason that we took ourselves out of the Quaker persuasion. Are you now going to speak for segregation? It is not segregation, Angelina. It is colonization. Dear diary, Sarah and I are currently disagreeing on an issue. No great matter. Sisters should disagree from time to time. It acts as a stimulation. Our disagreement has stimulated me to write a pamphlet. I'm going to call it an appeal to Christian women of the South. In this pamphlet, I will speak of the horror. The cruelty, the licentiousness of slavery. I beg all Southern women to come out against slavery, to free their slaves, to help educate them, create a healthy society, one that we can be proud of living in. Mary, Mary, have you seen this, this pamphlet? Yes. Yes, I saw it. My God, what has happened to him up oh. there? An appeal to Christian women of the South by Angelina Grimke. She sounds like a raven maniac. Listen to this. Slavery is a whited sepulcher full of dead men's bones and all unclean. And there's more. I think it's only right that the postmaster should be burning this filth in the public square. Well, that isn't the only ex Angelina's pamphlet. The mayor was here earlier to speak with me about... Angelina's coming to visit us. Known it? Bring us two lemonades, quickly. Go on, go on. What do you want? Well, nothing, actually. He just simply wanted to inform me that Angelina would not be allowed to leave the boat in Charleston Harbor. Where is that? I'm sorry, my dear. Go on. She would not be allowed to leave the boat or, or communicate with anyone in this city by any means. And furthermore, he said, if she should manage to come ashore somehow, she'd be arrested. He strongly advised me to inform her that she shouldn't come to Charleston because there have been threats made. Well, I guess that's to be expected, writing trash like this. How dare she drag our name down like this? Where is that? Noni! I, I can't go. Sarah, I can't go home. I know, I know, darling. I read the letter. I would defy them. The police, everybody. No, no, you mustn't. We can't bring that kind of pressure to bear on our own parents. Dear Diary, it is now a year since Angelina's pamphlet, An Appeal to Christian Women of the South, was published. And she was denied the opportunity to visit our parents, our home, because of it. During the course of this year, Angelina and I have had philosophical differences, but her latest pamphlet, An Epistle to the Clergy of the Southern States, has taken me completely to her side. I hope the ministers of the South will respond to her, to the pressure of her arguments. How can men of God support the degradation of human beings? Or at least not oppose it? I think Angelina and I have found our life's work. Ready on set. Hi, this is Michael Landon. You know what goes on behind the scenes is important. Because if things don't work well here, they won't work well up front. Same with pictures. What's behind them can make a difference. So I get mine printed on Kodak paper. And it's always available where you see the Kodak paper sign. You can't miss it. It's the sign with that memorable face. Mine. You're on, Mr. Landon. Okay. Look for the Kodak paper sign when you get your pictures developed. And tell them Michael sent you. The American Land Title Association takes you backstage with D.G. Shepard. Hi, folks. This is T.G. Shepard. You know, before you put your money into a home, find out what's going on with things like financing, closing costs, and land title protection. The American Land Title Association will help you. 
For free information, write ALTA, Box 566, Washington, D.C., 20044. The secretary of the American Anti-Slavery Society invited the Grimke sisters to New York to speak to women abolitionists. The Grimkes became evangelists of abolition. Dear Diary, last evening, as Sarah and I were speaking in Dorchester, Massachusetts, men entered the town hall and took seats. Several men. Somehow, I did not feel embarrassed by their presence. After the meeting, Sarah and I had a long discussion about the impact of dealing with a mixed audience. We came to the conclusion that it would be necessary to speak on the problem of women's rights as well as abolition. It's bad enough that these two women are going about the country trying to tell others what to do with their property. I'm saying to you that we must silence these women. We must make them aware of their true nature. God did not make women as strong as men, but he did design them in such a fashion as to be perfectly suited for the bearing of children. He gave us a creature who offered perfect companionship, not someone to argue with or to compete with. God created woman from the rib of man and gave her a place, the home, which is where every God-fearing woman should be. Dear Diary, in Boston, every church was close to us. Placards announcing our meetings in private homes were torn down. The General Association of Congregational Ministers of Massachusetts condemn our speaking out, and yet we persist. The opposition to our efforts to seek justice has stimulated us tremendously. Dear Diary, my sister is a glowing example of how steel is tempered by fire. She has written a pamphlet entitled Letters on the Equality of the Sexes and the Condition of Women. Her soul sings and moans from its pages, and so indeed does mine. The many pages of history teem with women's wrongs. It is wet with women's tears. I urge women to plant themselves beside men to whom they were designed to be companions and helpers in every good work and word. And in a spirit of togetherness, go forward. Sarah, Sarah, listen to this. Wendell Phillips says... Sarah Grimke's eloquence swept the chords of the human heart with a power that has never been surpassed and rarely equal. Oh, I'm pleased and flattered by his words, but I'm even more pleased that you've been invited to speak to the legislature of Massachusetts. Oh, Sarah, I'm so afraid. I... Don't be afraid. Be proud that you're the first woman ever to be allowed to speak to those gentlemen on the issues of slavery and women's rights. <laughs> Gentlemen, today in this year of our Lord, 1838, I stand before you as a southerner exiled from the land of my birth by the sounds of the lash and the piteous cry of the slave. I stand before you as a repentant slaveholder. I stand before you as a moral being. As a moral being, I owe it to the suffering slave and to the deluded master, to my country and and the world to do all that I can to overturn a system of complicated crimes built up upon the broken hearts and prostrate bodies of my countrymen in chains and cemented by the blood and sweat and tears of my sisters in bondage. Dear Diary, I am pleased to be able to write of Angelina's triumph before the legislature of Massachusetts. The chairman was in tears during the course of her speech, such was her eloquence. I'm also pleased with the situation I can see developing between her and Theodore Weld. Weld is a Connecticut abolitionist who has given his time and expertise in an effort to channel our energies to their most productive ends. He is deeply in love with Angelina, but pretends not to be. His greatest fear, I think, is that our common cause would be made to suffer if he were to commit himself to Angelina. I want to scream at him that this would not be so, that the linking together of our efforts would only forge a stronger chain. Sarah! Sarah! Theodore has asked me to marry him. Praise be. 
If there was ever a case of love at first sight, I was exposed to it when I met Angelina Grimke. I was hesitant about exposing my feelings to her at first, blame it on my Connecticut background or whatever you will, but what I was concerned about was whether a wife would prevent me from continuing to carry on the fight for the abolition of slavery. I need not have worried. I knew after her speech to the Massachusetts legislature that we could accomplish a great deal together. In May of 1838, we were joined in holy matrimony. Their wedding was not of the usual variety. We made it a demonstration for anti-slavery and women's rights. Six former slaves of our family were invited as a protest against the position they'd been forced to occupy in our society. Two Negro and two white clergymen offered prayers. William Lloyd Garrison read the marriage agreement, and Theodore read a statement that protested against the power allowed the husband by the laws of the United States over the person and property of his wife. My dear brother-in-law. We saw a way with our wedding, dear diary, to strike at the system we hate. No sugar from slave-grown cane went into our wedding cake. Only free sugar. The mattress of our farm home in New Jersey was not stuffed with the usual slave-grown cotton. Our honeymoon was devoted to a deeper commitment to the cause. We were part of the group that opened the Anti-Slavery Convention of American Women in Pennsylvania Hall. 3,000 Negro and white delegates were seated together. This defiance of the laws drew a fierce mob outside the hall. I made an effort to speak above and beyond their vicious assaults on justice. Men, brothers, mothers, daughters, sisters. Many accept that the slave is unhappy under the worst forms of slavery. But I have never seen a happy slave under any circumstances. I have seen him dance in his chains, it is true, but he is not happy. With all hope gone, they sometimes adopt the attitude, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. In slavery, there is no neutral ground. If you are not for it, you must be against it. What can we do? What can we do? We can show the mob with its threats that we are unafraid, that we are ready to die for the cause. And what can we women who have no voice at the ballot box do? We can petition and petition and petition. When enough of us have signed our names back by moral strength and put these petitions before our legislatures, they will have no choice but to effect change. Dear Diary, I am living with Angelina and Theodore in a large, comfortable home in Massachusetts. After the exhaustion of dealing with the bigots, the prejudice, the bias, we felt a need to rest for a bit. During the course of this rest, Theodore and I have decided to document evidence of how cruelly the people in slavery are treated. We are calling it, Slavery as it is, the testimony of a thousand witnesses. The testimonies are being taken from newspapers that advertise for fugitive slaves. We were quite surprised to discover that slave hunters, as well as people who were totally against slavery, offered their advertisements without hesitation. Household slave, runaway, answers to the name Noni, will no doubt show the marks of recent whippings. Reward offered. Field hand, answers to the name Jasper. Runaway, January 12, 1838, has learned how to read, should be considered dangerous, wanted dead or alive. Runaway slave, stamped on the left cheek and R, and a piece is taken off of her left ear. Sarah, female slave, almost full grown, branded N-E on the breast, and having both small toes cut off. John, neck permanently disfigured, escapee from a punishment. About 22 years old, to be considered dangerous. Reward, dead or alive. Repeat, considered dangerous. O.D., small-shaped, sneaky, has learned how to write, left eye missing. Considered dangerous. Reward, dead or alive. Our 
our investigation produced a mood of deep despondency. We had no idea that our fellow citizens, our fellow Americans, both North and South, regarded enslavement of their fellow creatures in such a narrow, calloused light. After Sarah and Theodore completed slavery as it is, the testimony of a thousand witnesses, we renewed our pledge to fight for justice. This is Gene King for your Better Business Bureau. When was the last time you checked your car's oil level? If your car's oil level is low, your engine's performance will decrease, and at the same time, wear and tear on the engine will increase. In fact, did you know that if you don't have enough oil in your engine, various parts of your car, such as the pistons and bearings, can actually melt due to heat caused by friction? Now, the best time to check your car's oil level is when your engine is hot. Do you know how often you should add oil to your car? Well, that depends on how old your car is, as well as your driving habits. For example, when you drive at high speeds, particularly in hot weather, you'll burn up more oil. Also, if you have a new car as opposed to an older model, your engine is probably using more oil. Because, well, its parts haven't been broken in yet. So to be on the safe side, check your oil level every time you get gas. A tip from your Better Business Bureau. Lorne Green again, and here's the fourth act of the Grimke Sisters, Abolitionists. Sarah, Angelina, I'd like to hear more. Who knows, someday I might make an effort to uh, write the story of the Grimke Sisters. <laughs> One of them is now my wife, but that won't matter. We'll simply use poetic license when we reach that section. Oh, Sarah, <laughs> what you the... Go? In... <laughs> oh, you, you, you speak first, sister. Well... <laughs> Our brother Thomas was the one to open my heart, eyes, and soul to the vicious seeds inherent to the practice of slavery. He was a great man, I think, our brother Thomas. I cannot honestly say where he developed his opinions, how he came to the conclusion that slavery was wrong. All I can remember, as far back as I can recall, he was telling me, Sarah, slavery is wrong. It is wrong because it forces one group of people to serve another group of people. It degrades the people who are forced to slave. It demoralizes the people who use slaves. And that's the horrible picture he painted on my mind. It's strange somehow to think of how differently our brothers were, how different Thomas was from Henry. Yes, it is strange. Henry never felt that slavery was or is wrong. I can better understand Henry than I can Thomas, his attitude. You you can? Yes, objectively speaking. I mean... I should think that having a group of people to serve you, to answer to your every beck and call, would be a delightful state of affairs, if you never bothered to make the moralistic considerations we're making here at this dinner table. Yes, I can understand that, too, objectively speaking. But why one and not the other? Why would Thomas see it for the evil it is and Henry... Why would Henry look at it in another light altogether? Maybe it was parental influence. Parental influence, yes, but it was as strong for Thomas as it was for Henry... How does one explain that? Mm, I would be hard put to give an answer to that. I would be more interested in knowing why the two of you decided against slavery. Well, I, I cannot speak for Angelina. But for myself, realizing the validity of Thomas's teachings, I had no choice but to feel that slavery is evil. Had I not had the benefit of his advice, his teaching, I cannot predict what my attitude would have been. If I stretch my imagination far enough, I could see myself sitting on the veranda, sipping a cold drink, watching people labor in the hot sun for my benefit. Sarah, I, I can recall moments like that, but with a sense of shame. I think from the moment I heard a fellow creature scream for mercy under the lash, I was against it. I think it was that for me also. The sound of a person being whipped like a beast without a soul. And the other things, the unspeakable things that every child knows about whose father owns slaves. All of that and more. Makes it difficult to know who to pray for sometimes, the slave owner or the slave. If you own slaves, Theodore, that wouldn't be a difficult decision. I take this opportunity to record a number of feelings, both good and bad. 
I'm extremely happy for Angelina that she should have been fortunate enough to find a husband like Theodore. He's one of the few men I've ever met who is so secure within himself. He doesn't find it necessary or proper to impose his will on others. He offers his version of the truth and prays it will be accepted. Because I live here with them, the vicious rumor has been circulated that Theodore is the husband to both of us. It makes me very sad to realize there are people in the world with minds like that. The tract that Theodore and I assembled, Slavery as it is, the testimony of a thousand witnesses, is being given a tremendous reception. There are those who think that it is a pack of lies and hate it, and others who know it's the truth and hate it also. I feel so completely drained from the struggle of trying to make people understand that it is immoral and inhumane to treat our fellow creatures so brutally. I ask myself, What are the magic words or phrases? If slave owners can invoke the name of God as a justification for their sins, what is the counterbalance? Sarah, I don't think this mob will listen to you. He's right, Sarah. I've seen several men with guns. Even mobs are made up of people. We came here to speak to them, and we will. And now, our featured speaker of the evening... Miss Sarah Grimke. Thank you very much for that. At least it tells me my audience is not asleep. You ought to be at home baking biscuits or something. I might do that after I've earned your support for abolition of slavery and the right of women to be first-class citizens. I want every man and woman... Unfortunately, I only see four besides my sister and me. I want everyone here to leave this hall pledging in your heart that you will work for the construction of a decent, humane society. We can begin this by eliminating slavery. You're crazy. Why should we give up our slaves? What have we got to gain? Firstly, my friend, your soul. Secondly, you will have demonstrated to the world that we are a civilized people who needn't depend on the misery of others to make our way. Where are you from, my friend? I ain't from Africa. (laughs) No, you're not. But think of how differently you would have arrived here were you from Africa. Uh, No, no, let her speak. Let's hear this hand laying in. (laughs) If you you had been brought here as the African that you call a slave was brought here, you would have spent at least two or three months below the decks of a ship that was coated with the filth of hundreds of bodies packed together like, like beans in a sack. You would not have enough room to sit up straight or turn to your right or left. Your chains would have worn pieces of your flesh away. You would have been taken off of this wretched vessel naked and sold to the highest bidder for a lifetime of drudgery. And you would have survived in exactly the way they have survived because they are a resourceful people. And only the very strongest were able to complete the middle passage. And because they are strong, they will be free someday with or without our consent or help. I beg of you to consider the future, our country's future. Let these people go. The conclusion of our story, after this word. Hi, this is Michael Landon. Are you the Michael Landon who talks about Kodak paper on TV? Yeah, that's me. I just love your commercials and your paper. Oh, thanks, but it's Kodak paper. Do you get your pictures printed on Kodak paper, too? Well, absolutely. I always look for you when I get them developed. Uh, You mean you look for the Kodak paper sign with my face on it? Yeah, because I always get Kodak paper where I see you. Um, it. Right. Well, nice talking to you. Yeah, what a handsome sign. Look for the Kodak paper sign when you get your pictures developed. This match is one of the world's most lethal weapons. It kills thousands of people each year, countless thousands of animals. It lays waste to millions of acres and destroys thousands of homes. It strikes at high noon and in the dead of night. Man created the match. Man uses it to his benefit and misuses it to his sorrow. Only you can prevent forest fires. A public service of this station, the Smokey Bear Program, and the Ad Council. Listen to this. 
Archibald Grimke is scheduled to speak at Brewster Hall, Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. Grimke? Sounds like more than a coincidence to me. How many people in this world are named Grimke? Upon inquiry, Sarah and Angelina discovered that they had two nephews, relatives created by a relation of their brother Henry with a slave named Nancy. The sisters publicly acknowledged their black nephews, Archibald and Francis, and made them part of the Grimke Weld household. At their aunt's expense, Archibald and Francis completed their education. Francis Grimke became pastor of the 15th Street Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C., and Archibald Grimke became a U.S. consul to Santo Domingo and vice president of the NAACP. Daughters of the South, enemies of a degrading style of life, Sarah and Angelina preached the gospel of togetherness and fired the conscience of many American men and women. The dialogue of this story was invented, the circumstances constructed for dramatic effect. But the truth is that we are a stronger and a more moral nation because the Grimke sisters were for real. When I need refreshment, old-fashioned taste comes first. One thing I can depend on when I get parched and dry, the taste of good old-fashioned lemonade right in country time. Country time, country time, tastes like that good old-fashioned lemonade. Not too tart, not too sweet, with natural lemon flavor, country time lemonade flavored drink. Tastes like that good old-fashioned lemonade. This slide is of Mary and the kids shopping in Tijuana. And now we're heading back to the good old USA. And here's the border inspector. Just before he confiscated Daddy's $60 parrot. Never mind, Kim. And there's Daddy having a tantrum. Kim. Oh, Bill, didn't you know birds are restricted from entry? Well, how was I to know? Write for Traveler's Tips. It's a free booklet. You should have written Traveler's Tips, USDA, Washington, 20250. Gosh, free, Dad. Quiet, Kim. The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, The Grimke Sisters, Abolitionists, was written by Odie Hawkins and produced and directed by Fletcher Marco. Your host was Lauren Green. Our stars were Mary Jane Croft and Janet Waldo. Featured in the cast were Lynn Berman, Ann Seymour, Harley Bear, Tyler McVeigh, and Howard Culver. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you by Country Time Lemonade Flavored Drink Mix. Country Time tastes like good old-fashioned lemonade. This is Andy Griffith. Join us tomorrow at this same time. I've got another story I think you'll find riotously amusing. This is Lorne Green. Tough, hard-hitting journalism in this country did not start with Watergate and Woodward and Bernstein. It's an old tradition. Why, in the 19th century, newspapering could be rough and dangerous. Reporters and editors were crusaders and reformers and hell-raisers. And I'm not talking just about men. No, some of the fiercest firebrands of the frontier were female. One such was Jane Grey Swisshelm. A hundred and fifty years before there was the term women's liberation, she fought for equality of the sexes. 
She was one of the first female newspaper editors in history. She was the first woman in the Washington Press Corps, the first woman to sit in a congressional press gallery. She also fought for the rights and freedom of blacks. And to do that in our nation's capital and on the frontier, she had to take on many a powerful politician. In 1850, no less a personage than Daniel Webster felt her sting. Jane's sister, Elizabeth, warned her. Jane, Daniel Webster and his friends will destroy you if you publish this. About his drinking and his women. Jane, you must not publish this. Is it true? Yes, it's true. People in Washington have known it for years. Then I'll make it known to the rest of the nation, the voters. Jane, Jane, this is the sort of thing, well, well, it will hurt Daniel Webster, naturally, but it will hurt you more. How? You know the world, Jane. It blames the messenger for the news that he or she brings, especially if it's a she writing about scandalous matters. Elizabeth, my good sister, does not the cause of the slave hang on issues before Congress right now? Yes. And isn't Daniel Webster's influence all against that cause? Yes, it is. Would not that influence be very much less if the public knew just what a moral hypocrite he is? Yes, but... Then I'll publish it and let God take care of the consequences. The mighty silver-tongued Daniel had stepped into the den of the lioness. But unlike the biblical Daniel, this one lost lost. He was devoured. He had dreamt of the White House, but he was not nominated for the presidency. Having dealt this blow to Webster, Jane Grace Wishelm put Washington behind her. On the western frontier, she battled another prominent politician in a fight that threatened her life. This is a true story of journalistic courage and a feminine nerve and verve. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Words, Words, Words by P.M. Klepper. Our stars, Mary Jane Croft, Tyler McVeigh, and James McCallion. Mutual Radio Theater is being brought to you in part by Kodak Paper. When you get your pictures developed, be sure to ask for the only paper in the world that says, this paper manufactured by Kodak. And by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. Product value. Sears Laboratories work to maximize that value for you. Its manufacturing consultants work with products and their manufacturers to cut production costs. One example is our power spray carpet cleaner. Its plastic parts require molds to form them. Molds are expensive, especially certain designs. So our manufacturing consultants recommended designs that cut mold costs. End result, a better value for you. Sears Laboratories. One reason Sears is where America shops for value. For the record, sir. Of course. You're a lawyer, author, corporation head, and you've scaled Mount Everest. Yes, all before age 26. How? Off the record. Certainly. The Unicap Tea Vitamin Supplement. Unicap Tea? Put the best in yourself to get the best out of yourself. Uh, Unicaps. Amazing. Feeling good about myself gives me the confidence to succeed at everything. Oh, what's (laughs) next, sir? A backstroke swim of the English Channel. Is that for the record? It should be. My practice time was only four hours. Unicaps. Feel good about yourself. It's a decade before the Civil War, and Jane Grace Wishelm is moving to a village on the frontier. Back east, she's been a firebrand of a crusading newspaper editor. How will these two, the woman and the town, get along? Afternoon, Elizabeth. Oh, hello, Mr. Brott. What brings you here? Same as you. Oh, Mr. Brott, I'm here to meet my sister. Mm, The same. Jane? How did you know? Elizabeth, practically the whole town knows that Jane Gray Swisshelm is arriving. Much as you try to keep it a secret. She's famous. My husband says infamous. Oh. I said to him, please be nice to Jane. And he said, I'll try because she's your sister. 
But it, it isn't easy for a businessman in a small town like St. Cloud to have a radical like Jane Gray Swisshelm living with us. I imagine not. I said she's not a radical. And he said a female newspaper editor who backs all sorts of third parties like those new Republicans and advocates every crackpot idea from women's suffrage to Negro abolition. I know you'll hear it somewhere if you haven't already, Mr. Brott. Jane took her daughter and left her husband. I, I'm only interested in her ability as a newspaper editor. Why? Oh, no, no, Mr. Brott. Oh, yes, Elizabeth. Every reader in the country has read the story she wrote for the New York Tribune. Picked up by papers all over, even way out here in Minnesota. And you... Have a broken down printing office, but no one's edited a paper. Elizabeth, if a town like St. Cloud is to grow, it's got to have a newspaper. Mr. Brott, don't start anything. Jane could take that shop of yours and set it ablaze, a pillar of fire in the desert. Oh, there's the stage. St. Cloud, prepare. Jane Gray Swiss home is about to hit. Jane! Jane! Elizabeth! Oh, it's good to see you. Jane, you look so tired. A long trip. A ah, long trip. A long struggle. Oh, Elizabeth, this is Henrietta. Nettie, she's called. This is the niece you've never met. What a beautiful baby. <laughs> Thank you. And this is Eliza. Afternoon. Oh, yes, sir. You... She's a freed slave, Elizabeth. Nettie's nursemaid. Not my slave in any sense. My friend. Welcome, Eliza. Thank you. Eliza, uh, take Nettie inside while the driver unstraps the luggage. Yes, Miss Jane. Mrs. Uh, Swisshelm. Jane, this is George Brott. Uh, how do you do? I have a business matter to discuss. Oh, can it wait? Well... I, uh, don't want to discuss or do anything right now, Mr. Brott. Come along, Jane. You can rest. Yes, I'd like that. This is Jane Gray Swisshelm, the firebrand. Jane, Mr. Brott is going to offer you the editorship of a new paper. Oh, I appreciate the offer, but I'm not up to it. I didn't think running a newspaper in St. Cloud, Minnesota, a few hundred people surrounded by forests and Indians, would be much of a challenge. After what you did in the East... Elizabeth, when my marriage ended, I had sort of a collapse. Oh, Jane, no, I've recovered my health, mostly... But the spark is gone. All the drive. I... I hate to see you this way. Why? You were constantly embarrassed when I kicked up dust. When I made politicians and clergymen and businessmen squirm. Yes, but to see you so subdued. Oh, my dear, sometimes I envied you in your little haven of serenity. The lady of a peaceful house. Especially in this little town with the Mississippi River down there. Lovely lakes and the woods. And I, I envied you. Of course, I'm content with how marriage is. The man is the master. But, but though I didn't approve of your public life... You took I... after Mama. Mama. She was so proud of you. Her child prodigy quoting the Old Testament at the age of three. Remember how she used to tell us that her family was descended from British royalty? <laughs> she named me for Queen Elizabeth. And me for Queen Jane Grey. Who reigned for only nine days. <laughs> I remember. People said that you... Whoops. <laughs> I know that as an editor, I acted like a queen. <laughs> you know, I'm always said that no respectable woman ever had her name in the paper except when she was married and when she died. I once went beyond Mom on that. When I was in my mid-twenties, I would have broken an engagement rather than permit my name to appear in print, even in the announcement of marriage. Do you know I was nearly 30 years old before I saw my name in print? Soon it was every week. I had as much newspaper notoriety as any man in public life. I may have agreed with the others that it wasn't quite ladylike, Jane, but still it seemed an exciting life. Of course, I was never forced to make my living. When Pa died, I was just a baby. I was six. And went to work at ten, helping Mama support the family. I felt guilty later, you doing all that needlework to sell to ladies and teaching school when you were 14. Oh, you would have done the same if you'd been the oldest. I like to think so, Jane, but I don't have your pluck. Few women do. Few men, either. <laughs> I guess that's right, come to think of it. More women should, and would, if they were encouraged. 
But we're talking of the past. I've come here to just rest. Here on the free frontier, away from the problems of politics and issues. Jane! Jane, he's here! General Lowry's right out in the hall. Is he? Who is General Lowry? Just the most important man in the territory. Lowry? Oh, yes. Most important politically. Because he can give away federal appointments to his friends. Richest man, too, Jane. He has a big place here on the Mississippi and still keeps a huge plantation in the South. He wants to talk to you. You can win a two-week all-expense trip to anywhere in the USA. Hi, this is Michael Landon, and that's just one of 3,891 prizes you can win in the Kodak Paper Sweepstakes. Seven grand prize two-week trips, 24 one-week trips, and thousands of Kodak camera and film prizes. Enter the Kodak Paper Sweepstakes. There's nothing to buy. Get an entry blank at your participating photo dealer, where you get your film processed on Kodak Paper for a good look. Mail it by October 15th, 1980. Void where prohibited. All across America, national parks are being made more accessible to disabled visitors. And a 200-page book called Access National Parks has maps, descriptions of accessible features, and other information to help you locate these special facilities. For a copy, send $3.50 to Access, Consumer Information Center, Pueblo, Colorado, 81009. Also available in Braille and talking book from the National Library Service. A message from the National Park Service, U.S. Department of the Interior. Firebrands have a tendency to burn out. And that seems to be what happened to crusading newspaper woman Jane Gray Swisshelm, who went west to find peace and quiet. Until she met the man who ran the territory. General Lowry, please come in. Thank you, ma'am. General, my sister, Mrs. Swisshelm. Delighted. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, yes. Well, I'm needed in the kitchen. It's uh, impertinent of me, Mrs. Swisshelm, to call on you for the first time on a business matter. I don't hold with formalities, General Lowry. Well, since you are so direct, uh, almost like a... A man, General. I hear that you brought with you a colored servant. I brought with me Eliza, my baby daughter's nursemaid. I would have said Mammy. Yes, I imagine you would. To be as blunt as you are, Mrs. Swisshelm, I had heard that you're not in the best way uh, financially. An understatement. I was hoping that you might not need this man... Uh, I mean this nursemaid now. Oh, you wish to hire Eliza? Hire? I want to buy her. You want to buy Eliza? Yes. Uh, again, to be blunt, uh, forgive me, ma'am, but I have a colored manservant who is restless and ornery, and I, well, he... Uh, Don't mince words with me. I won't with you. I want to get him a female. I wouldn't bother you, Mrs. Swisshelm, except it would take some time for a wench to be sent up for my plantation, so I felt I could strike a bargain with you. You strike horror in me. Ma'am? Eliza is not a slave to be sold. A free Negro? And I would never deal in human flesh. Oh, an abolitionist. My ego and some things my sister and others have said gave me too large a sense of my own importance. Ma'am? Obviously, my reputation isn't as widespread as I've been led to believe. Back East, General, no slave owner would have dared ask Jane Grace Swiss Elm to barter a human being. A soul. You struck fear in the hearts of... Well... You are correct. I hadn't heard of this reputation of yours. And if I interpret your remarks correctly, you cause trembling in the breasts of men whose crime it is to own property and dispose of it as they see fit. Property? Slaves, sir. You are talking of property that has a mind and a soul. Mrs. Swisshelm. When I lived in the South, I saw such property bleed and die because of the brutality of its owners. Mrs. Swisshelm, I resent these accusations. I will call my servant. Thomas, come here. Come in here. Yes. Mrs. Swisshelm, have you ever seen the starved children of the working class in the factories of the North and the tenements in which they live and where their old folks die when they are no longer able to work? Thomas, 
Your pappy hasn't done a lick of work since he became ill 15 years ago, has he? No, sir. And he has eaten and had a place in your cabin? Yes, sir. And he was once seen by my own physician down there on the plantation, wasn't he? Yes, sir. So, Mrs. Swisshelm? Thomas, have you ever been whipped? Well, I, m- ma'am, that ain't nothing. Have you ever seen women, young and old, horsewhipped, and children taken from their parents and sold? Why, m- ma'am, it... Oh, wait outside, Thomas. Yes, sir. I regret, Mrs. Swisshelm, that you have seen fit to turn a peaceful business mission into an occasion of rudeness. Sir, do you know the law? Some. And I have a personal attorney, James Shepley, to advise me. Then he should be able to tell you, General, that you are breaking the law. Whatever dealings you have in human flesh in your home state, you are living in Minnesota, a free state. And it is against the law to bring and send slaves and to sell men and women here. It may be the law, but it isn't enforced. These idealistic Minnesotans know it's good business not to annoy their southern visitors. This is good tourist country. Many a family with its slaves come here for the cool summer months. I intend to make it a hot summer for your kind, General. You? I have an offer to edit a newspaper. So, you would print in it... uh... Facts about the issues. Issues. People don't care about issues. They don't understand issues. They understand money and power. I have both. I don't even bother to get myself elected to Congress. I send men. I accept this challenge, General Lowry. I will become editor of this paper. How do you like the shop, Elizabeth? You've cleaned it up real nice. Jane, I I have to have help. Put that sign in the window, man wanted. I don't like to limit it to men, but I knew it would be useless to expect a woman or a girl to apply. Jane, another thing that's useless is fighting General Lowry. That attack and this issue, Jane, he controls this region. The only thing useless was what I did when I met him, argue with him. The only way to get a man like that is where it hurts, in public. And there's only one way to do that. This newspaper, the St. Cloud Visitor. Oh, Jane... Well, I must be getting home. Yes, get supper ready for the Lord and Master. Jane. Oh, hello. Is this the paper? Yes, it is. And there's the boss. I, you the boss? A woman? What can I do for you? You need help? Oh, you read the sign in the window. No, somebody told me about it. What do you pay? What do I pay? Aren't you going to ask me what you'll do? I can do almost anything. Really? Yeah, what do you pay? Now, there's more of a job than what's paid. You don't pay much. You're astute. Y- yeah. What's your name? Johnny Greer. Where do you live, Johnny? Here in St. Cloud. Where? Oh, around. Your parents? Dad. Had some relatives on a farm in Wisconsin. I ran off. They wanted me to work the fields and tend the cattle and go to school. Well, nothing wrong with school. Ah, not for me. You ain't going to tell me what you pay? You need money badly? Until next spring when I can go trapping. Oh, that's no life. Nobody bosses you around. I'd like to do that until... Well, until I can work for somebody like General Lowry... Maybe someday be General Lowry. You don't want to be anybody but yourself when you find out what that is. And especially you don't want to be General Lowry. He came here before this was even a territory, much less a state, and he had a trading post for the Indians, and look what he is. I have looked, and I don't want anybody to be like that. Johnny, I'm going to give you a try. When can you start? Right away. Good. We went to press last night. Those copies are to go to the post office. Sure thing. Oh, not those. This week's issue. But, well, I, uh... You can't read very well. Well, not much. And you want to work in a newspaper office? You don't want me, now. I didn't say that. I told you there was more to a job than just money. This is an opportunity to learn. Like school? Oh, shh. I'll teach you to read better and to write and how to put out a newspaper. Yeah, I understand. You ain't got much money to pay me. Johnny, you learned the first truth about newspapering. Take 
care of your house and save. At Sears Super Homeowners Sale. Save from 10 to 35% with super values on many items. Like easy living interior paints, selected washerless faucets, fire screens, and Kenmore dishwashers. On dependable Craftsman products like selected table saws, chainsaws, circular saws, and portable power tools. So many savings right now at most Sears retail stores. It's It's Sears Sears Super Super Homeowners Homeowners Sale. Sale. Put a good dream to work and get real action, citizen action. We can clean up the world, starting with each and every community throughout the nation. Cars tuned away from pollution, the use of public transportation, the support of clean air laws. That's the big road to a real clean air dream come true. Help that dream now. Write your lung association for free information on how you can help. They bring you this public service message because they care about every breath you take. They've squared off. The man who controls the town and the woman newspaper editor who just naturally dislikes it when anyone controls anyone else. Mr. Broad? Jane, my, you've got town talking. Not only about the paper, but you, a woman working in a business. You know, Mr. Brott, until I went to work in a newspaper office, I'd seen only one woman ever working in an office. Her father was a prominent lawyer in the East, and he employed her as a clerk. Their office was sheltered away from the commercial area in their home, and yet it caused a painful amount of talk because of the remarkable circumstance of a female working in an office. Women are said to be a distraction in business. Oh, I know. I was pretty once. Why? I didn't mean... Don't be embarrassed. I know how I look. I lost my looks by working, emotional turmoil, and illness. But I was attractive. When I first worked in a newspaper office, I wore a scarf over my hair. One man even asked me why his wife had told him I had lovely hair. Woman's crowning glory. Well, why did you cover it? Never wanted to use feminine wiles in the business world, as it would have been interpreted. A woman should succeed or fail in the world, not on her charms, but on her ability. Oh, Napoleon, oh. Uh Uh-oh, Lowry. What? General Lowry? Oh, look at that horse. Thoroughbred. Johnny, where are you going? Morning, General. Good morning. Some fine horse. Very valuable. Can I look after him while you're inside? You, uh, Mrs. Swiss Helms boy? Printer's devil. (laughs) Well... Despite that, I'll trust you with Napoleon. Thank you, General. Thank you, General. He's just a lad, Jane. Who wouldn't be impressed with General Lowry? Morning, General. Brought. Mrs. Swiss Elm. General. Well, I, I must be going. What can I do for you? I want copies of your newspapers, ten of each in which I'm mentioned. As you know, you're mentioned in every one. Yes, I, uh, I want to send them to relatives and friends around the country... I've been informed that it's an honor to be attacked by Jane Grey Swisshelm. You're amused. Should I be angry? Many great men have been your target, I learn. Even Daniel Webster, your own northern hero. Not my hero. He wanted to continue this nation half-slave. But there's no compromise for Jane Grey Swisshelm, correct? No. Freedom everywhere, for everybody. So, freedom's the issue. Freedom such as, uh, oh, to take a hypothetical example... Freedom to desert a husband, break marriage vows. Sir, do you know one reason I strive to help the Negroes? Because I personally identify with them. Every married woman in this country can identify with slaves. Ma'am, I am perplexed. You say you own slaves. I say no person can own another person. I have explained slaves are property. The law says so. And so are wives. The law says so. We cherish our wives. And all ladies. Ladies, perhaps. When I started a school in Louisville for Negro children, some of the gentlemen there threatened to burn the building and tar and feather me. But then, I'm not a lady, just a woman. But I sincerely pray you are not a monster, General. My husband was not a monster either, just an average male in America today. He believed he owned me, his wife, and the law backed him. Uh, Mrs. Swishell, After I... I'd been married several years, making the living since my husband failed in business, my mother became ill. She was dying of cancer painfully. 
When I told my husband I wished to go to her, he said my duty was with him. And since she was dying anyway, he said it was no use my going. But I did. Against your husband's wishes? Against his command. And while I was attending my mother on her deathbed, my husband sent his mother to inform me that it was my duty to be with him, not my mother. So, not all women share your liberated views. Oh, true. Some women are the worst enemies of women's freedom. But I nursed my mother until she died. She'd been a poor widow for a number of years, and she left a pitiful estate next to nothing. But my husband sued to get that meager estate to pay for my services as a nurse when I was away from him. In other words, he felt, as you do, about your slaves, that I was a piece of property and any product of mine was automatically his. And it was a legal right. I and two other women fought to get the law changed in Pennsylvania. So now for the first time, a married woman there can own something in her own name. Think of that, General. For the first time, a person, a wife, can call something her own, not in the name of the man to whom she is married. I see no cause for rejoicing. Oh, I know, General. I know. That was the way some men reacted there. You would have thought I'd caused the fall of Rome. I came here, General, to Minnesota because I thought that on the frontier there hadn't yet been formed the prejudices and intolerances keeping anyone from being a free person. I want freedom for everyone. The black man, the red man, and women of all colors. Who appointed you the guardian of these big questions? My conscience. When I saw how few men took up the cause. Now, let's be reasonable, Mrs. Swisshelm. Now, you calm down, yourself and your editorials, and I'll see that this paper prospers. Good day, sir. Goodbye, ma'am. Thank you, Johnny. I love horses. Well, then why don't you come work for me? I can always use good help. I'll pay you more than you're getting here. That wouldn't be hard. Well, I, I'll think about it. You see the visitor, Shepley? Yes, sir. The visitor is more than ever an unwelcome visitor to this town. I didn't ask you here for banter. This Swiss Helm woman's newspaper attacks me viciously. My manner of living, according to her, I'm living in semi-barbaric splendor in an imposing house, keeping slaves brought and sent to the South with no man saying him nay, dictating the political destinies of his neighbors. She hints at crooked land deals. These aren't libelous. We can't get a court injunction. There's no way to stop her legally. Well, in that case... Another drink, Dr. Farmer? Thanks, Shepley. You lawyers can afford good stuff. When you have a client like General Lowry, you can. I'd like to be his personal physician. Should be in good fees. You can work for Lowry. <laughs> Shepley, can you see? Enough, General. It's so dark. Dr. Palmer, you have the axe? Use it. There, General. Easy as walking into your own home. Now, Palmer, take those drawers of type and throw them into the Mississippi. Shepley, you and I will have the pleasure of playing bull in the china shop. Destroy everything, starting with the press. This will stop Jane Grey Swissholm from printing any more lies about your being autocratic, General. I'm Susan Anton. It's a good feeling to sleep the night. Soft is the ultimate in sleep. Unique extra thick cushioning for heavenly comfort on top. Ultra firm support inside. Perfect sleeper pillow soft. Firmness that feels good. Be a perfect sleeper. Buy a perfect 
As we enter the 80s, Underwriters Laboratories has an important message for you. Keep up the good work. Yes, continue to be careful with electrical products. In the 80s, you're certain to be confronted by products requiring new precautions. To meet this safety challenge and to keep up the good work, we suggest always reading instruction booklets and using electrical products only for their intended use. A public service announcement of Underwriters Laboratories and this station. Lorne Green again, and here's the fourth act of Words, Words, Words. Oh, no. No. Who? I think we know who. Your hero, Johnny. General Lowry and his friends. When that man yells, stop the presses, he means it. Unless they smash this head, Mr. Brott, they won't stop me. We know who did it, but we can't prove it, and we can't print it. Oh, isn't it depressing? This mob action by professional men, the most educated, high-placed, privileged men in society, those who should most uphold the law and the peace of the state. Oh, Mr. Brott, I'm so sorry about your property. Oh, don't fret about that, Jane. But it's more than I can muster right now to set up the shop again. I have a few dollars put away. Thank you, Johnny, but we'll need quite a bit more than that. You know how poorly I pay you. I should kill him. I will. I'm going to shoot that General Lawry. Johnny, 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 now look. You could shoot him, and one of his friends would shoot you, and so it would go. And where would it go? Nowhere. The general is wrong if he thinks his sword is mightier than the pen. Well, how are you going to use your pen if you can't print the words? No, Mrs. Swisshelm, you're wrong. Words. Just words, words, words. Johnny... The best book in the world begins, in the beginning was the word. And I say that in the end, it'll be the word. The word will triumph. Use words to open eyes, to convince, to tell the truth. The truth? Yes, truth. Always tell the truth. The truth shall set you free. Tell the truth. But you admit you can't tell the truth about what Lowry did here. Maybe we should just let it lie. Yes, Jane. There's no disgrace in giving up in face of such danger. Men who'd smash a place like that, they they might not hesitate to... Well, I I won't say more. No, we can't give up. Well, if you're determined, I'll invite everybody in town to a meeting. We'll ask them to subscribe to a fund. Loan me the money to get the shop back in operation. It'll be the first town meeting we've had without General Lowry hanging over us. And I'll address the meeting. You, Jane? Miss Jane. Yes, Eliza. You remember the men back in Kentucky? The general, he might get his men to try and tie and feather you like they did down there. A lynch you. Jane, you mustn't go. Think of your child. I am. I know I've been a neglectful mother sometimes. Thank goodness for you, Eliza. But I didn't mean to be. And I'm doing this tonight for Nettie. And for all the young people who'll grow up to inherit... What we can leave behind, freedom. But being shot isn't what I'm frightened of. What then? I've never spoken to a public meeting. Citizens of St. Cloud, Mrs. Swisshelm. Last night... The St. Cloud visitor was put out of existence. The vicious action of hoodlums. An act of violence that you as citizens of this community cannot ignore. Some of you, many of you, have not agreed with my politics, my ideas, or with me personally. That doesn't matter. What matters is that a voice has been stilled. And if one voice, no matter how disagreeable, can be stilled... By vigilante violence in the dead of night, this town is no better off than if a band of murderers was free among you. For these men in a free land have killed a free press. Think on that. (laughs) 
Jane, more than 40 people subscribed to the funds. Yeah, they said things like, for the good name of the town. Intimidating a woman. Yeah, trying to intimidate. We'll be back in operation as soon as we get a press. Oh, isn't it wonderful? So many people backing our paper. <laughs> uh, begging your pardon, Mrs. Wishelm, but it isn't our paper or your paper. It belongs to them, the town. Mr. Broad, doesn't it look great? <laughs> the first new issue of the St. Cloud Visitor. Uh, it sure does. You two certainly move fast. That's the way we do things, fast. A new visitor this week, a new editor the next. What? I must go to St. Paul for the week to the Capitol to watch the Minnesota legislature at work. So, Johnny will be in charge here. <laughs> What are you doing here? Getting some advertising. What are you doing in here, Dr. Palmer? What does a man usually do in a tavern? Hey, thought your boss didn't approve of liquor. How come she's taking ads for a tavern? Well, she's gone for the week. I thought I'd get some more rev... Uh, Revenue, uh, is that what you're trying to say? Yeah. Street scamp. That woman has got things going again, huh? Uh, that woman, Mrs. Swisshelm, can't be stopped. Wasn't for want of us trying. <laughs> what? <laughs> Bulls in the china shop. The general ordering, Shepley smashing, and all of us knocking things this way and that way. You and General <laughs> Lowry and Shepley? <laughs> yes. And now I can afford all the drinks I need. Did you see the visitor? Of course, General. The headline. General Lowry and cohorts responsible for vandalism. Destruction of newspaper office. It gets worse. I know. I'm named in it. You're damn calm. General, this is our libel case. This will put that woman out of business. Legally. But, Mrs. Swisshelm, it's the truth. I know, Johnny. Prove it, Mrs. Swisshelm. But well, Dr. Palmer here told me... Oh, uh... Uh, would I tell anybody if I'd done a thing like that? Well, you would if you were drunk, which you were. Young man, don't add to this libel. I'll get him to tell the truth. No, Johnny, that's no solution. My lawyer has the solution. I have prepared the papers. What papers? Mrs. Swisshelm, we will drop the libel charges and the resultant payment of damages. Which would come out of the pocket or the property of Mr. Brott. Your terms? You will swear that you will cease publishing and never again publish the St. Cloud Visitor. Mrs. Swisshelm. Johnny, I cannot allow Mr. Brott to be ruined. You taught me how to write fairly well, and you drummed into me to tell the truth always. And I did. And now, this. Well, things don't always turn out as we expect them to. They don't for anybody. General, you know it was me that wrote that. I take the blame. Sign. All right. There you are. Good. Done. The St. Cloud visitor is dead. Mr. Brott, there are a few more papers to be signed. Oh, Since yes. this doesn't concern uh, me... General, wait a moment. I just signed the death certificate of the St. Cloud visitor. I thought you might wish to witness the signing of a birth certificate. A what? I'm selling Mrs. Swisshelm this print shop. There. I am sole owner. And editor. Editor? Of what? Of a newspaper, of course. But this document you states... You left a loophole a mile wide. I promised never again to publish the St. Cloud Visitor. Mr. Brott has been a sturdy rock through all this, and he's a Democrat. Although my leanings are to Mr. Lincoln's Republicans, I will honor my friend by naming my paper the St. Cloud Democrat. <laughs> But, 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 but you can't. I, I mean... This... General, you and Shepley have been outsmarted. Do you realize what you've done? Your paper illegally, libelously... Printed the truth about you. With no proof. And you're getting away with it without paying. So, Mrs. Swisshelm, I can't stop you by charming you, bribing you, using logic of the law. How can I deal with a woman like you? General, when I first went into newspaper work, some male editors started battles of words with me, more to twit me because I was a woman than for any real issues. They almost always lost. I remember one of them named George. He was finally told by a colleague, Brother George, beware of Sister Jane. How do you deal with a woman like me? 
by letting me alone to go about my work. The conclusion of our story after these words. Hi, this is Michael Landon. Are you the Michael Landon who talks about Kodak paper on TV? Yeah, that's me. Oh, I just love your commercials and your paper. Oh, thanks, but it's Kodak paper. Do you get your pictures printed on Kodak paper, too? Well, absolutely. I always look for you when I get them developed. Uh, you mean you look for the Kodak paper sign with my face on it? Yeah, because I always get Kodak paper where I see you. I'm um, it. Right. Well, nice talking to you. Yeah, what a handsome sign. <laughs> Look for the Kodak paper sign when you get your pictures developed. Ahoy there. This is your captain, Gavin McLeod, speaking. You've seen me on the love boat. But today, I'd like you to come aboard the membership and join the thousands of people who are helping the mentally retarded citizens live, work, and play in your community. Join up when the Association for Retarded Citizens has its Recruit a New Member Day. We need your help if we are to stay on course. As we say on the love boat, full speed ahead. General Lowry took Mrs. Swisselm's advice and let her alone. What happened to this innovator and freedom fighter? Well, she became a nurse in the crowded hospitals of Washington, D.C. during the Civil War. She was a close friend of Mrs. Lincoln. Then, Jane Gray Swisselm, who hadn't seen but one woman working in an office a few years before, worked for a government agency with hundreds of other women who were needed there as the country grew. She also edited a periodical, which was critical of Lincoln's successor, President Andrew Johnson. He had her fired. For a while, she lived in Chicago with her married daughter, Nettie. Then she retired to a small cabin in Swissdale, Pennsylvania, named for her husband's family, and died there in 1884, long forgotten by the big world in which she had been such a controversial figure. Oh, yes, I'd like to add that Jane is credited with a few other accomplishments, not quite as stunning as her defense of freedom of the press, but once there was a train wreck, and Jane proposed a safety measure to try to prevent more of the same. And that's why trains, ever since, have had a red light signal on the last car. Quite a woman, quite a person, this Jane Grey Swisselm. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of fine names to make Sears names stand for quality. Names you've always counted on, like Kenmore, Craftsman, Easy Living, and Die Hard. Names that kids and mo Winnie the Pooh and Tough Skins. Names that are a part of your life today, like Permapress, Klingalon, and Winner 2. And, of course, there's Sears Best Products in everything from T-shirts to tractors. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of truly dependable names to make our name. Sears Roebuck & Company. I'm Charlene Tilton. Bluegrass music has changed a lot since it was brought to this country by our ancestors. One thing that hasn't changed, though, since their time is the desire of most people to own a home. Before you buy a place, it's a good idea to learn about precautions. For free information on title insurance and other home buying precautions, write American Land Title Association, Box 566, Washington, D.C., 20044. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Words, 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 was written by P.M. Klepper and produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Lorne Green. Our stars were Mary Jane Croft, Tyler McVeigh, and James McCallion. Featured in the cast were Robert Doki, Ann Given, John Shea, Mady Norman, and Tommy Cook. John Harlan speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CVI.
Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you in part by Serta Perfect Sleeper Mattresses and Foundations with the top comfort and deep support for firmness that feels good. And that's a healthy investment in yourself. This is Andy Griffin. Tomorrow at this same time, by golly, we're going to work on your funny bone. Join us, won't you? Just for laughs. This is Lorne Green. The winter of 1878-79 saw near starvation in the Oklahoma Indian Territory. The food supplies promised by the United States government to those Indian tribes who moved onto the Oklahoma Reservation were cut back drastically. Of course, the very young and the elderly suffered the most. And the one logical solution to the food shortage, permitting Indian braves to once again hunt buffalo, was no longer possible. Because by 1879, the wanton slaughter of the buffalo had taken its toll. What had been the food staple of the Plains Indians was now on the verge of extinction. May the great spirit guide your hand, my husband. Do not worry, little tears. In ten suns, I return from the valley of tall grass with plenty buffalo. Enough food for all the people of our village. But broken hand of the Arapahoes did not return with buffalo. In fact, he did not return at all. After three weeks, the village chiefs began pressing little tears to act like a good wife and mourn her dead husband. Little Tears refused. She claimed that in a dream she had received a message from the Great Spirit. In her dream, Little Tears saw Broken Hand lying in a field of tall grass, injured and calling her name. Though the village chiefs believed Little Tears' dream was inspired more by grief than by the Great Spirit, they didn't prevent her from setting out alone to search for Broken Hand. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Little Tears by Bruce Martin. Our stars, Joan McCall, Hans Conried, and Len Berman. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you in part by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. And by the King Coil Posture Bond Mattress. Its unique bonded construction assures comfort and durability year after year. The King Coil Posture Bond Mattress. Product value. Sears Laboratories work to maximize that value for you. Its manufacturing consultants work with products and their manufacturers to cut production costs. One example is our Power Spray Carpet Cleaner. Its plastic parts require molds to form them. Molds are expensive, especially certain designs. So our manufacturing consultants recommended designs that cut mold costs. End result, a better value for you. Sears Laboratories. One reason Sears is where America shops for value. Want to get a peek at nature when nature isn't looking? Then visit a national park. If you want nature to really take center stage, plan a visit during the off-season. All you'll miss is the crowd. For your free copy of a list of national parks located near urban areas and served by public transportation, write Parks, National Park Service, Washington, D.C. That's Parks, National Park Service, Washington, D.C., 20240. This message from the National Park Service, U.S. Department of the Interior.
Darlington, Oklahoma. Agency headquarters, Indian Territory, 1879. The golden halo of a kerosene lamp spills across the desk of Indian agent John Miles. May the 18th, to Acting Commissioner William Leeds, Bureau of Indian Affairs. Dear Mr. Leeds, this letter is in response to your inquiry of April the 22nd requesting information on the significance of the Plains Indians' religious dreams. Recently, I heard a first-hand account of the extraordinary journey of my former agency staff interpreter, Mrs. Little Tears. Confirmation of the peculiar events which transpired during Mrs. Little Tears' journey come from a prospector, Mr. Gustav Kuntz, and from the Federal Assay Office in Denver. Yeah, look, looky here. There's a customer coming up the trail, Hugh. I can hear. <laughs> if it be another stone-broke prospector, I'm going back to bank robbers. Open your eyes. Ain't no prospector under that buckskin. We got us a squaw on a pinto pony. <laughs> well, at least we can get the pinto. The horse ain't my fever. I want the squaw. Catch hold of them rings. I got him. Take your hands off me. Hey, Huey. This squaw speaks civilized life. Oh, well, full of surprises and pleasures. Yeah. Let me drag her down into them bushes over there. I warn you, the great spirit protects me. Oh, maybe after Zeke and me are through, we'll be kind and send you to the great spirit. Stop. Get her horse out of the way. Get horse! Get! The great spirit will punish you. Oh, I'd be scared, real scared, squaw lady. <laughs> Me too. What was that? You! You! Oh, I'll be fine after I wipe the dust out of my eyes. <laughs> was that her great spirit? Can't you tell dynamite when it knocks you off your feet? Nine, I think not. Your friend has a thick head. Hey, careful with that scatter gun, old timer. Stay flat on the ground. Move and I will shoot. Now, nah, you just listen, old man. You just funny with that squaw. No, they lie. Their hearts are evil. They want to... Yeah, I know what they want. They are animals. <laughs> Well, you can't point that scatter gun all day. What are you going to do, old man? Yeah. Miss, these two wish to hurt you. What do you say I do with them? The great spirit sent you. It is for you to decide. The only thing that sent that kaiser your way was luck. Yeah. Good luck for you. Dead luck for him. Yeah. Put your guns on the ground. And stand on. Now, whatever you say. And slow me them guns on the ground or I shoot. Do like the old timer says, Zeke. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Now. now walk. Walk where? Down the mountain. What about our horses? Now, the dynamite chased your horses down the mountain. We're going to be coming back for you, uh, old man. Perhaps, but your guns stay here. Now keep walking or I shoot. Thank you. If you did not help me... No, I do not like those two. They are animals. I am called Little Tears. What is your name? Oh, Gustav Kunz. I come from Europe. You know where Europe is? Yes, sir. The land from where the white man come. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so... Now we must find your horse and leave. But first I... I fetch my horse and my mule. This dream, little tears, it, it comes every night to you? At night, or sometimes at day. And always you see your husband? Yes. In a field of tall grass lies my husband. I see blood on Broken Hand's legs. But why do you search alone for Broken Hand? Alone is very dangerous. The chiefs of my village do not believe my dream. It is not a good time in our village. 
our people starve. So the chiefs worry about finding food. They do not worry about looking for my husband. Yeah, yeah. And the Indian agent you work for, why did he not help you? If my village chiefs do not believe my dream, do you think Agent Miles would? Uh, I suppose not. I believe the Great Spirit has sent you to me. <laughs> oh, no, no. I return to my camp with my mule and my supplies. I, I have found no gold, but there is always tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, but uh, about you finding broken hand alone, I don't know. I believe the Great Spirit give me much medicine. I have my dream, and I have my medicine. I will find broken hand. This this medicine from the great spirit. Can, can you tell me what this medicine is? I can. It is you. Oh, I want him bad, Hugh. Real bad. So do I. But we can't light out after that engine lover till you catch hold of that horse of yours. Easy. Come on, easy, boy. I'd be the way to talk to a horse, Sig. Easy, 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 fella. And I figure we'll ambush the old timer. It'll be our Winchesters against his scattergun. Easy. easy. Lord knows a scattergun ain't got a nickel's worth of range. Ha! <laughs> I got him, you. Nope. Not a Nicholsworth. And uh, this mattress is called the what? The King Coil Posture Bond. You can't buy any better in our store. Well, it's very comfortable. Oh, yes, and you'll get firmness and durability year after year. Oh, gee, I wish my husband were here to try it out with me. Ooh, that's the best way. Oh, mm-hmm. say, that man over there, he's about the same size and weight oh, as my Excuse apple. me, sir? Yes? Uh, could you lie down on this King Coil Posture Bond mattress for a moment? Well, I'm just waiting for my wife Oh, it'll here. just take a second. She's buying a throw pillow for our breezeway. There you go. Now, let me get on the other side. Ooh, this Posture Bond is very comfortable. It's the unique construction of the King Coil posture uh, bond. See, could you throw your arm over me? That's what Walter does. Like this? Exactly. Now, could you put your foot in the small of my back? Okay. And the pillow over your head? All right. No matter how you scrunch up, this king coil posture bond is still firm and comfortable. Yeah, golly. You know what Shirley and I do? We sometimes... Hi, Shirley. I was just lying in bed here telling this lady how we... See, this is a king coil. She needed my foot to... Help. Try a king coil posture bond. Its unique bonded construction assures comfort and durability year after year. Indian agent John Miles dips his pen into the inkwell on his desk. And one senses a man lost in concentration. Agent Miles is lost. Lost in the retelling of Little Tears' dream. I submit, Mr. Acting Commissioner, that there is only one way to comprehend the fervent faith which Mrs. Little Tears placed in her dream... We must suspend personal prejudice against the mystic beliefs of the Plains Indians. We must attempt to view the religious significance of their dreams as the Indians themselves do, as time, time and the compilation of a series of unexplainable events, forced Gustav Kuntz to do. Are you sure you would not eat a little soup before I put out the fire? No, thank you, Gustav. Ah. Yeah, then, then we let the fire go out, yeah? You know, it is not good not to eat, little dears. You, you become weak. I have had no food since my dream began, seven suns from today. God in heaven, that, that's more than a week. Food is bad for dreaming. I drink water. Yeah, perhaps, but it is wrong, not good for the stomach. But very good for my dreaming. Good night, Gustav. Oh, yeah. Good night, little dears. Little tears. 
little tears. I am here, Broken Hand. Hurry, little tears, before the morning dew leaves the waking grass. Danger comes. Broken Hand, wait for me. I am coming to you. Hurry, little tears, for the evil ones come for you. You must hurry. The evil ones. Broken hand, broken hand. What is wrong, little tears? You call your husband's name in your sleep. Broken hand.、Uh, you're you're dreaming, eh? Yes. Broken hand came to me. He says we must leave this place. Oh yeah, yeah. We we go, but but first we have breakfast. No, there is no time. The evil ones come for us. Those two desperados must find their horses first, <coughs> and they have no guns. Oh, there's time for breakfast, I think. No, Gustav. An old man like me does not travel well on an empty stomach. And sit down, you be quiet. You have nothing to complain about. You ate breakfast, and, and the horses ate. Broken hand said, "We must leave." Now,、oh, little dears, my breakfast is ruined if we go now. I, I promise you, those two desperados are very far away. Gustav, perhaps the desperados are not so far away. I will ask the great spirit to protect us.、Uh, we need more than prayers. Oh, why did you not listen to Broken Hand's warning?、Uh, shh, listen, they stop shooting. Oh, great spirit, hear my words. We promise you we'll be back, old man. Gonna have us some fun before we kill you. Please guide my path. Lead me to my husband. This woman looks for her husband, who is a very sick man. Why not let her go? We don't care a damn about that squaw's husband. Yeah, yeah. Well, we got in mind that squaw. The great spirit has come. Oh, oh, what in God's name? The grizzly, the grizzly, it done come for me. Well, shoot the critter. I can, I can. I, I dropped my rifle climbing the tree. Well, hang on, you darn fool! I'm coming. Well, hurry, hurry! The grizzly is climbing the tree. Gustav, we may leave now. Yeah, yeah, it's a good time to leave. I, I, I do not believe it. But it is true, you have seen. But these things are only、uh, what is in English a coincidence. Yeah, it's only coincidence. The great spirit sent the bear to stop the evil ones, as the great spirit sent you to stop them, and now the great spirit leads me to Broken Hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perhaps you will believe when we find Broken Hand. Oh, little dears, I ride with you only until we reach the trail that goes to my camp, the Two Horns Trail. Two Horns is the burial place of my people. Ah,、uh, you are、uh, another coincidence. No, another sign from the Great Spirit. Gustav maintained that he was determined to part company with Mrs. Little Tears when they reached the mountain trail leading up to his mining camp. Though he had never found a trace of gold before, he still believed that his claim would one day make him rich, and he was anxious to return. What Gustav was not prepared for was another of Mrs. Little Tears' coincidences. When they reached the Two Horns Trail, the trail not only led up to his mining camp, but also overlooked the Valley of Tall Grass, Broken Hands' hunting ground. You can see the two horns from here. And somewhere down there, Broken Hand lies wounded. In that little valley, huh?、Eh? It is the valley of tall grass. See how the wild grass grows to touch the mountain? This is Broken Hand's valley, 
Yeah, I see, but, but the grass grows so tall, you, you may ride right by Broken Hand and, and never see him. I do not have to look for Broken Hand. He calls to me. Yeah, but, but you tell me Broken Hand has been hurt. Perhaps his wounds make him sleep, or, or he cannot speak. The Great Spirit leads me to the Valley of Tall Grass. Little tears. To find Broken Hand. Broken hand? What is happening? I am coming. Oh, no. No. Why now? Little tears, can you hear me? Yes. You saw broken hand again? Broken hand lives no more. He has gone to the spirit land. Winter's on the way, Zing. Just finished building our backyard greenhouse in time. Uh, Two men on a motorcycle, Zing, and they're headed this way. Mr. Saxton? Uh, It's Sergeant Braxton, Canadian Mounted Police Retired. This is my lead dog, Zing. He's retired, too. I'm Harold Quimby, and I'm here to tell you that your purchase of this house from my nephew, Marvin, is void. Oh? Marvin is a minor. He has no legal right to convey title to real estate. Hmm. Never met Marvin. Must have been off motorcycle racing. No one mentioned he's a minor. That makes no difference. Hey, man, since it's still my place, might as well get in some practice. Watch this! Look out! My greenhouse! Don't let surprise problems spoil your home ownership. Take precautions. For free information from the title industry, write American Land Title Association, Box 566, Washington, D.C., 20044. Indian agent John Miles stretches at his desk. For the first time, he notices the lateness of the hour. But oddly, that thought somehow eases the writer's cramp in his right hand. He dips his pen into the inkwell and continues Little Tears' story. Mrs. Little Tears led Gustav down the mountain into the valley of tall grass in silence. The premonition of her husband's death was a natural barrier against conversation. The dry, wild grass of that valley grew to the height of a man's shoulders sitting on horseback. But to Gustav's amazement, Mrs. Little Tears found Broken Hand's lifeless body on the crest of a small hill with unnerving directness. I am sorry, Little Tears. He has the face of a good man. My dream... Is answered. I have found Broken Hand. He must have been trampled, hmm? It would seem so. Broken Hand found the buffalo my people need. But the great spirit yeah, decided... Yeah, come, come, come. We wrap his body in the blanket and we bury him. Yeah? He must be buried at Two Horns with his fathers. Yeah, yeah, I, I help you. It comes again. with this thunder? fire spirit of this valley wakes. He walks broken hand to the spirit land. Yeah, well, we bury him and then we rest at my camp. Hey, 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 hey. Too much thunder, no rain. It ain't natural. Don't you worry. No rain for long. I just hope we find them two before it does. Well, we sure are going through a heap of trouble to square this thing. You back it out on me. I ain't said that. Hey, hey. That's engine singing. It's a squaw. Hey, Yanni, hey, hey, Yanni, yeah, 
little okay. tears. Okay. The horses, have you seen them? No. The horses and my mule, they, they've wandered away. I hear horses coming now. Uh, I'm, I'm old, my ears are not so good. Yeah. I guess you folks didn't oh. hear us riding up by the count of all that thunder. Now you just stay put, old man. Check where the old geezers got wrapped up in that blanket. Okay. Gee, it looks like a body. It's the body of her husband. Well, make sure he'd be dead then. You, you get away from that blanket, this squaw lady. This woman wishes only to bury her husband. Oh, I think I'm about ready to cry. Well, that ain't you dead or ain't he? <laughs> He's just dead as firewood. Oh, my Lord. That thunder just spooks my heart. You anger the fire spirit of this valley. We had enough superstitious engine talk out of you. All thunder, no rain. It ain't natural, I tell you. You see them black clouds <laughs> other side of the valley? There's your rain. The fire spirit comes for you. Well, by the time he gets here, all he's going to find is a dead squaw. No, no, wait. You kill us and, and you have nothing. Nothing but a pile of plenty. But I, I can make you rich, don't you? He's just talking, Hugh. Now let's get it over and let's ride. Oh, I fancy hearing a man beg for his life. Keep talking, old man. My gold mine. Gold mine in the mountain. He has got a gold mine like I got a Texas spread. You got any proof? The dynamite I saw out here, you, you, you remember? Just because he's carrying mining equipment don't mean he's got a gold mine. Say, speaking of equipment, where be your horses and that pack mule? They walk away, I don't know. I'm got a mighty huge. Oh, I told you to forget the damn thunder. It ain't nothing but fire! It's prairie fire. What do you mean, prairie fire? Them black clouds ain't no rain clouds. That'd be smoke. We gotta ride out of here, and I mean now. You would not listen to my warning. That's what must have spooked their horses. They smelled the fire coming. Listen, Hugh, I've seen prairie fire afar. Burns wild like the wind. Nothing can stand against it. Hey, look there. I can see the fire licking the tops of that tall grass. The wind is blowing right this way, and we have got to ride. I can hear the fire. Let's shoot them and ride. Shoot them, hell. I'm leaving them for the fire. They ain't got horses. Then come on. Hey! Caught in hammer. Gustav, we are safe now. Safe of it? We are trapped by the fire. The fire spirit will carry me to broken hand. Carry? No, we must find the horse. The great spirit led me to the valley of tall grass. So I would be with Broken Hand. He sends the fire spirit to carry me to Broken Hand. Mine, I must find the horses. Gustav, the great spirit will give you a place in the spirit land. Did not the great spirit send you to me? Yeah, perhaps, but not to die. Come, we must find the horses. Gustav, it is too late to run. I like to sleep till 10 o'clock each morning But when I do, my boss gets most annoyed The taste of Maxwell House, it gets me going Maxwell House, thanks to you, I'm still employed Maxwell House is Good wake up Maxwell House is Good morning Good to the last drop, Maxwell House Get your mornings going with the great taste of Maxwell House coffee Coffee you can count on Good to the last drop, Maxwell House we're doing a lot to save gasoline, and it's working. Keeping our cars in tune and our tires properly inflated helps us save even more. So keep it up, America. Keep it up, keep it up. You can great, you can save, and coming through and the going is tough. A public service of the U.S. Department of Energy and the Ad Council. Keep on doing your best. Green again, and here's the fourth act of Little Tears. 
The fire spirit is almost here. Yeah, well, I do not wish to insult your fire spirit, but please tell him for me that I do not wish to meet him. Yeah, the sort of being burnt to death. Oh, there's no escaping the prairie fire. If only... Oh, oh, that is my Sidonia. Perhaps she is with the horses. I must go see. You go, Gustav. The fire spirit comes to carry me to the spirit land. Where a broken hand waits for me. No, that is wrong. You tell me broken hand's body must be buried in his father's land, the two horns. That was before the prairie fire. Oh, come, Sidonia's there, calling to us. But it is too late. Oh, there's Sidonia and the horses by the water hole. We ride like the wind, or the fire spirit takes us. Help me with broken hand's body. <laughs> Gustav and Mrs. Little Tears fled the blazing wall of prairie fire for the safety of the nearby mountains. Their horses galloped with such fury that the ground trembled beneath them. The smell of ash and the heat of flame was enough to make Gustav's mule Sidonia keep pace. But the prairie fire followed at their heels with mercurial speed. They reached the mountains only because the wind, a strong gusting wind as Gustav remembered it, suddenly changed direction. Later, Gustav discovered that their perilous ride to safety was watched by the two desperados, Hugh Kelsey and his partner. There are just too many strange things happened to that squaw, for my comfort. Nothing what can't be explained. What about that grizzly bear? What, chased me up that tree? What made him turn tail and run? Bears don't run once the fight is in their blood. I shot at that bear. But you didn't hit him. If... If you're scared of some half-baked engine superstitions, why don't you come out and say it? I ain't scared. I just think it's mighty strange about that bear. And this wind... It's strange. The way this wind decided to swing around and... and turn back the prairie fire just when it looked like... like the squaw and the old man was was Garner's. Next, you'll be going on about the thunder. Well, I... I didn't like that thunder none too much, neither. You cutting loose on me. I ain't running out on you. But I say that it ain't worth it no more. And what if that old man weren't lying about that gold mine of his? Would that make it worth it? Well... Uh... Yeah, I reckon it might at that. <laughs> Let's get on their trail. Find out. If you prefer, the little tears, I-, I could tie Broken Hand's body to Sidonia. Sidonia can carry much weight. My husband's body belongs by my side. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Little tears. I wonder... Uh, yes? In the valley of the tall grass, you rode to the very place where Broken Hand's body was hidden. How did you know where to look? Broken Hand called to me. Yeah, in, in your dreams, I, I know that. But, but Broken Hand was already dead when we found him. Gustav, Broken Hand's spirit voice called to me. Ah, uh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, it's so very hard for me to understand. I know. Uh, it's not so far now. Soon we come to my camp. You have spent many snows in your gold cap? Two years. And still, I I find no gold. Gold must be dear to make you live all alone. Very dear. But with gold, I can send for my family and you. You have a wife? My wife is dead. But I have brother and his wife and their kinder. Uh, Michael is three. Little tears. Uh, Wolfgang is seven. Little tears, hear my words. I hear you, my husband. Man, I six now. Danger rides the trail behind you. 
Right for the two horns. Right against the wind. Broken hand, I wish to be with you in the spirit world. If you ignore the great spirit's warning, then the great spirit will not permit it. Tell the great spirit I wish to be with you. Make tracks before the evil ones catch you. Little tears, can you hear me? Gustav? Bogman spoke to you again? Yes. There is no time to lose. Uh, we must run from the evil ones. Come, we ride for my turn. We can hide in the mine! Look there, Hugh. There's, the day's making a run for it. Ain't no way we'll lose him this time. Well, how'd they know we was on that trail? Was to see us. They're heading for the camp. Oh, then the old timer. He, he wasn't lying about his gold mine. There. Squaw and the old man rode right into the mine. How are we gonna flush him out? Fire? <laughs> you missed what's lying on the ground yonder. Where? There. Hey, hey. Looky there. It's old geezer's scatter gun. Uh-huh. We can blast our way into the cave if we want. Oh, we are in much trouble. My gun. Somehow I lost my gun riding into the mine. Broken hand said we must ride to the two horns. This place is beneath the two horns. Perhaps the great spirit will help us once more. Yeah, yeah, I hope so, I hope so. But, but we must help ourselves, too, I think. Uh, come on, uh, help me untie Broken Hand's body from your horse. Yeah? Uh, 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 uh. We should uh, send the horses outside. Uh, 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 that's what I think, too. I, I send the horses out of the mine to the desperados. Uh, uh. And then? Uh, then dynamite. Zidonia carries the dynamite. I must get it from her pack. Oh, man. Come on now. Uh, go, horses, go! Hurry! It's not in there, Ronnie. Go, go, yeah, 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 I have the dynamite now. Send the mule out to them. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'll be the rain, Zidonia! Listen, how quiet they are. Yeah, yeah well, I have two dynamite stakes. Soon it will not be so quiet. No, 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 no. Ah! Gustav! Are you bleeding, old man? <laughs> Let's find out. Gone too quiet in here for comfort. I can't see a thing neither. You got a match? No, I ain't got. Look, huh? th 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 there's a light up ahead. Something lying on the ground by the light. What? Oh, ain't ain't that the blanket? The one the old timer buried the dead engine in? I can't remember. Stop trying to spook me. The light's getting brighter. That blanket moved. I told you to cut that spook stuff. Old man. Where you at, old man? The blanket did move. Well, shoot it. My God. It's a dead engine. Evil ones, your spirits will never rest. Ah! That engine ain't dead. He's alive. The conclusion of our story, after these words.
Save 20% on selected items in Sears Baby Shop. Now through September 13th, save on a crib or a high chair, a stroller, a cuddly Winnie the Pooh. Save on bedding, clothing, and more. There are lots of big savings for little ones. Save 20% now on selected items in the Baby Shop at most larger Sears retail stores, where America shops for value. Your little reasons are the biggest little reasons for shopping and saving at Sears. I'm sorry, so sorry. I'm Brenda Lee, and that's my favorite song. When I recorded it way back, I didn't dream I'd be a victim of kidney disease. Well, I was, and it meant a change in my way of living. But thanks to advanced methods of treatment, I'm leading a normal life today. So let's give others the same break. Support the Kidney Foundation with a generous gift of life. You won't be sorry. Gustav, it is little tears. Gustav? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm alive. Can you stand? No, no, the bullet. I'm bleeding. We go out of the mine where I can help you. There is a lantern by that wood support. Please bring that lantern to me. Yes. Is is there a match? Oh, yeah, yeah, I have. What, what happened to the desperados? Yeah, I remember nothing. Broken hand sent them away. Broken hand? Well, how? Animals like that do not believe in ghosts. Oh, you are wrong, Gustav. They believe now. Uh, the bullet scrapes my head, and then I... My, I remember voices, but, but then nothing. Uh, Where is uh, the match for the lamp? Uh, oh, 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 here, in this pocket there. You have it? Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, what... Wh- What did Broken Hand do? Broken Hand came back from the spirit world. He showed the evil ones his spirit, and the evil ones rode away very fast. They will not be back. (laughs) Ah, little dears, it's it's very hard for me to believe. Even after, after all you and I have been through... Why else would the evil ones run? Yeah, it is true, but I cannot believe that they go. Gustav, what is wrong? The wall. You better come outside. No, no, hold the lantern up against the wall. Up here? Yeah. Oh, God in heaven. Gustav, what is it? Gold. The whole wall is streaked with gold. Gold? My heart is very happy for you. Now let me see to your wounds. But you, you do not understand. The wall was not gold before you. You and broken hand come to me here. It is a miracle. No, Gustav. The gold is a gift from the great spirit. Now, let me see to your wounds. Gustav's head wound proved only superficial. The next day, he and Mrs. Little Tears placed Broken Hand's body in the burial ground of his ancestors atop Two Horns Peak. Enclosed... You will find an analysis by the Denver Federal Assay Office of the gold content in Gustav's mine dated May 11, 1879. Please note that Gustav's gold is the purest ever discovered in our 39 United States.
Feeling fit feels so good. Firming up the way you know you should. Fitness by day that feels so right. Needs firmness that feels good every night. Be a perfect sleeper. Buy a perfect sleeper. Perfect sleeper by Serta. Hi, I'm Susan Anton. When you buy a Serta Perfect Sleeper, you get a mattress and foundation that provide the top comfort you want and deep support you need night after night. Plush layers of comfort cover Serta's famous patented construction. That's top comfort with deep support. You get both with every Perfect Sleeper. So remember, fitness by day that feels so right needs firmness that feels good every night. Be a Perfect Sleeper. It's a healthy investment in yourself. The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Little Tears, was written by Bruce Martin and produced and directed by Fletcher Marco. Your host was Lorne Green. Our stars were Joan McCall, Hans Conried, and Len Berman. Featured in the cast were Dawes Butler and Ed McNamara. John Harlan speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you in part by CERTA, perfect sleeper mattresses and foundations, with the top comfort and deep support for firmness that feels good. And that's a healthy investment in yourself. This is Andy Griffin. Tomorrow at this same time, by golly, we're going to work on your funny bone. Join us, won't you? Just for laughs. This is Lauren Green. One of the things that most perceptive people on this earth are concerned about is shortages. Shortages of one kind or another, whether it be gas, grain, drinkable water, air to breathe, or whatever it is our planet is running out of. Our story concerns itself with one of the most valuable resources our planet has ever produced. People. It's a story that should be visualized with two distinct considerations in mind. One is a consideration for what has happened. The other, for what might happen again. If it is not already happening somewhere in the world to another group of people... People like Eno, the last man of his tribe. The sound of the town's dogs first alerted the people of Brochville to the fact that there was a stranger in their midst. It was a warm August morning in 1901. What in tarnation are those curs yapping about? Sure. Sheriff, come quick. We got a wild engine cornered down at Johnny Bob's corral. What? An engine, you say? Yep. Looks like a real wild one. The people of Brochville, California, had no way of knowing on that particular August morning in 1901 that they were about to become the historical backdrop for one of the most unusual events ever to happen on the face of the earth. They were to be the witnesses to the beginning of the end of the life of Eno, the last man of his kind. 
And that, unfortunately, is how we begin our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Eno, the Last Man, by Odie Hawkins. Our star, Shepard Mencken. Mutual Radio Theater is being brought to you in part by Maxwell House Coffee. Coffee you can count on. Maxwell House, always good to the last drop. I like to sleep till 10 o'clock each morning. But when I do, my boss gets most annoyed. The taste of Maxwell House, it gets me going. Maxwell House, thanks to you, I'm still employed. Maxwell House is... Good wake up. Maxwell House is... Good morning. Good to the last drop. Maxwell House. Get your mornings going with the great taste of Maxwell House coffee. Coffee you can count on. Good to the last drop. Maxwell House. This is Steve Allen to tell you about Choice Magazine Listing, a free service for the blind and others with a sight handicap. Sponsored by the nonprofit Lucerna Fund, Choice Magazine Listing brings you, on phonograph records, eight hours of selections from leading magazines. It's all free, six times yearly. So for more information, write Listening, Box 10, Port Washington, New York, 11050. That's Listening, Box 10, Port Washington, New York, 11050. The townspeople of Brochville had no real way of knowing or appreciating the idea that they were capturing and imprisoning the last member of a tribe, of a people. Eno was an Indian, an enemy from their recent past, not a person to be approached with a tremendous sense of logic, care, or humanity. Watch him. He might have a weapon. That's not too likely, Clem, that he'd be able to do too much damage with ropes around every part of his body but his toes. Well, you can't ever be too careful. No telling. What I can tell from the look of him is that he's in need of a good meal. Well, who is he? Where'd he come from? One of them wild ones we've been seeing for years. Caught him down in Johnny Bob's corral, stealing horses. Well, let's not be jumping to too many conclusions. All we got to go on for now is that he was cornered down in the corral. Remember, this is still America where a man is assumed innocent until proven guilty. Oh, come on now, Sheriff. What would an engine be doing around the corral except a steel horse? We don't have any evidence to back that up yet. Well, what more evidence do you need? We caught him right-handed. We didn't catch him doing nothing but trespassing. Well, he looks guilty as sin to me. Look at his shifty eyes. Hey, you can't tell nothing about a man from his eyes, Clem. Half the men in this town got shifty eyes. I say we ought to have a trial right here and now and string them up. You're right, right now, in front. Now, hold on, hold on here, just hold on. This town didn't elect me sheriff to preside over a kangaroo court in the streets. Now, either you want law or you want lynchings. If you want lynchings, you don't need me. We don't want lynching, sheriff, you know that. But we want to see justice done. Now, what are you going to do with him? What am I going to do with it? Well, uh, uh, I'm going to place him under protective custody while I investigate the charges against him. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I sure hope your investigation proves what we've been telling you, Sheriff, about this fella being a horse thief and all. My investigation will prove whatever it proves, and that'll be that. Now, let's break it up and go on about our business. Oh, oh, that is Zeke, you stop over to Wild Biscuit Betty's and tell her to bring a dinner over to the jail. There. Hope you won't find that bunk too soft for you. The last guy we had in here complained it was too hard for him. Now then, there's just the two of us. You can level with me. What were you doing down in Johnny Bob's corral? Tinker, noca, ino. Now look here, fella. Uh, 
let's have an understanding. I saved you from a pretty bad time out there, and it wouldn't take too much for them bullies to... Tika bow, stop, kos, koro. Come in. We'll get back to this. Howdy, Sheriff. Rushed over as soon as Zeke told me. This the guy? Looks like he could stand a good meal. Well, I hope you didn't bring more than half a dozen of those rock-bellied biscuits. We'd hate to see this poor guy stuck to the floor. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but jokes about my biscuits no longer hurt me. What tribe's he from? What's his handle? He won't say. He keeps mumbling some kind of weird tongue noise. Or... Ever occur to you that he might not speak our lingo? Or something to think about. Meanwhile, let's see what he thinks of my vittles. Uh, he, you better let me hand it in to him. There you go, bub. Plate of wild biscuit Betty's chicken and dumplings. Mm, yeah, it smells pretty good, Betty. Think I'll trot over for a helping myself in a little while. <laughs> now that's what I call real enjoyment. Nasca. Ulo. Nasca. Ulo. Finally found somebody in town who doesn't joke about my grub. What do you make of him, Sheriff? Don't too much favor any of the engines I've been used to seeing. He does seem like a different type, don't he? Why do you think his hair is cropped close like that? You'll have to see Amos about that. He's in the barbering business. I'm in the restaurant business, which is missing me right now. Now, I'll see you later, Sheriff. Yeah, I'll see you in a while. Now then, my friend, now that the wrinkles have been ironed out of your belly, let's palaver. Who are you? Where'd you come from? Tinka, Noka, Ino. Well, I guess Betty's right about one thing. Looks like we're going to have to find someone who speaks your lingo. Tinka, Noka, Ino. Ino! You know, I've heard it said that you can't buy quality anymore. Well, that's not true about gloves. Wells Lamont has been making quality gloves for over 70 years. It still takes three inspections by hand before Wells Lamont puts their name on a pair of gloves. Look for the white mule trademark that says, Wells Lamont is stubborn about quality. Stubborn about quality, Wells Lamont gloves. Without trees, where would country life be? We'd have to breathe the smog and be stuck in the city. Without trees, where would our music be? We couldn't play our banjos and guitars for company. Trees have always been a part of good old country living. So when you're in the backwoods, do us all a favor. Help prevent forest fires. This country songs could not last long without trees. A public service of this station, the Smoky Bear Program, and the Ad Council. The story of Eno, the last man, continues. Well, what do you make of him, Sheriff? I don't know what to make of him. We had Squaw Man Jones in here to try to palaver with him. Squaw Man Jones speaks just about every engine lingo you can think of, and he got no words. Can he speak at all? I ain't heard a peep out of him since you stuck him in that cell five days ago. Boy, he can talk. Every morning at dawn, he says something loud and clear. Sounds like a prayer or something. Well, what are you going to do about him? Clem and the boys are getting a mic touchy about their tax money being used to feed our horse thief. Now, here we go again. I've told Clem and all the rest of them we ain't got no proof that this guy was trying to steal anything. So far, the only thing we can definitely prove is that he was trespassing. Okay, he was trespassing. What are you going to do about it? Well, I ain't decided yet. Give me another day to think on it. Like I said, Sheriff, Clem and the boys... Yeah, they... yeah, yeah, okay, Clem and the boys already told me. Now get. Well, they know about anything. Here we got a guy in the Huska that I can't even get a confession from because he can't talk our lingo. We're going to have to do something about you pretty soon, my friend. Something. Meanwhile, it's my time of day for a siesta. Yeah. I 
sit here, and my heart hurts with the many memories that wash through me. I cannot yet speak in their tongue, but in my own tongue, I think of the happy times when there was fish to catch in the streams, deer to be killed for their sweet meat, rabbits, food of the forest, gifts from the great mystery, and then gradually less and less of everything, fewer people every year. No children born, no new blood. How did it come to that? How did I come to be the last man of my nation? Sheriff, mm. wake up! You got visitors. Oh, Lord, Dad, bless it. Man can't even get a little snooze in the heat of the day without somebody bothering him. Open up! We know you're in there. Sorry to wake you up, Sheriff, but these two strangers expressed a real great interest in seeing our captive wild man. Uh, sorry to disturb you, Sheriff. My name is Dr. Jonathan Martin. This is my wife, Nan. How do you do? Pleased to meet you, folks. What can I do for you? I told you, they want to see our wild man. Uh, let me explain, Sheriff. Uh, I'm an anthropologist. A what? And, uh, an anthropologist. Well, what in tarnation is an anthropologist? An anthropologist. Is someone who studies man, his infinite variety, physical and cultural characteristics, customs, language, social relationships, especially of non-literate people. Oh, so that's what an anthropologist is. I'm proud to say that my husband is one of the best in the world in his field. Oh, thank you, dear. That's very gracious of you to say so. Now, may we take a look at your wild man? Well, sure, why not? Uh, what brings you folks through this neck of the woods? Uh, we've been aiding Professor Evans uh, over on the Snake River Reservation uh, with a language classification project, and we found out that you had a, had someone called a wild Injun in jail, and so here we are. He is pretty wild-looking, ain't he? Jonathan, do you... Do you think that... Uh, I don't know. I don't know yet, but... Don't know what? <laughs> well, has anyone been able to converse with this man? Well, Squaw Man Jones who speaks just about every Indian tongue around, including a little French. He couldn't get through. Uh, Eno? Ska! Eno! Tinka noka Eno! Well, I'll be. Will you look at that? He's actually smiling. What'd you say to him? You find out what he was doing in Johnny uh, Bob's corral. Oh, no, no, hold on, Sheriff. I just said the only word I know in his language, <laughs> which hardly qualifies me to ask a lot of questions. Jonathan... Is he a Yana? Mm, I, I can't say yet, but we'll have to Is he a what? The... What are you folks talking about? Now, let's all shoot straight. There's a strong possibility that the man you have in this cell may be the last of his kind. I don't quite understand, ma'am. we got heaps of engines around here. <laughs> Not like this one, Sheriff, unless I'm badly mistaken. Well, I'm beginning to think I ought to get on back across the road to my restaurant. Bacon biscuits is what I understand best. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, maybe I can clear this up without uh, becoming too technical. Well, let's say that we were in Europe. All, all the people are Europeans, French, Germans, Dutch, Danish, etc., etc. And everyone in the French branch of the family died. Now, all except for one Frenchman. This man, I think, is a Yana, the last Frenchman, as it were. Well, mercy be to heaven. Now, I, I'm not certain yet. Uh, we'll have to investigate. What did you say to him? The only word I knew of his language, man, Eno. Tinkanoka Eno. Eno. Product value. Sears Laboratories work to maximize that value for you. Its manufacturing consultants work with products and their manufacturers to cut production costs. One example is our power spray carpet cleaner. Its plastic parts require molds to form them. Molds are expensive, especially certain designs. So our manufacturing consultants recommended designs that cut mold costs. End result, a better value for you. Sears Laboratories. One reason Sears is where America shops for value. In my country, I have seen grown men too weak to walk and nursing mothers with no meal for their babies. In Cambodia and in refugee camps in Thailand, the people are suffering. 
Just one dollar from you can help buy the medicine they so desperately need. This is Pearl Bailey in Cambodia. Your dollar is priceless. Please give today to the National Cambodia Crisis Committee, P.O. Box 242, Washington, D.C., 20044. Where's that dollar, honey? There are not many people in the world who find themselves forced to cope with the unimaginable. But then there are not many people in the world like Eno. Jonathan. Yes, dear? I hate to disturb your work, but I simply must talk to you. It's about Eno. Oh, what about him? I hardly know how to put it into words. The incredible loneliness I feel that I think he feels ever since we brought him here to live with us. I mean, there are times when I think we should have simply bailed him out of that jail cell and released him to the mountains. Now, we're not holding Eno captive, my dear. Now, remember, he came with us voluntarily. Now, I understand how you feel, and I have that feeling, too, from time to time. You do? Well, certainly. But I find it necessary to put it aside and, and to look at the brighter side. I mean, here with us, he has companionship, friends... In the forest, he, he would have been alone, completely alone, and he would probably have died alone. I know what you're saying is true, but still... Oh, no. One has to feel deeply for someone who stepped out of one life into another alone. My people wanted only to be left alone, to live the life we knew best, in harmony with all things... And the great mystery. But that was not to be. We did not want to leave the mountains, the places where our ancestors' bones rested. And so, over a period of time, we were surrounded by people of the white tribe and forced to move higher up in the mountains to avoid contact. We, Yana, were never too many. And in a few moons... We became fewer, always fewer. Food was scarce. We lived like coyotes and wolves for years. One day, under the stress of hunger, one of our young men killed one of the white tribe's animals, the big horned beast with the udders. We feasted for days. And when the feasting was done, we had to move higher into the mountains because the white tribe came after us with fire sticks. There. Think I got one. Dirty varmint, stealing cattle. Some of us were killed by the fire sticks. Some of us were killed by the animals. Run, run, it's a she bear and her cubs. The great mystery took some of us away. The great mystery took my wife, Suna, from me. I am going. I am going. I can already see behind the beyond. I have tried to be all that I could be to you, living as we live. And you have been all things to me. But I did not give you sons. If only we had had children... I buried five other people of my nation before I buried my wife. And later, five others. And finally, suddenly, I was alone. Alone. No words in any tongue can ever tell the story of my loneliness. We, Yana, have always been a family people. And now, there was no family. No one to talk with, share experiences with. I wandered the mountains for three moons, searching for another Yana. Amos, you see that? Just a flash. What was it? I ain't sure, but it looked like a man. I think you better stay away from the corn. What kind of man could be living up here in all this snow? Yeah, I guess you got a point there. Well, come on, let's check out the rest of these traps. It'll be stark raven dark in another couple of hours. 
after three snows, my loneliness became so great, I decided to go down the mountain into the white tribe's village. I knew they might kill me, but I did not care. I felt they would be doing me a good deed. The great mystery would not allow me to kill myself. I cropped my hair with a flint knife, smeared ashes on my face, and in the custom of our people, walked down the mountain, singing my death song. Nan, Nan. Calm down, dear. What is it? We're beginning to make headway, Eno and I. We understand each other. And he, he's beginning to reveal things to me this morning. Very casually, with words and gestures, he began to give me the Yana First People legend. Well, it seems that in the beginning, according to their uh, creation legend, two arrows were shot from a bow by the great mystery. And as they fell to earth... They were separated. The arrows became lonely, and they began to look for each other. And, and then when they... they found each other, they were so overjoyed, they asked that the great mystery send more arrows. Uh, uh, how, how did you... He spoke to me about it yesterday. Oh, I see. Oh, don't be angry, dear. He just seems to feel that I'll understand some things better than you. <laughs> It's incredible sometimes. It, uh, you know, I, I think the man must be some some sort of genius. I mean, can you imagine how it would be if we suddenly found ourselves forced to live where he was, where he came from? No, I don't think I'd be too successful. But let's face it, he hasn't quite gotten the hang of things in San Francisco either. I took him grocery shopping with me yesterday. Did I tell you about that? So many people. So many tribes. Maybe if I look closely, I might discover a Yana. No. No, that would not be possible here. There are too many people. And besides, no Yana would live in this manner. What do you think of the coconuts, Eno? Coconuts. Oh, you don't know what a coconut is, do you? Here, we'll buy one. So much meat, so many different kinds, behind a clear wall. You know, you look puzzled. You're probably trying to figure out how it got behind that glass and who killed that meat. Yes. Well, um, let me assure you, it's a pretty involved process. I've discovered that he thinks glue and matches are two of the greatest inventions in the world and has no problems with either one. <laughs> but have, have you watched him try to deal with the window shades? He just can't seem to get the knack of it. And how peaches get into cans. You know something, dear? I found myself trying to puzzle out quite a few things I used to take for granted. How do peaches get into a can? <laughs> how do peaches get into cans? Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, well. Oh... Well, it's quite a process, too complicated to explain. I see. Uh, Nan, are you coming to the demonstration tomorrow? To see how a fire is made with sticks and birds are talked into a cage? I wouldn't miss it for the world. How kind the bookman and his wife are to these strangers. They... They explain things to them that I cannot explain. As you can see, ladies and gentlemen, the making of fire is an extremely arduous task. They are like gifts from the great mystery, these two. I think if it were not for them, I would not be alive. There, as you can see, ladies, you have a nice little fire to cook with. Oh, isn't that it? It is interesting to see how these people see things. I wonder how they made fire before they had the little sticks that light up. What is love? Yes. What love? Uh, do you want to answer that, dear? Oh, I'm afraid I popped in a bit late in the conversation. Uh, what is he asking? From out of the blue, our friend here asked, wife of the bookman, what is love? How would you answer that? Hmm. Well, it uh, depends on, on, on what kind of love we're talking about. You know, what kind of love uh, did you have in mind? Love. Oh, you mean the big kind. Love. 
Eno, love means that people care for and respect each other. Eno, love you. And we love you too, Eno. Yes. We love you too. Very much. Well, how is he? If my expert diagnosis is correct, I think he'll live. What's the problem? I mean, should we call Doc Larson? I hardly think a hangover warrants calling a doctor. Uh, a hangover? The signs are unmistakable. But, but, but how? I, I mean, I'm pretty what? certain he got the idea from watching you sip your after-work sherry. Welcome to civilization, you know. I felt very strange after drinking four glasses of the bookman's special water... It was as though my head was being drummed and my stomach was full of wrestling snakes. I felt I needed something. I needed help from the great mystery. Jonathan. Jonathan Eno's gone. Gone? Where? I don't know. I took a tray of fruit to his room knowing that he wouldn't feel like sitting at the dining room table and he's gone. Oh, my lord. In the middle of San Francisco at 8 o'clock on Saturday night. And there's no telling what might happen to him. L- let me get my coat. We'll look for him. I hope nothing happens to him. The Singer Sailathon is on. Pass it along. The Singer Sail Along is on a thon? At Singer Now, save $150 off regular price on one of the world's easiest to use sewing machines, the Touchtronic 2001 Memory Machine with 27 built in stitches. Or save $120 off regular price on the Touchtronic 2000 Machine with 25 stitches. Don't pass it by. The Singer Store where saving is always in store. Price is optional at participating dealers. I'm George Kennedy, here to tell you about a remarkable machine. It's both a communications device and a food processor, and its beauty can be dazzling. It's built to last the life of its owner, requires no electricity or gasoline, just healthy foods and regular cleaning. I'm talking about your mouth, especially your teeth and gums. With all they do for you, aren't they worth a little care? For a free brochure on how to become a wise dental consumer, write the American Dental Association, Chicago 60611. Lorne Green again, and here's the fourth act of Eno, the Last Man. Well, don't you stand out there peeking in. The doors swing in and out. Come on in. (laughs) My goodness, you certainly got a beautiful head of hair. (laughs) Wish mine would grow that long. Well, maybe if I stop bleaching. (laughs) Well, how about buying a girl a drink? Where are you from? I am Eno. Yana people. Long way from home, huh? How about a couple of fingers of red eye, stranger? Couple of fingers red eye? That'll be just dandy. Mm-hmm. There you go, folks. That'll be four bits. Pay the man, honey. Have no money. Hey. What's with this guy, Maisie? Is some kind of joke? He orders two fingers of my best rye whiskey and says he got no money to pay. I'm not order. Is this your idea? Some kind of joke? Going around asking for drinks and not paying for them? Not ask. She ask. Well, I beg your pardon. Hey, Bruno. Come over here and throw this long-haired bum out of here. Oh, and I hope I never see you again. Nothing in the world I hate worse than a deadbeat. No, where have you been? We've been looking everywhere for you. Oh, my goodness. He has blood on his shirt. Here, help me get him inside. How is he? Sleeping. Doc Larson sewed his scalp up and gave him some medicine to put him to sleep. He'll be all right. Good. Would you like a cup of tea? <sighs> yes, a cup of tea would be most welcome. Jonathan. Mm, yes, dear? What is it? We must do something for Eno. Do something? I don't quite understand. Oh, I've been thinking about it for the last year that he's been with us. You've studied his language. 
I've learned how to sew with the whiskers from a catfish. You've taken him to the museum to have him demonstrate his way of fire making, his way of a, making a strong bow. We all of us have taken his life apart and placed it under a microscope because he is such an exotic human being. The last one of his kind. Why did he run away? He didn't run away. He was ill in a way that was unusual to him. And so he went to seek help from what his people call, or from what his people used to call, the great mystery. And he returns with a gash in his head that requires ten stitches to close. Now, that's what I mean by the unfairness of it all. It just seems like such an unfair exchange. He explains the meaning of the turning of the leaves in autumn. How to use certain herbs to cure stomach aches and relieve high blood pressure. In return, we give him a gash in the head. Oh, it isn't right to put matters in such a one-dimensional light, Nan. I'm surprised at you. Well, of course there are a lot of things wrong with our civilization. Uh, but there's also a good deal to be proud of. I mean, have you ever watched Eno explain how cold he was up in the mountains when it wasn't possible to make a fire? Uh, I'm sure he, he would have given anything for a wood-burning stove or a couple of boxes of matches. I know. I do know, Jonathan. I just get so frustrated sometimes thinking about the number of things we can't share with him. And he can't share with us. Be specific. Oh, you and your scientific mind. All I can think about is the difference between us, this this Stone Age man and ourselves. I thought you were going to be specific, and I fail to see what... Can't you see? We're giving him a... An imitation of everything that he's always had naturally. Ever since we first met Eno, we've asked him to come into our world, to understand it, to be a part of it. Why don't we offer him the opportunity to take us into his world? That's a very good idea. Well, why didn't I think of that? Nan, my dear, you are a genius. No, darling. Just a woman. Just a woman. Well, I'll be hornswoggled. If it ain't the wild man, all dooted up and all. Howdy, Dr. Martin, Ms. Martin. What brings you folks back this way? How long's it been? Two years, Sheriff. Almost two years. Hey! It's the wild man! I am not wild. I was never wild. You hear that? He speaks our lingo now. Well, dog my cat, so he does. How you been, bub? How's life in the big city? Now, hold it down, hold it down. Let's give the doc a chance to talk. Now, Ann, what brings you and the wild man His here? His name is Eno, Sheriff. Oh, yeah, sure enough. Well, what are you folks doing around here this time? Well, we're trying a little experiment, Sheriff. We've decided to offer Eno a chance to give us a taste of what his life was like up in the mountains. Up in the mountains? Well, up in the mountains, down in the valley, wherever. I know you folks must have stirred up a right sharp appetite getting here. Come on over to the restaurant. I'm dishing up son-of-a-gun stew today. And fresh biscuits made from scratch. Oh, no. Nasca. Ulo. Nasca, Ulo. How's that, Eno? What'd you say? I said, it is good. It is good. You know something? That's one of the first things I noticed about you right after we met. Your serious appreciation for the finer things in life. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I never would have believed it, not in all my born days, that one human being could have gone through so much and come out whole. Says a great deal for the power of the human spirit, doesn't it? Indeed it does. I hate to be the one to call this delightful evening to an end, but uh, we should be seeking accommodations in order to start out fresh early tomorrow. Don't need to go no further than upstairs, Dr. Martin. Didn't you notice? Wild Biscuit Betty's Restaurant and Borden House is what that washed-out sign says. Hope your beds are not as hard as your biscuits. Guess I'll just have to go along with that comment coming from someone who just ate half a dozen of them. <laughs> How strange it is. I stand here at this window, looking up at the places I used to look down from. 
Once I was out there, alone. Now I am inside with people who love me. The bookman and his wife want to know something of the life I had, the life my people had. <laughs> what can I show them? Can I show them the caves we starved in? The places where we huddled close together, trying to keep warm without fire, where we were afraid. How can I explain the feeling we Yana people had for each other, the warm looks we had for those who were good hunters and fishermen? No, I cannot explain that. It cannot be explained. I must not stay with the sad things. The sad things would make us unhappy. I will take them to the mountains, into my old home, and explain as much as I can of what the great mystery revealed to the Yana. <coughs> so many beautiful, good things. The glow of the sun at the end of the day and at the beginning. The taste of honey after the bees have been smoked out of their home. The love songs of the birds. The way the deer step through the forest, each tiny foot placed just so. The taste of trout, fresh from the stream. There is much that I can show them, much I can teach them about my home. <coughs> I, I will show the bookman's wife which greens are good for the cooking and where to find the right herbs for tea and medicines. I will make two bows and some arrows, and show the bookman how to stalk the deer and rabbits. I will teach them everything I can. <clears throat> but above all, I will teach them to be careful of all humans on the earth. All humans of all colors and kinds. <coughs> <coughs> The conclusion of our story, after these words. Hi, I'm Susan Anton. Fitness that feels good by day needs firmness that feels good by night. That's why you'll love the Serta Perfect Sleeper. Luxurious top comfort plus deep inner support. You get both with every perfect sleeper. So remember, be a perfect sleeper. It's a healthy investment in yourself. Mom, aren't the cheeses here in Europe fantastic? Mm-hmm. I'm taking some back home on the plane. Oh, are those cheeses cured? I didn't know they were sick. Oh, honey, uncured cheeses and many other fresh dairy products are prohibited from entry into the States. What? It says so in Traveler's Tips, that free booklet the travel agent gave us. Oh, my one little cheese won't hurt. Oh, it says here even one can hurt. Ask your travel agent or write Traveler's Tips, USDA, Washington, 20250. It's free. I felt myself to be part of some strange dream when the bookman and his wife brought me back to Yana land. I never thought that I would see those mountains and smell the good, clean air again. During the time of the moon that we spent in my home, I took long walks alone at night while they were sleeping to visit the graves of my people and my wife. <coughs> I did not take the bookman and his wife to the resting places of my ancestors because it would not have been right. The elders were not alive to give their permission. Even though I could not explain everything I wanted to explain to the bookman, I think I gave him at least two hands worth of understanding of how the Yana once lived. <laughs> I 
feel certain that I made them understand how precious all life is. <coughs> Don't, don't cry. He's he's become a part of his great mystery. Uh, Dr. Martin, I hate to have to ask you questions at a moment like this, but, well, you know how it is. Uh, should we list you and Mrs. Martin as the next of kin in his obituary? And could you please give me the correct spelling of his name, sir? We, we called him Eno, E-N-O, meaning man in the Yana language, because his, his tribal taboos prohibited him from saying his own name. Next of kin? No, don't list us. You may say that we had no next of kin. No kin at all. This story, or a facsimile of it, may have happened. Or it may be happening somewhere in our world this year. Today. Every day, more of you decide to shape up, build up, tighten up your body. And now at Sears, we're having a sale on the physical fitness equipment you need. A single leg lift weight bench with five position incline back is now $20 off. A 177-pound weight set is also $20 off. But hurry, both are on sale only September 7th to the 20th. At Sears, we want you to build a body you're proud of and save $20 to $40 while you're doing it. Hello down there. This is Alexander Hamilton. As the founding father who was first secretary of the treasury and an all-round businessman, I urge today's businessmen to join the team of employers who encourage employee participation in guard and reserve training. Employees who serve on national guard and reserve teams make better team workers for you. The man whose face is on your $10 bill wouldn't lie to you. Write employer support Arlington, Virginia, 22209. Oh, what a team. Oh, what a team. A public service of this station and the Advertising Council. The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Eno, The Last Man, was written by Odie Hawkins and produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Lorne Green. Our star was Shepard Mankin. Featured in the cast were Barney Phillips, Virginia Gregg, Larry Moss, Helene Winston, Don Diamond, and Ed McNamara. John Harlan speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you in part by CERTA Perfect Sleeper Mattresses and Foundations with a top comfort and deep support for firmness that feels good. And that's a healthy investment in yourself. And by the Singer Store, where right now you can save $150 off regular price on one of the world's easiest-to-use sewing machines. This is Andy Griffin. Tomorrow at this same time, our story is earmarked for comedy. Just try not to laugh. <laughs> I tell you something, I can't. This is Lorne Green. The first months of the Civil War were for the northern side a time of confusion. The Battle of Bull Run had destroyed the Union's feeling of optimism that had found its best expression in that jaunty phrase, on to Richmond. Suddenly, the lesson was clear. This would be a long and bloody war. But the northern people were not psychologically prepared for such sacrifice. Romanticism was still in the air. Heroes were still being sought. An easy solution was still hoped for. After Bull Run, 
President Lincoln called for an additional 400,000 volunteers to supplant the original 75,000 men that had been defeated by Beauregard's forces. These new volunteers would have to be supplied with uniforms, ammunition, foodstuffs, and medicine. This would be a difficult task for the most efficient of war machines, but for the Northern Army in 1861, it was well nigh impossible. One of the chief problems was the appointment to positions of responsibility of the so-called political generals. Howard Hubbard, the hero of our story, is not a political general. He's a political colonel, a lieutenant colonel to be exact. Howard is also a United States congressman from Ohio, and he is fully aware of the newly passed law that requires congressmen who are generals to resign their office. By accepting the lower rank, Howard can be in uniform and still take his seat in the House. It is, all in all, a perfect arrangement. And it's made even more perfect since Howard is assigned to the Quartermaster Corps, safely ensconced in Washington, far from the whine of enemy bullets and close to the political and social lights of the Capitol. Yes, Howard Hubbard would appear to be a very lucky man in that summer of 1861. His only worries revolve around bed rolls, haversacks, hardtack, and other dry details of supply. The rebels are across the Potomac. The parties that summer are splendid. Howard has made two speeches on the evils of the South to ringing applause from his house colleagues. He's 31 years old, and his future is enormous. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, After Bull Run, by Kevin Sellers. Our stars, Jack Bannon and Vic Perrin. Mutual Radio Theater is being brought to you in part by CERTA, perfect sleeper mattresses and foundations, with the top comfort and deep support for firmness that feels good. And that's a healthy investment in yourself. Ah, here we are, Zing, new owners of a home surrounded by a picturesque swamp. But these alligators are no problem. We'll just use this narrow strip of land to come and go. Right, fella? What's this? A barricade and a man carrying a shotgun. Uh, pardon, name's Braxton, Canadian Mounted Police, retired. This is my lead dog, Zing, also retired. Mind telling us why you're blocking the right of way? It's wrong way now. <laughs> I told that fella I was cutting off the easement of forest, sold his house to y'all. Don't want no more jacking through here, boy. Strange, no one mentioned an easement. But how do we come and go? This strip of land is the only way out except through the... Alligators. <laughs> Guess you ought to have to talk nice to them critters. <laughs> well, Zing, looks like it's time for some fancy stepping. Let's go. Learn about title insurance and other precautions before you buy a home. For free information, write American Land Title Association, Box 566, Washington, D.C., 20044. In 1861... Lieutenant Colonel Howard Hubbard has something to be thankful for. Namely, Captain Edmund Fitzpatrick, his subordinate officer, a regular army lifer who knows the intricacies of procurement and ordnance. Howard is in the habit of leaving the actual running of his department in Captain Fitzpatrick's hands while he attends to the more absorbing matters of politics and society. Captain Fitzpatrick and a staff aide thus find themselves on this hot summer afternoon cooped up in the War Department reviewing supply records. Can I close the window, Captain? Aren't you hot, Sergeant? Oh, I'm burning up, sir. But hearing the birds and the people outside it only makes it worse. Try losing yourself in your work. I'd rather be fighting Johnny Reb, sir. And would you rather starve? These records show each soldier with an average ration of two pieces coarse bread, half pound salt beef, and a quarter canteen of water per day. And they say Johnny Reb goes without eating some days. Yes, and that's why they'll lose the war. 
eventually. I think we'll be in Richmond this time next year. Perhaps, as prisoners of war. Oh, M- McClellan will get us there, sir. <laughs> I love that little man. He's given the Army new hope. He's certainly given it a new name, the Army of the Potomac. Rather interesting naming an army after a river. May I, uh, I ask you a personal question, sir? <laughs> Seeing as how we're both shut up in this mausoleum together, you may, Sergeant. Are you a, a Democrat, sir? If you wish to know for whom I voted last November, the answer is Lincoln. Oh, I knew you were no awful Democrat, sir. I think it's time we went to work. <clears throat> yes, sir. <laughs> ah, Fitzpatrick, diligent as always. Colonel Hubbard, Mrs. Hubbard. I thought we agreed on Howard. With all due respect, Colonel, I prefer the formal address. It is precisely because you have no respect for my husband, Captain, that you won't use his Christian name. Adele, please. Fitzpatrick is regular army. I understand that. Thank you, Colonel. I thought I'd come around and see how the wheels were turning. Adele and I were in the neighborhood, garden party at the McClellan's. And did the general shake your hand? Yes, of course. Why, shouldn't he have? Indeed. It's just that in every photograph, the general has his right hand inside his coat. One wonders if it's an emulation of Napoleon or a severe case of dyspepsia. (laughs) I fail to see the humor, Captain. Really, Mrs. Hubbard? I thought it was quite broad. I do see, however, why you are still a captain at age 40. Adele, that's uncalled for. And it's imprudent of you to laugh at such jokes, Howard. I'll wait for you in the carriage. Good day, Mrs. Hubbard. I won't be long. My wife has become very close with Mrs. McClellan. She's right, though. It's jokes like that that have kept me from advancement. I started making them at the point to keep from going crazy, and I've never learned to stop. Besides, it's just as well your wife left when she did. Sergeant. Sir? Wait in the ante room till we're finished. Hmm? Very good, sir. I've uh, been going over these requisition papers, Colonel. And I note a certain discrepancy between... Can't this wait until next week? I have a speech coming up. Obviously, if this did not directly concern you, Colonel, it would already have been taken care of. I'm sorry. Go ahead. As you know, Colonel, I double-check each regiment's requisition papers against prior reports. I find that in the case of the 5th Ohio Volunteer Regiment... That's Clem Ward's outfit. Yes. And last month, General Ward requested 1,500 pounds of salt beef. The month before that, he requested and received 2,500 pounds of salt beef. And this month, he asks us for an additional 2,800 pounds of salt beef. Now, that's a lot of meat. Well, let's figure it out. The average ration of salt beef per soldier is roughly a pound. Half a pound, Colonel. Of course, half a pound. That adds up to... Double the regiment. What's your point, Fitzpatrick? I hardly think Clem Ward's hoarding beef. Nor do I, Colonel. I do know, however, that the commanding officer tends to sign whatever his quartermaster officer puts before him. And it's perfectly plausible that the quartermaster officer and the local sutler are in league. You mean... I mean the sutler gets paid twice the amount he should. Then divvies up his profits with the quartermaster officer. It's an old army game. Well, what do you recommend we do? Well, seeing as how General Ward's family is close to your wife's family, perhaps you could speak to him informally and alert him to what's going on. Very good. Arrange an appointment, then. Let's say week after next. I'll need at least that much time to prepare for my speech. It's a scientific refutation of slavery using the very Colonel, latest... Re- if I may make a suggestion... I know. You don't want me to tell Adele. No, no, no. You can tell your wife whatever you like. I was going to suggest that you go to see General Ward rather than vice versa. But why? Well, it might arouse suspicion if General Ward is suddenly summoned to the Capitol to see the chief quartermaster officer. If you were to show up at his headquarters, we could disguise the visit as an inspection tour. But Clem's regiment is halfway to Harper's Ferry in very desolate country. I don't think the enemy is within 50 miles of the 5th Ohio, Colonel. That's an unfair remark. I wasn't thinking about the enemy. And what were you thinking about, Colonel Hubbard? I'm your superior officer. I don't have to take this from you. I'll put in a request for transfer, Colonel. No. No, the heat has us all upset. When do you recommend we visit General Ward? As soon as possible. Very well. We'll leave tomorrow. Carry on. Colonel. You can return to your work, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Well, (laughs) there's a man I feel sorry for, sir. Why is that, Sergeant? 
Well, his wife's a regular she-devil, for one. Oh, I don't know. She gives him sound political advice. She's loyal to him. She comes from good Ohio landowning stock, same as he. No, Sergeant, I don't feel sorry for Colonel Hubbard. He's very lucky. It's all come easy for him. He's never been tested. And it's to be hoped he never will be. For he'd surely fail. Hi, I'm Susan Anton. Fitness that feels good by day needs firmness that feels good by night. That's why you'll love the Serta Perfect Sleeper. Luxurious top comfort plus deep inner support. You get both with every perfect sleeper. So remember, be a perfect sleeper. It's a healthy investment in yourself. Hello, this is Larry Hagman with the prenatal care message from the March of Dimes. Have you ever heard the old warning about three on a match? Well, two on a match also can be bad luck. And if you smoke while you're pregnant, there are two of you on every match you strike. Smoking during pregnancy is dangerous to your unborn baby. It can cause miscarriage and low birth weight. Don't take a chance. If you're pregnant, the March of Dimes urges you not to smoke. In the summer of 1861, the Potomac River was the border between the Union and Confederate forces. On the Virginia side, nestled the troops of Beauregard and Joe Johnston while along the Maryland side of the river lay the Army of the Potomac under George McClellan. The 5th Ohio Volunteers, Clement Ward commanding, was encamped roughly halfway between the capital and Harpers Ferry. Sentries were posted along the river, of course, but the enemy was reported to be a full day's march to the northeast, and the sentries mostly amused themselves playing Pinochle and three-card Monte. We use this part of the river as a community bathing area. You won't find any lousy men in my regiment, Howard. It's very bucolic, Clem. Reminds me of the Muskingum back home. Oh, my foreman writes me glowing letters of the corn yield. As does mine. If half of it's true, we'll be rich men. Excuse me for interrupting, gentlemen, but isn't that a sentry over there on that outcropping? Yes, Captain Fitzpatrick. We post a full guard as if the enemy were directly across the river. And I take it the enemy is using observation balloons? Not to my knowledge. Why do you think that, Captain? From the position of that sentry stretched out flat on his back with his face to the sky above. What? Oh, uh, excuse me, gentlemen. Sergeant, there's a sentry asleep on his post. Have him properly disciplined. I suppose such conduct is excusable with the enemy so far away. I can assure you, gentlemen, that was the exception and not the rule. Obviously, if it were the rule, General, you would not be alive to greet us. That's a little morbid, Fitzpatrick. I've uh, taken the liberty of serving lunch. I trust it will meet with everyone's satisfaction. I'm admiring your tent, General. Hardly army issue. That's right, Captain. I had it specially made at my own expense. It helps to absorb the heat. Clem! You remembered. <laughs> yes, Howard. Plum tart, your favorite. With freshly picked plums. Mm, they're delicious. Try one, Fitzpatrick. Thank you, no. I will try some of this claret, if I may. Are you gentlemen in the mood for an off-color story? <laughs> Let her fly, Clem. <laughs> all righty. Uh, we all know General Lee's horse is called Traveler, and every time Lee mounts the beast... I think it's fair to warn you, General, that I've heard this story, and if you persist in the telling of it, I must leave your tent. Oh, come on, Fitzpatrick. We're grown men here. Then I suggest we act like grown men. I was under the impression Lee was the enemy. General Lee is a gentleman, and I won't hear him traduced. Lee taught him at the point, Clem. Ah. Oh. I see, I see. If it's all the same, I'd like to get to the matter at hand. That's fine with me. Howard? I suppose the sooner we take care of this unpleasantness, the sooner we can all relax and enjoy ourselves. General, your commissary officer is a Major Bagby, William Bagby. That's right. West Point fellow, like you. Hardly like me, General. Would you have him sent here, please, so we can question him? Well, surely, Captain. I'll be right back. Now make yourselves to home. You're the prickliest fellow sometimes, Fitzpatrick. I guess I'm not used to this kind of war. Mm. 
You will handle this, Bagby, won't you? I find it difficult to be harsh with anyone. I'll do the questioning. You will stay in the tent. You have no respect for me whatever, do you? I think you're a brilliant politician, Colonel. <laughs> Soon this war will be over, Fitzpatrick, and you'll need us politicians. Because military men cannot legislate. They cannot preside over the nation's day-to-day -day affairs. They cannot wrestle with the tariff. You're the making a speech, Colonel. That's right. And you'll let me finish because... What's that? I believe they call it the rebel yell. You said the enemy was nowhere near. It appears I was wrong. Well, what's going to happen? We must hope that General Ward will turn out to be a better soldier than he is a storyteller. Shouldn't we see what's going on? We can hear what's going on. We're being attacked. Ah, Clem, Clem, what's the situation? Oh, it's a small raiding party. We're repulsing them. First raiding party I know of to use mortars. Uh, a company, then. Certainly no more than that. You, of course, have sent out reconnaissance patrols to determine the exact strength of the enemy? Uh... Well, yes, that, that was my very next order. Now, if you gentlemen... Ah! Oh, my God, Clem. Don't, don't touch him. He's gone, Colonel. No, no, he's not. He's still... Don't handle him, you fool. Oh, my God. You've spilled his brains over the floor. I'm going to be sick. Yes, yes, a good idea. I'll be right back, Colonel. This, this is absurd. I shouldn't be here. I, sh I should be at the War Department or at my desk in the house. Damn faulty intelligence reports. Enemy 50 miles away. How are we expected to win a war with intelligence like that? Oh, God. Oh, God. Pull yourself together now. It won't... It won't do to have Fitzpatrick. You're crying like a baby. I'll be damned if I'll wait here and get to blown to bits in this tent. I'll commandeer a horse and ride to Washington. After all, this isn't my command. I'm a visitor here. Now hold on, Hubbard. Think. Think this through. Would it be wise of me to leave the scene of a battle? I just hear the Democrats when they get hold of that one. Hubbard ran. That'd fix me. End of my career right then and there. And the corpses don't become senators now, do they? No, they don't. And besides, I'll say I was writing for help. For reinforcements. That's that's plausible, isn't it? Where are the horses? I can't see anything in all this smoke. I thought I told you to stay in your tent, Colonel. Oh, Fitzpatrick. Where'd you find that horse? Never mind. Mount up. Gladly. I take it you know the way to Washington. Nope. But I know the way to that farmhouse up there on the ridge. <laughs> then you'll stop and ask directions? I mean, that's your headquarters, Colonel. What? Well, you're the ranking officer. General Ward, Colonel Edwards, and Major Bagby are dead. But I'm not a combat soldier. To say the least. That's why your order shall be filtered through me. But, Fitzpatrick, that's patently dishonest. You surprise me sometimes, Colonel. Yes, it is patently dishonest. But it'd be a lot worse for both you and the Army to own up to the truth. Well, I'm not too concerned with your embarrassment, Colonel. I happen to care very much about the Army. Are you sure it'll work? No, but with your luck, it probably will. I'll bet I end up making you a hero. <sighs> this farmhouse looks sturdy enough to withstand some shelling. Colonel Hubbard, Major Henderson, at your service. I am Captain Fitzpatrick. The gentleman to my rear is your commander. Oh, yes, Major. Uh... <clears throat> What is the state of things? Oh, we've fallen back in good order, sir. Estimated casualties, 30 killed, 45 wounded, including General Ward and Colonel Edwards among the casualties, sir. I see. Uh, have the men deployed along the ridge and uh, organize a reconnaissance party. Very good, sir. Uh, you remembered about the reconnaissance party. Very good, Colonel. Was my order to deploy the men along the ridge sensible? Eminently, seeing as how they're already here... Why don't you wait here in the parlor while I look around for a private room for us? It's a lovely parlor. Reminds me of the farms back home. Music box. Comforter. Calico curtains. I feel safe here somehow. I hope Fitzpatrick can make this work. Fitzpatrick, that was close by. 
fit. Oh, there you are. You look white. How observant of you, Colonel. You're bleeding. Yes, I am. As you can see, I've been shot. Don't move. Don't move. I'll, I'll get an orderly. Major Henderson! Major Henderson! Yes, sir? Captain Fitzpatrick's been shot. I'll dispatch a stretcher, sir. Hold on, Fitzpatrick. We're getting help. Damn rebel snipers. Best marksmen in the world. If it's not too painful for you, I need to ask your advice. What orders should I give now? You should make a diversion. Yes. And then you should... Yes, a diversion. Fitzpatrick, are you conscious? Oh, my God, he's fainted dead away. I'm in for it now. This is Gene King for your Better Business Bureau. Biking is a very popular sport in America... And if you're planning on buying a bicycle, here are a few tips which will enable you to purchase one that best suits your needs and budget. First of all, buy a bike that fits. The frame size, which is measured from the pedal crank axis to the top of the seat tube, should be 9 or 10 inches less than the rider's inseam. Also, make sure that the saddle height is right. You should be able to sit comfortably in the riding position, one knee flexed, when the pedal is at its lowest point. Now, if you're buying a bike for a child, never buy a bike that's too big based on the theory that the right size would soon be outgrown. It's a better idea to choose an easy-to-handle, properly-sized model which can be sold or traded in for a larger size when the time comes. An oversized bike can be a real safety hazard. A tip from your Better Business Bureau. During the Civil War, there were many small skirmishes. In the overall context of the struggle, they were unimportant, merely a way for the dormant military muscle to flex itself. Fifty men would die, seventy-five would be taken prisoner, a hill or a stream was temporarily captured. Soon the engagement was forgotten, obliterated by a Gettysburg, a Chickamauga, a Bull Run. Even the soldiers who participated in these skirmishes tended to lump them together in one long five-year panorama of blood, mud, and boredom. For Howard Hubbard, though, this particular skirmish would not be forgotten. It was, as Captain Fitzpatrick implied, his first test. I think he's dead, Major. No, he's not. Be careful, boys. How you carry him? Will he regain consciousness soon? I hope not for his sake. It's two miles to the field hospital, and the roads are rutted out. I've prepared a map of our position, sir. Thank you, Major. I need time to study it. Where can I go to be alone? With all due respect, sir, the situation calls for an immediate decision regarding the route of retreat. I said I need time to think. Uh, I believe there's a sitting room beyond the parlor, sir. I'll post a guard. Thank you, Major. I'm sorry to be so abrupt. I simply need time to acquaint myself with the uh, terrain. Yes, sir. Did you say the sitting room was beyond the parlor? Yes, sir. I'll only be a moment, Major. Yes, sir. That Major has contempt for me. Doesn't he understand the plain fact that I'm not a combat officer? Why did Fitzpatrick have to go and get himself wounded? It's as if someone were deliberately trying to humiliate me. First Clem gets killed, and Clem's chief officer, and now Fitzpatrick's wounded. I've never had such a run of rotten luck. Yes? Sir, the scouting party has determined the enemy's position and approximate strength. Yes? It would be easier, sir, if I didn't have to shout through a closed door. Of course, of course. Forgive my rudeness. It's the 2nd Mississippi, Colonel. General Evans' regiment. We appear to outnumber them by roughly 500 men. They broke through on our south flank, and they're presently in control of the river crossing and the main Washington Pike. Yes, I see. What are your orders, sir? 
Uh, I still need time to study the map. Colonel, for God's sake, the retreat route will soon... You shall close the door, Major, and leave me. Sir. I dislike shouting at the fellow, but he's too insistent. All right, let's study this map now. It looks simple enough. And there's the Potomac. Enemies in control there. There's the ridge. Hmm. What's this? Murdoch's Hill? Ah, oh, that must be that rise of land to our immediate east. Hmm. Seems to me, if artillery can be placed there... Yes. Major Henderson? Sir! Take some artillery and move on Murdoch's Hill. That's not possible, Colonel. Why not? We have artillery, don't we? The enemy has already taken Murdoch's Hill, sir. Why wasn't I told that? I thought it was obvious, sir. Well, Major, if the enemy has taken Murdoch's Hill, then I see no alternative but to retreat. Exactly, sir. Only now it may be too late. Well, don't stand there then, Major. Sound the retreat. Wouldn't the Colonel like to know the path of retreat? I see it, Major. It's this bridge over Taylor's Run. I'm not a complete blockhead, you know. I'll have the men move out, Colonel. I guess retreat's preferable to surrender. No one can expect me to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. I'm not McClellan or Buell. All in all, considering the extraordinary circumstances, I've acquitted myself admirably. I don't see what else I could have done. <laughs> Fitzpatrick will sure be surprised. I'm sure he will have expected me to fail utterly. Perhaps I'll even earn a measure of his bloody respect. Are we ready, Major? Captain Claiborne is here, sir. Yes, Captain. I'm sorry to report, sir. The enemy has taken the bridge spanning Taylor's Run. I thought you said this was our escape route, Major. I'm afraid delay has cost us the advantage, sir. Are you implying that I'm at fault? Simply noting a fact, sir. You're being insubordinate, Major. Sir! And don't retreat behind your regular army facade. At least I can retreat, Colonel. You'll retract that remark. Uh, Colonel, I think we can take that bridge. Patrick, that's insanity. I think it's very interesting. Please continue, Captain. An all-out assault on the bridge can succeed. The enemy is tired. They've marched a double time in the heat to beat us to the bridge. I completely disagree, Patrick. And what's your alternative, Major? That we send for reinforcements. Now, the nearest troops are at Leesburg. That's a 15-mile march we'd never hold out. The artillery's got a range. I cannot condone a frontal assault on a well-guarded bridge. Uh, let me understand this. If we fail to procure reinforcements and stay here... Then we'll be compelled to surrender? Right, Colonel. The other course is, with all due respect to Patrick, suicidal. It can work, Colonel. I agree, Captain. Order the assault. Yes, sir. You're dismissed, Major. This is outrageous. You're playing politics with men's lives. Major, I'm warning you. You gave that order because you wish to avoid the embarrassment of a surrender caused by your own ignorance. One more word. And I'll have you put under armed guard. Sir! How dare you impute such motives to me? Sir! I must make the decisions. Isn't that the way of it? Sir! Well, answer me. I was ordered to say nothing more, sir. Not one more word. Is the colonel now rescinding his order? Get out of my sight. Sir! I'm counting on you, Claiborne. Please be right and end this string of bad luck. As we enter the 80s, Underwriters Laboratories has an important message for you. Keep up the good work. Yes, keep up the good work of helping to reduce the number of accidents from electrical products by remembering to be careful with your appliances and power tools. In the 80s, with its inevitable technical advances, you're certain to be confronted by products which will require new precautions. To meet this safety challenge and to keep up the good work, we suggest always reading manufacturer's instruction booklets and using electrical products only for their intended use. 
and remember to check that none of your plugged-in appliances can be accidentally immersed in water or any other liquid. And when we entered the 90s, perhaps your careful use of electrical products will once again earn a keep up the good work. A public service announcement of Underwriters Laboratories and this station. Lorne Green again, and here's the fourth act of After Bull Run. The assault on the bridge was successful, at a cost of some 200 killed and 300 wounded. But the enemy's losses were only slightly less. And as the newspapers pointed out, even a costly retreat was preferable to an out-and-out surrender in these discouraging days after Bull Run. For Howard Hubbard, the engagement was a personal triumph. He was the guest of honor at a presidential reception, was given a rousing ovation when he went to his desk in the house, and McClellan offered Hubbard a promotion to Brigadier General, which he graciously declined. Everyone knew why, of course. A general would have to resign his house seat. And no one ever accused Howard Hubbard of faulty political instincts. Certainly no one believed Hubbard's stated reason, which was that he was not fit to be a general. It's such a lovely afternoon, Howard. Must we visit a stuffy army hospital? You needn't. I've told you that. You would like me to come with you, though. It's up to you, Adele. I really don't care for Captain Fitzpatrick. I know. And he doesn't care for us. Which is why I find it so curious that you go out of your way to see him. He's my chief aide. That's not why you visit him. For some unfathomable reason, you seem to admire the man. He has many good qualities. Such as? Jealousy? Arrogance? Fitzpatrick is arrogant, but I don't think he's jealous. He's crawling with envy toward you. Why else would he refuse to congratulate you on your victory? It wasn't a victory, Adele. It was a retreat. It was a brilliant tactical move. Everyone else saw fit to praise you, including the Democrats. Why not your sainted subordinate? Because he saw it for what it was. A desperate gamble by a confused, inept political officer. Please, don't shout. You sound like a barnyard turkey. Two hundred men were killed assaulting that bridge, and I might as well have executed them myself. Is this what Fitzpatrick's been telling you? You know you could have him court-martialed. He hasn't told me a thing. Surprising as it may seem to you, my dear, I possess some semblance of a conscience. You don't need to be sarcastic toward me. I apologize. Would you rather have surrendered? Yes. Now that I reflect on it, yes, I would. At least those 200 men would be alive. If you call being shut up in Libby prison being alive... Subject to torture, starvation, rats gnawing... Please, Adele, I've already given that speech. I don't understand this sudden shift in your attitude. It's quite simple. I find it loathsome to be treated as a hero when in reality I'm just a bumbling fool. A dangerous bumbling fool. So you were telling the truth? Pardon me? About the promotion. You really feel you're unfit? Yes. But it failed to serve its purpose... It didn't wipe out those dead men. Perhaps nothing will. Howard, you did the best that anyone could expect. Don't you see? I had no business commanding. While I was trying to read a basic military map, the enemy outflanked me. If I'd had the least qualifications for my job, the brilliant retreat would not have been attempted and we wouldn't have lost anyone. That's the thing in a nutshell, my dear. Then why didn't the newspapers report that? Oh, don't be naive. They're desperate for good news now. They'll grasp at the flimsiest of straws. They certainly won't question the wisdom of a course of action that works, no matter how costly or unnecessary it was. It's not like you to be so cynical. I'm not cynical. I'm very patriotic. I believe in making large personal sacrifices for one's country. The successful leader must not be afflicted with self-doubt. I agree. If you give in to self-doubt and introspection and gloom, your constituents will reject you. You're absolutely right. Oh, my. Why do they place the hospital so near the river? Isn't that uncomfortable for the patients? Yes, but river swampland is much cheaper. I'll only be an hour with Fitzpatrick. Why don't you drive through Rock Creek and we'll meet at 4 o'clock? Would you like some fresh peaches? Well, that sounds delicious. I'll do some shopping then. Howard.
Edward. Yes? You have a large destiny. Don't lose sight of it. I can't imagine that happening. Goodbye for now. Colonel, I see you're sitting up, Fitzpatrick. That's good. Yes, I can see the unfinished Capitol Dome without the help of pillows. I do appreciate the symbolism of an incomplete country. But when are you politicians going to vote enough money to finish the damn thing? <laughs> In time, I hope, for Lincoln's next inaugural. Yes. And speaking of wild rumors, I heard one of the effect that you refused a generalship. Yes. You said you weren't fit? That's correct. Did anyone believe you besides me? <laughs> My wife. That's good. That's good. A man should be honest with his wife. Yes. In all things. You sound troubled, Colonel. No, not at all. I... I just find it odd that a bachelor like yourself would make such sweeping pronouncements upon marriage. I wasn't always a bachelor, Colonel. I see. Uh, I'm sorry, Fitzpatrick. When did it happen? Our first post out of the point, Dakota Territory, Sioux Raiding Party. We were led by the territorial governor's nephew. He, too, harbored political ambitions, but he didn't have your luck. He perished along with Sylvia. It's no wonder you feel contempt for me. Actually, Colonel, taking the past into account, I'm amazed that I like you as much as I do. What in the devil's that? I'll take a look. Why, it's General McClellan. Better button up my hospital gown. I think I'll mosey along. Don't be foolish. We haven't had a proper visit. I, I really must go. I told Adele that... Attention! At ease, Captain Fitzherbert! Uh, General, I, I believe you know Colonel Hubbard. Ah, Hubbard, didn't see you. Biggest fool in the army. Uh, General, please, we agree. You that... know what this fool went and did? He refused your promotion. Oh, that, that wasn't foolish at all. That's good politics. No, this fool actually resigned General, his please. colonel's commission. And if that isn't enough, he insists on being kicked down to buck private. <laughs> We're now addressing Private Howard Hubbard. I suppose I should order him about, have him black my boots, but I just can't. Well, I trust you're on the men, Captain. Thank you, sir. Yes, I am. Where are you from, Fitzherbert? New York City, sir. Not a bad place, though I prefer Boston. Higher level of culture, you know. Well, carry on. Thank you, sir. Up to, Private. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, at that rate, he should tour the hospital in a little under an hour. <laughs> He's a whirlwind of a man. He should always be on horseback, though. Another of your jokes? Not at all. He's quite short and plump, but his posture's perfect. Mounted, he's imposing. Standing, he's pompous. <laughs> You're telling me these kinds of things because of my new rank. Perhaps. Who else knows? No one. Yourself and the general, that's all. No wonder you looked pained when I made my observation about honesty toward wives. It won't be easy to tell her. You'd better hurry. I have a hunch General McClellan will betray your confidence. I was going to tell her this afternoon, but I couldn't work up the courage. What outfit are you joining? The 5th Ohio, of course. You ever fired a rifle? Not since I was 17. You are an interesting man. I completely underrated you. Coming from one superior officer, that's quite a compliment. Actually, Private, for the first time in our relationship, it's you who outrank me. The conclusion of our story, after these words. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of fine names to make Sears names stand for quality. Names you've always counted on, like Kenmore, Craftsman, Easy Living, and Die Hard. 
Names that kids and moms cheer, like Winnie the Pooh and Tough Skins. Names that are a part of your life today, like Permapress, Klingalon, and Winner 2. And, of course, there's Sears Best Products in everything from T-shirts to tractors. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of truly dependable names to make our name. Sears Roebuck and Company. My name is Lenny. I'm 19. I took driver training and got my license three years ago. The more I drove, the smarter and more reckless I got. And the more rules I forgot. But I'll never forget the accident. It happened just nine months ago. I don't have a license anymore. I don't deserve one. Because I, I killed my best friend, Bill. Why couldn't it have been me? This has been a safe driving reminder from the Motor Vehicle Manufacturers Association. The following is a letter written by Private Howard Hubbard to Captain Edmund Fitzpatrick. The date is August 31, 1862. Dear Fitzpatrick, Writing paper and ink being in short supplies, I'm sure you are undoubtedly aware. I shall make this letter brief and to the point. They are calling this the Second Battle of Bull Run, and I'm afraid we have fared no better than at the first. General Pope's blunders make mine the acts of a military genius. Everyone is clamoring for the return of McClellan. I would wait for a happier occasion to communicate with you except for two occurrences that have happened on this date. The first is the anniversary of my decision to renounce my command. To say that I have not regretted my decision would be false. Perhaps my former letters have conveyed some measure of the discomfort, fear, and loneliness it has been my lot to endure this past year. But as a large penance was required of me, the sheer magnitude of my miseries as a foot soldier have eased my burden somewhat. My conscience is not entirely at peace. How can it ever be? But I begin to feel a small sense of expiation and release. The second occurrence is a happier one. I am no longer Private Howard Hubbard. You are now pleased to know Private First Class Howard Hubbard. This promotion is entirely routine. In a time of war, they tell me one gets sent up a rank each year as a matter of course. Be that as it may, let me end this letter by saying that no advancement has pleased me more and no achievement has made me as proud as this promotion. Compared to it, my election to Congress and my appointment as Lieutenant Colonel are but pebbles. I think only you, my good friend, will understand this and not think me crazy. I must go now. It is my turn to stand watch. Yours respectfully, Howard Hubbard, Private First Class, U.S. Army. This is Nanette Fabre. Can you imagine what life would be like if you couldn't hear music? Or what if you could never hear children laughing? The sounds of nature. Or even the sound of another human voice. Millions of deaf and hard of hearing live in a world of silence. Television to them is often frustrating, meaningless, silent pictures. But now, many primetime shows have captions that are visible only on specially equipped TV sets. To learn more about caption programming, write captions, Box 23299, Washington, D.C., 20024. Or call toll-free 800-336-3444. That's captions, Box 23299, Washington, D.C., 20024. Or call toll-free 800-336-3444. The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, After Bull Run, was written by Kevin Sellers and produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Lauren Green. Our stars were Jack Bannon and Vic Perrin. Featured in the cast were Marvin Miller, Joan McCall, Barney Phillips, and Jack Manning. John Harlan speaking. The Elliot Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI.
Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you in part by Sears, a name that means quality and value, a name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. This is Andy Griffith. It's time for laughter on tomorrow's show, and we challenge you to keep a straight face while you're listening. This is Lorne Green. It is early spring in 1879. Driven by starvation and hardship, a small band of northern Cheyenne has taken refuge with their allies, the Sioux, at the Pine Ridge Agency in South Dakota. On this night, Dull Knife, an old man chief of the Cheyenne, has called his few remaining warriors to his lodge. There he invites those spirits held sacred by the Cheyenne to smoke the ritual pipe with him, and in so doing, to give their blessing to what is about to be said. Thank you for coming to my lodge, my friends. I have nothing to say that has not been said before. But there is one among us who will leave us soon, and it is for him that I ask you here. Listen to the words of two stars. I thank my friend Dull Knife for asking you to his lodge. May the words I say here be true, and may the spirit above and the Mother Earth help me in this matter. We have been through much together, my friends, but I am sad at this meeting, for I know that the time will come soon when even friends such as we may not be permitted to gather in such a way. How did we come to such a place? It was only a few summers ago that we joined our friends the Sioux to stop Custer and the Long Knives. That should have been the end of our troubles, but it was not. And that is only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Death Song, A Cheyenne Memory, by Steve Sharon. Our stars, Len Berman, Marvin Miller, and Vic Perrin. Mutual Radio Theater is being brought to you in part by Serta Perfect Sleeper Mattresses and Foundations, with the top comfort and deep support for firmness that feels good. And that's a healthy investment in yourself. Feeling fit, feel. So good, firming up the way You know you should Fitness by day That feels so right Needs firmness that feels good Every night Be a perfect sleeper Buy a perfect sleeper Perfect sleeper Buy a Serta Hi, I'm Susan Anton When you buy a Serta Perfect Sleeper You get a mattress and foundation That provides the top comfort you want And deep support you need Night after night Plush layers of comfort cover Serta's famous patented construction. That's top comfort with deep support. You get both with every perfect sleeper. So remember, business by day that feels so right. Needs firmness that feels good every night. Be a perfect sleeper. Buy a perfect sleeper. Perfect sleeper. Buy Serta. It's a healthy investment in yourself. After the defeat of Custer and the 7th Cavalry, the demands from the East to remove the Indians from their lands became more insistent. In exchange for peace, the Northern Cheyenne were promised food for the hungry and a reservation on their own land in northwest Nebraska. And so they surrendered. And then the promises were broken. Like so many cattle, they were herded south to the Oklahoma Territory, to join the Arapaho and Southern Cheyenne on an already overcrowded agency. 
Unaccustomed to the hot, humid conditions and the scanty food rations, the tribe soon became sick with malaria, dysentery, and starvation. By the summer of 1878, two-thirds of the nearly 1,000 northern Cheyenne had died. The warrior, two stars, has not forgotten how his people suffered. The soldiers would not let us live in peace after Custer. We were driven into the hills and the winter was hard. We surrendered. You all know how we were betrayed by the yes-sayers among us. We were sent south to live away, far away from our own country. The soldiers kept us in that place for a year. There was a sickness among our people, and every lodge was filled with the death songs. How empty I felt to see my wife, White Bird, and my two sons sick with that thing. Two stars. White Bird is dead. The sickness. Oh, oh, plum man, if I could see this sickness, if I knew where it came from, I would go there and fight it. It is this country. It is too hot. Our people cannot live here. The country is not to blame, plum man. It's the whites that bring the sickness. Here in this place, there are also Arapaho and Southern Cheyenne. Why is it only Northern Cheyenne who have the sickness? No two stars. This place is unhealthy. We must leave here. The soldiers could not keep the sickness from our lodges. Soon, every man was for leaving, even those who once had said we should come south. We went to the agency to speak to Miles, the agent. Our chiefs then were Little Wolf and Dull Knife, who had the respect of both our people and the whites. Now then, Dull Knife, Little Wolf... What is it you've come to say? Fred Miles, we are going home. You know you can't go home, Dull Knife. You and your people promised to stay here in Oklahoma. For one year. Now we go. Well, I'm afraid the Army just ain't about to let you go back to Nebraska, and that's a fact. This is bad country. Our people die every day. I'm sorry about that. Truly I am. But I've only got one doctor to take care of 5,000 people, and I'm doing the best I can. Now, I've asked for medical supplies, and I'm sure that when they get here, things will be better for you and your people. Until then, you... Well, you just have to make do as best you can. No. If we stay, none will be left to go home. And if you leave, Little Wolf, how many do you think will be left after the soldiers get through with you? Can't you see, man? I'm trying to save you. Save us for what? The white man's sickness? If we die here and go to the burial rocks, no one will speak our names. So we go north. And if we die in battle, then at least our names will be sung around the campfires. <laughs> Don't be a fool, little wolf. If you leave now, the soldiers will punish those who stay as well. Their blood will be on your hands. We are going home. If you send the soldiers after us, wait until we are far away. Then we will fight, and those who stay will not suffer. That night, those of us that had strong hearts left our lodges standing empty beneath the big guns and began the long trail north. One thousand Cheyenne had come south. Less than three hundred were left to return. We had few horses and few guns, but Cheyenne have always been fast runners. But few of us could outrun the soldier horses. And in the evening of the third day, we watched from a hilltop and saw them far down below us. The soldiers had found our trail. There. See how the setting sun shines on their long knives. So, the soldiers come as Miles said they would. We must be ready for them. No, two stars. There are too many. We must not fight until we have to. The soldiers will hunt us down like buffalo. You forget, little wolf. Buffalo cannot fight on the run. Cheyenne can. Was there any doubt in our hearts that the soldiers' only thoughts were of killing us? What could we do to escape their guns but run faster? Day after day, they chased us, forcing us to fight on the run. Soldiers from the north, right in our path. Women and children back. Warriors, keep moving. Drive them east. Little Wolf, 
We need rest. The women and children cannot keep up this pace. Soon, dull knife, soon. When the soldiers sleep. Every day was the same, always running. Our only chance for rest was at night when the soldiers made camp. Dull knife and I smoked the ritual pipe and asked the spirits to protect us from our enemies. It's been a long time since I've smoked the pipe away from the stink of soldiers. When we reach our own lands, we will join with the Sioux again and drive them out. No, two stars. I am thinking that our time is over. The whites are too many. Their villages are too big. Not even the Sioux can drive them away. Dull knife, you were a great warrior, a dog soldier. And now you would give up so easily? That was long ago. Now I am tired of running. So are my people. They only wish to stop and live in peace. We cannot give up now. Not after so many of us lie unburied along the trail. If we give up in our own country, we will not be sent south. We can make the whites promise ah, that... What white man has ever kept his word? You've seen how they will not let us live in our own land. The whites want it for their own, as if the Mother Earth is something to be kept. You cannot surrender. This running and fighting is now a way of life for us. You are old now, Dull Knife, but there are young men here who would fight before they went south. I know. They would follow Little Wolf. I must think of my people first. If you were young, Dull Knife, you would fight. I am not young. And now we must make peace with the whites. Come. We have a long way to go yet. I would sit a while longer. A time will come when our people will have to give up to the soldiers or they will be no more. Remember that I am chief. I must think of the people. Remember that I am not chief. No, two stars. You are not. But you are Cheyenne. <laughs> This is Ava Goda with a message from the U.S. Customs Service. Everyone who travels out of the country must complete a declaration form when they return through customs. To save time and trouble, write for a free kit of useful material that the United States Customs Service has put together to help you. Especially when you get ready to bring yourself and your foreign purchases back to the United States. The kit includes a declaration form that you fill out while you shop for gifts and souvenirs. A great way of keeping tabs on your foreign purchases while you make them. So before you leave the country, get your free travel pack of information. Write Travel Pack, United States Customs Service, Washington, D.C. That's Travel Pack, United States Customs Service, Washington, D.C., 20229. Or ask your local travel agent for a free travel pack of information. You'll never find a better travel kit than your free travel pack. Three hundred Cheyenne, mostly old men, women, and children, have left their fever-stricken agency in Oklahoma and are fleeing across Kansas toward their own homeland in northwest Nebraska. Determined to kill or capture the small band, the War Department has set all its resources in motion. But troops and supplies are stretched thin on the frontier, and communication is difficult. Bogged down in bureaucratic red tape and conflicting orders, the cavalry is unable to deploy its troops effectively. Meanwhile, the Cheyenne continue to march steadily northward, stopping only to fight off attacking soldiers. As Two Stars recalls, the cavalry was not the only obstacle the Cheyenne had to overcome. The running was harder now because our food was almost gone. When we reached the Arkansas River... We captured a party of whites. They were hide hunters. There will be no killing. Our fight is only with the soldiers. Take all their guns and bullets and tie the whites to the wagons. I am against letting men such as these live. But you are chief. Take the whites away. There is a small herd of buffalo across the river 
We need as much food as we can get. We cannot stop now. The soldiers are too close. How can we go on with no food, little wolf? This may be the only herd we come across. The people are tired and hungry. A hunt will take their minds off our troubles. Very well, dull knife. We hunt, but the soldiers will come. We should be ready to fight. Yes, there will be another fight. While the men hunted, the women dug pits to protect us from the soldiers' guns. We ate meat, the first in days, and rested, waiting for the battle that was to come. Is everything ready, dull knife? The women and children are back with the horses. It will be a hard fight, little wolf. There are only 40 warriors left to stop the soldiers. And we... Many get... soldiers come! More than before! They bring big guns! Hear me, Cheyenne! This is a good place to die, but it must be the soldiers who die here. We must make them afraid of us. Have we come so far to die before we reach our homeland? I am not ashamed to say I was afraid. The holes that were dug not seem deep enough to save us from the big guns. Steady, Cheyenne. The great spirit above will not desert us. The spirits of those who have suffered at the hands of the whites are with us. Have you not heard the wind bringing us the voices of our dead? Have you not seen their tears drop from the skies? They cry to see us humbled by the whites. They say, let the whites be driven back upon the trail of blood they have made. Be brave. Let them come. Remember, you are Cheyenne. Little Wolf seemed without fear, like some wild bear. No Cheyenne who saw him that day could be afraid. We drove them back. The great spirit above had not deserted us. But we were not happy. We had lost many brave warriors. We ran for days and nights without stopping. The scouts were kept out far behind, always watching. We crossed the Republican River, and no soldiers came. Then the South Platte, and still no soldiers came. Some took this as a sign that the whites were beaten. But it was in my mind that the soldiers' chiefs were only confused and would soon be after us with even more soldiers than before. Finally, we reached our own land in the country the whites call Nebraska. We stopped to rest and take counsel. We were home at last. My friends, the soldiers have stopped following us for a while, but we must decide what to do. I say we should go to our old agency at Pine Ridge, where we will find Red Cloud and the Sioux. They will be waiting for us with the iron ropes. It is our right to come back. We made use of that agency before we went south. It is our right to use it again. You have seen what rights we have, Dull Knife. We cannot go to that place. What would you have us do, Little Wolf? Fight all winter? Look about you. Many of our people are lost or dead from the running, yet you would have them fight on. You have acted as a warrior instead of a chief. I would rather fight than go to the agency like a whip dog. Then you are a fool. Winter comes and there is little food left. You will only make it easy for the soldiers by starving to death. I will not give up to the whites. There are those that would rather fight than be sent south. Then let them choose the chief they will follow. You see, dull knife... Most of the young men think as I do. Perhaps. But Two Stars and Plum Man have not chosen. Two Stars, Plum Man, come with me. Warriors like you should help drive the soldiers from our land. My heart is with you, little wolf, but your thoughts are of war when they should be with your people. I go with Dullknife. And I... It is wrong for the people to be split apart like this. 
We should stay together, Dull Knife. Then come with us to the Pine Ridge Agency. Never. And so the people were divided. For three days, 148 Cheyenne walked behind Dull Knife to the agency. Already the air carried the sting of winter. The creeks were icy and the rain felt hard and cold. The heart has been torn from these people. They could not stand another fight. Little Wolf was right. The whites will not help us. Then why did you choose to follow me? My family is gone. There are old people and children here. I would not see them shot down. I'm here to protect them. You begin to think like a chief, Two Stars. No, I would not want to be a chief. Whites know only treachery. We must learn to smile while we kill. As they do, take first, then ask. We must forget the old ways and become white. To be white is to become an animal, or worse. If you do not act like the whites do, then you will follow the path of those that lie back on the trail. All Cheyenne follow that path. Dull knife. Soldiers are all around the agency. Red Cloud has been placed in the House of Stone. He has become a yes-sayer of the whites and says for us to give up. To be sent south? After all this running. What are we to do now? Try to join Little Wolf. The first snow will fall soon. We have no meat, no shelter, nowhere to go. Little Wolf will be proud to see that he was right. The first storm of winter came, and all we could do to stay warm was keep walking. But we did not go far. They stood before us like mounted bears in their skin coats and beaver hats. The soldiers had found us. I'm Captain Johnson, 3rd Cavalry. Which one of you is chief? Which one? I am Dull Knife. We have come home. We do not wish to fight. Good. You need food. We'll feed your people and give them shelter. We will not be sent south. We mean you no harm. We only wish to help. We do not need the help of whites. You'll die out there, Dull Knife. Look at your children and the old ones. Be sensible. Come with us to our camp. Very well. We will come. But we will not be sent south. Handel's oratorios, the symphonies of Brahms, Mozart, and Beethoven, the piano music of Chopin, the concertos of Rachmaninoff, the music of Tchaikovsky, the rhapsodies of Liszt, the operas of Wagner, the ballets of Stravinsky, the great masterpieces of man are also the great masterpieces of our forests. Take away the wood in pianos, organs, and harpsichords, and you take away the medium through which these geniuses communicated their inspiration. A symphony of life abounds in every tree, in every forest. Please allow that music to be appreciated by our children and our children's children. Only Bach could have written the Toccata and Fugue in D minor, but only you can prevent forest fires. A public service of this station, the Smoky Bear Program, and the Ad Council. The Army's disorganized campaign to recapture the determined Cheyenne had failed. Once the tribe reached home in northwest Nebraska, they split into two bands. It was on the morning of October 23rd, 1878, while attempting to rejoin Little Wolf, that Dull Knife and his band were captured by a troop of the 3rd Cavalry. The Cheyenne were taken to the soldiers' camp and they're confined to a makeshift stockade. Move along, engine. You can warm yourself with the fire in the stockade. Uh, just look at them, Sergeant. Sick, starving, half-frozen to death. 
It's hard to believe they've come 1,500 miles with half the U.S. cavalry chasing after them. Yeah, they're tough people, all right. But mark my words, Captain, they ain't whooped yet. Not by long shot. You give them half a chance, they'll lift our scalps quick as you please. Well, I can't let them starve because of something they might do. You make sure they have hot food and some blankets, Sergeant. And see if something can be done about those children. Their feet must be frozen solid. Yeah, if you say so, sir. Three days we rested, and the soldier, Chief Johnson, was good to us. Beg pardon, Captain. Yes, Sergeant, what is it? Well, it's the men, Captain. They ain't too happy about you letting those Indians keep their guns. I fully intend to confiscate their weapons, Sergeant. I've allowed the Cheyenne to keep them this long as a show of trust. I wouldn't trust them cussed devils as far as I I'm could... aware of your feelings, Sergeant. No matter. I'm sure Dullknife knows by now that our intentions are peaceful. He shouldn't give us any trouble from now on. You take a detail and collect the guns from the Cheyenne. Yes, sir. Now it looked as if the soldiers would kill us as they had done in other places. Detail. Draw weapons. Sergeant, there's no need for that. Yes, sir. Troops. At ease. Dullknife. I must have all your guns and ammunition. Also the horses. We will not be left helpless. There'll be trouble if you don't give me the guns. This is what happened when we were sent south. We will not let that happen again. Well, I'll see that it doesn't happen as before. I am against it, Dullknife. They wish to make us helpless. I've given my word. There will be no trouble. Very well. I would not see my people shot down over some old guns and tired horses. Oh. Thank you, Dullknife. In return, you must take down the fences. We are not animals that need to be penned up. That's fair enough. Another soldier chief will come in a few days. He will say what's to be done with your people. But I'll try to see that you stay here in Nebraska. We gave the soldiers some of our guns. The rest were hidden so that we were not left defenseless. Johnson was a good man. But it was the bad whites that were often the big chiefs. The man who rode into the stockade the next day was one of those. Are you, Johnson? That's right. Captain Wessels, Fort Robinson. I'm here to take over the prisoners. I've had no orders to turn over custody of these people. I was expecting General Crook. This gives me authorization. Uh Uh-huh. You permit these scum to wander about the camp like this? They're people, Captain, not scum. If it weren't for the fact that they were starving to death, we'd still be chasing them all over God's country. Ah, you call them what you like. I'm just here to see that they get back to the fort. They're not going to like this. Who cares what they like? Just tell them to be ready to move within the hour. That's impossible. There are children and sick people to deal with. Besides, they'll never agree to going to Fort Robinson. They'll see it as the first step back to Oklahoma. Captain Johnson, you've been relieved of your command. I suggest, Captain, you carry out your orders. Dullknife, this officer has come to take you and your people to Fort Robinson. Fort Robinson? To be sent south again? We will die first. That does not mean you will be sent to Oklahoma. Only to Fort Robinson where you can be fed and cared for. Cheyenne are not a people to be cared for like little white children. Leave us to make our own way. This man is no longer in command. Now, from now on, you'll take your orders from me. We will not go to Fort Robinson. Very well. Sergeant, have your men draw weapons and prepare to fire. Wait. We will go to the fort. But not to the south country. That we will never do. Get your people ready. We leave within the hour. I'm sorry, Dullknife. I'll do what I can to stop them from sending you south. I wish I could promise you the justice you deserve. Justice is an empty word like all white words. But you have acted better than most white men. For that, we thank you. So we changed from the hands of one man to the hands of another, as if we were the white man's paper money. The death song was on our lips and the fear in our hearts as we entered Fort Robinson. It was a place built to keep people in rather than to keep them out. 
No matter what the whites told us, we were still prisoners. We had not been there a day when Dull Knife was called to the new soldier chief's lodge. Dull Knife, I've received new orders about your people. What is to be done? The fighting is over. We're supposed to be friendly to one another. Then we are free to leave? Not that friendly. You and your people must stay here for three months. Then the government will decide what to do with you. We will not go south. That's not for you to decide. If I had my way, you'd be dead. However, just to show you that my heart's in the right place, you had the freedom of the post. Go anywhere you like. But each night at supper time, your people must return to the barracks. We want no trouble. That's the idea, Chief. Sergeant, put them in the old barracks for now. Search all the men and confiscate any weapons you find. Yes, sir. Oh, and dull knife. Don't get any ideas about running away. If one of you leaves, I'll shoot the rest. We are home now. There will be no trouble. We were searched again and put in the wooden lodge, but the soldiers found no more guns because the women had them hidden. What is to be done? Our troubles are over for now, plum man. That soldier chief is just like all bad whites. He would have us dead. Two stars is right, dull knife. This Wessels is one who needs killing. No, plum man. He is not a big chief. There are others that tell him what to do. I think we will be treated fairly. The whites do not treat the Cheyenne fairly. I am for leaving. And I... And if the young men leave, what will happen to the women and children? No, we must wait. For a while, at least. I am not chief. I did not say we should come here. There are others that feel the same way. So, you are like Little Wolf. What kind of Cheyenne do you call yourself that you do not think of the others? If one man leaves, all will be killed. Then what do we do? When the time is right, we will... Tangled hair and a small raiding party of Sioux were headed in this direction. And I need scouts to help track them down. Why come to us? Well, in exchange for your service, you'll be given extra blankets and food. There is no honor in such a thing. The Sioux are our friends. If you're smart, you'll forget that and help yourselves. Friendship is a thing not forgotten by the Cheyenne. You don't want the extra blankets and food? That's fine with me. I was just trying to help you. Ungrateful, bloody savages. You see, Dull Knife, the whites tried to make us like them. I will never become white and turn against old friends. Mm, Marge, your desserts are such a success. What's your secret? Actually, I have 47 secrets. How can you keep them all? Pillsbury keeps them for me in their Sweet Success Recipe Book. Where'd you get it, or is that a secret, too? Nope. You can get the Sweet Success Recipe Book free from participating grocers when you buy one package of Pillsbury Plus Cake Mix and one can of Pillsbury Frosting Supreme. But these desserts look fabulous. It must have taken all day to make them. Not at all. They're all made with Pillsbury Plus Cake Mix or Pillsbury Frosting Supreme. Supreme, so you know they're easy to make, even though they look like you spent the whole day baking them. Forty-seven great dessert recipes from Pillsbury. Mmm, mmm is right. Golden granola pound cake, country apple dessert, maple nut mocha tort. The Sweet Success Recipe Book has ideas for cakes, cookies, even candies. And it's free? Yes, but hurry, because they won't last forever. With all these hungry people around, <laughs> neither will your desserts. Now that's the sure sign of a sweet success. Thanks, Pillsbury. Lorne Green again, and here's the fourth act of Death Song, the Cheyenne Memory. The next three months at Fort Robinson went by slowly. It was a cold winter, but we were treated well. Many saw this as a sign that we would not be sent south, but it was in my mind that this was a way of the soldiers to trick us into going back. To keep their hearts strong, we told the young boys stories of better days. It saddens me to see our people in a place like this. Sad when I think of the days of my youth, 
when the Cheyenne were many. Our warriors were like huge bears, and the white soldiers were like wolves that stay in their dens. But in those days, we caught the wolves outside their dens, as it was done at Fetterman. Mm. Remember two stars? Mm. It was the winter after my dance on the pole. The Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho came together to drive the whites from our lands and to stop the building of forts among the graves of our dead. That night, Plum Man and I were taken to the lodge of the soldier chief. Only bad could come from talking to such a man. He was a white that had the stink of death about him. The sergeant tells me you two had a part in the Fatiman massacre. Now write down the names of all the Cheyenne present in this fort that had any part in the massacre, and I'll let you two go. Well? I don't reckon they can write, Captain. Take down the names, Sergeant. Yes, sir. He is wrong. We were not at the place you talk of. That right, Sergeant? I heard him talking about it myself, Captain. It was a story told to us by others. Don't lie to me, Injun. What's your name? Two Stars. Well, let me tell you, Two Stars. My brother was one of those you killed that day. Now, you give me those names or I'll have you shot. Very well. Sergeant, see that these two are locked away from the others and kept there until the Cheyenne moves south. You will send us south? Oh, no, not you two. You'll be dead by then. But the rest of your scum are being sent away back where they belong. No! Come man, wait! Get that other engine. I want him dead. Plum man had escaped. I was beaten until I could no longer feel the pain. Then I was made to stand in a box of iron with iron ropes about my wrists. It was a punishment that only a white man could think of. A box for the dead. Only I was alive. Hey, engine, two stars, you hear me? I hear. You give me the names of those who took part in the Fetterman massacre, and you can come out. Hmm. Suit yourself, then. See how long you'll last in that box. Captain, the Cheyenne have barricaded themselves in the barracks. What? And they're armed. Their squaws must have hid the guns in their clothes. Damn, I should have had the women searched as well. You want me to order the men to break in? No. No, there's a better way. Dull knife! I order you and your people to come out of that barracks. Very well. No food or water until you come out. Now, just to show you a fair man, send out the women and children. This is January, the middle of winter. No food or water, dull knife. No wood for the stove. How long do you think you'll last? Well, have it your way, then. When you do come out, you'll be punished. Just as two stars is being punished now. Every day for a week, the soldier chief came to talk to Dullknife. They had no food, no water, no way to keep warm. Still, my people would not give in. I was proud to be Cheyenne. Then came the sound which I have heard in my sleep ever since. What I feared most came true that night. Dullknife and the others broke out of the barracks. They were trying to escape but the soldiers were waiting with guns. My people were shot down. Of all times, that night was the saddest night of all. The next day, the iron box was opened and I was let out. My legs were weak from standing, my lips swollen and cracked, but I was not hungry for food, only for the death of those whites. Now will you go south? Finish the killing. You stupid engine. Sixty-four Cheyenne dead, Captain. Seventy-eight prisoners been recaptured, but about twelve are still missing, including dull knife. Very good, Sergeant. We'll keep the patrols out. As for you, engine, you can see it does no good to try and escape. I want you to tell your people to go to Oklahoma peacefully. Hear me. We would rather die from bullets here than from the sickness in the south. Send us to live with this. Damn you people for being so stubborn. 
Very well. Some of your people can go to the Pine Ridge Agency. But the troublemakers will be sent back to Oklahoma. None will go south. Don't push me, Injun. You and those I choose go south. Or I'll shoot the whole damn bunch of you. So I made only one decision as a leader of the Cheyenne. And no more blood was spilled. The men were sent south. But I escaped from the soldiers and found my friend Plum Man living in the hills. The old way was hard now. The buffalo were gone. The whites were clever. They killed the buffalo and my people at the same time. Our bellies were empty. We needed food. But when Plum Man tried to take a white man's cow, he was shot down. The killer of Plum Man is also dead. I have seen to it. And now, I have come to Pine Ridge so that all of you who remained may know all that has happened. The spirit above and the Mother Earth know that the words I have spoken are true. My friends, you have heard what Two Stars has to say. You were brought here because the soldiers have found the white man two stars killed. The yes-sayers among us have already told the soldier chief at Robinson that two stars is here at Pine Ridge. If he is caught, the soldiers will hang him with a rope. Two stars, you have asked my counsel, and now I give it. You must go far away before the soldiers come. You must go to Canada and live with Sitting Bull's people. No. I am tired of running from the whites. Send a man to the soldier chief and tell him I am guilty. Tell him I will not be choked by the white man's rope. I will die like a Cheyenne. The conclusion of our story, after these words. Product value. Sears Laboratories work to maximize that value for you. Its manufacturing consultants work with products and their manufacturers to cut production costs. One example is our power spray carpet cleaner. Its plastic parts require molds to form them. Molds are expensive, especially certain designs. So our manufacturing consultants recommended designs that cut mold costs. End result, a better value for you. Sears Laboratories. One reason Sears is where America shops for value. We're doing a lot to save gasoline, and it's working. Driving at a moderate speed and a smooth, steady pace helps us save even more. So keep it up, America. Keep it up. Keep it up. You've been great. You've been saving. Coming through and going is tough. A public service of the U.S. Department of Energy and the Ad Council. Keep on doing your best, keep it up, keep it up. On an early spring morning in 1879, a detail of troops from Fort Robinson came to the Pine Ridge Agency to arrest the Cheyenne Two Stars. The troops, under the command of Captain Wessels, deployed for a charge 50 yards from the village and there halted with weapons drawn. Sergeant, I want this engine captured alive. No firing unless I give the order. Yes, sir. Two stars, you are hereby charged with murder. Will you surrender peacefully? It is a good day to die. What the hell's he doing, Sergeant? Earth have pity. He's chanting, Captain. Sky, see your son. Oh, he's chanting his death song. It is better to die fighting. It is a good day to die. Hey. With the memory of all that his people had suffered still fresh in his mind, two stars charged Captain Wessels and his troops. The Cheyenne would be avenged this day. Shouldering his carbine, two stars took aim. Captain! Captain Wessels slumped to the ground, a bullet deep in his chest. Ah! Troop! 
fire! Astronauts report it feels good. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. The American Eagle. 10, 9. Ignition sequence starts. 4, 3, 2, 1. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. We set sail on this new You're looking good here. Because there is new knowledge and new rights to be won. Is that something? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the and other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. The Eagle has landed. Roger, tranquility. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. America. It speaks for itself. Thank you. From the Freedom's Foundation at Valley Forge. That's one small step for man. One The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Death Song, A Cheyenne Memory, was written by Steve Sherrod and produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Lauren Green. Our stars were Len Berman, Marvin Miller, and Vic Perrin. Featured in the cast were John Larch, Drew Boardman, and Parley Bear. John Harlan speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you in part by Sears, a name that means quality and value, a name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. And by Pillsbury Frosting Supreme, so smooth and creamy you can spread it with a paper knife. This is Andy Griffin. Tomorrow at this same time, by golly, we're going to work on your funny bone. Join us, won't you? Just for laughs. <laughs>